SNES Drunk. When I first made this channel project thing called SNES Drunk, I wanted the focus to be on how certain games have held up over time. But every once in a while, I do like to talk about the original context in which these games were made and released. And nothing encapsulates that better than the experience of renting a game. Whether you went to Blockbuster, Hollywood Video, Mr. Movies, Video Update, or even crappy Video Vision in South St. Paul next to Highway 52, the process was usually the same. You looked to see if your favorites were available for rent, and they usually weren't. But then you'd take a look at some of the more polished titles, maybe some other game you've heard about in a magazine or something, games from developers like Capcom, Konami, or Squaresoft, or even first-party titles from Nintendo themselves. My personal favorite was renting an RPG like Breath of Fire or Earthbound or whatever, and seeing someone else's save files, and seeing what ridiculous names people came up with for the characters. Sure, let's name Chrono Spork, why not? I don't know about you, but I always treated these save files with a certain amount of respect. It was always fun to dive into them to see further into the game than you might not normally have time for, but I'd never save over them unless there were no other save slots to use. But even then, I always felt bad for saving over someone else's game. But yeah, sadly, games of that quality were almost always checked out too. And once you saw that those were all gone, that's when you have to roll the dice on a game that you've never played before. Sometimes you'd strike gold. Hell, I can remember renting Top Gear on a whim, and to this day it's one of my absolute favorite games ever. But I can also remember renting crap like Bill Ambeer's Combat Basketball. Screw that game. And that brings me to the main point of this video. You know how certain arcade games back in the day had these absurd difficulties? spikes that would pop up out of nowhere? Those were derisively called quarter munchers, and there was a similar phenomenon in the home console industry when it came to renting games. A good way to describe these would be rigged rentals. Big thanks to Andrew for this idea and for coining that term. Some of you may know him as either Critical Android or as Stoss Drunk. Check out his content any way you can. But anyway, one of the best examples of a rigged rental was Lion King. Here's a cute and colorful, happy, bouncy game where you start out playing as Simba, hopping on enemies, climbing trees. Seems simple enough, but dear god, this game is hard. It's seriously one of the hardest games of the 16-bit era. It's completely ridiculous. All I gotta do is mention this stupid section here with the hippo tails. You gotta be pixel perfect to get past this part. This game is filled to the brim with difficulty spikes that will have you shaking your head. I mean, the entire second level is is just insane. I mean, how are you supposed to know what you can jump on or hang on to? The fact that you hit a roadblock so early on in this game is confusing and frustrating. So why is this game like this? Were the developers just sadistic? Well, maybe, but the entire idea behind making this game so difficult is so people wouldn't be able to beat the game in one rental. If you're able to crank through Lion King willy-nilly in just a couple of days, then you'd have no reason to pay full price to buy it. It's really that simple. And it explains a lot of game design choices back then. You can also see this in how a game is localized. Game rentals were practically non-existent in Japan, so rigged rentals really weren't a thing there, but in the US, Nintendo fought tooth and nail in the court system to make rentals illegal. They failed, so they had to resort to other tactics to get people to buy games instead of rent them. Of course, many of you that grew up renting NES games already know this, just look at Castlevania 3, but it continued with the Super Nintendo in slightly more subtle ways. Take Super Valis 4, for instance. In the Japanese version of this game, most enemies early on take one hit to destroy, and your health meter replenishes at the beginning of the next level after beating a boss. In the North American version, certain enemies take two or three hits to destroy, and your health meter does not replenish after a boss fight. It's the exact same game in every other aspect, but those two changes were made for one reason, to make it more difficult to beat the game on one rental. One of the most famous examples of this isn't a Super Nintendo game, but a Sega Genesis title, Contra Hardcore. The North American version is just brutally difficult. It's your typical Contra action with enemy projectiles flying all over the place, crazy stuff happening left and right, and one hit kills you and you only get five continues. It's a hell of a challenge. But if you play the Japanese version of the game, you get a health meter. It takes three hits to kill you instead of one, and you get unlimited continues. Playing the North American version as is though, especially back when this game was first released, ugh, this, that is the definition of a rigged rental. 
Another way a game could be a rigged rental is if the game itself didn't explain all its mechanics, making the player rely on the instruction manual. What sucked about this is that not every rental store gave you any kind of game instructions. I can remember Mr. Movies in West St. Paul providing a Xeroxed copy of the manual with each rental, and later on, Hollywood Video would just print their own version of the game instructions on the back of the plastic rental case. Sometimes, though, you just got a game without any clue how to play it. Take Spawn, for instance. This is actually capable of being a pretty fun game, but it's one of those titles where every special move you can do is some overly complicated nonsense. I mean, look at this. To do a burning fist attack, you hold the R button, then hit right, then left on the D-pad, and then press X. To teleport, you hold R again, then roll the D-pad counterclockwise all the way around, starting with up, and then press Y. It's stupidly convoluted and not intuitive in the slightest, so if you're playing Spawn without the manual, there's no way you're going to figure out any of the special moves unless you're just button mashing and you get really lucky. So as a result, the game is going to suck. Thankfully, now we have sites like GameFAQs to help us out with stuff like this, but back then you were pretty much screwed and missing out on an essential part of the game, and that's what makes it the definition of a rigged rental. Well, that's all for now. Did you have any bad experiences from renting a game way back when? Any game that sticks out to you as a rigged rental? Let me know in the comments. And I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Drunk. So far, I've looked at Batman games, Battletoads games, so now it's Spider-Man's turn. The first Super Nintendo game featuring Spider-Man was Spider-Man and X-Men in Arcade's Revenge, where the X-Men are taken captive by the crazy-ass supervillain Arcade. First, Spider-Man has to rescue Wolverine, then Wolverine rescues Cyclops, on and on one at a time. You do play the most as Spider-Man though, assuming you get all the way through this ridiculously tough game. The platforming is good enough, it's especially fun to play as Spider-Man, climbing walls and stuff. You'll find that to be a recurring theme in this video, believe it or not. One thing that stands out here is how frickin' weird this game looks. If they were going for a crazy aesthetic to match the villain's personality, they may have outdone themselves, because this is a frickin' mess. The music is also a weird fit. I like it, but it's just not what I would have expected. Also, one nitpick I have as a Gambit fanboy, his weapon sucks. Come on, who tosses playing cards like the rocks like that? That's terrible. Anyway, this also came out a couple years later on the Genesis, but the levels are all exactly the same, so the only difference is how it sounds and looks, based on the different hardware. Spider-Man and X-Men in Arcade's Revenge is just a slight notch above okay. It's certainly not a classic, but it's not bad either. Next we have Spider-Man and Venom in Maximum Carnage, perhaps more famously known as one of the two red Super Nintendo cartridges. And yeah, if you want a red cart for your Super Nintendo collection, get this one instead of Doom. This is a classic side-scrolling beat-em-up with a few other levels thrown in for variety, like climbing buildings and web-slinging around the city. The visual presentation and structure of this game is as good as any comic book game I've ever played. It's really good. The pixel art lends itself so well to the comic format that it makes me wish other games did this too. However, despite the title, Maximum Carnage is single player only, so that seriously hampers the replay value here. You do eventually get the option of picking between Spidey and Venom for a few stages at a time, so that's nice. I've heard that the ending differs depending on who you finish the game with, but this game got so hard and so frustrating that I never found out for myself. But yeah, if you're a fan of the Spider-Man comic, this is the game to get, because holy crap, they shoehorned as many characters as they could think of into this game. And also I gotta mention the soundtrack to this game was written and produced by the band Green Jelly. You know, the guys who did the song about the three little pigs? So yeah, the soundtrack really sounds fantastic. My only criticism about the gameplay is that the beat-em-up mechanics are a bit limited. I'd like a few more special moves, like in Final Fight, how Hagar has the pile driver and Cody has the spinning kick. Sure, Spidey can sling around, but it's really just to avoid stuff more than anything. They do have a token system where random superheroes show up to help you, but I would have liked something a little more in the form of a move from Spider-Man himself. Either way, this is an excellent game and one of the better beat-em-ups on the Super Nintendo. It's also worth mentioning really quick that this game was also released on Genesis, but it's pretty much the exact same game.
Then we have Venom and Spider-Man Separation Anxiety. Kind of a goofy title, but whatever. And that's a direct sequel to Maximum Carnage. This game is multiplayer and allows you to pick between Spider-Man and Venom from the very beginning of the game, so there's an improvement. However, this game really feels half-assed compared to its predecessor. The comic panels and kick-ass pixel art are reduced to just text, and the Spider-Man and Venom sprites look kind of flat. I mean, just look at Venom's tongue just lifelessly hanging out of his mouth. What is he, gnawing on a jalapeno or something? The combat also feels a bit flimsy by comparison, and you've got the same enemies as the first game. Separation Anxiety just feels like a blatant cash-in, you're way better off playing Maximum Carnage. That's as simple as I can sum up this game. I mean, it almost seems like Maximum Carnage is the sequel to Separation Anxiety because that game does just about everything better, like they took time to improve each and every aspect after doing a mediocre job, but in reality it's the exact opposite. Weird. The one advantage Separation Anxiety has is that it's multiplayer, so I guess if you really need a multiplayer Spider-Man beat-em-up, then there you go. Next we have Spider-Man the Animated Series, or simply Spider-Man as the box says. This game is more of an action platformer that reminds me of the first X-Men game for Genesis with Spidey's range of motion and the large level layout. Am I alone in thinking the Spider-Man sprite here is just funny looking? I mean he looks like a 5'3 guy that compulsively bench presses things. Anyway, this game is just okay. The controls are a little awkward to get used to, and you have a limited amount of spiderweb to fling around. That's kind of an annoying handicap to work with. There's six large levels to traverse through, so you get plenty of opportunities to do all the classic Spider-Man stuff. Again, there's a huge cast of characters from the Spider-Man universe that show up, and FYI, this is mainly where the Super Nintendo and Genesis versions of the game differ. Some characters will overlap, but for the most part, there's different people in different games. Again, I want to point out the music and sound here are very good. It seems like they are in every Spider-Man game for some reason. The music in particular here is a bit goofier and off-kilter, kind of like Spider-Man and X-Men in Arcade's Revenge, but it fits the game just fine. I like this game better than Separation Anxiety because the visuals and comic storytelling are much better and help give this game some life to it. I'd still much rather play Maximum Carnage though. Last, we have a game exclusive to the Super Famicom, The Amazing Spider-Man Lethal Foes. And right off the bat, check out the cover art here. Now that is frickin' badass. And yeah, staying on that theme, this game is fantastic looking, on the same level as Maximum Carnage with sharp colors and fluid animation. The controls, however, are pretty strange and hard to get used to. You hold the R button as you press X to traverse across rooftops, but it's not as easy as it sounds because it's easy to flail out of control at any second. Also, this game is very easy. Spider-Man can take a ton of damage and the enemies are total pushovers, including the bosses. Speed is the name of the game here though, as you gotta reach checkpoints before the time runs out. However, that's also pretty dang easy to do as well. So yeah, this game might be a neat curiosity on the surface, but the controls are just too awkward and the game is way too easy for it to be anything more than a novelty. It's pretty easy to get bored with this one quickly. Anyway, that wraps it up for Super Nintendo Spider-Man games, and as you might expect, I'd pick Maximum Carnage as the best game of the bunch. Its comic book layout of the story is really cool, the soundtrack is kick-ass, and as far as traditional 16-bit beat-em-ups go, it's better than average. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day! Schnastrunk. The Super Nintendo has three very different Batman games in its library. Batman Returns, Batman Forever, and The Adventures of Batman and Robin. Let's start with Batman Returns, which is a classic styled beat-em-up made by Konami, although if I didn't know any better, I'd think this game were from Capcom. This game has a big Final Fight vibe with the huge sprites, crisp sound, and very satisfying gameplay. Yep, that's right, this is another beat-em-up with a great punch kick sound. That's like my trademark at this point. One thing this game does very well is allow you to get all the enemies on one side of the screen, and this is critical in a game like this if you want to be able to progress far and see the whole game. Not only that, you can knock guys' heads together like the Three Stooges. You can even throw guys through windows, which is freaking awesome. You're also able to block, which is useful, and you get a variety of weapons to use. There's a surprising bit of variety in the gameplay as well. One stage has you use Batman's belt grappling hook to avoid enemy fire here, and another stage has you gun down goons in the Batmobile. The game follows the movie pretty closely, if that's important to you. Catwoman and Penguin are prominently involved, of course, and there's lots of cutscenes with images straight from the movie. Batman Returns also saw releases on NES, Sega Genesis, Sega CD, Game Gear, and lots of other systems, but I can't speak to any of those. All I can say is that the Super Nintendo version is a very strong beat-em-up, and a somewhat rare case of a movie-licensed game being a lot of fun. 
Next, we traverse back in the complete opposite direction with Batman Forever. Now, this is the kind of lazy, half-assed crap we're used to seeing from licensed games, because this is awful. Angry Video Game Nerd already took a dump on this game, and I can't say it better than he can, but still, this game is a massive disappointment. First of all, the character animations, D-pad controls, and buttons are all cloned from the Mortal Kombat series. It's clunky and stiff enough as a fighting game, but it's way worse as a platformer. Yeah, that's right, this game is a platformer, or it tries to be, sort of. Right away you have no freaking clue where to go until you dick around and find that you're supposed to go up somehow using Batman's belt grappling hook. And how do you use this? You press select and then up. What the hell is that? And then to jump down someplace, you'd think it'd be selecting down, maybe, but no, it's down in R. What, did they just throw a bunch of buttons into a hat and just pull out a bunch of random combinations for random shit? It's just awful. Now, sometimes mediocre gameplay can be forgiven in games like this as long as they nail the presentation, like for example, X-Men for Sega Genesis. But number one, the gameplay here is much worse than mediocre, and number two, everything is way too dark, and Batman looks like 90s Batman, but Robin inexplicably looks like 1966 Robin. Why? And the villains here are all these doofy looking guys. What exactly are they going for here? It's just a big mishmash of random shit, and it just doesn't work. This game is seriously bad. Adventures of Batman and Robin, however, might be the best game of the three. This one is based off of the outstanding Batman animated series. This is yet another great Konami title that nails down the visual style of the source material perfectly. Plus, this game has friggin' everybody. Joker, Penguin, Catwoman, Poison Ivy, Scarecrow, Alfred, Commissioner Gordon, on and on. This is how you make a stylish action platformer. Take note, Batman Forever. Batman has tons of abilities, and they're all intuitive. You can grab enemies and toss them, just like in a beat-em-up. You can duck and do a roll by pressing down and jump, and the A button uses Batman's special weapon, of which he has several. The Batarang, smoke bombs, x-ray goggles, a grappling gun, and each one is useful more than once throughout the game. Not only that, but the old wall jump is back from the NES game. That's awesome. The music is tremendous, just as it is in the series. And it can't be overstated how great this game looks. I mean, just look at this. If there's a flaw, it's these clunky overhead Batmobile stages. It reminds me of the overhead stages in Contra 3, but worse. I just wanted to get past these so I could play some more of the platforming stages. Also, despite the title, this game is single player only. Robin isn't even a playable character. Not that anyone would care, but still. There's also a Genesis version which is way, way different. It's a multiplayer run and gun game that even includes shoot 'em up levels. And it is insanely fun in its own right. In fact, it might be one of the 20 best Genesis games ever. It's that good. It's almost like a Batmanized version of Pocky and Rocky or Gunstar Heroes. Be forewarned though, the music is terrible, and it's really really hard, but that game is definitely worth checking out. So there you go, three distinctly different Batman Super Nintendo games. Check out Batman Returns if you're pining for an old school beat-em-up, avoid the hell out of Batman Forever, and definitely check out Adventures of Batman and Robin on both Super Nintendo and Genesis. But here's the depressing part where I mention the prices. Adventures of Batman and Robin is like 70 bucks for Super Nintendo, but luckily it's around like 12 bucks for Sega Genesis, and same with Batman Returns. Anyway, thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your day. Marvel Super Heroes War of the Gems certainly sounds like it should be a good game. On paper, there's a lot to like. It's from Capcom, and they rarely did wrong back then. The game certainly looks nice, the music is cool, the story layout here is based on the Infinity Gauntlet series, where Adam Warlock calls for the help of his superhero buddies to seek out the powerful Infinity Gems before they fall into the wrong hands. Wait, what is this? Final Fantasy, the beat em up? Anyway, yeah, I know the arcade game has the same story, but this is not a port. It's original for the Super Nintendo, and instead of being a straight ahead beat em up, the game is structured the same way as X-Men Mutant Apocalypse, where you've got five superheroes to choose from to play four stages in any order before unlocking the final stage. Captain America, Iron Man, the Hulk, Wolverine, and Spider-Man are all playable characters here, and again, just like Mutant Apocalypse, the gameplay utilizes a couple Street Fighter-style commands to do special attacks, so that's cool. Sadly, War of the Gems has a fatal flaw, the level design. This is some of the most half-assed design I can ever remember seeing. I mean, you've got these cool-ass comic book superheroes with badass powers, and what does the game have you do with them? Them, smash walls. Smash lots and lots of walls. The basic gist of each level is walk to the right until it stops scrolling, come to a clearing, beat up three or four enemies, then keep going. Maybe a wall gets in the way every so often that you have to smash. Sometimes you'll have to jump a couple times. 
Alright, the game's not that bad. I just want to get across the point that this game plays very dull, and a large part of that is because of the level design. It's still somewhat fun in a beat-em-up sort of way, and there is a little bit of platforming here, but it still comes across as lifeless. Mutant Apocalypse at least has some parts that allow the mutants to take advantage of their agility, like Beast hanging from the ceiling, or Gambit and Psylocke having plenty of opportunities to show off their quickness, or to just have something that allows them to take advantage of their mutant abilities. Instead, War of the Gems has stuff like the Aquarium level, where you're stuck underwater moving in slow motion and, you guessed it, smashing walls. Oh, and you have to move as quickly as you can or you'll run out of oxygen. Come on, I thought the whole point of a superhero game like this was to do cool superhero stuff, not kick down barriers at half speed. Trying to stay positive here, the superhero sprites are at least really well done. Spider-Man and Wolverine can climb walls, that's pretty cool. Captain America and Spider-Man can attack from a distance with projectile attacks, and it's cool finally being able to play as Iron Man in an SNES game. There's also a training room here that converts the game into a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. Although it's not all that good, because it plays so slowly, it uses beat-em-up mechanics of course, instead of traditional fighting game mechanics. Maybe the best feature this game offers is that there's potential alternate paths that can be opened up if you finish a level with a certain character, so that's a nice touch. And hey, the pixel art for these cutscenes is freaking sweet too. Really, if all you're interested in is just playing as your favorite superheroes here, then I'm not gonna slag on anyone for that. I mean, the game gets the job done in that aspect. I mean, yeah, War of the Gems looks cool, sounds good, the music is nicely done, the hit detection and all that are fine. It's just the layouts to do all this stuff in make the game fall completely flat. If you're looking for a Marvel superhero game on the Super Nintendo, X-Men Mutant Apocalypse is so much better. Or Maximum Carnage, or Separation Anxiety, or hell, I'd personally rather play X-Men and Spider-Man in Arcade's Revenge rather than this. But hey, if you just want to smash walls with the Hulk, go for it, there's plenty of them here. SEGA DRUNK Obviously, I was a Super Nintendo kid during the 16-bit wars. I hated everything about the Genesis, the same way Minnesota Vikings fans hate the Green Bay Packers. I didn't think the Genesis sucked necessarily, I just didn't like it on principle. I had picked my side, well, actually my parents picked it for me, so I felt like I belonged to something, I felt obligated to defend it and dismiss everything else. Gotta support the team. However, there was one game in particular I was always jealous of. I really wish the Super Nintendo had a game like the Genesis had for X-Men. I loved X-Men as a kid, and this game predated the Super Nintendo game, X-Men Mutant Apocalypse, by nearly two years. What I like best about this game is that it really feels like a team game. There's a ton of characters. You get four to choose from at the start, Wolverine, Nightcrawler, Gambit, and Cyclops. And you also have four other X-Men that you can call upon to help out. Kind of like a screen clear all special ability from Rogue, Storm, Iceman, and Archangel. You can also switch between the four playable characters as you're playing in the level, similar to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for NES. This is the perfect approach for the X-Men universe in a video game, and it's something that I really wish the Super Nintendo game did as well. So, what would the obvious appeal of an X-Men video game be? Playing as your favorite mutants, of course, or fighting them, for that matter, as this game features tons of classic villains as well. Granted, yeah, it would be nice to have more than four playable characters, but whatever, I appreciate the cameos from the others nonetheless. Of course it helps that everyone really looks great. The sprites are all true to their early 90s comic book form, and they got the colors absolutely dead on. That sounds simple, but it's very important for a comic book game, especially one as colorful as X-Men. They did a great job capturing each character's mutant power as well. For the story, the game technically takes place inside the Danger Room, which is basically the X-Men's version of the holodeck. Magneto transmits a virus into the Danger Room computer, just to be a dick I guess, and it disables the safety limits. I gotta say, that's a pretty convenient way to get all the prominent villains involved. Once the X-Men get rid of the computer virus, they head on up to Asteroid M to face Magneto himself. As for the actual gameplay, it's just average. It's good enough, I guess. It's way more of a platformer than a beat-em-up like Mutant Apocalypse. Jumping can be a bit iffy at times, and that's being kind, but that's when you call upon Nightcrawler and you just teleport your way around. Man, I love that. But yeah, I admit, I feel okay giving the game a pass for just average gameplay because, well, why are you playing an X-Men game? To play as the X-Men and to do cool stuff with mutant powers and stuff, right? If the gameplay is just average from an objective standpoint, that's fine, because if you're an X-Men fan, you're not going to be objective about this game. You're going to have an incentive to enjoy it because it nails the X-Men universe so well, from all the playable characters to the colors to the mutant powers. That's what's important. There are two glaring flaws that need to be addressed though. Number one is the sound design. 
Jesus, that's annoying. And number two is, holy Christ, this game is hard. Like NES hard. Asteroid M is preposterous. It doesn't help that the jumping kind of sucks. Ugh. Also, the game makes you reset your genesis to continue at a certain point. That's completely stupid. I admire the developers for trying something different, but sacrificing your progress in a really difficult game is not a good idea. Have I mentioned this game is hard as hell? Anyway, it's tricky to review a game like X-Men, but you gotta keep in mind its target audience. The gameplay is mediocre, nothing going out of your way to play, but if you like X-Men, you're much more likely to forgive that aspect, because the game gets the presentation down so well. And for that reason, I like it slightly better than X-Men Mutant Apocalypse, even if that game is objectively better in terms of gameplay, if that makes any sense. So yeah, it's pretty simple. If you like X-Men, check out X-Men for Genesis. Don't expect to get wowed, but it's still a fun time hanging out with your favorite mutant. Sega Drunk. My favorite thing about X-Men 2 The Clone Wars is right when you start the game, there's no title screen, no menu, no text, no nothing. You turn on your Genesis and you're dropped as a random X-Men character into a snowy 2D platforming landscape fighting bad guys to the death. That is awesome! Why can't more games do this? You advance through the stage and then you get to the title screen. Yeah, that's right, you have to earn that screen, damn it. I reviewed the first X-Men game a long while back, and it really took me a while to come up with ways to phrase how that game can still be pretty good even though objectively the gameplay isn't all that that great, so there was a lot of hand-wringing and stuff that had to be apologetically phrased. Thankfully, I don't have to do that with X-Men 2 The Clone Wars, this game is just flat out good. Everything that made the first X-Men game good is all here, the number of mutants, the fun use of mutant powers, the villains, the perfect use of that early 90s X-Men color palette, and it's corrected most of the mistakes that game made, like the iffy platforming and the annoying sound design. Even better, this time around there's no limit to how often you use your mutant power, which is really smart, because I mean, that's why people play X-Men in games, right? Not to punch and kick like any other game. People want to blast stuff with Cyclops and blow stuff up with Gambit and teleport with Nightcrawler. Some mutant powers can even be charged to a certain extent if you have enough health. But yeah, the same four X-Men are back from the original game, Wolverine, Gambit, Cyclops, and Nightcrawler, in addition to Psylocke and Beast being playable characters. Oh, and there's one more guy you can get after the third level, but I don't want to spoil it. I'll just say it's a long time coming being able to finally play as him. What makes this game really great, though, is that each of these characters aren't just ultra of the same basic sprite. Yeah, they have unique powers, but they also all have unique speeds, sizes, and ranges of motion that are accurate reflections of that particular mutant. So after you play X-Men 2 for a while, you start to get a feel for each character, so by proxy you get a feel for which character works for each level, whether it's the brute strength of Beast, Nightcrawler's dexterity and agility, Wolverine's resilience, or Gambit's speed. This really adds a lot of replay value to the game. There's hidden areas you can discover. It's the smaller, more detailed stuff like that that sets this game apart. I have to mention, of course, that this game is multiplayer as well. However, that brings about the game's biggest flaw, and that it's pretty frustrating to play with a second player because the screen doesn't always know where it wants to scroll, or if it wants to scroll at all, so that can get kind of tiresome. The game's story mirrors the story that was going on in the comics at the time, which was the Phalanx story arc. No, not this guy. It's this kind of techno-organic virus that indiscriminately spreads very easily through all sorts of living matter, sort of like the Borg but in virus form. The Phalanx is trying to assimilate Earth and the X-Men travel through all sorts of familiar settings you might recognize, like Magneto's mutant haven Avalon or the Savage Land. And of course you run into a potpourri of villains, everyone from Exodus to Deathbird to Apocalypse. I mentioned earlier that the sound design is much improved from the first game, but the soundtrack especially steps it up big time, with all sorts of memorable tracks that fit the game flawlessly, and a good soundtrack like this really goes a long way toward adding that much more energy to the action, and it works awesome here. The soundtrack here is so good that it got released on CD as part of the Sega Tunes series. So yeah, while the first X-Men Genesis game appealed strictly to X-Men fans, X-Men 2 The Clone Wars appeals to everyone, and if you're into X-Men, you're gonna like it that much more. In all likelihood, this is the best X-Men video game I've ever played, on console. Sorry, nothing will top the four-player arcade game. But yeah, this goes beyond just the regular licensed gaming stuff. Sure, it's awesome to play as your favorite mutants and fight the familiar villains, but they really got everything right, from giving every mutant a wide variety of strengths and weaknesses, creating huge levels that allow you to utilize all sorts of mutant powers, and allowing the player to play however they want. Want to blow shit up? Play as Gambit. Want to go berserker on their ass? Play as Wolverine. Want to sneak around? Play as Nightcrawler. It's freaking great, and it's one of the best games on the Genesis. Sinestron? 
Shaq Fu has been a running gag in the gaming community going on 20 years now. One big reason is the very forced attempt at the time by mainstream corporate America to make Shaquille O'Neal the latest and greatest marketable superstar athlete, a successor of sorts to Michael Jordan since he did the whole retirement thing to go play baseball. There were two problems with this. Number one, people saw right through it, and number two, everything Shaq touched turned to shit. His movies were terrible, his rap album was seen as a joke, and his video game, uh, wasn't exactly well received either. I really think though that this is one of those instances where people just absolutely load the idea of this game more than the game itself, because it's actually not that bad. In fact, it's not even half as bad as people like to say it is. It's just that the idea of Shaq Fu on the surface is so absurd and so forced, and it didn't help that there were a gazillion one-on-one -on -one fighting games out there anyway, so this just felt like one more hanger-on trying to leech off something popular. Also, believe me, this was up there with Bubsy in terms of how much this game was advertised. If you bought a gaming magazine, there were at least two ads in it for Shaq Fu, so overexposure and subsequent burnout also played a big part in why this game is hated by so many. As for the game itself, the Super Nintendo edition anyway, since that's what I have, it's fine. No, it's not worth going out of your way to play or track down, despite it going for an average of only 450 on eBay. And yeah, there's a lot of fighting games I'd much rather play instead, but Shaq Fu is largely inoffensive, uh, as long as you ignore the story, which features Shaq going into a dojo in Tokyo, getting sucked into another dimension, and rescuing a boy from a mummy. Sure, okay, whatever. In versus mode, there's seven fighters to choose from, everyone from Shaq himself to the evil mummy, to a couple monsters, to a catwoman person thing, to a magician. The graphics, backgrounds, and sprite work here are actually very good. Kudos to the game for making unique looking characters instead of doing the lazy sprite swaps. But all of the standard stuff is here, hard punch, quick punch, hard kick, quick kick, as well as move boost and taunt. I'll give Shaq Fu this much, it's got some personality. It's a weird personality, but it does have one. Anyway, pressing back or forward while holding the move boost button allows your character to, to kind of teleport a short distance, and that'll be useful because jumping in this game is terrible. You either jump straight up or leap across the screen at a set distance. One thing I have to mention about the fighting gameplay is that it really feels like there's a delay between when you press a button or a direction and when it actually happens on screen. That's uh, kind of a major problem, and it's another reason why people crap on this game, I would guess. You do kind of get used to it, and also bear in mind that the people that made games like Flashback and Out of This World also worked on Shaq Fu. If you think of this game in those terms, the way those games play, it's a little easier to digest. It really seems like they were going for something huge here the same way those games did, but it just didn't work out as a fighting game. Don't get me wrong, Shaq Fu is perfectly playable. It does feel awkward at first though. It's worth pointing out by the way that there is a blood code in this game. There's not a lot of blood, but it does unlock some mildly amusing finishers. So yeah, Shaq Fu isn't very good, but it's far, far from the worst game ever. I mean, how can anyone call it that when the SNES port of Pit Fighter is right there? There is also horrible crap like Street Combat and Rise of the Robots, so this isn't even in the top three worst fighting games on the Super Nintendo. But the legend lives on, for better or for worse, to the point that a sequel was crowdfunded and is being made right now. Boy, people sure do love their irony, don't they? There's also weird stuff like ShaqFu.com, whose mission is to destroy all copies of this game. Okay, I'm not sure what that's supposed to accomplish, but whatever. Shaq Fu is ultimately a harmless, forgettable fighting game with a couple notable strengths, like the graphics and animation, and it's got a lot of weaknesses, but there's really not too much that's offensive here. But hey, if you simply can't get enough Shaq Fu, the Genesis has five more playable characters, a few extra stages, and a longer story mode, so there you go. If you're looking for the worst game on the Super Nintendo, Shaq Fu is not it. Go play Pit Fighter instead. Wait, no, what am I saying? Don't play Pit Fighter it's horrible. Go play Shaq Fu instead. It's uh, better than Pit Fighter. Snatch Jack? There were four Street Fighter II games for the Super Nintendo. That's a lot for a genre game that consists of one-on-one -on -one fighting and not much else. Are there really that many differences between the four games? In some ways, yeah, definitely, but in other ways, no, not really. The core gameplay of Street Fighter II has never changed that much, the more sequels it spawned, but I still thought it would be helpful to at least compare the four games to see how they hold up today. The games at their core are so similar that ultimately I have to admit it comes down to pure subjectivity. You're just gonna like what you're used to, or what you grew up with, and of course 
course, there's nothing wrong with that. Anyway, let's start with the original Street Fighter 2, The World Warrior. There's only 8 playable characters here, and the first thing you notice when you play the game is how slow it is. Like, the fights are happening underwater. And I'm not saying just compared to Street Fighter 2 Turbo, I mean compared to every other Super Nintendo fighting game. To be fair though, this game still holds up really well. All the inputs and special moves are responsive, and have a consistent rhythm. The sound and music are both great, and the pixel art is top notch. If you were to play this game on its own without knowing the existence of the other Street Fighter games, you'd think this game was as good as any fighting game could get, really. It's just that the other Street Fighters came along and made it that much better. Starting with Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and yeah, the speed increase here can't be overstated. Some people don't like how fast it is, and that's fine. Personally, I love it. The speed increase adds another layer of difficulty onto the gameplay. Going from the first version to Turbo is like drinking Jameson to drinking 21-year-age Jameson. It's a whole new ball game. But it's a fair, even test of skill that is unlike any other game. Seriously, if you're able to master the controls of any character here with how fast this is, then dang, you are the real deal. I guess that's what I really like about this version. The challenge is really appealing to me, but the difficulty is never unfair. But hey, if speed isn't your thing, you can still play normal mode here too. One thing I gotta point out about the first two Street Fighter games is the sound. I love the heavy kick and heavy punch sound effect. It just has this deepness to it. It's so satisfying just to crush someone with one of those. Plus the voices here, from the announcers and the characters, are really well done. There's 12 playable characters, and you fight your own character, which I always liked. A few of the characters have some new moves here, like Dalsim's Yoga Teleport, and Chun-Li has a fireball now. I remember this being a really big deal at the time. It also warrants mentioning that the Nintendo Power Player's Guide says that less energy is drained when you're attacked, so the matches last longer, so that's pretty interesting. I never realized that at the time, but after playing for a while, it's definitely true. The pixel art is cleaned up a bit as well, so Guile doesn't look like J.K. Simmons with a flat top. Lots of little touches were added like the animated backgrounds, and the announcer is more involved. Street Fighter 2 Turbo is really what sequels were all about in the early 90s. More, better, faster. Can't argue with that. Next is what I would consider a true sequel, Super Street Fighter 2. The turbo aspect is pretty much gone, but the pacing is still faster than the original. There's some new game modes here, Group Mode, Tournament, and Time Challenge, and these are very welcome additions to the series for sure to add some variety. The gameplay is also spruced up a bit with a combo system, so that's pretty cool. There's four new characters here, and they're hit and miss. Fei Long and Kami are good additions, but T-Hawk and DJ don't really stand out. The big difference here between Super Street Fighter 2 and the first two games is the sound. Listen for yourself. That might seem minor, but to me, that's a big deal. The whole point of kicking someone's ass in a fighting game is that it should feel satisfying, and a big contributor to the feel of a game is the sound. That weak slapping sound is not satisfying at all. There's a new announcer here, too. What happened to the original guy? This guy sucks! Anyway, the difference here depends on how you feel about Super Street Fighter 2's extra game modes. The sound and the challenge the extra speed presents are the biggest differences that have me prefer Turbo over Super Street Fighter 2. Then we have Street Fighter Alpha 2, and wow, this game is in another universe. It's almost like alternate timeline Street Fighter. There's all new artwork with some incredible graphics and animation. There's tons of new characters, including some from other games like Rolento, one of the bosses from the original Final Fight arcade game. This game plays like a precursor to future fighting games like the Marvel vs. Capcom series. There's fundamental changes to the gameplay here too. While most of the moves are the same, there's another layer of complexity on top of everything. You can stick with the old reliable moves, but you gotta learn the new combo and special moves to beat the tougher opponents. Street Fighter Alpha 2 brings back the turbo feature, but there's fewer game modes overall. And also there's no button map here, you can't switch around what button is what attack, and that's kind of a bummer. Anyway, Street Fighter Alpha 2 got at least a dozen ports to all sorts of other systems, but the Super Nintendo port is very well done, one of the most impressive pieces of work ever put together on the console, especially in terms of visuals. In fact, this along with Star Ocean is one of the only cartridges to feature the SDD1 chip, which decompresses graphics on the fly, that's high tech stuff. As for the gameplay, they did a nice job keeping it familiar while adding some new wrinkles. Anyway, like I said at the beginning of the video, there's no wrong answer between any of the four Street Fighter games. All four are really well made, but your preference is going to depend on what you're most comfortable with. Whether that be the more deliberately paced Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior, the intense challenge of Street Fighter 2 Turbo, the updated graphics, additional characters, and game modes of Super Street Fighter 2, or the off-the-wall alternate universe gameplay of Street Fighter Alpha 2. My preference is still Street Fighter 2 Turbo, because I love the sound and I really enjoy the challenge the speed presents. Feel free to list your favorite and why in the comments. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day.
That's drunk. The original Star Fox for Super Nintendo is the hardest game for me to review because it's the ultimate example of objective thinking versus subjective bias. Personally, I love this game. Back in 1993, I got it for my birthday a couple weeks after it was released. Flying around in your own spaceship, shooting lasers, blowing stuff up, complete with a Star Wars inspired soundtrack? It's like this game was custom made for me as a kid. I think I've beaten Star Fox more than any other game. Trying to put all that aside is really a challenge, so I hope you bear with me. The bottom line is, 1993 was over 20 years ago, it doesn't matter anymore. The question is, does playing Star Fox have any value in this day and age, even if you don't have any nostalgic attachment to it? Now let's get it out of the way right now. When people talk about Star Fox, what's the first thing they notice and the first thing they mention? It's the graphics. And yes, aesthetically, they couldn't possibly look more outdated and trapped in the early 90s. I know it's very likely the graphic design of this game is the way it is because, well, it had to be that way, because of limitations in technology at the time, but they designed it in a way that kind of has its own artistic style to it. To me, to complain about the graphics is missing the forest for the trees. The visual style doesn't detach or distract from the core gameplay, in my opinion. The real problem with Star Fox is the frame rate and the slowdown that comes with pushing the hardware to its limits. Sometimes your ship can be slow to respond, especially on this rotating boss here, and on the land levels you get stuff popping up out of nowhere. Now that's a big time problem, and sadly that's a major hurdle that really keeps the game outdated. I have seen other videos on YouTube where the GSU-2 chip is overclocked, so the game plays like Star Fox Turbo. Sort of like Street Fighter 2 Turbo, right? The improvement though is minor at best, it kinda speeds it up, but I don't think it really makes that big of a difference. Anyway, despite the gameplay being limited to nothing but flying a ship around and shooting stuff, they at least do a nice job making the levels diverse. Sector Y has a certain calmness and serenity about it that I really love. Fortuna is really goofy with all sorts of strange animals and a totally whacked out boss. And to this day I still get a rush playing the Space Armada stage. And that's thanks to the music. With such simple, straightforward gameplay, Nintendo really needed to get the window dressing in this game right, and they hit it out of the park with this soundtrack. The Space Armada theme gives me goosebumps to this day, and the Venom music is outstanding. It really gives off a sense of urgency, like holy shit, you're almost to the end. In my opinion, that's what helps give the game value today, the variety in the levels and the music. The developers took a very simple idea, but did such an incredible job with the little things, the window dressing, so to speak. It's sad to say this game does not hold a candle to Star Fox 64 or to the Star Fox 64 re-release for the 3DS. If you want either an awesome rail shooter or you just want to enjoy the Star Fox universe, that's obviously the way to go. As for Star Fox on the Super Nintendo, it really depends on how much the limited frame rate and the pop-up issues bother you. They don't bother me, of course, because I have an incentive. But if you've never played Star Fox and you're playing it for the first time, it's, it's a good chance it could be a deal breaker. If you can get past those technological limitations though, Star Fox is a wonderful experience. That's start to finish one of the most fun games to play on the Super Nintendo, and that, in my opinion, is its biggest advantage and the best reason to play. It's so simple, you just plug it in, turn it on, and you start shooting enemy ships till they go boom. How can you beat that? That's drunk. In my review for Super Castlevania 4, I talked about how the mood and atmosphere surpassed the gameplay to the point that you just wanted to hang out and soak it all in. Unfortunately, as a linear platformer, you couldn't really do that in that game. You had to keep going. But in Super Metroid, the whole point of the game is to explore and discover, so the atmosphere is everything. If Nintendo didn't nail that aspect of this game, then it would have been dismal. But thankfully Nintendo hit it out of the freaking park. The music, the darker color palette, the enemies, the bosses, the backgrounds, and... Did I mention the music? The soundtrack is the most important part of Super Metroid, especially toward the beginning of the game when you first arrive at Zebus. You're just wandering around completely by yourself on this seemingly desolate planet, and you really do feel totally isolated. Oh god, what is this? But then you backtrack a bit into Mother Brain's lair and suddenly... Oh shit. There's monsters everywhere and the music kicks in. Oh shit. That's ultimately what separates Super Metroid from every other game, those moments in the game that make you say oh shit out loud. There are at least five or six of these moments and they just never get old. There's a famous one at the very end of the game when Mother Brain materializes a body from nothing. Oh shit. Those moments are just so good that I don't want to spoil any more of them, you just gotta experience them for yourself. I'll just say there's one that happens after you beat a certain boss. It was so unexpected and so freaking cool. 
Another thing that separates Super Metroid from any other game is that it rewards your curiosity and attention to detail. You ever play an old school RPG where you feel compelled to check everything just in case you'll find a hidden item or something, only it seems like you hardly find anything and you're just wasting your time? Well, in Super Metroid, you're almost never wasting your time being that thorough. I mean, that's the whole idea of the game. It invites you to find out all the hidden areas and items and upgrades and secret entrances or tunnels, and there's tons of them. And the game isn't too cryptic about where to go, but it's not too easy either. It even introduces a tool that helps you to spot secret areas if you're diligent enough. From a visual standpoint, the best part of the Super Metroid universe is that it comes across as lived in. I love the wrecked ship, both the area itself and the idea that it's simply called wrecked ship, which of course implies that other people have tried to explore this planet and they couldn't even freaking land, they wrecked their ship. Not only does Super Metroid reward your diligence through the gameplay itself, but it caps it off by featuring what I think is the best ending to any Super Nintendo game. I won't spoil it, but I can tell you it is brilliant. And again, the music and the sound design were the most important aspects of what make it as good as it is. Now, I do have a couple nitpicky flaws that bother me. First and foremost is the wall jump. It sucks. Okay, maybe it's just me and I suck at it, which is very possible, but I don't think it was done very well. There are a few instances, particularly in Norfair, where I got so friggin' tired of trying to do these ridiculous jumps, it's just tough to do it right consistently. Again, maybe it's just me. I also think Samus gets a little too overpowered towards the end of the game. The Ridley boss battle seems way too easy, and the Mother Brain battle is pretty easy as well. Again, this is total nitpicking, nothing major. But yeah, there's a reason Super Metroid is talked about as being one of the best Super Nintendo games ever. Every aspect of the game complements itself brilliantly. The nature of the gameplay, the soundtrack, and the darker graphics all fit together. There's a saying, the whole is greater than the mere sum of its parts. No game fits that saying like Super Metroid. In many videos, I've described the leap that certain game franchises take from the NES to the Super Nintendo as either NES games put on steroids, or NES games turned up to 11, or you get the idea. Perhaps the best example of that is the leap from Super Mario Bros. 3 to Super Mario World. And really, Mario 3 is Mario World's closest contemporary to this day, so that's going to be the main comparison I'm going to make here, where superior looking Super Nintendo platformers like Contra 3 and Super Castlevania 4 and the Mega Man X series only had anywhere between 6 and 20 something levels, Super Mario World had 96 to plow through, and with its flawless tight controls and classic Mario stylings, there's really just no other comparison on the Super Nintendo, not even its quote unquote sequel, Yoshi's Island. It's just in its own universe, which is pretty remarkable considering that it's a launch title. Anyway, while I understand Super Mario Bros. 3 will always have the nostalgic edge for many people, and yeah, it does do some things better, Super Mario World takes many, many things that game did and makes them better. Whether it's the new items like the feather, new interactive characters like Yoshi, a slew of new enemies like my favorite, Charge and Chuck, unlocking new stages on the world map like exclamation point blocks, and worlds like the Forest of Illusion, which just openly screw with you, the ghost houses and those are still fun to try and figure out, and the really fun Star World stages, which was another universe of difficulty compared to the rest of the game. And the main criticism I hear about Super Mario World is that the ability to fly basically breaks the game. My response is, well, kind of, but not really. Flying and staying in the air were a little bit of a tricky process. You need enough room to take off, and you need to time the backspace correctly to stay in the air evenly. And that's unlike games like Demon's Crest, where you literally press a button twice and you're flying anywhere you want. Now that's how you break a game. But still, even if flying is a process, the criticism remains that it robs the game of its difficulty. Uh, well, you know, there's really next to no threat of death in Super Mario World anyway, flying or no. The fun in Super Mario World is not in the challenge, at least not until you get to the Star World. The fun is plowing through all 96 levels. One of my favorite things to do in this game is to just sprint straight through it on a speedrun without dying and without stopping to unlock anything else. Super Mario World is reminiscent of Super Metroid in that there's more than one way to play it. It's very speedrun friendly, or you can take the time to explore and unlock everything, or you can go straight to the Star World from nearly the beginning of the game if you'd like. You can try to get 50s at the end of every level. The game is wide open for many different styles of players. Even furthering this point, what I really love nowadays is seeing the sheer amount of crazy ass homebrew levels that fans design and put on YouTube. It just goes to show the Super Mario World universe has a timelessness to it. And seriously, if you've never seen the auto Mario videos, YouTube search that right now. They are goddamn amazing. Going back to the NES comparison, where I give the advantage to Mario 3 is that the world themes were much stronger and much more fun. I mean, the world where everything's huge? Who doesn't love that? 
Really, the only memorable world team in Super Mario World is the Forest of Illusion, where you have to keep a lookout for alternate endings to levels so you can clear a path to the castle. I do wish Mario World had gotten more creative along the lines of the huge world in Mario 3, but I wouldn't blame the developers for thinking, well, we've already done that, let's do something else, like unlocking stuff on the world map. And that makes sense to me. Where I think Mario World has a clear advantage over Mario 3 is that Mario 3 has so many auto-scrolling levels. Seriously, those get so old. That's just my opinion, obviously, but I'm thankful there's only a handful of those levels in Super Mario World. Now, as far as comparing the controls, the graphics, the sound, and all that stuff, they're still very close, which is a testament to Mario 3 more than anything. But still, to me, nothing beats an afternoon of a Mario World speedrun. Over 20 years later, and it's still immensely satisfying to just bulldoze your way through this game. And hey, even if you aren't into speedruns, there's a multitude of other ways you can approach this game. That's the beauty of Super Mario World. Every time you go into a used game store, you know, one that actually has Super Nintendo cartridges, you're always going to find the same set of games no matter where you go. You're going to see crap like Balls 3D, you're going to see Mario is Missing, you'll probably see Rival Turf, I'm sure, and you'll definitely see like two dozen sports games. Always sports games, that's a guarantee. Why is that? Well, sports games have a short shelf life by nature. From year to year, players switch teams, making the rosters outdated. As a Minnesota Vikings fan, there was nothing more annoying to me as a kid than playing as the 1994 roster in, like, 1997. More than half these guys aren't even on the team anymore at this point. Come on, Warren Moon? Terry Allen? Screw these guys, I want to play as Randy Moss and Randall Cunningham. Sports games also got incrementally better from year to year by adding more and more features. They went from generic made-up teams to real teams to real players to full season stats. So most of the time, the older sports games simply just got left behind the same way cassettes and VHS tapes did. Anyway, the only real way for a sports game to stay relevant is to, uh, well, you know, actually be a good game on its own. Imagine that. And by good, I mean it's got to appeal in some way to people that don't give a crap about the sport. I think good examples of this are games like NHL 94, Tecmo Super Bowl, and Ken Griffey Jr. Presents Major League Baseball. Hey, we finally got to the game after that long-ass preamble, but anyway. Even if you don't give a crap about baseball, this game still is a blast to play. It's a perfect example of cartoony realism. The players look like cartoons with their over-muscled physiques, which actually fits the era in which this game came out, you know, with the steroids and all that kind of stuff, but the physics behind the game itself is realistic. Hitting is all timing, there's no targeting a pitch or anything like that. Pitching is very straightforward as well. I really like all the different batting stances and pitching motions. Dennis Eckersley's in particular is badass. Plus you gotta love when you strike a guy out, he snaps his bat over his knee like a twig. And sometimes a dude will actually yell at you. What dude? You swung and missed, don't, don't yell at me, asshole. Or sometimes he just kinda sighs, totally defeated, and sulks back to the dugout to go listen to some Morrissey or something. Whatever, dude. The game is paced really well, you can get a 9 inning game completed in less than 20 minutes. And it's got a season mode that lets you play through all 163 games if you want to, and it keeps stats along the way. Or you can just skip right to the playoffs. There's also a home run derby which is fun, but really flawed if you're playing the one player mode. Because you have to sit there and watch the computer go first, which takes forever. Whose idea was this? Also, I love the names they came up with some of the participants. You gotta love Can O'Corn and Nick Nohart. Speaking of names, the game has a Major League Baseball license, so it's got real teams and real stadiums. But one odd quirk is that while real players are included, as in their likenesses, but their names aren't. For example, this is clearly Kirby Puckett, and this is clearly Kent Herbeck, right down to their stats from 1993 and their batting stances. But Nintendo, for whatever reason, was unable to get a license from the MLBPA to use real names. The only real name used in the game is, of course, Ken Griffey Jr. They could use their likenesses, though, for some reason, but not their names. The game does let you change all the names, so it doesn't even matter anyway. And yes, when I was 12 years old, you better believe I sat in front of a pile of newspapers looking up every single player from box scores and changing their fake name to the correct one. It took me for like four hours, but damn it, it was worth it. I was 12, what the hell else was I gonna do? Or you could be like my friend from junior high who changed all the names on one team to male porn stars. When I asked how he knew the names of 20 different male porn stars, he did not have an answer for me. Also, it is worth noting that some of these fake names aren't just any fake names. For example, the Cincinnati Reds consist of authors like Bram Stoker and Philip K. Dick. The Milwaukee Brewers have Peter Parker, Bruce Wayne, and Clark Kent. 
It's pretty amusing. I have a link in the description that has more information in case you're ever curious about some of these guys. Anyway, this game is the best baseball game on the Super Nintendo because of the colorful artwork, the personality, and the pacing of the game. Stuff moves right along, it's never dull for too long. It's totally worth picking up today, I think, because of, like I said, the cartoon-like realism. The game has a lot of personality, and you just don't see much of that in modern baseball games. Sadly, they dropped the cartoon aspect in the sequel, Ken Griffey Jr.'s Winning Run, and the game just feels totally flat and dull as a result. I think they're going for more real, a realistic approach, but it's just its just not working. The colors aren't as bright, everything looks kind of lifeless, and listen to this music. Why so serious? It's a freaking baseball game. Anyway, yeah, if you're looking for a one baseball game for the Super Nintendo that's worth playing today, it's Griffey MLB. Zombies Ate My Neighbors is the Super Nintendo subreddit game of the month for October, fittingly enough. Just take one glance at the cover art, which is some of the best of the 16-bit era. In fact, the title alone, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, is just fantastic. There's no ambiguity here. You know exactly what you're getting into, and that's the realm of cheesy, campy horror movies. Being a ginormous Mystery Science Theater 3000 fanboy since I was a kid, that's right up my alley. Zombies Ate My Neighbors is a simple top-down arcade-style shooter where you're able to shoot in eight directions in all sorts of different settings. A football field, a mall, your neighbor's yard. This game reminds me of games like Turtles in Time, in that the incentive to keep going is to see what crazy shit the game will throw at you next. The classic movie monsters are all here, from werewolves, vampires, giant babies, god I hate this thing, and oh yeah, zombies. And you shoot at them with an Uzi water gun, a fire extinguisher, a bazooka, or bomb them with explosive pop cans, and tons of other weapons you find along the way. Some of the levels get pretty inventive, like where you have to rely on these Jason-esque chainsaw-wielding guys to create a path for you to rescue some of the townsfolk. There's 55 levels total, and to advance you gotta rescue all your neighbors. This is where the map is very handy, so you're not wandering around forever wondering where the hell to go. If you can't save people fast enough, they die, and you won't have a chance to get them the rest of the game. However, you do occasionally get a second chance to save them. The best thing about Zombies Ate My Neighbors is that it's multiplayer, and not just that, it's very smooth with two players, there's no slowdown or anything like that, and the AI even amps up the difficulty a bit. And believe me, this game gets hard as hell. Anyway, you've got two characters to choose from, Zeke and Julie. I don't think they could have made this dude look 90s enough, that outfit could use some Zubas. If you want to learn about the differences between the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis version, you're not going to find a better resource than this video from Game vs. Game. I will quickly say though that the obvious difference is the status bar that squeezes the aspect ratio down on the Genesis version, while the Super Nintendo version has an overlaid map that can be toggled on and off. There was a quote-unquote sequel made called Ghoul Patrol. The original development of the game, however, had nothing to do with Zombies Ate My Neighbors. They just added some bells and whistles to make it look like it fit in alongside as a sequel, as kind of a cash-in. As a result, the game totally lacks personality, and also totally lacks a map, which is kind of weird. But yeah, it's okay at best, but it was never originally intended to be a sequel. Anyway, there really isn't any other game like Zombies Ate My Neighbors on the Super Nintendo. The closest, in terms of a match in gameplay and charm, is probably Super Smash TV, but even then, that game has a totally different vibe. But yeah, do you like to laugh? Do you like to shoot zombies and monsters? Do you like a challenge? Then check it out, and if that's not enough, it's one of the best multiplayer games of the 16-bit era, and it's worth tracking down just for that reason alone. When you think of 90s gaming, nothing invokes imagery quite like Doom for PC. If you felt you'd outgrown stuff like Mario and Sonic, and were already bored with the one-dimensional Mortal Kombat games, then Doom was your go-to game. It took the rock-solid keyboard and mouse mechanics and map exploration of Wolfenstein 3D and made it as gory and brutal as possible. And I'm not just talking about the dead bodies and the bloodshed, either. The first time you played Doom, you didn't just play it, you survived it. It was tough, and it kept you on your toes. The face at the bottom of the screen was usually an accurate reflection of how you felt while playing it. Or at least it was for me. That's a normal Sunday morning for me right there. Oof. Anyway, Doom was obviously a huge hit on PC, so when Williams brought it over to the mighty Super Nintendo in 1995, I was fired up. Hey, one of my favorite games on my favorite system, bring it on. So you turn it on, get it started, and... What the hell am I looking at? Are those enemy soldiers? Seriously? What is this, Atari? Is that an imp? Holy crap, how did that get to me so fast? Yeah, you'll notice right away, there's a gigantic delay between when you press the directional pad to move and when you actually move. That's, uh... Kind of a major problem. 
If you play this, you will immediately realize that there is a gigantic difference between Doom on PC and Doom for Super Nintendo. This game feels like 100 pounds of ground beef being squeezed through a 1 inch meat grinder. It's so slow! Not only that, you get stuck on walls, too. It's like a precursor to Superman 64. Come on, dude, move it! Come on! The smaller screen resolution is a big letdown, too. They did the same kind of thing out of necessity in Star Fox as well, but that game is light years faster and smoother than Doom, and that's saying something. Seriously, the amount of real estate available on the screen is kind of jarring. There's also a sizable imbalance between enemy projectiles and how quickly you're able to move. You can strafe left and right with the L and R buttons, which is a nice touch, but it doesn't make you move any quicker. And the hit detection and damage is pretty wonky. What? Really? That brings me down to 30%? Whatever. Doom for Super Nintendo does do a couple things right though. This game is a hell of a soundtrack, no pun intended. The music sounds freaking great in typical Super Nintendo fashion, and the select button brings up the map on which you can still move around. That's unexpected and kind of impressive actually. But that doesn't change the fact that playing Doom for Super Nintendo is like driving a Ferrari underwater. I just wanted to make this video as a warning. I understand the appeal on the surface if you're younger and you weren't around when Doom first showed up. And you should play Doom because it remains a great game, but don't play it on Super Nintendo and not Sega Genesis either with that 32X nonsense. Get out of here with that. Don't be fooled by the flashy red cartridge either. If you really need a red cart for your collection, go with Maximum Carnage. That's a way better game anyway. And stay away from Doom on Super Nintendo, but there's absolutely no reason not to go get it on Steam instead. Strong. Illusion of Gaia is a pretty weird game, but I'll start with the positives here. Its strengths lie in the dungeon design. It successfully takes advantage of the top-down Zelda-like battle system and creates some clever puzzles that can be challenging. The Sky Garden in particular is one of my favorite dungeons in any game ever. Mu and the Great Wall of China are also really well done. The game has you switch forms between Will, who's a kid, and Friedan, this Fabio-looking guy who's a knight of some kind, and then a third form you can obtain later on. Will is able to reach areas that Friedan is not, and vice versa. And the game does a nice job taking advantage of that by creating some decent puzzles centered around that dynamic. Another positive of Illusion of Gaia is that it's not a walk in the park. It's a little challenging. For instance, you're given a finite number of health replenishments, so you've got to pick your spots and use them wisely. Many of the puzzles are cleverly designed and take some thought, and some of the bosses, like the vampires here, are pretty tough, and it took me a few tries to finally beat. What I like about the combat is how simple everything is. Clear the area, and a new path opens up. The hit detection is quality, and the sound of defeating an enemy is addicting. So the game does a nice job of building momentum. The game takes a while to really get going at the beginning, so don't let the very slow start deter you. Unfortunately, Illusion of Gaia must insist on attempting to tell a big sweeping story, and let me tell you, it is one of the weirdest, most bizarre stories ever, even for a video game. It goes like this, or as far as I can tell anyway. Will, our hero, is on a quest to find these mystic statues because his dead dad told him to by communicating through a possessed flute. Some vague bullshit like evil is spreading throughout the world is spouted, and thwarting child slavery appears to be a consistent theme, but we're never told what the mystic statues actually do, or what the direct motivation is for anything. Also, this game is a sequel to Soul Blazer, but that's news to this game. In fact, there are so many weird ideas haphazardly thrown together that I don't think I can adequately explain things. There's a comet headed towards Earth, there's ancient civilizations, there's vampires. At one point, Will and his friends are taken captive by a tribe of cannibals, but his girlfriend's pet pig sacrifices himself to keep anyone from getting eaten by jumping into a campfire so he can be eaten instead. What the hell is that? Even the game's sense of humor is bizarre. You gotta love this random villager who you just walk up to out of nowhere. He says, no one can put a show on like I can. And then he sets his hair on fire. Yeah, I gotta agree with you there, buddy. I'm pouring it on a little harsh, and I don't wanna undersell the qualities this game has, because it is a good game. The good outweighs the bad. The problem is that the story can't be ignored because there are so many unskippable cutscenes and half of them barely make any sense. And I mean, beyond any kind of like translation issues, some stuff just makes you say, what the fuck? I get the feeling whoever wrote the story was just making shit up as they went along. The story tries hard to hit some emotional notes and it is effective at some times. The story hits a nice note with the character Kara, who is a spoiled princess who accompanies Will on his journey and she actually gains some perspective for the first time of her life. But aside from the story, Illusion of Gaia is a very good game, and the gameplay will remind you a lot of Link to the Past or Lufia 2 in the best possible ways. There's some nice action and stimulating dungeon design, so it is worth playing nowadays, I would say. As long as you're down with, you know, suicidal pigs and cannibals and vampires and all that shit. 
so it's drunk. It's always tricky to review a game like Super Mario Bros. Wonder. In some aspects, it feels kind of useless, because, I mean, it's Mario. You know it's going to be well-made, you know it's going to be crammed with all sorts of wildly creative ideas, and you know the controls are going to be spot on. But when it comes to Mario Wonder specifically, it's getting comparisons to Super Mario World, and it's already considered one of the best games of the year, if not the best, of 2023. So, I figure my job is to help manage expectations with videos like this. It's always kind of weird to go into a game you haven't played before, and you're expecting the absolute best of the best. So, I'm here to tell you, does Mario Wonder live up to those insanely high expectations? Oh, hell yeah it does! I'll start by saying for making this video, this has got to be the easiest game in the world to get footage for. Every level in this game is completely unique and packed with tons upon tons of crazy ideas implemented in the most unexpected ways, to the point that Mario Wonder is one of the hardest games to put down because you're always thinking, just one more level, I gotta see what's in it, I gotta see what badge I'm gonna get next, I gotta see how hard this level is. You take that kind of hook and add it to a game as well made as Mario Wonder, then yeah, it's easy to see why this game is so much fun. Mario Wonder borrows the structure from Super Mario World, where you've got eight worlds set up in an overworld that features all sorts of secrets you can unlock, including a special world level, which is very similar to the Star World in Super Mario World. The goal of each level is to find the Wonder Seeds. You get those by either completing the level and by finding the Wonder Flower, which opens up an entirely different level within the level. It can be tricky to find these at times, since there's a few secret exits, false flagpoles, and hidden areas, but man, that's the allure of this game, just finding out what kind of crazy stuff is going to happen when you find it. Right away, in the second level of the game, you got singing piranha plants. What is this, the small world ride at Disney World? You get the seed and everything goes back to normal. Or no, wait a second, what's up here? Huh, wait, I'm in the foreground now, what the hell? Again, this is just the second level of the game. We're barely scratching the surface at the sheer depth of creativity here. Okay, what's gonna happen here? Aw, oh, crap. What's this one gonna do? Okay, I guess I'm a pincher bug that can jump really high? Sure, that works. Every single level is like this, it's just endlessly entertaining. There's lots of other kinds of levels too, like wiggler races, puzzles where you need to find five flower coins, badge challenges that give you optional new abilities, and of course there's other self-imposed challenges like getting to the top of the flagpole or collecting all three purple coins, and there's also levels where you're transformed into a Goomba and you have to sneak past these things trying to eat you. It's such a good time! The power-ups are a lot of fun, too. There's the usual bog-standard Mario stuff, but there's also the elephant apple that lets you destroy blocks and hold water in your trunk. There's the drill hat that lets you sneak past enemies and find crevices and ledges you can burrow through. And there's the bubble flower, where you create your own platforms you can jump on. The game does a great job utilizing these by gradually escalating the difficulty, allowing you to get comfortable with using them before throwing the kitchen sink at you. And yeah, I gotta talk about the difficulty. It is so freaking refreshing to finally play a 2D Mario game that's really challenging, but not cheap as hell like we're all used to dealing with in Mario Maker levels. The special world levels are just plain hard, and I mean that in the best possible way. But what I really love is how the game scales its difficulty. If you happen to get stuck somewhere, you have a bunch of options available to you. One is to use badges, which you earn with badge challenges, or just by buying them at the store, and there's 24 of these. They can either help you out, like allowing you to float using your hat, but there's some that make the game a lot harder, like the badge that makes you sprint forward. Trying to complete a special world level with this badge is insanely hard, but you always feel like it's still doable somehow. Sometimes with games like this, it's easy to get caught up in getting every enemy instead of just getting by. Think of games like Contra or Ghouls and Ghosts. In Mario Wonder, it's a similar deal, where you just have to learn from your mistakes and be better the next time you try. And the controls and level design are so tight that it always feels rewarding. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go! Oh god! Seriously? I missed the last jump? Come on! Another option available to you is to turn on the online multiplayer mode where you can see up to three other players and you can just watch what they do to figure things out, kind of sort of like Elden Ring, it's pretty cool. These aren't just ghost images either, these are people playing in real time right alongside you. While I'd normally keep stuff like this turned off in games like this, it is really cool to work with other players to figure out certain levels, and if you die in this mode, you turn into a ghost with five seconds to either find another player to revive you, or to find one of these signposts that other players put down. This mode turns Mario Wonder into an entirely different kind of experience, and it's really well done. The way the difficulty is scaled overall reminds me of, again, Super Mario World, where you can kinda control your own difficulty by only unlocking one or two Switch palaces, or even none at all. This game builds on that, and of course, it's about a thousand times more nuanced. And if that's not enough for you, you can also play as a Yoshi, and they don't take damage, so all skill levels are welcomed here. 
My only nitpick with Mario Wonder is that I think it's too much of a leap from 4 star difficulty to 5 stars. Call me crazy, but I was able to breeze past most levels that were 4 stars and under, but 5 stars gets pretty ridiculous. Again, I mean that in a good way. This is coming from a guy who regularly tortures himself going back to the Star World and Super Mario World, or seeking out new crazy Kaizo Mario levels to play. I just wish the 3 and 4 star levels were more on the difficult side, and that's a total nitpick though, because I can always just apply a badge and try and complete a level while jumping around like this, or by zipping around shooting vines like this is Just Cause 3 or something. So yeah, I'm not gonna lie, when I first saw Super Mario Bros. Wonder with a $60 price tag, my reaction was, eh, I don't know, I wasn't much of a fan of the new Super Mario Bros. series because they kind of felt like empty collectathons. But Mario Wonder is a quantum leap better than those games. It's great that Nintendo realized that we're at the point where the kids that grew up playing the new Super Mario Bros. games are now old enough to enjoy the challenge in Mario Wonder, and they do that while still making the game accessible to kids, which is just crazy. And plus, Mario Wonder is just so addictive, where even the most challenging levels are always bringing you back for just one more try. The best compliment I can give this game is that I've gone back to complete certain levels a whole bunch of times, not just to get to the top of the flagpole or to collect the purple coins or whatever, just because it's so freaking fun! So yeah, I was skeptical at first, but as it turns out, Super Mario Bros. Wonder is the best game I've played in 2023, and you should be playing it too. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hello, anytime I venture out onto the old YouTube, I'm always left wondering why aren't there more videos listing and ranking things? So I figured I'd do my part and help fill that need. But really, the original video I made about the best Super Nintendo multiplayer games is almost 10 years old and badly needs to be redone, so let's just make it a top 13. The criteria I'm going by is pretty simple, it's just what games are made a lot better with the addition of a second player, and that can be cooperative or a versus game that pits two players against each other. But honestly, don't take this list that seriously, I just want it to function as a guide more than anything else to point people in the right direction if they're looking for good retro multiplayer games. Of course, since this is a list video, there's only so many spots available, so some good games are going to get left out, and I'll post a complimentary video to this one later on that includes the honorable mentions, so to speak, stuff like Secret of Mana, Top Gear, Kirby Superstar, Legend of the Mystical Ninja, and so on. But in the meantime, let's get on with the list. 13. NBA Jam Tournament Edition. Yes, that's right, a sports game, but really, you don't need to be into basketball to have fun with this one. It's up to four player compatible and the controls are simple enough that anyone can get into this game almost immediately. There are a lot of other sports games that could have filled this spot, like NHL 94 or Ken Griffey Jr. Presents Major League Baseball, but the fact that NBA Jam is so easy to play makes it an easy choice as the best multiplayer sports game. You can either be teammates or you can face each other. And if you've got the four player multi-tap, you can do two on one or two on two. Plus, this one has all sorts of goofy characters you can unlock. Everyone from Randall Cunningham to DJ Jazzy Jeff to Bill Clinton, or my favorite, Crunch, the old Timberwolves mascot. You can also put in codes that can make you ridiculously overpowered, like being able to dunk from anywhere. It's always good for a laugh when you see a wolfman dunk from the other team's baseline. Heating up! Twelve. King of Dragons. This is one of the better arcade ports the Super Nintendo got, and it's one of the best beat-em-ups too. It's really held up well over time. There's five classes to pick from, from range fighters like the elf and the wizard, melee combat fighters like the cleric and the dwarf, and the regular old balanced guy. You get six lives and three continues to get through 14 long levels split up into stages and boss fights, but what's cool is that you use continues right there on the spot. So you really have 18 lives to get through the whole game, which is great, because the game doesn't make you replay play sections you've already completed. King of Dragons is a beefy boy too, it's a long playthrough, and it's so dang fun to play with other people. It's one of those old school beat-em-ups where the life meter stretches off of the screen, you gotta love that. 11. 
Metal Warriors. Not as many people know about this game, but it deserves a spot on this list because of one reason, the head-to-head -head mode. You have six mechs to choose from, and player one gets the top half of the screen, player two gets the bottom half, and you fly around and try and kill each other. You can do that with your machine gun, which seriously goes pew pew pew. Or you can use a handy lightsaber, which gives away the fact that this game was made by LucasArts. There's a few different maps you can play through as well, so there's a ton of mileage you can get out of this mode. Plus, I mean, you're two crazy overpowered mechs firing missiles at each other and fighting with lightsabers. How can you not love that? And yeah, if that doesn't appeal to you, then check out this weird-ass basketball mode you can unlock. So hey, if you're not entertained by mech violence, then maybe, uh, whatever this is, will do the trick. Ten. Pocky and Rocky. This is one of those games where it's best experience with two players, if only because you'll need a second player to even get past the first few levels. This game is so freaking hard, but it's still very approachable. It's a top-down eight-way shooter where you collect stuff to upgrade your shot, but in addition to that, you can also slide into your partner and send them careening out of control into enemies. It's a good time. Plus, this is one of those games that's just plain entertaining. I mean, look at some of these enemies. Here we got some kind of ghost zombie pirate guy riding Bowser's helicopter thing he flies around in at the end of Super Mario World. Then after that, you fight Sweet D, who's wearing knight's armor. There's six levels to get through with unlimited continues, so there's no excuses not to complete this one. So you can all experience all the weirdness this game has to offer for yourselves. Nine. Mortal Kombat 2. Come on, do I really need to sell you on this one? This game was an event when it came out, and once I owned it, I don't think the cartridge left my Super Nintendo for a solid two months. I still have the Game Informer magazine that lists every single move for each character. But if you're somehow unfamiliar with Mortal Kombat 2, it's like the first Mortal Kombat, just ten times more of everything. More characters, more finishers, more special moves, more weird moves, more secrets, more story, more settings, more backgrounds, and some blood here and there. And no, do not say this game was better on Sega Genesis. Get out of here with that. Mortal Kombat 2 is best played today on the Super Nintendo. Eight. Street Fighter 2 Turbo. As fun as Mortal Kombat 2 is, I don't think it's the best fighting game on the console. That title belongs to Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and thanks to the sharp pixel art, accurate hit detection, and smooth controls, this game still holds up extremely well, even for fighting game veterans. I picked Turbo because the original doesn't have the four boss characters, and Super just doesn't have the same vibe for some reason. I prefer Turbo, especially against a second player, and you gotta love that incredibly satisfying sound design that's music unto itself. You win. Seven. Tetris Attack. Here's a totally different kind of one-on-one -on -one game. The multiplayer modes here are pretty simple. There's a time trial mode where you race to get the best score in a two minute time limit, and a versus mode where you attack each other with shock panels, chain reactions, and combos. And of course, you create those by matching at least three blocks in a row, and you accumulate all sorts of extra stuff when you create a reaction that falls into place. And the more blocks you clear, the more miserable your opponent will be. The larger the combo or chain reaction, the larger the garbage block will be that plops down on your opponent's side. Tetris Attack has long been my pick for the best Super Nintendo puzzle game, and the multiplayer just puts it over the top. If you're not into fighting games or action or sports and you'd rather just play something a little different, then this one is for you. Six. Big Apple, 3 a.m. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4, Turtles in Time. But then of course if you are into action and non-stop chaos, then this is your game. Turtles in Time is right up there with Streets of Rage, Final Fight, all the top tier beat-em-ups, and a big reason why is because it's so much fun with a second player. This game still runs very smoothly with minimal slowdown despite all the craziness on the screen. And the Ninja Turtles world lends itself perfectly to this kind of game. Throw in all the time travel craziness where you eventually fight Pirate, Rocksteady, and Bebop, and this game is a damn good time. In addition to that though, there's also a time trial mode where you can compete against each other, and a one-on-one -on -one fighting mode, and unlike the fighting mode in Double Dragon, this one is actually pretty good, and it includes moves like ducking your head back into your shell. So yeah, when it comes to a two-player game, you get your money's worth and then some with Turtles in Time. Five. Donkey Kong Country. This is one of those games that really should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. It's a great multiplayer game for a couple of reasons. First, it's obviously a well-made game with the right amount of challenge, and it's always fun to fight over who gets to be Diddy. 
But also, this is one of those games that everyone has played, so everyone is familiar with it and has at least played the first few levels. Sometimes when you talk about how games age in different ways, this is an example of a game aging well, but it doesn't have much to do with the game itself. It's just the fact that you could sit down with pretty much anyone that grew up in the 90s, and you'd be able to crank through the first few levels, up until you get to those annoying barrels anyway, and you'd both have a blast doing it. And hey, even if you don't for whatever reason, you can at least chill out to that relaxing David Wise soundtrack. Four. Zombies Ate My Neighbors. Now, if you'd rather have a co-op experience where you're both cursing each other out and crushing Mountain Dew Code Red while sweat comes out of your eyeballs, then you gotta play Zombies Ate My Neighbors. This is another game where the controls are really simple. It's a top-down shooter and one button shoots while another flips through your weapons. But while the controls are simple, the game is not. This is easily one of the hardest Super Nintendo games, even with a second player. But hey, some people want their two-player experience to be full of pain and suffering, and I get that. Some people really want to feel like they've earned it, so if that's what you're looking for, then there's no better game for that on Super Nintendo than Zombies Ate My Neighbors. Three. Super Bomberman 3, although really you could put any of the five Super Bomberman games in this spot because they're all great, but the third one is what I have the most fun with. It allows up to five players, there's tons of items to create all kinds of chaos, and there's Louis, these kangaroos with special abilities like kicking bombs, kicking blocks to trap players, or filling entire columns with bombs. The third game also has a soccer minigame as well as the bad bomber mode, so even if you get eliminated you can still hang out on the outside and cause problems. It's great. But like I said, any of the Super Bomberman games would fit here. They're all great multiplayer games, especially with the four-player multi-tap. Goof Troop. Some of you might think this is ranked a little high, but uh, have you played Goof Troop? It's awesome. It's like the perfect all-ages co-op game. It's simple enough, but still offers enough of a challenge. And it's the ideal game to play with kids to introduce them to retro gaming. It's a Capcom Disney game, so it's really well made. The puzzles are clever, but not cheap. The combat is easy, the controls are easy, the music is great, and the presentation offers a lot of charm from start to finish. You can play this one by yourself, but it's way more fun to play with a second player. One. Super Mario Kart. There's no way this wasn't gonna be number one. I can remember a time in my life when all my friend and I played for like a month straight was the battle mode in Super Mario Kart. And again, like I said about Donkey Kong Country, Super Mario Kart was one of those games that was absolutely everywhere. If you're of a certain age, it's likely that you have some memory of playing this one. And it's also likely that it's the one-on-one -on -one battle mode, which was really kind of the first thing of its time for a home console. I mean, friendships hung in the balance with these games. You were always just one red shell away from never speaking to your friend for the rest of your life. Well, at least until the next game starts and you hit them with a wild green shell, totally on purpose obviously, but yeah. The battle mode in Super Mario Kart still holds up extremely well, and hey, two-player races aren't that bad either, and that's something that translates to all skill levels. Throw in a great soundtrack and you've got yourself the best game to play with a second player on the Super Nintendo. Alright, that's all for now. Next week I'm going to be posting a video about the best of the rest, the other great multiplayer Super Nintendo games that missed out on this video, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day! Hi there, last week I went over what I thought were the 13 best Super Nintendo multiplayer games, and that's for both co-op and versus multiplayer, and now let's take a look at the best of the rest. Some games are just better with a second player, like take Mortal Kombat for example, playing by myself against the computer nowadays, eh, that's okay, but playing with a second player while trying to figure out all these ridiculous moves, that's a way better time. 
let's start the best of the rest with Contra 3, The Alien Wars. You don't need some guy on the internet to tell you that this is a great game, single player or co-op. I mean, come on, look at these crazy machine monster things you have to fight. This game is incredible. And yeah, multiplayer is fun, but be forewarned, the game gets a bit tougher with a second player because there's a lot more cheap deaths, and there's even more chaos and carnage and stuff on the screen, so it can be hard to see what the heck is going on, and it even occasionally gets to the point where that old Super Nintendo slowdown comes into effect. Plus, the top-down levels suffer the most because your viewpoint is split in half. That's a bummer. But yeah, if you're willing to power through some cheap deaths and just deal with the slowdown or maybe even patch the game, then hell yeah, Contra 3 is an amazing co-op game. I mean, it's an incredible game on its own, but you already know that. Let's move on to Kirby Superstar, and this was the game I had the hardest time leaving off of the list. This one very cleverly allows a second player to join your game by allowing player one to exchange a power-up for a little helper dude who hops around behind you. In a single player campaign, they'd be controlled by the computer, but just press start on the second controller and bam, you've got a second character to play as. I should mention that this only works in some of the game modes in Kirby Superstar, but for straight ahead platforming done Kirby style, this is perfect. There's also Kirby's Dream Course, otherwise known as the game on the SNES Classic where everyone asked, what the heck is that game? Well, it's kind of like Putt-Putt or Billiards, but using Kirby as the ball, and you've got all sorts of wacky courses and obstacles to contend with. This one can be a bit tricky to get the hang of since the physics can be all over the place at times, but it's definitely a unique game. There's not much else out there like it, and it's well worth checking out with the second player if you haven't already. Secret of Mana is also a very good multiplayer game with great music and lots of hacking and slashing with all sorts of different weapons. You can even add a third player eventually so three people can all switch between the main dude, the girl, and the sprite. This game comes with a caveat though, when it comes to multiplayer, you're gonna have to play single player for a little while until you find the girl. And then she leaves. And then you get the sprite for a while. But the point is, it's kind of an up and down experience when it comes to multiplayer, but I suppose it's not all that hard to just have a save point prepared ahead of time. Either way, this is a great choice, because the game is so simple. Just pick a weapon and go to town. Since I mentioned Secret of Mana, I also have to talk about Seiken Densetsu 3, although I gotta say that you're probably better off playing the recent remake these days, but still, if you're feeling froggy and you want to play the original, that's another game that's a ton of fun to take on, with even more characters, more story, more options, and more stuff going on. Again, it's structured similarly to Secret of Mana, where you gotta play single player for a while before running into another character. But this game is still well worth your time, especially when you've got a friend or two to run through it. Bear in mind you'll need a patch to make this one work with three players, but a second player works just fine with that one. Joe and Mac is a Super Nintendo game I don't hear talked about a whole lot. I played this one multiplayer for a video on Gaming Jay's channel years ago, and for a two-player game, it holds up really well. The controls take a little bit of getting used to. This is a slower, more deliberate game. The jump reminds me of Arthur's Jump and Super Ghouls and Ghosts, but it's not game-breaking or anything. What I like most about this game is that it's not all that difficult, and it has a ton of charm and personality, which makes it a great time with the second player. Sunset Riders is kind of like Contra 3, another Konami run and gun that's pretty dang tough, but still a lot of fun. The boss fights in this one always give me a lot of trouble, so it's nice to have help from someone else, or at least be able to watch someone else die just as often as I do. But this is another game where the Super Nintendo port might just be as good as the arcade, same as Turtles in Time. Here's a few games that were only released in Japan, but are still playable today any way you can. Longtime viewers of the channel know how much I love Great Battle 4 and Great Battle 5. They're action games made up of all sorts of characters ranging from Gundam, Ultraman, Kamen Rider, among many, many others. And these games were made by some of the folks that worked at Capcom back in the day, so these are well-made, polished games from start to finish. Great Battle 4 is mostly a side-scroller similar to Mega Man X, but Great Battle 5 combines that with some gallery shooter stuff stages, and a Wild West kind of a motif. They're both co-op and they're both excellent playthroughs. There's also the games from the Goemon series that never made it over to the United States. We got Legend of the Mystical Ninja over here, and that's an excellent co-op platformer with a lot of gameplay variety and a surreal atmosphere. There's also three more co-op platformers that were only released in Japan, and these games can get pretty nuts, as you can see. At one point, you're commandeering this goofy Goemon mech thing, you're hopping around in vehicles, you're fighting shadow puppets, one player can piggyback onto another, and this is just the second game in the series I'm showing. The others have even more to offer, so check them out any way you can. 
Wild Guns is worth mentioning, of course, but it's in a similar category as Seiken Densetsu 3 in that it's an awesome multiplayer game, but you're better off playing the recent remake from Natsume. I highly recommend checking that one out if you can, but if you want to stick to the old Super Nintendo, you really can't go wrong there. It's the best gallery shooter on the system. There's also Run Saber. This one is a little more under the radar, and it's kind of like the Super Nintendo's answer to Strider. It's a short playthrough with only five levels, but it's quality co-op action that's cut from the same cloth as Contra 3, with all sorts of craziness, like, you know, just casually going out for a stroll on the surface of this fighter jet as it races through the sky at a thousand miles an hour. Of course, I gotta mention Super Smash TV, and this is another game where the Super Nintendo port is very good, almost as good as the arcade, because the Super Nintendo controller lends itself so well to the basic controls of Smash TV. The D-pad moves you around, while the face buttons act as a second D-pad controlling your aim. This is a tough game though, one of those that has so much crap on the screen at once you might get a headache, but it's still a lot of fun. Another one off the beaten path is Soldiers of Fortune, and our friends overseas might know this one as the Chaos Engine. This is quietly one of the best multiplayer games on the Super Nintendo. It's another top-down shooter like Smash TV and like Zombies Ate My Neighbors, but in this one, there's six different soldiers you can play as, all with different weapons, plus four different skills you can level up as you go. This is a game you should seek out no matter what, whether it's single-player, multiplayer, or whatever. It's well worth your time. Real quickly, I want to mention the beat-em-up and fighting game genres, and really, there's so many here to choose from. You really can't go wrong with Final Fight 3, or Knights of the Round, or Battletoads and Battle Maniacs, or Battletoads and Double Dragon. I could list like 10 more quality titles, but I personally like Final Fight 3. Similarly, with fighting games outside of Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter, you really can't beat Killer Instinct or Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighter. Those are the two that I always go back to. Gotta mention some shoot 'em ups, and there's two very good ones that play extremely well with two players with minimal slowdown. The first is Arrow Fighters, also known as one of the Super Nintendo cartridges that goes for a stupidly high price. So, this is one you gotta play any way you can. I always really liked Arrow Fighters because everything feels like it has some weight to it. Sometimes in space shooters, everything feels too floaty, but flying a fighter jet like this and effortlessly crushing everything in your path feels a lot more satisfying, especially when there's two jets. Another really satisfying shooter is Firepower 2000. Here you've got one player as a tank and the other as a helicopter, and the game does a nice job balancing out enemies that can only be destroyed by one or the other. It's a good time. If you're looking for an easier shoot 'em up experience and an easier game in general, there's Poppin' Twin B, and this is another game I had trouble leaving off the list, the main reason being that this game has a couples mode. That means that most enemy fire will be focused on player one. It's a really nice feature to help get kids into games like this, or just for people like me that aren't very good at shoot 'em ups. If you're looking for older arcade stuff, Miss Pac-Man has both two-player versus and two-player cooperative with four different mazes you can play through, although bear in mind in co-op if one of you dies, you both die, so this is a game that could lead to some fisticuffs. On to racing games, Top Gear is the obvious pick here. This is one of those games where I feel like I'm mentioning it every four or five videos or so just because I can. I mean, come on, it was the very first video on the channel. So yeah, if you haven't played this one, make sure you do it. It's a great two-player game that maintains a fantastic sense of speed throughout the entire playthrough. But then some people need combat in their multiplayer racing games, and the best game for that, in my opinion, is Rock and Roll Racing. It plays just like RC Pro-Am for NES, so if you dig that game, then you'll dig this one too. And it's got a soundtrack good enough to get you potentially flagged on YouTube if you already use it in a video. My go-to sports game on Super Nintendo for multiplayer has long been NBA Jam or NBA Jam Tournament Edition, Hang Time, or anything from that franchise really, but a close second, believe it or not, is Looney Tunes B-Ball. Same as NBA Jam, this one is easy to pick up and play and get the hang of right away, and plus, this game is just plain funny. Who doesn't love seeing Elmer Fudd making it rain from 35 feet like he's Steph Curry? Or seeing another player get a pie thrown in their face, or having the ball get turned into a bomb? This game is a great time any way you slice it. It's one of my personal favorites on the Super Nintendo. If you're looking for an easy versus game off the beaten path, then there's Sanrio World Smash Ball. The game is really simple. There's six characters, six different settings, and you smack this disc thing back and forth. It's kind of like a vertical version of Windjammers, but with Hello Kitty characters. This game is fun though, and it's easy enough for anyone to get into.
If you'd rather have just pure chaos, then you should play WWF Raw. Yeah, I know, it's a wrestling game, but even if you're not into wrestling, you'd be missing out if you don't play this one. It's such a great time with other people because it's just unhinged. You're smashing people with chairs, tombstoning people left and right. There's a bucket you can hit people with. To this day, I still don't know why there's a bucket of all things in this game, and it makes me laugh every time I use it, especially the way you just hit people in the arm. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm alone in that, but I find this game incredibly entertaining. A more polished wrestling game was made by Capcom called Saturday Night Slam Masters, and this is an arcade port, and it kind of plays like a beat-em-up more than a wrestling game. In fact, it's got Hagar from Final Fight as a playable character. This is another game that's compatible with up to four players, and Capcom gets all the typical wrestling stuff right. There's silly characters, big entrances, huge moves, and guys that look like they'd be batting sixth for the Marlins in Ken Griffey Jr. Presents Major League Baseball. And by that, I mean they look roided up to the gills. Whew, all right, that's it. That's 27 more multiplayer games, but I'm sure I left your favorite off this list, so let me know what it is in the comments. But in the meantime, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Titus Software is probably most infamously known for Superman for N64, one of the most dreadfully awful games ever made, but before that, they actually had a hand in quite a few Super Nintendo games. Granted, they're not exactly instant classics, stuff like Blues Brothers, Prehistoric Man, and Realm. No, not that Realm, and not to be confused with the early 90s PC game Realms. This is a 2D side-scrolling run-and-gun game taking place in the year 5069 AD, and you're fighting off an alien invasion through four long levels, starting in a forest in working your way into the alien's home base. You play as a super cyborg called Biomech, and he looks like Trunks cosplaying as Vegeta. Seriously, that looks almost exactly like Vegeta's outfit. Anyway, it's your standard run-and-gun fare here. You pick up a variety of different weapons from homing lasers to spread guns to, uh, more powerful lasers. You can flip between two of them at a time, with each having their own respective ammo that you can collect by shooting these crystals. And you'll need every bit of ammo you can get, because one quality this game has is the number of bosses and and mini bosses you have to fight. Yeah, it's pretty simple pattern recognition, but there's some interesting battles here, like this human heart that throws what look like blood clots at you, or this crazy phlegm wad looking thing, or this spaceship you shoot up at as you're falling. That's pretty cool. What keeps Realm from being good or even decent, though, is the level design. The opening forest level in particular just feels blah and uninspired. The layout is just kind of thrown together, and you just wander all over the place. Granted, there are some interesting elements here, like these platforms. You have to rotate by shooting a switch while fending off these cool-looking tree climbers. But then you get this section here, where you're just making blind jumps while these flaming tumbleweeds bounce all over the place. It just feels totally random, and it's frustrating for the wrong reasons. Also, there's no battery save or passwords here. This is yet another game you gotta beat in one sitting. The controls are good enough, nothing that touches the likes of stuff like Contra or Super Turrican, but it controls better than something like Time Slip or some of the more generic and derivative run and gun games out there. You can hold L or R to lock in a diagonal shooting angle like Super Metroid, which is a nice feature, but other than that, it plays about as you'd expect, just not as tight and precise as some of the more prominent games of the time. The graphics are okay, not terrible, not great, and again, the highlight is the boss and mini boss design, which is pretty cool. There's also some cool effects here, like when you defeat this heart mini boss, the sun briefly shines through before it starts raining. The music kinda sorta reminds me a bit of Super Turrican, only much cheaper sounding, if that makes sense. Same with the sound design, I feel I've heard all these sound effects before in a ton of other games. So yeah, Realm is okay-ish, it's not in the same universe as stuff like Contra, and probably better compares to lesser titles like Time Slip, which I looked at a few months ago. Realm is better looking than that game, and controls much better, and the game cuts a quicker pace. But the level design in Realm is just kinda uninspired. Here's another example where you're riding this cool looking machine thing, but that's the extent of it. It just carries you up the incline, and you fire at enemies as usual. I will say the game does get better the further you progress, but the first couple levels really drag this one down. Realm is frustrating but there is some cool stuff here, you just have to work to get to it, and whether or not you want to put in the work is up to you. Mm,
Test Track. Some of you older folks watching probably remember Pitfall, one of the most popular games to ever come out for the Atari 2600. Twelve years later, in 1994, we get Pitfall the Mayan Adventure, where you're actually playing as Pitfall Harry Jr., the son of the main protagonist from the first game, and the crappy Super Pitfall game for NES. And Harry Jr. is out to rescue his dad. This is one of those games that received tons of ports. There's a Genesis version, Sega CD, 32X, Windows, Atari Jaguar, and later Game Boy Advance. However, it was first released for 16-bit systems, although I'm not sure if the SNES or Genesis version came first. Either way, I'm just going to be looking at the SNES version, obviously. Pitfall the Mayan Adventure is an action platformer, and as you can immediately see here, one of the game's biggest strengths is your character sprite. It looks freaking great. There's many, many different animations here, and they all look fantastic. And the best part is that they don't really slow the game down. This isn't one of those games where you're forced to wait for the animation to conclude. Your character here handles fluently and smoothly. It's pretty impressive. Also, this game does a great job making use of the entire controller. B jumps, the Y button slings stones, hold down Y for a stronger attack that you can aim, A is a whip melee attack, X is a boomerang, L and R throws smart bombs, and select lets you toggle between all the weapons you can use. So yeah, that's a formidable arsenal and a lot of weapons at your disposal. And you can collect more ammo for each as you progress throughout each of the game's 11 levels. One interesting touch here is that instead of a life bar, you've got a picture of your character about to be eaten by a crocodile. The closer you are to being eaten, the closer to death. There's also gold pieces here. Here. It wouldn't be a proper platformer if there weren't something gold to collect, right? Collect 50 and earn an extra continue. The game has you climbing and swinging from vines, crawling, riding zip lines, using these weird plants as bungee cords. At one point, you're even riding a minecart. What, does this guy hang out with Donkey and Diddy Kong or something? The thing is, though, these levels sprawl out all over the place in every direction. It kind of reminds me of Genesis action platformers like Vector Man and the X Men games, where you're climbing and jumping and wondering where the hell to go next. It's rarely just point A to point B. What's What's nice here is that while you might get lost, there's still stuff you can find, like Mayan artifacts, there's the hourglass which can freeze time, and the Mayan chili pepper which allows for a temporary boost in strength and speed. In addition to that, there are a couple hidden bonus areas you can find, one is a secret vault, but the other is the actual original Pitfall game, how cool is that? Remember to watch out for those scorpions. This game isn't perfect though, one aspect I have to point out is the boss fights, holy crap these are tough, even the first one here is way too fast, I only have a chance to die how am I supposed to hit this guy? And then later on you fight two of them at the same time? There's also points of frustration like this section that reminds me of the disappearing blocks in Mega Man 2, and you have to make these blind jumps. Ugh. There are checkpoints here though, so that helps, but no password system and no battery save. Another thing is that your mileage may vary when it comes to the level design. The first level can get a bit tiresome figuring out where to go or what insane jump you're supposed to do. Even with these statues that point in the direction the game wants you to go, it can be a bit of a chore to finally grab onto that vine or whatever the case may be. This game would be a lot more palatable if those freaking vines had more forgiving hitboxes. The only thing I have to say regarding port differences is that I prefer the SNES version over the Genesis game. The latter has a split second delay that simply doesn't exist on the SNES version, so because because of that, I'd go with the Super Nintendo game every time. So yeah, Pitfall the Mayan Adventure looks great, the sprite animations are incredible, like Earthworm Jim level great, the music may not stand out on its own but it fits the game well, and your character controls well and consistently, plus it's always fun to have a variety of weapons to choose from. The only issues here are the sprawling level design and the difficulty, especially with the boss fights. Other than that, Pitfall the Mayan Adventure is certainly worth playing today. It's not going to be top tier along the lines of stuff like Donkey Kong Country or even Aladdin or Mickey's Magical Quest. It's closer to games like Artie Lightfoot or Plock or Indiana Jones Adventures. It's a worthwhile playthrough. Drunk. Everyone's familiar with the old angry video game nerd running gag, right? When it comes to games based on a movie and it's made by LJN, the game has no chance of being good. Unless that game is True Lies. Yeah, that's right, a movie licensed LJN game that's worth playing. How about that? This game is a true hidden gem. I mean, it doesn't get any more hidden than seeing a movie title next to the LJN logo, right? And not only that, but this game prominently features Tom Arnold's face. That sounds like a nightmare. But don't be fooled, this game is a lot of fun. Don't believe me? Just look at the footage here. You get to play as Arnold, you get to shoot bad guys with an Uzi and a shotgun, you can dodge stuff by doing a dramatic epic maneuver. Hey, remember that meme? YTMND 2006? No? 
Okay. Anyway, you can fire in eight directions, you can throw grenades, you gotta watch out for civilians. If you kill three of them, your mission is over. The graphics aren't a disaster, and the sound is functional. There's even a crazy shoot 'em up style level where you control a fighter jet. That's nuts. The game is kinda like Super Smash TV, but starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, which is an odd coincidence considering that Smash TV was inspired by another Arnold movie, The Running Man. The best thing about this game is that it knows what it is, and it's comfortable with that. It doesn't try to get cutesy or ambitious, and I appreciate that. The game doesn't bother with realistic notions like reloading your weapon or anything. Although you can run out of ammo, but you always default to a pistol, so you're always able to shoot stuff. Self-awareness in a game like this is always a positive. There's even hidden weapons like this flamethrower here. Yeah! And there's tons of passwords that give you infinite lives, infinite weapons, and stage select. That gives the player the freedom to mess around and experience this game at its best. Bored with one mission? Switch to another. Okay, so do you have to see the movie to play this game? Well, no, there's no prerequisite to shooting bad guys. The game barely follows the movie anyway, and it's missing a couple major characters, but who cares? However, the movie is arguably Arnold's last great action flick, so it's worth seeing if you haven't. True Lies does have its flaws. The soundtrack is extremely repetitive and gets old real quick. And some of the levels and maps are mind-dullingly repetitive, like this snow level where all you really have to do is just get to the bottom as quickly as possible. It's pointless to even shoot stuff, but whatever. Some of the other missions are just way too long, like the subway mission here. There's nine missions total, and there's some that are definitely better than the others. Despite that, True Lies is a lot of fun. I was seriously amazed the first time I played this game because my expectations were as low as you could possibly get. But go check out True Lies, it's shockingly good. It's also worth noting real quick that this game is also available for the Sega Genesis and is nearly the exact same game, so even if you're more of a Genesis guy, you can check it out there too. Steam Drunk! Yeah, that's right. For the third time in as many months, the Steam Drunk series is taking a look at a game that actually came out on Super Nintendo first. This time it's Bubsy Twofer, and it's nothing more than the two Bubsy SNES games on an emulator. There's no display options, nothing new at all. You even have to reset your controls every single time you start up the game. What the hell is that? This package was even approved by Steam Greenlight, so this is all your fault for making this happen. They even have an embarrassingly whiny, guilt-inducing passage here. It says, Accolade's most notorious character had not been seen since an ill-fated venture into 3D. Out of the blue, he showed up at Retroism's doorstep, bedraggled and mumbling about being doomed to a legacy of shame and obscurity? Wait, what? Has he been drinking Jim Beam behind a dumpster every day for the past 20 years? But we've cleaned him up and given him a new lease on life, a shot at returning to the big time, but he'll need your support. Well, that bedraggled and mumbling cat got it, but like I said, these are just the SNES ROMs played on an emulator, so whatever. Hey, you know what? I know someone who can help me with this. Snatch drunk. There were two Bubsy games for the Super Nintendo, Bubsy Claws Encounters of the Third Kind, and the more succinctly titled Bubsy 2. Starting with the first game, this is just exactly what you'd expect. You're a cat, you jump around, you jump on enemies, you run to the right. I'm trying to come up with a list of the game's strengths here, and uh, it's certainly bright and colorful. Yeah. At its best, there's just nothing here in Bubsy that a thousand other games haven't already done to death. I wish I could just call the game an inoffensive platformer and leave it at that, but no. In Bubsy Claws Encounters of the Third Kind, you don't have a lot of screen real estate to work with, so it's up to the player to manually scroll the screen in various directions to look out for danger. This is a ginormous pain in the ass, and really there's no way around not doing it because everything in this game kills you. That's right, one hit deaths. You die from enemies, you die from water, you die from falling. Not only that, there's no power-ups at all. Nothing here can help you. The non-intuitive level design does you no favors either. Oh, hey, a pipe. Where does this go? Oh, straight to hell. I see. The controls can best be described as floaty. You can read a dozen reviews of this game, hit Control F and search for floaty, and you'll find it in just about every one. Now, if Bubsy had a life bar instead of one-hit deaths, that'd make the game a little more tolerable, but the way it is, it's just bad. It's, it's really bad. To sum up, Bubsy is a classic example of a game I've talked about many times throughout many a video over the couple years I've been doing this. Some suits come up with a cutesy anthropomorphic mascot, stick it in a 2D platformer, market the bejesus out of it, and seriously, this game was advertised freaking everywhere. And meanwhile, how the game plays is like number 75 on the list of priorities. Bubsy is generic at best and pandering crap with little regard to game design at worst, and it's one of the worst games on the Super Nintendo. 
Bubsy 2, to its credit, tried to make some improvements on its predecessor. There's no more one-hit deaths. There's weapons to choose from, and the floaty controls are... less floaty. In fact, they went in the opposite direction and made the controls way too tight. Bubsy moves too fast, and oftentimes the screen does not scroll fast enough to keep up. He's so fast that it's hard not to keep him from flailing out of control. They did at least add weapons, like what looks like a ping-pong gun, so that's useful. The levels in Bubsy 2 are huge, and you just kind of wander around and find doors that may or may not lead somewhere you actually want to go. There's bonus games, there's an Egyptian motif, a medieval motif, you're in outer space. This game is as generic as it gets in gameplay and appearance. There's just nothing here worth going out of your way to experience. To its credit, Bubsy 2 is better than its predecessor, and by that I mean it's more tolerable. It's mediocre rather than bad. Alright, that's like eight paragraphs on Bubsy, and that is way too much. The point is, don't be fooled when you see this on Steam. It's the same SNES games that weren't any good back then, and they aren't any good right now. Avoid these games. Mm, that's drunk. Hi there, previously I've done videos on games released on both the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis that I thought were better on Genesis, but let's flip it around and look at some games that you're better off playing on the SNES instead of Sega. Again, I have to say my usual disclaimer that I'm not going to include games like Earthworm Jim, Aladdin, Zombies at My Neighbors, or Shadowrun because you can't go wrong on either system with any of those games. Let's start with Sunset Riders. Right off the bat, you can see the Super Nintendo port has four playable characters. The Genesis port only has two. Kind of a big deal, since each character has a different weapon, so it's nice to have that opportunity to find a character who fits the way you play. And that's important because Sunset Riders is a pretty tough game on both consoles. In particular, however, the Sega port is just absolutely brutal. The balance of speed feels off. In past videos, you've heard me prattle on about how certain games are faster and more intense on the Genesis, but here it backfires. Sunset Riders on Sega is borderline unfair to play, while on the SNES it's challenging, but it's still an accessible game. And don't give me that get good crap or whatever the hell, the principle of the matter is, what incentive do I have to play a port as imbalanced as this when the SNES port is sitting right there? I won't go into the differences in terms of how the Genesis port has a different level structure, because ultimately that's not that big of a deal, but what is a big deal is how each port is balanced in terms of speed and difficulty, and the SNES port wins that battle hands down. Next there's Smash TV, and this is an easy one. On the Super Nintendo, the controller lends itself perfectly to the gameplay. The arcade version uses two joysticks to dictate the action, one to move and one to aim and fire. The SNES controller only has one D-pad, but the four buttons function as a kind of makeshift D-pad, so it captures the simplicity of the arcade game's controls perfectly. The Genesis port simply can't replicate this, not even with the six-button controller. In that version, it's the D-pad to move, one button to shoot forward, and one to shoot in the opposite direction, and one to lock your character in place. Why settle for that? Smash TV is just so much more player friendly on the Super Nintendo without a doubt. Let's tackle a couple racing games, starting with Rock and Roll Racing. Now I'll give the Sega version points here for having a wider viewpoint so you can see more of the track as you're racing, but I mean, the game is called Rock and Roll Racing. A big part of the fun is the sound design, not just with the soundtrack obviously, but the sound effects when you destroy another car, as well as the announcer. In the Genesis game, not only does the music struggle to represent the songs they're supposed to be, but the music pauses anytime the announcer says anything. First. That really gets old after a while. The sound effects also aren't up to par either. The SNES game kills it. The songs sound fantastic, everything is layered so there's no interruptions, and the sound effects of all the destruction really add to the experience. No doubt about this one, give me rock and roll racing on the Super Nintendo any day of the week. And then we've got Street Racer. This is kind of an interesting one, since the implementation of the core racing mechanics here are reliant on the Super Nintendo's Mode 7 rotation capabilities, no different than Super Mario Kart. The Sega Genesis obviously can't do that, so instead they just made the game more of a straight-ahead arcade racer instead of a kart racer, and as a result, it's really boring and really easy and just kind of a generic. It robs a lot of what makes Street Racer a fun game. Street Racer on Super Nintendo nails the kart racing feel while giving the player a truly fantastic visual presentation with the layered, scrolling backgrounds, and the sprite work in some of the attacks. This is an underappreciated kart racing game, and if you play it today, on a 16-bit system anyway, make sure it's on the Super Nintendo. 
Batman Returns is another one where you're better off with the SNES. The Genesis game looks and sounds and plays like a generic movie cash-in. It's an action platformer where the graphics are dark and bleary, and the music is utterly generic. The gameplay here is as boring as it gets, and it can feel like work to get through at times. The Super Nintendo game is a fast-paced beat-em-up with huge detailed sprites, awesome sound design, and some variety in the gameplay with these driving stages. Even if you're not keen on beat-em-ups, this one is fantastic just for the amount of destruction you can cause not just on your enemies, but in property damage in the backgrounds. I get that the Genesis game is its own thing, but its own thing kinda sucks, and I'd consider it a stay away. If you wanna play as Batman just to let off some steam and kick some ass, go with the SNES game. Next there's Saturday Night Slam Masters. This is a good game on both systems, but this is just more of a public service announcement because the Genesis version only has single player and a versus mode, while the Super Nintendo version has multiplayer co-op as well as a two-on-two -two versus mode that can support up to four players. I'm not exactly the most social guy in the world, but if I want to play an SNES game with other people that has zero learning curve that anyone can get into, one of my go-to games is Saturday Night Slam Masters because of the four-player functionality. It's fantastic and it represents all the over-the-top absurd of pro wrestling perfectly. The Genesis game, while a good game on its own, just doesn't have that functionality, so go with the SNES game here, it's a good time. We'll finish up here with two fighting games, the first being Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters, and this is another easy one. The Super Nintendo game is intuitive, with quick responsive controls, it's just a well-made 16-bit fighting game, and one of the better fighting games of the era. It's pretty easy to learn all the moves, and there's an interesting collection of fighters here, including Shredder, which is nice. The Genesis version is just... good god, I mean, this is one of the worst Genesis games I've ever played. The controls are a complete mess, and the game is absolutely impossible in single-player mode, Casey Jones in particular is absurdly overpowered in this game. The Super Nintendo game is much more player friendly, with the controls having a lot more functionality, an easier learning curve, and again, it's pretty cool to have Shredder as a playable character. Last, there's Mortal Kombat 2. The first game was better on Genesis since it had the fatalities and more responsive controls, but I have to ask, if you're gonna play a Mortal Kombat game today, why wouldn't it be Mortal Kombat 2? It's a great true sequel that takes everything the first game did from the lore to the gore, and you're probably better off experiencing it on the Super Nintendo over the Sega Genesis. Mortal Kombat 2 is all about atmosphere, and it simply looks better on the SNES, especially the backgrounds. The music and sound effects also have a certain depth to them that's lacking on the Genesis. Yes, both games are insane insanely difficult in single player mode, but like I said, these games are all about the visuals, sound, and atmosphere. And, you know, turning into a dragon and eating someone's torso. And if you're gonna turn into a dragon and eat someone's torso, you want it to look nice, right? And it looks best on the SNES, so play that version instead. Alright, that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and have a good rest of your day. That's struck. Back when I was a kid in the early 90s, it was Super Nintendo vs. Sega Genesis. You picked your side, or more accurately, you just kind of ended up with whatever your parents bought you. And from then on, you defended your console tooth and nail. However, to this day, in 2017, I still get comments on this channel like from this guy here. SNES was trash. It was a baby console for kids that can't play difficult games or parents that didn't like blood. Genesis for life. Hey, I was a total slobbering fanboy for my console too, when I was 10 years old. But now that we're all adults, presumably, we can enjoy both the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis consoles, imagine that. And by god, I'm gonna take it a step further. Believe it or not, there were titles released for both consoles that might have been a bit better on one over the other. And I'm gonna take a moment to talk about the games that were just a bit better on the Sega Genesis. Now this is kind of a tricky line to walk because there's stuff like Shadowrun and Aladdin. Both of those games are great in their own way. That's one of those things that boils down to semantics and what you personally like in a game. There's a few games, however, that may share the same name and be different titles, but for whatever reason, the Sega Genesis just got the more interesting and less flawed game. Maybe the biggest example of what I mean is Jurassic Park. The SNES version is decent enough. It's a top-down action game where you're looking for eggs, occasionally going into buildings where you shift into this first-person mode. The big flaw, however, is that there's no battery saves or passwords, so you gotta either beat this game in one sitting or use save states. That's just stupid. The Genesis version of Jurassic Park is a side-scrolling action platformer where you can play as either Dr. Alan Grant or a frickin' Velociraptor. Now that's cool. The visual design here is also fantastic. The SNES 
opted for a more bright and cartoony vibe, whereas the Genesis game looks dark and intimidating. The level design here may not be the greatest, it's got that wide open all over the place feel to it that was pretty typical of other Genesis action platformers, but still, the controls are fine, the music is good, and did I mention you can play as a Velociraptor? This is still easily the better game between the two of the 16-bit Jurassic Park titles. One of the games that inspired this video was Robocop vs Terminator. On the Super Nintendo, the game is okay-ish, but Robocop moves slowly and deliberately, his jump feels awkward, and the action here is just one big battle of attrition, one after another. You shoot the Terminator, he falls, he gets back up, you shoot him again, it's pretty boring. The Genesis edition of the game meanwhile plays much faster, the action is more chaotic, I mean just look at these people freaking explode! That's so over the top, it's hilarious. The music and sound design here are also a huge step up, so yeah, Robocop vs Terminator Terminator is one you want to skip on SNES, but definitely one you want to check out on Genesis. Tasmania is another game that got titles on both consoles. The Super Nintendo version takes an over-the-shoulder third-person perspective and plays like a racing game. You just have to beat the time limit and eat as many birds as you can along the way. In other words, it's really boring and it gets old after about five minutes. The Sega Genesis edition of Tasmania is again an action platformer, using Taz's whirling attack to defeat enemies, and it features all the usual platforming stuff you'd expect from a mascot platformer like the token ice level, the token desert level, and so on. Tasmania on Genesis is an exactly a must play, but it's way better than the SNES edition. Here's kind of an obscure one, the Genesis has a game based on the Battletech lore and background simply titled Battletech, and it was later ported to the Super Nintendo where it was titled MechWarrior 3050. This is a case where the Super Nintendo version isn't necessarily bad, it's perfectly fine, and the two player feature of each player controlling a different part of the mech is cool, but the Genesis version executes everything here much better, and the gameplay is much more player friendly like the targeting system. The SNES game can be a slog, it's a really tough game, but the Genesis version has a pick up and play quality to it that makes it a lot of fun. Now here's one that might boil down to personal preference for me, it's Doom Trooper. The SNES version definitely isn't bad, I mean based on the backgrounds and visual style alone, this looks like Donkey Kong Country meets Contra. It's a pretty good game, but this is one of those that once you play it on the Genesis, you'll have a hard time going back to the SNES version because the Genesis version is so much faster and more intense. On the SNES, this is just another run and gun action game, but the Sega version is the kind of game that has you gripping your controller so hard you can hear the plastic creaking. Next is not really a game in particular, but an entire genre. Shoot 'em ups on the Sega Genesis are usually a better bet to be worth playing today rather than a shoot 'em up on the Super Nintendo. Of course, the SNES does have some great shoot 'em ups like Axelay, UN Squadron, and Space Megaforce, but games that could have been great, like Gradius 3 and Super R Type, are marred by stretches of bad slowdown. Now some people will say, well the slowdown actually helps curb the difficulty of some of these games, but I can't say I agree with that, because the slowdown comes and goes without warning. It's unpredictable. The Genesis just had the hardware that lent itself better to what's required to make a good shoot 'em up A good example of this is a comparison between Thunder Force 3 for Sega Genesis and its Super Nintendo port, Thunder Spirits. The latter is a perfectly okay game, but once you play Thunder Force 3, you'll have a hard time going back to Thunder Spirits. It's just faster, more intense, more player friendly, and more responsive. It's almost got kind of an arcade quality to it, whereas the SNES version, while still decent, feels slow and sluggish by comparison. That's just one example. There are so many great Genesis shoot 'em ups that are all time classics to this day. Everything from Musha to Eliminate Down to Steel Empire to Wings of War to Thunder Force 3 and 4. Of course, I can't do a video like this without talking about the NHL series. Sure, these games are still great on Super Nintendo, but on Genesis, I mean, NHL 94 in particular, has to be considered one of the 20 best Genesis games ever made. That's how good these games are on Sega. And again, it's because the faster processor allows multiple sprites to quickly and smoothly move around in a responsive fashion. The gameplay here is so addictive that even if you don't like hockey, you can still get into the NHL series on Genesis. Along the same lines, one last gaming franchise I'll mention is the Madden series. For whatever reason, these games are just borderline unplayable on the Super Nintendo. On every single play, the line of scrimmage turns into this giant indecipherable ball of humanity, making it difficult to run the ball since there's no rhyme or reason to the blocking, and nearly every pass gets tipped at the line of scrimmage. It's so annoying. On the Genesis, the Madden series is much better. You can actually complete a pass downfield, imagine that. It just seems like EA and the developers they worked with had a much better idea of how to code and develop these games on the Genesis than they did on the SNES. It shows especially on Madden 96 in particular. That's my pick for the best of the bunch. It's a fast-paced game that can even rival stuff like Tecmo Super Bowl. Alright, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.
Snestruck. Today I thought it'd be fun to get back to the roots of this channel. I grew up with a Super Nintendo, and finding games both here and overseas became a lifelong hobby, but in the meantime I missed out on a ton of Genesis or Mega Drive games. So while this may be a no-duh kind of a video for a lot of you, I thought it'd be cool to look at some of the best games that only were released for the Genesis. Maybe there are some of you out there that are in the same boat as I am, that were so hung up on the SNES that they just kind of ignored anything Sega did. So here we go, and just to be clear, I'm gonna go over these titles real quick. Not a lot of detail, and I'm not going to go into port differences. I know games like Earthworm Jim and Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat all came out on both systems, but this is stuff that just got released on the Genesis. If you want information about port differences, there's a couple great channels on that, like Game vs. Game and Console Wars. Might as well start with the most obvious of the obvious, Sonic 1, 2, and 3, and Sonic and Knuckles. Well, no frickin' duh. I will at least say though that these games highlight something that's hardly represented at all on any Super Nintendo game, and that's the combination of Twitch controls, level design, and memorization. In other words, the Sonic games get better the more you play them, because then you get used to the level design and learn to anticipate the way things are laid out, and as a result, you just get faster and faster, and the faster you get, the more addicting the gameplay. And of course, that's all predicated on the fantastic level design that I think reached its peak in Sonic 2. It's safe to say that no SNES games came close to what the Sonic games on the Genesis bring to the table. The Genesis also did the run and gun genre better than the SNES did, and all it really needed was two games to prove that, Gunstar Heroes and Alien Soldier. The frenetic energy, crazy ass enemy design, and the non-stop carnage these two games offer is second to none. The only Super Nintendo game that comes close to this kind of action is the Japan exclusive title Rendering Ranger R2, and even then that game is just way too hard. Alien Soldier and especially Gunstar Heroes are much more approachable and accessible, so by proxy they're much more addicting. I seriously think Gunstar Heroes is one of the five best Genesis Genesis games ever made. Moving on, the Super Nintendo's problems with shoot-em-ups are well documented. Games that could have been good, like Gradius 3 and Super R-Type, were marred by crippling and unpredictable slowdown that came and went as you played. The Genesis hardware lent itself in a much better way to shoot-em-up gameplay, to the point that it created all-time classics like Thunder Force 4 and Musha. Look, the SNES still had some really good shoot-em-ups, but nothing was going to touch games like these two. And even then, there's more under-the-radar shoot-em-ups like Gyarez, Glay Lancer, and Steel Empire, not to mention the rest of the games in the Thunder Force series, as well as the superior port of Raiden Trad. The point is, if you like shoot 'em ups but you only had an SNES, you have like a dozen quality ones to choose from on the Genesis. One of the best developers for the Super Nintendo was Konami, cranking out games like Super Castlevania 4, Turtles in Time, and Contra 3, but they didn't stop there. They created a Genesis exclusive game for each of these series as well, Castlevania Bloodlines, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Hyperstone Heist, and Contra Hardcore. When I was younger, I thought these were just ports with different titles, but they are in fact original games, and well worth checking out, especially Castlevania Bloodlines. Of course, I have to mention the Streets of Rage series, Super Nintendo had Final Fight 1, 2, and 3, and the Genesis had Streets of Rage 1, 2, and 3, with the second game being one of the best beat-em-ups ever made with a killer soundtrack and fantastic sound design. If you want even more beat-em-up action, then I have to mention Golden Axe, one of the defining titles in the early Genesis library, a fun multiplayer arcade port. Speaking of multiplayer and defining Genesis titles, there's Toe Jam and Earl. If any game sums up the early 90s, it's this one. It's goofy, but it's still worth sharing a laugh with the second player. There's also the Shinobi series, in particular Shinobi 3, Return of the Ninja Master. The closest the Super Nintendo got to this was Hagane, and that game, while great, is just way too hard. The Shinobi games represent the same sort of side-scrolling gameplay that's a little more approachable and accessible for everyone, featuring tons of moves, techniques, and power-ups. Speaking of ninja gameplay mechanics, there's also Strider, a really fun and fast-paced action platformer. The SNES again tried to come up with something similar in games like Run Saber, but Strider was just miles ahead and is certainly worth playing today. Sticking with side-scrolling platformers, there's games I've already done individual videos on, like Vector Man, X-Men 2, and Ristar, that are well worth checking out. But there's also games like Comic Zone, where you fight your way through the pages of a comic book, Kid Chameleon, where you use a ton of power-ups to run through over a hundred levels, and Aladdin. Yeah, this game is technically different from the SNES game, and it's better and well worth playing. Here's a game versus game video detailing the differences between the two games. 
No Genesis video would be complete without mentioning NHL 94. Yeah, the NHL series came out in Super Nintendo 2, but the Genesis is able to handle multiple sprites like this in a much smoother fashion, so the gameplay here is more immediate and responsive. Speaking of hockey, there's also stuff like Mutant League hockey, as well as Mutant League football. The title and footage here of each are pretty self-explanatory, and both games are a lot of fun, especially with a second player. You can even bribe the ref in Mutant League football, that's so awesome. Sega also took some interesting risks with certain games like Echo the Dolphin. Yeah, this game isn't for everyone, but it is a curious blend of atmosphere and exploration. It's almost like Sega's answer, kinda sorta, to Super Metroid. It's an interesting idea for a game at the very least. I'll mention a couple games I don't hear mentioned too often, like Landstalker. This is a great looking adventure style game with a sense of humor, well worth checking out if you can find it. And there's a lot more information here in this video review from Daria Reviews. There's also Beyond Oasis, a straight-ahead top-down adventure game. This one's closer to A Link to the Past or even a Secret of Mana type clone, but it's really well done. I hardly ever see this game mentioned. Last but not least, there's the RPG genre. Yeah, the Super Nintendo pretty much runs circles around the Genesis in this category, but there's still stuff like Fantasy Star 4. There's nothing revolutionary or really that original here, but it's just got that traditional JRPG type experience, so if that's what you're jonesing for and you've never played this one, it'll definitely scratch that itch. Plus the soundtrack here is freaking great. But yeah, sure the SNES had a ton of great role-playing games, but on the strategy RPG side of things, eh, there wasn't a whole lot there. That's where you had to turn to the Genesis. Seriously, if you like strategy RPGs, or if you're completely new to the genre, and you've always wanted to dive in, play Shining Force 2. It's, it's perfectly balanced in all aspects with an easy learning curve, plus it's great looking with an upbeat soundtrack, an engaging story, and a fun battle system with a lot of mechanics, but not too much that you get overwhelmed. Of any on this list, this is the one I wish I got on the Super Nintendo the most. So yeah, that's about it for me. I know I could name like 10 or 20 more games, like the Road Rash games, Rocket Knight Adventures, Mega Turrican, on and on, but I wanted to keep this video somewhat concise. And I want to give you guys in the comments a chance to list your favorites as well, so go ahead and do that. Anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks to Sean for requesting this one. He astutely pointed out that the most viewed video on this channel is best Sega Genesis games that SNES owners missed out on, which is uh, kind of weird considering this channel is mostly, you know, Super Nintendo stuff. Anyway, he wanted to see a part two of that video, so thanks for the request. I thought I'd narrow down the focus for this one a little bit for Genesis exclusives that aren't all that well known, but there are a couple well known games that I have to start out with that I simply flat out forgot to mention in the first video. Games like Herzog's Vi, one of the best 16-bit games ever made, period. This game combines shoot 'em up and top-down run-and-gun gameplay with a real-time strategy game structure. You control an airship to fly around the battlefield, but you can transform into a mech and fight stuff on the ground. In the meantime, you order combat units, command them to attack the enemy base wherever that may be, and all sorts of other stuff. This game is way, way ahead of its time, seamlessly blending action and real-time strategy, and it has a two-player versus mode, which is pretty cool. This is up there with Gunstar Heroes, Fantasy Star 4, and the Sonic games as one of the best Genesis games ever. I also have to mention the Road Rash series, particularly Road Rash 3, although all three Genesis games are pretty good. The third game, however, has better and more interesting weapons to beat the crap out of these other racers with. The biker sprite animations may not be the greatest, but it's still so satisfying to clobber other racers or to watch them get blindsided by oncoming cars. Like I said, you can't really go wrong with any of the Road Rash Genesis games, but I had the most fun with the third one. Not a lot of nuance or strategy here, which, funny enough, makes it almost the opposite of a game like Herzog's Vi, but if you just need to unwind and kick the bejesus out of people while racing on motorcycles, then you can't beat Road Rash on Genesis. Let's get back to what the Genesis does best. For example, a game like Ranger X. I mean, just take one glance at this game. Look at this friggin' insanity! This isn't quite your typical run-and-gun action platformer, though. Ranger X controls like a cross between a game like Metal Warriors and Defender, meaning the A button fires your weapon to the left and the C button fires to the right. In the meantime, flipping between special weapons with the middle B button. It takes a bit to get used to, but once you do, this game is a ridiculous amount of fun, with flamethrowers, bombs, and really cool-looking full-screen clear-all attacks. Ranger X is a great example of what the Genesis could do really well and to make it stand out from the Super Nintendo. 
Now, of course, the Super Nintendo did have some pretty good running gun games like Cybernator, otherwise known as Assault Suits Vulcan, but the Genesis got their own game in the Assault Suits series a couple years earlier titled Target Earth in North America and Assault Suits Lanos in Japan. And if you liked Cybernator, you would really enjoy Target Earth. It's got similar gameplay and controls, a ton of weapons to choose from, and the mission structure here also keeps things interesting. Like in the first level here, it's not just run to the right and beat the boss, you have to beat the boss before it destroys one of your bases. Target Earth isn't perfect, the controls can be a bit clunky and seem unresponsive at times, but it's still worth playing if you haven't. Let's keep going on the run and gun front with Dinosaurs for Hire. Yes, that's right, Dinosaurs for Hire. You play as a friggin' dinosaur with a machine gun in a Contra style game that allows for two player co op. What's not to love here? Sure, this isn't nearly as good as something like Contra 3 or Contra Hardcore, and there's zero nuance here, but there doesn't need to be any nuance. Sometimes it's just fun to play as a Stegosaurus, a Triceratops, or a T Rex with a machine gun and just blow up anything that moves. Alright, next let's check out Red Zone, a top-down helicopter shooter where you use your radar in the upper right corner to hunt down enemies, occasionally switching to levels where you gun down enemies on foot. What really makes Red Zone stand out in the Genesis library are the real-time zooming and rotation effects that makes this look and feel like kind of a combat pilot wings. The controls take a long time to get good at, unfortunately, and the difficulty here is brutal. You get one life and it's game over. But still, Red Zone is a great demonstration of what was technically possible on the Sega Genesis. I'll say this much, if you like the final bonus level of Pilot Wings, you'd really enjoy Red Zone. From the creators of Xenophobe and Rampage comes General Chaos, a one-on-one -on -one war strategy game that takes place from an isometric kind of viewpoint in settings ranging from deserts, forests, and city blocks. You can pick from four different squads that each consist of skill sets like grenade tossers, a flamethrower guy, a machine gun guy, and so on. You just control where your troops run to and where they shoot. It's pretty straightforward for a strategy game, and when two opposing troops get close enough, they duke it out in a fist fight that plays like a fight in a hockey game. This is a fun game with a great sense of humor and a lot of personality. Next we have Cheeky Cheeky Boys, and I'm cheating a bit here because this game is an arcade port that also showed up on a couple other consoles like the PC Engine CD, but this is a bright and cheerful looking platformer that looks like the kind of stuff you'd see on the SNES, something like Super Adventure Island 2 for instance. To be honest, there's nothing all that unique here, this is just the case of a well-made game that could use a little more attention. All the fundamentals are executed well here throughout the game's 9 levels, and the level design keeps things interesting as well. It can't be overstated how nice this game looks though, and there's all sorts of locations locations represented here, like traversing the clouds, cutting through the jungle, or exploring a sunken pirate ship. Finally, we'll finish off here with two Genesis games that never left Japan. Here we have another game developed by Treasure, the same folks that made games like Alien Soldier and Gunstar Heroes. This is Panorama Cotton, and as you can see, this is a 3D rail shooter in the same vein as something like Space Harrier. And yeah, this game looks freaking spectacular. There's some occasional slowdown here and there, but this still is a great entry in the Cotton series. The Super Famicom also had a Cotton game titled Cotton 100%, but that was just kind of a run-of-the-mill side-scrolling shooter. The Mega Drive, meanwhile, had this, and this is another game where I just can't help but say, look at this freaking game. And really, you can't argue with the pick up and play rail shooter, definitely try and play Panorama Cotton any way you can. Another Japan-only release for the Mega Drive was the sixth entry in the Wonder Boy series titled Monster World 4. Yeah, I know that's kind of confusing. This is an adventure-style side-scrolling platformer featuring long, elaborate dungeons, tons of boss fights, and a visual style reminiscent of something out of the Shantae series. This is a great blend of adventure-style mechanics and platforming. The dungeons can kind of drag at times because they're so long, and Lydia, I might add, not much exploration here. But Monster World 4 still has a lot going for it with the atmosphere, music, and visual presentation, not to mention the number of boss fights, which are a lot of fun. Monster World 4 received an English translation on the Wii Virtual Console, PlayStation Network, and Xbox Live, so check it out there if you can. Anyway, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hello, this channel has been around about seven years so far, and I have a whopping one video on a Sega CD game, that being Popful Mail. But let's change that and take a look at some of the best Sega CD or Mega CD games out there. I'm not gonna lie, one reason I stayed away from Sega CD is because I thought most of the catalog was just filled with crappy full motion video games like Sewer Shark or Fahrenheit or Night Trap. 
but there's plenty of really good stuff to be found here, and I'm just going to give a quick overview of a few standout games you might have missed at the time they were released. Like maybe you were busy with Super Nintendo at the time, like some other guy I know whose name rhymes with mess bunk. We gotta start with the obvious first, and that's Sonic CD. This one may look and sound like a typical Sonic game at first, but certain control mechanics are different, like having two different dashes you have to charge, and, you know, being able to travel through time. That's right, you trigger a sign that'll say past or future, then gather as much speed as possible to travel in that direction in time. What's cool is that what you do in the past does reflect how the game plays out, including what ending you eventually receive. Really, it boils down to finding an enemy generator in each level, but that's a lot easier said than done because every zone is freaking gigantic. Sonic CD kind of reminds me of Yoshi's Island for Super Nintendo and that it feels like a typical platformer on steroids. There's tons of different ways to approach this game, there's multiple paths to get the best ending, you can go for speed or 100% or just hang out and explore. Any way you approach it, it's well worth playing today and even better is that it's been remade for PC, 360, and Xbox One, so check it out that way if you can. I gotta make sure I mention one of my favorite series ever, Final Fight, and Final Fight CD, which is one of the best home console arcade ports ever. You got all three playable characters, you got two-player co-op, plus you got different game modes like a gauntlet. And yeah, some of the game remains censored, and to be honest, I never really liked the Sega CD soundtrack all that much, but damned if this one still isn't fun to play today. This version remains one of the best beat-em-ups ever, and it's a must-have if you own a Sega CD. Now, if you just want to cut to the chase and skip everything and get to what the best game on Sega CD is, then my pick would be Snatcher. Holy crap, this game is incredible. It's made by Hideo Kojima, and yeah, I know that name can spur a lot of sardonic comments, sometimes from me, but this game is just really friggin' cool. It's essentially a point-and-click adventure game at its core, with a few other gameplay elements thrown in, but this is really a story-driven game through and through. This ain't no watered-down, censored-by-Nintendo-of-America type story either, as you can clearly see. Okay, so it takes after Blade Runner a little too closely, both visually and with the story, but hey, Blade Runner is one of my favorite movies ever, so this game works just fine for me. If I had to pick one game on this list to be the absolute best, it would be Snatcher. Do you like games like Star Fox? Then you'll love Soul Star, a rail shooter that has you zooming across space and skimming the surface of planets. Your ship can transform between three different forms, with all sorts of power-ups available, and spectacular graphics and music, and some really cool sprite scaling. There's even a two-player co-op mode where player one controls the ship and player two shoots everything that moves. This one is a must-play on the Sega CD, and it's a shame that it never got an official sequel. You can find a ROM of the cancelled sequel for 32X titled Soul Star X, but it doesn't touch the arcade-like performance and sound of the Sega CD edition. If you dig games like this, like I do, then there's also a Silpede. It pulls off some technical trickery to make the gameplay look like real-time 3D rendering, which is pretty cool. This game plays really fast, which makes it tough, but damned if this one isn't rewarding as hell to play through. Yeah, the backgrounds and settings aren't all that diverse. You're pretty much in space the entire time with only a couple of exceptions, and even then the backgrounds run very choppily. But besides that, this game is an awesome time and absolutely worth checking out. If you prefer regular old shoot-'em-ups, then you're not gonna find any better than KO Flying Squadron. This one has a bit of a parodious vibe. Well, I only say that because that's my main frame of reference for horizontal shoot-'em-ups with insane cartoony visuals like this one. But if you dig games like that, or other stuff like the Cotton series, then you'll dig this one as well. The soundtrack is appropriately bright and cheerful, and the difficulty is challenging without being R-type levels of insanity. Sadly, the price of this one is complete insanity, so this is one you gotta play any way you can. Android Assault The Revenge of Bari Arm is another fun one. It's developed by one of my personal favorite developers, Human Entertainment, and they always made interesting stuff. You can find four weapons that can be powered up three times, with the third power-up turning your ship into a mech with four different speeds you can switch between. And you use this to navigate some huge levels. To do a charge shot in this game, you have to stay off of the fire button. The weapon only charges itself, giving this one kind of a different spin on the shoot-'em-up genre that you may be used to. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Lords of Thunder. This game is the total package. Incredible visuals, smooth, consistent gameplay, a really tough challenge without being unfair, and a kick-ass soundtrack to carry you through the experience. We could argue till we're blue in the face about which version is better, this one or the PC Engine CD edition, but any way you play this one is well worth your time. As usual with Sega and shoot-'em-ups, there are tons available like Robo Aleste and Soul Feast. I just didn't want this list to be dominated by one genre, but if you're into games like this, there's plenty of quality titles to choose from.
If you prefer run and gun games, then there's the Terminator, and what a surprise this game is, considering both the Super Nintendo and Genesis Terminator games were letdowns. This game is totally different, and it's pretty much exactly what anyone would want in a Terminator game based on the first movie. You play as Kyle Reese in a Contra-style run and gun and shoot everything that moves game, with the visuals and music capturing that Terminator vibe perfectly, with the music being done by a name you might recognize in Tommy Tallarico. Man, why couldn't the Super Nintendo gotten this game? Speaking of licensed games, there's also Batman Returns, but there's a catch with this one. It's divided into two different games, an action platformer, which is, eh, it's okay at best, and the driving game, where you fly down the road in the Batmobile through five levels set to a time limit as you blast everything on screen. Gee, which one should I pick? But yeah, you can select the driving game right there at the main menu, and what you see here is what you get. It's so much fun to play through. Here's a completely different kind of driving game, Road Blaster FX. This is a port of an arcade game, but man, they did a heck of a job with this one, especially the visuals. Yeah, they're a bit bleary, and the frame rate isn't the greatest, but I mean, jeez, come on, look at this game. It's like an interactive Saturday morning cartoon, it's crazy, and it's pretty fun to play, too. If you want a cartoony styled game with a little more action, then you might want to try out Cobra Command. Again, the frame rate here isn't the greatest, but this game is definitely unique among its peers. It's essentially a gallery shooter where you control the crosshair and shoot targets as they appear. And to be honest, this game is pretty dang limited, but it's neat to look at and it sounds freaking great. Battlecore is a little more hands-on when it comes to the combat. Again, we have a first-person perspective, but this time you play as a mech with all sorts of weapons like missiles, guns, and flamethrowers. I really dig this game because while it's pretty simple on the surface, you just walk around and make stuff go boom, the art design here is done in a way that makes it look much different than most other games. I also love the ominous background noises. They really help give this game a sense of dread. Definitely check this game out. It's one of the best for Sega CD. Let's talk some RPGs on the Sega CD with the Lunar series, Silver Star and Eternal Blue. Both of these games got complete editions, so to speak, on other platforms, but they're definitely still worthwhile in their original forms. And while the random battles and combat system are about what you'd expect in any turn-based RPG, where these games really shine is in the story, the presentation, and the music. These cutscenes look freaking incredible, and the soundtrack really adds a lot to the immersion. And hey, the story holds up its end of the bargain too, even if the pacing gets kinda wonky here and there since you do have to grind a bit in both games, but still, if you're into RPGs, you'll love both Lunar games, even in their original incarnations. Next we got Popful Mail, and although this isn't a role-playing game by strict definitions, it's a quality adventure title with all sorts of weapons and armor to pick up while slaying tons of enemies on a side-scrolling action platformer. No leveling system here, instead you're grinding to collect money to get better gear. There's two other playable characters you can switch between as you progress through the game, which goes a long way in making this one a quality playthrough. Okay, you know me, and you know I love weird stuff, and Panic for Sega CD might be one of the weirdest I've ever played. A computer virus has made all the machines in the world go crazy, so you play as this kid and go around returning things to normal by solving these simple puzzles. It's a lot harder than it sounds, and it's a lot weirder than it sounds too. There's a lot of slapstick humor here, and yeah, this game isn't for everyone, but I got a kick out of it. Speaking of weird, there's also Heart of the Alien, otherwise known as the sequel to Another World, which is otherwise known as Out of This World. The Sega CD edition comes with both games, and they both have an intensely strange vibe that's consistent through both. It's one of those love it or hate it kind of playthroughs. Without giving anything away, all I can say is that if you dig Out of This World, you'll dig Heart of the Alien. Back to a little more traditional stuff, there's also Dark Wizard, a turn-based tactical RPG where the combat takes place on a hexagonal grid and you get four playable characters to choose from, each with their own attributes and all that good stuff. This is a story-driven strategy game with some really standout music. I mean, I know it's Sega CD and all these games have great music, but this one really stood out as something unique here. This game is a bit slow-paced and it's a long playthrough, but if you dig tactical RPGs, then you'll dig Dark Wizard. Finally, I gotta mention Shining Force CD. What, did you think I would forget this one? This game is actually a remake combining both Shining Force Gaiden 1 and 2 for Game Gear while packing in a bunch of additional content. Visually, it's just like the Shining Force games on Genesis, and I'm not sure there's many out there that are gonna argue that Shining Force CD is better than, or even just as good as Shining Force 1, 2, or 3. For one thing, the villages in this one are lacking, to say the least, which is kind of a disappointment, but hey, if you dig those games, then you're gonna dig Shining Force CD. It's just, you know, more Shining Force. You can't argue with that. 
All right, and I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Drunk. That's some of the most recognizable music in gaming right there. It kicks off one of Sega's most well-known franchises in Golden Axe, and the first game in particular represents one of gaming's biggest gaps between playing it back when it was released and playing it now. It started off as an arcade game back in 1989 and was ported to the Genesis shortly after. Now remember, this was at a time when the Genesis was in direct competition with the NES. We were still a couple of years away from the Super Nintendo, and Golden Axe was a huge feather in the cap for Sega because it was easily one of the best arcade to home console transitions the gaming industry had seen. Sure, there were some limitations here and there, like a few missing voice samples, but the visuals and music were very similar, it was two-player co-op, and most importantly, the feel of the controls was spot on. The moves, the bosses, the cool-looking creatures you could ride, it was all here, and it was a significant step ahead of the kind of arcade port the NES could pull off. Hell, they even added an extra level and an extra boss fight after the final boss. Okay, that's all well and good for 1989, but what if you wanted to play Golden Axe on Genesis today? Well, that's where your mileage is going to vary significantly, because Golden Axe is a really simple beat-em-up. Three characters, three varying attributes in strength, speed, and magic. There's a Red Sonya ripoff who's the quickest with the strongest magic, a dwarf who's physically the strongest of the three, and a Conan the Barbarian type who's the most balanced. And you slowly move to the right as you kick the crap out of each enemy that comes your way on the way to fight the evil Death Adder. There's also a one-on-one -on -one fighting mode here as well, but it's the same same as Double Dragon, it's the same moves as the regular game, making it kinda useless. Most infamous about the presentation here is when you defeat an enemy, their screams are so intense that they disrupt the soundtrack to communicate their agony. Another thing that sets Golden Axe apart is the ability to ride monsters, and it's not just you, either. Enemies can kick your sorry ass off of whatever these things are and get back on themselves. I've always liked that touch. Other than that, though, the combat is as basic as it gets. Sure, you can vary your attack combos by throwing an enemy or just choosing to beat their heads in with the blunt end of your sword. That's pretty satisfying. You can also double tap forward to run and do a charging attack and this weird rolling attack that I can never seem to hit anyone with. Normally, the running attack in particular would be a nice addition to a beat-em-up because it's speeds the game up, but here you're locked into an automatically scrolling landscape. That's a major bummer. Even with the second player, this game can really drag. It's slowly paced and the gameplay just doesn't have enough variety to make things a little more interesting. The magic system is something different, I guess. You have to collect these little blue jars to get a stronger attack, and you gotta pick your spots if you want to use it in small bursts or save up for a boss fight. Plus, beating the crap out of these little guys with this creepy music never gets old. The thing is though, Golden Axe is very static, just 7 levels plus that extra boss fight I mentioned earlier, 3 lives per continue with 3 continues, no password, no battery save, and what you see is what you get. I will say the fantasy motif here, with both the visuals and the music, is really well done. I still love how this game looks and sounds. Also, both the arcade version and the Genesis version have great endings. But Golden Axe is a simple, slow game. It was great for its time because it was such a good arcade port, but playing it today, your mileage varies big time. There's a gazillion ports of this one out there that you can choose from, and this one even got a remake that I'm not even sure I should mention since it plays like a completely different game. But speaking just for the original arcade and the Sega Genesis version, it hasn't aged that well because it's too slow and too limited. The visuals and music are great, but this one's kind of tough to play these days, especially compared to better options like the Streets of Rage series or, sticking with the fantasy theme, King of Dragons or Knights of the Round on Super Nintendo. Interestingly, the next Golden Axe game wasn't released for arcades or even for Sega Genesis, it was for the Sega Master System. Golden Axe Warrior is a spin-off instead of a sequel, and it's surprisingly more of a Zelda clone. Of course, there's crystals you have to recover, the story is the usual ho-hum adventure stuff, but the overworld features 200 unique screens and there's 9 different dungeons to get through, so there's a lot to this game. There's all sorts of different characters you can meet, items, weapons, and armor to buy, and special weapons that grant you new abilities. This game is surprisingly really good, and yeah, while it may be a blatant Zelda clone, that's not a bad thing, because it's a really good Zelda clone. Golden Axe Warrior is pretty expensive and hard to find, so if you want to play this one now, you can play it as part of Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection for the PS3 and 360 as one of the unlockable extra games.
Back to the main series, Golden Axe 2 skipped the arcade altogether and went straight to Sega Genesis, and it's more Golden Axe. They did change up the special moves, the visuals are even more impressive, and the magic system allows you to control how powerful you want a spell to be depending on how long you hold the button down. But other than that, it's the same three characters, a lot of the same enemies, although you do get to beat up these sorcerers now. And yeah, it's just like I said, more Golden Axe. The controls are the same, the feel is the same, the dual mode is still there, it's still two-player co-op, and it's six stages, three lives, and three continues. No battery save or passwords. I will say, I think the controls are a bit smoother in Golden Axe 2, but other than that, I'm really at a loss as what to say about this one. It's the same stuff, just a little bit different visuals and of course a different soundtrack, which is great. So if you like Golden Axe, then you'll like Golden Axe 2. It's not a bad game, but I still prefer the first game. And I will say to its credit, this is one of the all-time great boss themes ever. Later that year came yet another spin-off, Axe Battler, A Legend of Golden Axe for Sega Game Gear. And this is a pretty interesting one because it's another adventure style game where you wander into random battles and the game transitions into a side-scrolling beat-em-up, so it's a lot like Zelda 2. There's nine areas you need to clear as you fight your way up to Death Adder's castle, and there is a password system here so you don't have to beat the game in one go-round. One touch I like here is the inclusion of training dojos in each town where you can learn new attacks. This one isn't nearly as deep and interesting as the other spin-off, Golden Axe Warrior, but if you're into Game Gear games, Axe Battler is okay. Just, you know, keep your expectations in check. It's a friggin' Game Gear game, so it's kinda limited and outdated. Another Golden Axe game was released in arcades, but strangely nowhere else. It's Golden Axe The Revenge of Death Adder came a year after Golden Axe 2, and this is more like it. There's new characters with larger sprites, it's 4 player compatible complete with special moves where you team up, there's better enemy design and smarter AI, there's fire breathing mantises, there's these smooth transitions to other viewpoints which are all really well done, there's branching paths, there's crazier settings like this dungeon or this weird glowing cave, there's scorpions you can ride that can electrocute enemies, this one really feels like an evolution of the series. It's faster, quicker paced, and more intense, all while keeping the feel of the original Golden Axe. So I like this one a lot more as a follow-up than Golden Axe 2. It's a lot of fun and the best game in the series. But unfortunately, it was never ported anywhere, so the only way to play it right now is in an arcade emulator. Still, even then, this one is well worth checking out. Golden Axe 3 was only released in Japan and was only made available in the US via the Sega channel. We've got all new characters again, and the visuals are washed out looking. The controls have a much different feel, and as a result, Golden Axe 3 loses what made the series unique. Instead of a Golden Axe game, it plays just like another beat-em-up. It's still got some good qualities. For instance, the music is still great. There are branching paths which make the game interesting. There's all new special moves and a grappling system, and it's still two-player co-op. But the fantasy motif that's so strong in the earlier games in the series comes comes across so plain and flat here. It can't be overstated how blah this game looks, especially when the earlier games look so great. I can only imagine playing Revenge of Death Adder in arcades and then waiting for a home console release only to be met with this. Golden Axe 3 definitely isn't bad, it's just not really a Golden Axe game in looks or by feel, so keep your expectations in check with this one. Regardless, it's still a decent beat-em-up with some good qualities. Finally, we have Golden Axe The Duel, a one-on-one -on -one fighting game released in arcades and then ported to Sega Saturn. There's nine different characters to choose from, but once again, it's all new characters that are descendants of characters from previous games. Jeez, what is with this series? All anyone wanted was just to see the original three again, but with a visual upgrade. You do play as Death Adder, at least, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, this is pretty standard as far as mid-90s arcade fighting games go. There's the smaller, quicker character, there's a Blanca-looking guy, there's wizards, and it's a weapon-based fighter, so it it probably compares closest to something like Samurai Showdown. One twist I like is that just like in the older Golden Axe games, these little gnome guys show up and drop magic jars in the middle of battle. You collect them, max out your magic meter, and go into a super mode. Golden Axe The Duel is pretty good, it definitely looks and sounds great, but it doesn't touch the other fighting games of the time like the Street Fighter games, the Tekken series, or even X-Men Children of the Atom. Alright, that's all for now. I should mention quickly that there is one other Golden Axe game released for PS3 and 360 called Golden Axe Beast Rider, but I don't have any way of playing that, and besides, it got panned by critics and fans alike, so it's probably a good idea to avoid that one. But I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Sega!
drunk? Earlier this week, I posted a list video ranking what I thought were the best Super Nintendo beat-em-ups, which of course prompts a response from many of, oh, my streets of rage! Well, here you go. Here's a big video all about the three Streets of Rage games for the Sega Genesis. And no, I'm not going to act like anybody out there actually needs my advice as to whether or not these games hold up today, because they obviously do. What I like to do with games like this, though, is talk about why these games are as good as they are and why they've held up over time. All three of these games were first-party titles, developed and published by Sega themselves, with the first Streets of Rage game being released in North America in September of 1991. And I think it goes to show how confident Sega was in this one, because that's around the same time the Super Nintendo was released. Now, this game got all sorts of ports to Game Gear and the Master System, but I'm concentrating on the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive version for each of these games. There's three playable characters, Adam, Axel, and Blaze, each with varying skill sets and move sets. Adam is a boxer and the strongest of the three, but also the slowest. Blaze is the fastest, but the weakest, and Axel is the most balanced character. Right away in the first stage, this game is so distinct looking, with the neon lights, the music, it really builds a true sense of atmosphere, which is rare in a beat-em-up, at least in my experience. There's eight levels, and I really like how this game progresses through its world. You're on a beach, you're on a ship, there's this elevator stage. All of these games have such a strong sense of place, thanks to the art direction, and it warrants mentioning that the director of all three games is Noriyoshi Oba, who also directed the superb Revenge of Shinobi. When it comes to the gameplay of the first game, there's going to be inevitable comparisons to Final Fight, and yeah, it plays similarly to a certain extent, but Streets of Rage has more going on. For one thing, there's up to five enemies that appear on screen at once, and that makes a big difference. There's also a clear screen attack, where you call in the help of a policeman who fires a frickin' rocket that destroys everyone, except you, of course. You can also leap over a grappled enemy by pressing jump, that's handy, or if you're held from behind, you can still kick in front of you, or throw the guy that's got you. My favorite thing is if an enemy throws you, you can hold up and the jump button at the same time to land on your feet, I love that. One really interesting twist comes at the end of the game that I have to point out, so, uh, spoiler alert, on a 27 year old game? When you get to the final boss, Mr. X, an evil crime lord, he asks if you'd like to become his right hand man, or woman. If you say yes, you're sent back to level 6. And and when you get to Mr. X again, you become the new crime lord. It's pretty cool. If you just say no, you fight him as you normally would. What's really awesome though is that if you're playing this with two players, you each get asked that same question. And if you pick different answers, you eventually have to fight each other. That is awesome. The flaws that stand out about this one are that, yes, this game does drag a bit, especially when you come to the last stage, which is ridiculously hard. There's a boss gauntlet, and you don't get your clear screen attack. What, the cop can drive from nowhere on a beach or on a boat, but not in a high-rise? Come on! While at times it may feel like the levels stretch on forever, the original Streets of Rage is still a fun time, and it's since been released on like two dozen compilations, so this game is not hard to find. But if you'd rather save your time for the sequel, Streets of Rage 2, then I don't blame you. Obviously, this game has received a ton of hype over the years, so why is that? Well, for one thing, it builds on the solid foundation the first game laid down and improved on every facet. The visuals, the soundtrack, the moveset, the enemy AI, the game's structure, just about any nitpicky flaw you could have found with the first game, it's been addressed in the sequel. One major factor Streets of Rage 2 improved is the atmosphere, and for a beat-em-up, that's pretty unusual. We're used to seeing stuff like Sonic Blast Man or Captain Commando, which is just sort of a hodgepodge of weirdness. For games like Batman Returns, which do a nice job representing their source material, but Streets of Rage 2 creates a new world all of its own. It compares more to something like Super Castlevania 4 or even Super Metroid in that sense. A big reason for that is the music. This is beyond just another video game soundtrack. Each track is a legit good song made with great production value that got the most out of the Genesis sound hardware. The sound design here is also great. It feels really satisfying to beat the crap out of these guys. Another thing that makes Streets of Rage 2 better than its peers is something I talk about a lot on this channel, balance. And in this case, it's not just the balance of difficulty between your character's capabilities and the enemy and boss AI, which this game does well. And it's not just the balance of speed between everyone on screen, which is also present here, but also the balance of accessibility. And by that I mean, this is still such a great pick up and play game while having a layer of complexity behind it that you discover the more you play. You can land combos in this game. For example, you can stun enemies with a weaker hit and then go to town on them with a series of stronger moves. And everything is pretty easy to execute too, because the controls
controls are so satisfyingly smooth. Again, there's eight levels, and each of the now four playable characters all play differently. Adam has been kidnapped, so he's out of there, but Axel and Blaze are back, and Blaze is a lot more balanced, while Axel's just kind of the same, but with more functionality. After that, we have the big, slow, strong guy, Max, and the ultra-quick, weak guy, Skate. Each character has their own special moves, too, so certain characters' movesets lend themselves better to different parts of the game, and different boss fights, too. For example, you might want to use Skate's dash for certain areas, since he's the only character that can do that. Another change from the first game is that the omnipresent police car clear screen attack is gone. Instead, the clear screen attacks are structured like Final Fight, where you lose a bit of health every time you use them. But yeah, Streets of Rage 2 holds up as one of, if not the best beat-em-up of the 16-bit era because of two things, atmosphere and balance. The larger sprites, the details and the visuals, and of course the kick-ass soundtrack provide the atmosphere, setting the stage for all sorts of enemy types to come at you more than twice what the original game offered, and for you to kick some ass using all sorts of different maneuvers that are easy to execute, with the game remaining challenging, but not a slog to get through. If there's any nitpicky flaws with this one, it's that it doesn't have the multiple endings like the first game did, but that's okay. Streets of Rage 2 still features a ton of replay value just from the different characters alone. It's really easy to see why this one lives up to the hype even today. So how are you going to follow that? Well, something has to come next. So we have Streets of Rage 3, and this one concentrates a bit more on story, featuring lots of dialogue between stages. I appreciate the attempt to add to the atmosphere here, but let's face it, nobody plays beat-em-ups for the story. All you really need to know for Streets of Rage is vigilante cops go after drug lord who won't die. As far as the gameplay goes, I mean, they'd be crazy to change up much from Streets of Rage 2, and to the developer's credit, it's still a solidly made game, still better than the first game. Axel, Blaze, and Skate are back, this time joined by Dr. Zan, a former cohort of Mr. X, and there's some tweaks here and there, like the small blue meter to the right of your health bar, it lets you do special moves without sacrificing any life, which is nice, and it recharges every few seconds. There's also a roll maneuver you can do by double tapping up or down, and now every character can run by double tapping forward or back backward, not just skate. This helps the game move along faster, but unfortunately it also makes skate a little expendable as a character. But at least each character still has a unique move set, including unique moves with weapons, which is pretty sweet. In addition to all that, you also get what are called blitz moves. If you get to a certain score in one single life, you earn a star beneath your health meter and it increases your dash attack. Hey, it kind of reminds me of the stars in Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Despite all the cool moves you can do here, there's some downers here as well, like the weapons now having their own health meter, which is a bummer. I guess they didn't want them to be too overpowered. Also, since the game is sped up so much, it feels like they lost a little bit of the balance here between your character and the enemies, and as a result, that's thrown off the difficulty a bit, because this game is way tougher than the first two games. Whether that's better or worse is up to you to decide, but I think it's for the worse. Also, maybe this is just a personal thing, but the atmosphere in Streets of Rage 3 just seems off. The colors in the backgrounds don't seem right, the soundtrack isn't as catchy, Blaze is wearing gray instead of red. For whatever reason, it just doesn't feel like a Streets of Rage game. Until you play the Japanese version, Bare Knuckle 3. It turns out the North American version was heavily censored, and the story was changed up too. Plus, this game is much easier, so you can experience the whole game instead of getting frustrated and saying screw it. I'm not sure why they made those changes when the game was localized, but whatever. A few more things I should mention, one is that once you get to stage 6, the game opens up a bit to a few multiple paths, but this turns out to be more annoying than anything else in my opinion since there's no way to tell which areas you've already been in. Another thing to mention is that the multiple endings are back, so spoiler alert, when you're about to fight Mr. X for the first time, he's actually a Terminator? If you beat him here on easy, this is the end of the game, but on normal and hard, you keep going to a stage where you've only got 60 seconds to rescue the chief of police before the room fills with poison gas. If you save him, you go on to the good ending path, but even then, you have to beat Mr. X in less than three minutes. Fail to do that, and you still get a bad ending. Sheesh, this game is relentless. But yeah, if the chief of police dies, you go on another path to City Hall, where level one boss Shiva acts as the final boss. I should also mention there's a few unlockable characters in this one. For instance, at the end of stage two, if you can beat the clown without beating the boxing kangaroo, you can actually play as the kangaroo. Okay, he kind of sucks, but hey, it's a neat feature. You can also unlock Shiva if you hold B after beating him in the first level. Anyway, all this is to say that Streets of Rage 3 isn't as good as the second game, but I mean, what is? And it's still a very good game with a ton of features, but I think it's best experience playing the Japanese version, Bare Knuckle 3, if only because it tones down the difficulty a bit.
That was it for Streets of Rage on Sega Genesis, but Sega attempted to continue the series on Sega Saturn with a 3D game that was cancelled at the last minute and instead turned into Fighting Force for PlayStation and N64. They also attempted a Streets of Rage 4 on Dreamcast, but that too was cancelled. There were a couple other false starts for PS3 and 360 that never saw the light of day, but there is a Streets of Rage remake, a fan-made project that's available for PC that's floating around out there somewhere. It's kind of a mesh of all three games with some original content thrown in there as well, and as far as fan made games go, it's pretty good. So if you need another Streets of Rage fix, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Alright, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Sinestra. It's time for my first redo video, and I want to redo my video for Final Fight. It was one of the very first videos I made when I started almost two and a half years ago, and I want to take a look at it again for several reasons. Number one, I had no idea what I was doing yet. Number two, I only talked about the first game and not the two sequels. Number three, I love Final Fight, and number four, this series, the first game in particular, is one of the hardest for me to look at objectively, because the first game is one of the first games I ever own, so I have an easy incentive to like this game a lot. People like to rag on the Final Fight Super Nintendo port, and I understand why, but I don't think it's a bad port, just a very limited one. I should let you know though, there's a few major things you should know about the Super Nintendo version of Final Fight. There can only be three enemies on screen at once, they left out a playable character, Guy, they left out the fourth level entirely, and they left out the multiplayer feature. So if any of those aspects are deal breakers for you, then there you go. Capcom tried to fix this years later by releasing Final Fight Guy, which is exclusive to Blockbuster video stores, but they just replaced Cody with Guy, and the rest of the game is the same. Well, whatever, at least they tried. Notice though that the four things I mentioned there are just limitations. They're just things they had to leave out. The graphics and the actual gameplay are still really well done. So yeah, despite no multiplayer, no guy, a limited number of enemies, and a shorter game, I still think Final Fight is worth playing today because the core beat-em-up gameplay here is so well done. The hit detection is great, the variety of moves are kept intact, and there's big, huge, detailed, colorful sprites, especially the bosses who just look fantastic. And the sound design here is just amazing. In my earlier video, I talked about how every beat-em-up needs a hook of some sort, because beat-em-ups are very repetitive, obviously, so to keep them from getting boring, you gotta get people addicted to doing the same thing over and over. Final Fight's hook is the extremely satisfying sound of kicking someone's ass. And yes, I'm going to make the same comparison I made in my earlier video, because I think it's an important point. Listen to what it sounds like here. Now in the game Legend. Now in Brawl Brothers. Now in Pirates of the Dark Water. And now, in, even in Final Fight 3, and back to Final Fight. It's just that extra kick that makes this game so satisfying to play. And it's not just beating people up, you also beat the crap out of this car with your bare fists. Oh my God. Now that's funny. So yeah, despite its limitations, I do think Final Fight is well worth playing today. If you want to play something closer to the original arcade version, there's Final Fight for Sega CD. Or there's a spruced up version for Game Boy Advance, Final Fight 1. Or if you'd like, you can simply move on to the next game in the Super Nintendo series, Final Fight 2. There's multiplayer this time around, and three characters to choose from. Hagar is back from the first game, but there's also Maki and Carlos, who in a shocking coincidence play a lot like Guy and Cody, respectively. However, I gotta mention for multiplayer, both Final Fight 2 2 and 3, you can hit each other. Ah, <sighs> well, it's better than nothing, I guess. Sadly, the sound design here just isn't as good as the first Final Fight. It feels a little flimsy to punch someone out. It's lacking that deep crunching sound, so that's kind of a bummer. The gameplay, though, is mostly the same, although some levels scroll vertically. I do want to stress one other thing about the Final Fight series that makes it stand out among other beat-em-ups. One key aspect of being able to progress in a beat-em-up is being able to get all the enemies on one side of the screen. Each Final Fight game makes it very easy to do this. Just hit an enemy with a a couple punches, press the opposite direction on the d-pad as you're throwing the third punch, and the enemy is sent in the other direction. In Final Fight 2, you can do this via suplex, toss, or a monkey flip. This is a simple thing that a lot of beat-em-ups overlook that Final Fight 1 and 2 both do really well. There's not much else to say about Final Fight 2, so I'll move on to the third game in the series. Guy is back in Final Fight 3 along with Hagar, Dean, and Lucia to make four playable characters. There's a strong emphasis on multiplayer
player here because not only can you play with the second player, but you can play with the computer as your ally as well. So that's pretty cool. The gameplay here has really been spruced up. It's got your traditional Final Fight stuff in addition to being able to run, do a dash attack, and certain Street Fighter type commands can unlock a special move. You gotta love that. Overall, the gameplay here feels so much faster. Even Big Slow Hagar here can make short work of these guys, and it's commendable that despite the repetitive gameplay, the game moves along quickly. One small thing about the gameplay though, just a bit earlier I mentioned how easy it is to get every enemy on one side of the screen in the previous two games, but in Final Fight 3, it just doesn't work the same way. You have to grab the guy first, and that's kind of problematic. Granted, the hit detection here is very good, and what you'd expect from a game like this, and each character's range is pretty substantial, so it's easy to create space and not get overwhelmed by enemies on both sides, but still, I miss the fluid motion of the one-two punch throw or one-two punch suplex mechanic. But yeah, the graphics look better than ever, and the music is fantastic. All the additions to the basic gameplay, including a useful new game mode, make Final Fight 3 the best game in the series. So yeah, all three Final Fight games are worth playing today, and don't be scared off by the first one. Yeah, it's a bit limited, there's no multiplayer, but it's still a good beat-em-up, and the cartridge is around $5 or so. The carts for the other two games are a bit pricey, especially the third game, but if you insist on playing your beat-em-ups with another player, then those two games are the way to go. Hi there, let's take a look at each sim game released for the Super Nintendo. And no, I don't mean each game in the simulation genre, just the games from the Sim series. Sim City, Sim City 2000, Sim Earth, and Sim Ant. And I'll start with one of the North American SNES launch titles, Sim City. The title is pretty self-explanatory here, you build and simulate a city, and for a PC port in the early 90s, this was as good as you could possibly hope for. There's very little lag or slowdown as you work in real time. I already did a video on this one a long while back, and yeah, I was kind of hard on it, and my main talking point was that a game this ambitious isn't always going to age well, because later iterations of the same idea are going to be done on a bigger scale with a grander vision, and on a whole other level of detail. For example, you quickly run out of room to build your city, and then it's like, well now what do I do? And your options in general are very limited, especially since I've grown used to what's available in later SimCity games. Traffic is a problem? Oh, I'll just put down a few bus stations, build a subway, and... Oh, you can't do any of those things here. That may be the case, but the SimCity experience on Super Nintendo is still fine on its own. One thing this game nailed is how stress-free and relaxing it is. The music is absolutely perfect for a game like this, so you can sit back and either build a city from scratch, play out one of the scenarios, or just screw around and summon Bowser to wreck everything. I really like SimCity, it's one of my favorite games from my childhood, and while I wouldn't blame anyone for dismissing it because the series had moved on to much more advanced and more detailed aspects, I still think there's a lot of value in playing the SNES version in this day and age. The same, however, cannot be said for the SNES port of SimCity 2000. Well, they did the best they could, but that game is just too huge to cram onto a Super Nintendo cartridge. This is a very slow game with long load times, limited maps, limited scenarios, limited music, fewer disasters, and did I mention how slow everything is? Good god. I just want to get to the bottom of the map here, Jesus. This is especially disappointing for me personally because SimCity 2000 is one of my favorite games ever for PC. It's a natural progression from the original game with a lot more functionality and a lot more possibilities available to the player. You can build a subway system, high schools, colleges, water towers and pumps, marinas, prisons, libraries, museums, it's really cool. But the Super Nintendo version fails to execute the basic gameplay in a user-friendly manner, it's just way too slow. I will say they had the right idea with the music, it's perfect for this kind of game, and uh, you'll be hearing a lot of it as you scroll and wait and scroll and wait. Seriously, you're way better off with the original SimCity than this port. In fact, maybe it would have been a better idea to keep the graphical interface from the original game, but add SimCity 2000's additional options, plus, how about this, support for the Super Nintendo mouse. Now that would have been something. Let's move on to Sim Earth, and it's story time with SNES Drunk. Once upon a time in 6th grade, I lent my copy of Sim City to a classmate. In return, he lent me Gradius 3. About a week later, when I went to give his game back, he wasn't at school that day, so I just left the game in my locker, where it got stolen. 
Well, my friend's mom freaked and complained to my mom that it was only right that he got to keep my game since I was responsible for losing his game. What a bunch of bullshit. Well, anyway, as a replacement, I asked for Sim Earth for Christmas that year. It seemed like a huge upgrade anyway. Sim City, but on an entire planet? Hell yeah. But, uh, yeah. That's not what this game is at all. In fact, I had no freaking clue what the hell is supposed to be going on in this game in the slightest. It turns out what you're supposed to do is manipulate the planet's atmosphere, weather, and climate in order to make the conditions just right for life to form and evolve into an advanced civilization. So yeah, needless to say, this went way over my head as a 10 year old. And to this day, it is still really confusing. I guess I just don't understand enough about earth science to know how to mess around with continental drifts or atmospheric pressure or the proper conditions for bacteria to grow and spread. Yes, that's right. It's a video game where you're manipulating bacteria and amoebas. Feel the excitement. Anyway, I guess the idea behind Sim Earth is noble and enough, but even if this game were a little more intuitive and had a more user-friendly interface, and if, you know, you had any inkling as to what was going on or what you were doing, I still wouldn't be able to recommend it because it's targeted toward a specific audience. So all you geoscience majors out there, this game is for you. Good luck. Last we have Sim Ant, and mercifully this game is much better than Sim Earth because it's a lot more linear. Also the scroll bar here makes it a lot easier to understand what you're supposed to do, how about that? You're an ant, okay that's easy enough, so what do I do? You dig, okay now what? You lay eggs, okay now go find food. Oh shit, there's other ants, I gotta defend my eggs. You see Sim Earth, being straightforward and easy to understand isn't all that hard. Sorry, I'm still just really bitter about that game. The goal is to take over this guy's entire yard and drive this poor sap out of his house. Now that's funny. Simant is also a better port than SimCity 2000 because it operates much better. There's not much lag or slowdown at the beginning anyway. The game runs smoothly for the most part. And hey, it actually uses the SNES mouse. Imagine that. Now, there's a lot less functionality here to say the least. I mean, you obviously have to be big time into ants or insects to get a lot of mileage out of this game. But just in case you're not, the game helpfully includes a tutorial that explains everything you've ever wanted to know about ants. I don't know about you, but I'm really amused that this is here. You can't fault the game's developers for trying. There's three different ants you can play as, and each have their own abilities and requirements. Like, you'll need soldier ants to defend the nest, but they need a lot of food to maintain. So yeah, there's a smidgen of strategy involved where you really have to decide how you want to split up your worker and soldier ants, but really the majority of the gameplay is just gathering food. Sim Ant is a fine game, and it's certainly better than Sim Earth, but it's probably not for everyone. So yeah, that's all four Sim games for the Super Nintendo, and obviously the best game of the bunch is going to be the original Sim City. Sim Ant is fine for what it is, even if it is pretty repetitive, and it has kind of an oddball subject matter. Sim City 2000 is just a bad port, and Sim Earth is just bad in general. Anyway, that's it. Thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your day. Drunk. Hi there, I've been putting it off long enough, so let's take a look at some of the best games that were only released in the European region, or in other words, the best PAL games that never made it to North America for whatever reason, for Super Nintendo. I'm gonna do this the same way the Japan-only Super Famicom videos are done, so just a brief blurb on each game, and show off some footage for about 20 to 25 games. I'll start real quick with the games people are already mostly familiar with, like Terranigma. I already did a video on this one, it's the third game in the Enix Quintet trilogy, and the best of the three in my opinion, just edging out Soul Blazer. Terranigma is a bit more story driven, that's what you'll remember about this game first and foremost when you think back on playing it. But yeah, there's the familiar top down combat with the occasional puzzle here and there, some really nice visuals, and a superb soundtrack. Terranigma might be the best game on this entire video. Speaking of top-down games, there's The Firemen. This is a game that sounds kind of dumb on the surface. You walk around and put out fires with an arsenal of typical firefighting stuff, but for what it is, this game is really well done. There's a certain element of strategy to taking out fires and making sure they don't spread, and your character is given a lot of functionality here to deal with all the mayhem. The Firemen is just a well-made game that's something different from your usual action fare. Next there's Cannon Fodder. This is another game with a strategic slant as you survey high above the action here as your lemming-like army takes out bad guys. You're granted more and more functionality as you progress. This game seems like it shouldn't work as well as it does because everything is so small, but the hit detection here is very forgiving and it's pretty funny to blast these guys into oblivion. 
Staying with top-down games, there's Super Bomberman 3. Now, there are five total Super Bomberman games. The first two made it to the US, the third made it to Europe, but the fourth and fifth never left Japan. However, Super Bomberman 3 is my pick for the best in the series, because it features the most items to use, a ton of playable characters, these kangaroo guys named Louis as a soccer mini-game, and there's the bad bomber mode, where eliminated players can hang out on the edge of the map and still screw up the game for everyone. It's so fun. Now we move on to more traditional platformers with one of my personal favorites, Poppin' Twinbee Rainbow Bell Adventures. This game is early 90s Konami platforming at its very best, with wide open level design, smooth intuitive controls, and all sorts of nice little touches here and there that add a lot of personality. If Terra Enigma isn't the best game on this list, then Rainbow Bell Adventure would be my next pick. Another nice and polished looking platformer is Asterix and Obelix. I'm not sure how that's pronounced, but that's what I'm going with. This is a game that has a visual presentation similar to Earthworm Jim, fittingly enough as it's based off a serialized comic that was popular in France. A game that puts such a heavy emphasis on art style is always going to be a bit clunky to control at first because you have to get used to how the characters move and react, and that can take a while. Both these guys move pretty deliberately, which can be frustrating, but this is definitely a fun platformer with quite a bit of variety in the gameplay. Next is Whirlo, a pretty standard side-scrolling platformer that's good enough. You're this little green dude that swings around a pitchfork and gets it stuck in the ground occasionally. One hit deaths here, so it's pretty dang hard. Nothing spectacular here, but a decent enough game that can kill 30 minutes for you. Lucky Luke is a great looking run and gun game with a western setting which draws the obvious comparison to Sunset Riders. That's a better game, but Lucky Luke is still pretty good. You can't shoot while jumping which is kind of lousy, but there's hidden areas to find and a good amount of gameplay variety as well. Now let's move on to fighting games, and I only have to mention one franchise, Dragon Ball Z. There are seriously like 6 or 7 Dragon Ball Z one-on-one -on -one fighting games, and they're all very similar. I'm not familiar with the series, so I'm not the best person to tell you which is the best game or which best captures the spirit of the show or whatever. I can tell you that I had the most fun with Dragon Ball Z Hyper Dimension, just because the stage settings were pretty cool. These games don't come close to games like Street Fighter 2 or Killer Instinct, but they're alright. Next I'll tackle some shoot 'em ups The first Parodius game was released in Europe, but not North America. And that's really a shame, because this is one of the weirdest, most surreal games you'll ever play. Really, even if you don't like shoot 'em ups or if you just suck at them, I implore you to try Parodius. It's ridiculous in the best possible way. It's just one thing after another making you say, wait, what? It's hilarious and there isn't another game like it of its era. If you'd rather play a vertically scrolling shooter, there's Poppin' Twin Bee, pretty weird in its own right, but a well-made game. My only qualm with it is that it's so bright and colorful that it's often tough to see enemies or projectiles, so you gotta stay on your toes. You can control the power-up system to a certain extent by shooting these bells that pop up to make them a certain color to match what you need, whether it's a better weapon or points to build toward an extra life. Super Drop Zone is a Defender-style shooter, the sequel to the original Atari game that was, uh, pretty much a total ripoff of Defender. So if you like this style of shooter, I'm just letting you know that this is out there. Cyvalian is a decent arcade port where you control a metal fire-breathing dragon. It has some problems, like the strange out-of-place music and the unreadable text, but it's a pretty interesting game that provides multiple endings depending on how you play, and the maps are randomized throughout. It's definitely flawed, but it's worth checking out. On to puzzle games, there's The Humans, a really bad title, but an okay game. You play as a group of cavemen that you arrange to work together to get through each stage. You control one guy at a time switching with the L and R buttons, you find tools and weapons, kill dinosaurs, and earn abilities as you progress. There's also Worms, a PC port, and yeah, Super Nintendo PC ports can be dicey, but this game is fine. You control a group of worms that battles their way across the screen. In other words, it's the same Worms-style gameplay you're likely familiar with from the 2007 remake, just on Super Nintendo. It's pretty limited, but it's still a fun multiplayer game. Eberekis Popoido is an interesting name for a game to say the least. It's your typical Tetris Dr. Mario hybrid style game. This one in particular is similar to Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, only you can line up pieces diagonally. It's an inoffensive puzzle game if you like stuff like this, and again, it's a good multiplayer game. Last, let's tackle a few sports games, starting with racing. Micro Machines 2 is one of the best games on this list. It's a very good top-down racing game with reliable and consistent controls. The track is a bit slippery, and it's easy to knock each other off the track entirely, but you get used to it pretty quickly. It's a good game that's a nice change of pace from stuff like Mario Kart and Top Gear. 
Smash Tennis is another really good title because it supports up to four players. Okay, not everyone is that crazy about tennis, but still, behind Super Tennis, it's the best tennis game on the Super Nintendo. And to finish up, here's three games for sports I know almost nothing about, soccer, rugby, and cricket. I'm obviously not the best judge for games that best represent these sports because I just don't follow them. Hell, I barely understand the rules of rugby and I don't have the slightest idea what's supposed to be happening in cricket. But that said, Sensible Soccer European Champions is one I hear recommended a lot and I can see why. It's a fast-paced game that's easy to get into. And just as a quick aside, the crowd noise here is some of the best I've ever heard in a game. For rugby, there's world-class rugby, and for cricket, there's super international cricket. Those are two I hear recommended all the time. So yeah, there you go. If I had to pick the four best games from this list, I'd go with Terranigma, Poppin' Twin B Rainbow Bell Adventures, The Fireman, and Parodius, with an honorable mention to Micro Machines 2. Thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your day. A few years ago, I made a video going over some Super Nintendo games that skipped over North America and NTSC regions, and only left Japan to be released in PAL regions, and by that, I'm mostly referring to Europe and Australia. That video failed to cover every game, though, and there's one company in particular that, for the Super Nintendo, they only developed and published PAL region games, Infograms, who are now known as Atari SA. And interestingly, each one of these eight games are licensed and based on a comic or television show. Starting with Asterix, one of the most popular comics in the world, uh, other than the US, or at least my part of the US. I'd never heard of this before I was made aware of these games, but it's a long-running comic going all the way back to the late 50s. The game has you play out the story of the comic, more or less, taking place in 50 BC, where you're resisting a Roman occupation. You play as Asterix in an action platformer fighting Romans and various other enemies trying to rescue your friend Obelix. The game is as standard as an action platformer gets, there's nothing all that innovative or unique here, but that's not the point. The developers clearly set out to make a game that accurately represents the source material, and they did just that. Not that different than what you see with some Disney and Looney Tunes Super Nintendo games. Asterix is okay, but you're probably better off with... The sequel, Asterix and Obelix. It's the same kind of gameplay, but the colors, sprite animation, and backgrounds are all really well done. You can play as either character, and it's two-player co-op. I'm obviously not an expert on the comic, but based on other reviews of this game, it represents the comics universe much, much better than the previous game. There's locations varying from Bavaria to Greece to Egypt, you're climbing mountains, you're on a sailing ship, there's mini-games like this rugby one. Plus, unlike the first game, there's a password system here, which really helps because this game is long. If you're a fan of the comic series, Series, you'll love this one, but to anyone else it's still a perfectly okay action platformer, albeit a very long and challenging one. This one also received ports on Game Boy and Game Boy Color, also only in PAL regions. Another hugely popular comic series that got a couple of PAL region Super Nintendo games is The Adventures of Tintin, starting with Tintin in Tibet, and just take one glance at this one in the very first level. There are few 16-bit games that look like this. You're mostly dodging obstacles, moving from the foreground to the background, and talking to people trying to follow what's going on in the story. It's pretty simple stuff, but again, it's not like the developers were striving for innovation or whatever. They likely just wanted something that accurately represented the source material, and they pulled it off brilliantly. It's made for fans of the comic first and foremost. If you've never heard of Tintin, you might be drawn in by the graphics here, but the gameplay isn't as engaging as something like the Asterix games, for example. It's just okay. But yeah, if you're a fan of the comic, then this game was made for you. The same can be said for its follow-up, Adventures of Tintin Prisoners of the Sun. This is very similar to the previous game, just with a different story to follow. The gameplay is the same sort of deal where you just dodge everything and rarely attack, so it's like the game is one long passive run. That may be fun for some people, and it lends itself well to speedruns, but neither of these games are for everyone. But again, if you're a fan of the comic, there's a good chance you'll enjoy both Super Nintendo Tintin games. Also, each game got ports on Game Boy and Game Boy Color, with Tintin and Tibet getting ports on Mega Drive and Game Gear. Next is Lucky Luke, another game based on a comic that goes back to the mid-20th century, and this might be the best game in this video. The game looks great, of course, recalling other Western-themed games like Sunset Riders and Wild Guns, and it's a pretty good platformer where you've got to figure out how to use your surroundings to find hidden areas, collect a particular item, or rescue someone. So this may look like a run-to-the-right-and-shoot stuff kind of a game, but there's a lot more to it here. There's also some gallery shooter stages thrown in for some variety, which is a nice touch. This is a really good playthrough with about 10 levels and a password system. I should also mention that Lucky Luke received games in North America for PlayStation and Game Boy Color. I can only speak for the latter in saying that that's also a pretty good game. 
Just about everyone has heard of the Smurfs, and they received two games for the Super Nintendo in PAL regions. The first game is just titled The Smurfs. It's a ho-hum platformer that's hit or miss. It's kinda slow, some sections are interesting, but the first level here, why are other Smurfs attacking me? Then you get to this tree level where you're getting hit with stuff coming off screen, so frustrating. And the jumping here is just, ugh. But the game looks good, and it's a perfectly okay Smurfs game. There's 15 levels in a password system, and a pretty cool final boss battle against Gargamel, so it's not a bad game. I mean, if you have a small child that loves the Smurfs, this game would be okay, but otherwise I'd say no thanks. There's also a stripped down version released for the Game Boy in North America, but and that one's pretty blah too. There's also the Smurfs Travel the World, or Smurfs 2, and again this one is hit or miss. This game is much faster paced with 20 gigantic levels to explore and a password system, and it sounds like it uses the same sounds from the game Young Merlin for what it's worth. The problem with this one is that the controls feel too loose. If you die, it's not usually from an enemy, but from a missed jump. And also your kick move when you press A isn't really an attack, it's just there to move stuff around. And the sprite animation is also kind of limited, a little surprising considering how good all the other games on this video look. I would pass on this one, if you really want a Smurfs game, go with the first game, unless you're huge fans of the comic or the series, then you'll probably like both games. Last we have Spiru, and I don't know, maybe I'm getting burnt out on these platformers, but this one's just sort of there. I know I sound like a broken record, but again, this game is made for a specific audience. It's not out to reinvent the wheel when it comes to a side-scrolling platformer. There's eight levels in a password system. You zip around levels by going through doors while avoiding whatever gets in your way. But yeah, this one's just okay. Not great, not terrible, not a lot going on here. You're better off with the Asterix and Obelix game, or Lucky Luke. Anyway, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Let's try. In the past, we've looked at games that are better on Super Nintendo over Sega Genesis, we've looked at games that are better on Sega Genesis over Super Nintendo, but let's take a gander at a few games that were released on both the NES and Super Nintendo, with the better playthrough being on the NES. There's no better example of this than the Ninja Gaiden series, and I'm speaking, of course, of Ninja Gaiden Trilogy for Super Nintendo. Now, if this compilation were handled the same way Super Mario All-Stars was, then it might actually be worth the absurd price it's going for on eBay, but instead the visuals were just kinda half-assed, the button layout stays at A to jump and B to attack instead of Y to attack and B to jump to better fit the Super Nintendo controller, with no option of changing this. And the soundtrack was redone, and while it's the same compositions, it sounds completely different with this weird-ass sound font. Hell, the NES versions of these games have backgrounds with parallax scrolling, while the SNES compilation doesn't. What is up with that? So yeah, this is an easy call. The Ninja Gaiden games are much better played on the NES over Super Nintendo. Paperboy 2 is another example. The Super Nintendo version is clunky and way too difficult. All the stuff trying to slow your progress is like 10 times faster than you can possibly react. It's just a pain in the ass to try and play. Plus the music, ugh. The NES version of the game has a much better balance of speed, and as a result the game is a lot more forgiving. The game may look kinda weird since your character has this odd orange outline, probably to help them stand out amongst all the craziness, but still, I enjoy Paperboy 2 a lot more on NES, if nothing else because I don't have to hear that awful SNES soundtrack. Here's one that's not a direct comparison, but it's the same series, with Final Fight and Mighty Final Fight. The Super Nintendo port of Final Fight is extremely limited, it's paced slowly with long levels that stretch out forever, and with boss fights that are way too difficult. It does have its strengths like the great music, pixel art, and sound design, but its limitations get in the way far too often. The NES came back two years after that release with Mighty Final Fight, and it's a parodious style spin-off of the Final Fight series featuring super deformed character design and some expressive sprite work. Gotta love the look on these guys' faces as they get their asses kicked. Mighty Final Fight is a solid beat-em-up with a lot of personality, and it's well worth playing over the SNES Final Fight port any day. 
Some games on this list just boil down to simple features that need to be pointed out, like Super Off-Road. As you can see, there's uh, not exactly a world of difference between the two games visually, they both have the same layout, and they both play the same way. The big advantage the SNES has is in the soundtrack, but it needs to be pointed out that the NES version of Super Off-Road is compatible with up to four players, and the Super Nintendo version is not. I know there's a lot of people out there always looking for multiplayer games beyond just two-player, and Super Off-Road is a good one for NES, and there's no slowdown or flickering in the gameplay either. It's a fun time. Now, I know Battletoads and Battle Maniacs was advertised as a sequel to Battletoads, but it's actually kind of a spruced up remake with larger sprites and more detailed settings. Sure, there are some bonus levels thrown in, but a lot of the levels are laid out in the same infuriating way, like the Turbo Tunnel or that damn snake level if you can even get that far. But I feel like if you're gonna suffer through a Battletoads game, you're better off with the original NES edition. Sure, both the SNES and Genesis games have better visuals, but the NES game has the great soundtrack, including that awesome pause music. the cartoony atmosphere, and that great first boss fight where the viewpoint changes to the boss's perspective. That boss fight's not even in the Super Nintendo game, instead it's some boring stone boar thing. The NES game also has a lot more levels, where there's only six in Battle Maniacs, all of which are based in some way on the original. It's also a tiny bit more forgiving when it comes to gaining extra lives and continues. Battle Maniacs, meanwhile, seems like you reach a game over before you know it. Yes, these games are absurdly difficult to the point of being completely unfair, and the fact that the game jolts the player around to wildly different elements of gameplay is unnerving, but if you're gonna put your blood, sweat, and tears into a Battletoads game, I'd recommend the NES game, and the Genesis game for that matter, over Battletoads and Battle Maniacs. But just between you and me, if you want to play the best Battletoads game, it's Battletoads Arcade, which is available on Xbox One right now. The Super Nintendo could never quite get Robocop right. For example, take Robocop 3. It's a side-scrolling shooter, but Robocop handles like a tank. He's so slow, and his jump is ridiculous. Plus, there's this annoying stomping sound every time he takes a step. To make up for this, they shoehorned a couple overhead shoot-em-up levels in this one. Sure, okay, but it doesn't stop this game from being a total slog. The NES edition, on the other hand, is a perfectly okay action platformer featuring some great music, and here, Robocop uses the jetpack in a regular 2D setting, which not only looks hilarious, but it's actually kind of fun. The level design also does a decent enough job making the player think about what weapon to use and where. So yeah, the NES Robocop 3 isn't going to win any awards or anything, but I'd take it over the Super Nintendo game. And last, we have Super Ninja Boy for Super Nintendo, and Little Ninja Brothers for NES. These are both good games, I love the ideas behind both of them, taking typical RPG stuff and making the combat beat-em-up gameplay. But unfortunately, Super Ninja Boy is just extremely slow and clunky. It was clearly way ahead of its time, and it has that early SNES feel to it, like the game was made before the developer could really grasp how to get the most out of the hardware. In other words, it feels like an NES game. So, if you're gonna play a glorified NES game, you might as well play, you know, an NES game, and Little Ninja Brothers is just faster paced and better executed. That's really all there is to it. The beat-em-up mechanics are so much better here, and even better, it's two-player co-op, and the game just breezes along with the second player. Alright, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hello there, and yes, it's time for yet another list. We've covered Super Nintendo games that deserve to be on the Virtual Console, we've covered Super Nintendo games that deserve Super Nintendo sequels, and we've covered Super Nintendo games that deserve modern sequels or remakes. Next, let's take a look at some NES games that, for whatever reason, never made the leap from the NES to the Super Nintendo, but absolutely had every reason to. Thanks again to the Racket Boy forums for the idea of this video. The first game that always comes to mind for this idea is Ninja Gaiden. Sure, there was the completely lame Ninja Gaiden trilogy, which combined the three NES Ninja Gaiden games in one cartridge, but the graphics are barely improved, the music sounds warped, and the only real improvement made was a password system. The whole thing feels sloppy and ultimately pointless. I would have rather have seen a real Super Nintendo Ninja Gaiden game, but the cutscenes, the atmosphere, and the music alone would have been awesome. It warrants mentioning that there was almost a Ninja Gaiden Genesis game that was similar to the original Ninja Gaiden arcade arcade, but it was never released. That's a bummer, but you can probably find the ROM online somewhere, it's pretty interesting to look at. 
Next is Blaster Master. This is a perfect example of a game that would work great on the Super Nintendo because it's the kind of hybrid game the SNES always lent itself well to, featuring two modes of gameplay in your Sophia module for side-scrolling, and outside of it in a top-down view that emphasizes exploration. The SNES could have done so much more with a game like this, making the mazes less repetitive and confusing and more intuitive, while overpowering your module even more on the side-scrolling levels. This game can be frustrating, but it's still worth checking out if you haven't, and you'll see what I mean about the SNES missing out here. There was a sequel on the Genesis, of course, and that game catered to the strengths of the Genesis hardware, and rightfully so. I have a feeling the Super Nintendo sequel would have been a lot different, and would have made for an interesting comparison at the very least. Next I'll mention Crystallis. The gameplay here isn't why I want a Super Nintendo version, as Crystallis is kind of a Zelda clone, only with the ability to jump. I thought the story and characters were super weird, and the SNES could have had a good opportunity to build on that world. There's all sorts of crazy stuff going on here. The end of the world caused by a thermonuclear war, science and technology have been shunned as a result, but a magic floating tower contains this emperor guy who rules from high above, where he plans to revive science and technology to, uh, be more evil, I guess. There's swords, sages, spells, wizards, all sorts of fun stuff. I should mention this did get a Game Boy Color version that's pretty different, but come on, a Super Nintendo edition would have been nice too. I'll mention River City Ransom. Again, not necessarily because of the gameplay, because it's a pretty standard beat-em-up, although it does have some non-linear RPG elements to a certain extent, but because the game is so damn goofy. You gotta rescue your girlfriend, and in the process you have to get through gangs like the Squids and the Generic Dudes. The gameplay is very much like Double Dragon, but if it were made by the people who made Earthbound, the vibe is very silly and could have been made that much better on the SNES. The potential of this game makes me think of something like the Legend of the Mystical Ninja series, the first game especially, which was chock full of humor but also a great game on its own. I should mention this game did have a remake on the Game Boy Advance, but they ditched the multiplayer, so that sucks. Next is DuckTales, and yes I know this game got a modern remake, and also an NES sequel as well. Still, it always kind of baffled me that Capcom kept the Disney license but never expanded on the first two DuckTales games. They did make Goof Troop, which was excellent, but then they went on to do a game for Bonkers? Did anybody even like that show? Come on! Anyway, I didn't really like DuckTales Remastered. The cutscenes were endless and completely unnecessary, and it's more of a modern remake instead of a newly realized game. A 16-bit game would have been a lot more fun. I mean, just look at Donald Duck Mahono Boshi and how awesome that looks, or Mickey to Donald Magical Adventure 3. Those are good examples of how a good SNES DuckTales game could have been, complete with Scrooge's fun and addicting gameplay mechanics like bouncing around on the cane. Base Wars was one of my favorites as a kid. I love the premise of this game. Team owners were tired of paying players outrageous salaries, so instead they decided to uh, pay outrageous prices for robots to play baseball instead. Anyway, I love the fighting element in this game. If there's a close play at any base, the two players involved fight each other. That's awesome, and think of the possibilities if you added more fighting styles, more weapons, more explosions, customizing mech robots. It could be like frickin' Cybernator Baseball, who wouldn't love that? I guess the closest thing this comes to is Super Baseball 2020, which is pretty fun in its own way, but I want more combat and fighting in my baseball. Then we have a more puzzling game here with Kid Icarus, which was of course developed by Nintendo. This game got a sequel on the original Game Boy, which is pretty good, but the Super Nintendo was entirely ignored. I don't think they ever even planned a Kid Icarus SNES game, and that's a shame because there's a lot to like here. I always liked the old arcade-style level design this game presented. Add some SNES bells and whistles, and I really think you've got something there. Thankfully, this game did get another game in the series for the 3DS, Kid Icarus Uprising, which has gotten mixed reviews thanks to the controls but I guess that's as close as we'll get to it, SNES Kid Icarus. Metal Storm is another game with an interesting gameplay mechanic that calls for a keen and particular sense for some intricate level design. As you can see, you can reverse gravity to walk on the floor or the ceiling. It's a pretty fun game that makes for an interesting challenge. Despite getting a huge push from Nintendo, the game didn't do too well, and any series potential here just kind of vanished. That's really a shame, I feel there's a lost opportunity here. A potential Super Nintendo sequel may not have sold well, but I guarantee you it'd be considered a quote-unquote hidden gem now. If you've never checked out Metal Storm for NES, I highly recommend it. 
I'll also mention Life Force, also known as Salamander, the classic NES shoot-em-up. I touched on this when I talked about Gradius 3 in the SNES sequels video, but it would have been really cool to see how the Super Nintendo could have improved on this game. The same way Super R-Type, which pretty much sucked, was improved upon in R-Type 3, which is way better. The Super Nintendo definitely wasn't the best system for shoot-em-ups, but they seemed to get a better grasp of what they were doing the more time went on. Life Force got about a dozen ports, even to PS1 and Sega Saturn, and I'm willing to bet a Super Nintendo Nintendo version would have been every bit as good as those. Last, I'll bring up kind of an odd choice, Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link. This game is polarizing to say the least. Many people consider the top-down gameplay of the first Zelda game to be the only acceptable gameplay type for Zelda, and why not? It works awesome. Zelda 2 does have, uh, some flaws to say the least. The random battles, the difficulty, the pointless existence of certain villagers, the general sense of confusion as to where to go. But hey, who's to say those things can't be fixed and made better? I'd love to see Nintendo say fuck it and take a real risk and remake a game like Zelda 2 in the same way they made Link Between Worlds, just because number one, I think it could be done and done well, and number two, I think Zelda 2 is better than people remember. Anyway, that's it. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day. That's drunk. One of the best qualities of the Super Nintendo library is that there's so many games from established franchises that were able to make such a gigantic leap from the 8-bit era to 16-bit. There's the obvious stuff like Mario, Zelda, and Mega Man, but also lesser-known stuff like Equinox, a sequel to the NES's Solstice, and Doremi Fantasy, a sequel to Mylon's Secret Castle, just to name a couple of others. Unfortunately, there's quite a few NES games that were not granted a 16-bit sequel. I covered many of those in Part 1, stuff like Crystallis, DuckTales, Kid Icarus, and Metal Storm. I thought I'd expand this idea a bit and make a part two, going into a few lesser known titles that really could have spread their wings on a more expansive platform if given the chance. But first I gotta talk about a more well-known game in Bionic Commando. This game is such a well-designed title, it's a perfect example of balance between your character's abilities and the accompanying level design, and at the time, this game really seemed like the next evolution of sorts for action platforming, because there's no jump function here. You have to use your grappling arm one way or another. It forced you to be creative and find your own way, to a certain extent anyway, but as you know, Bionic Commando came and went, a Game Boy version was made, and then... nothing. We did get a remake, Bionic Commando rearmed in 2008, and that's decent enough, but this is a game that's begging to have new missions with brand new levels. And, okay, spoiler alert, skip to 150 to avoid spoiling the ending of Bionic Commando. Ready? Okay. Yeah, Hitler's head exploded, but that doesn't mean he died. I mean, it's Hitler. Someone that evil could easily keep living without a head. Besides, the helicopter only had superficial damage. Headless Hitler could have flown himself out before the base blew up and started a new army of, uh, bads. So yeah, Bionic Commando 2 16-bit edition, Lad, Spencer, and Super Joe vs. Headless Hitler. Make it happen! I also have to mention a game I looked at a few weeks ago, Guardian Legend. It's a game that combines two completely different modes of gameplay, top-down exploration and vertical shoot-em-up. This is a case where I not only want to see more of this game, but the story here was actually pretty cool science fiction stuff, which sees you traveling through tunnels inside of a planet in order to activate a self-destruct sequence that will destroy an incoming alien invasion. It's a neat story for an NES game, which makes me think they could have really built something substantial to follow up on the NES original. A potential Super Nintendo sequel also could have addressed the game's flaws as well, like having a map on screen and having some more distinct environments so you don't feel like you're going in circles. We did at least have games like Sigma Star Saga on Game Boy Advance and definitely check that one out if you haven't, but still, I would have liked to see the Guardian Legend lore continue on. Solar Jetman Hunt for the Golden Warp Ship is a bit of a strange one. You're the spaceship pod thing that floats around with similar controls to that of a game like Asteroids, and you navigate huge mazes in all sorts of different settings looking for pieces of a mythical spaceship that's capable of interstellar travel. It's part of the Jetman series that started with the game Jetpack way back in 1983 for the ZX Spectrum. It's one of those games that started with a really simple idea and was built upon further with subsequent releases in the series, but it stopped with Solar Jetman for NES. What I would have liked to have seen from a Super Nintendo edition is the inclusion of the CX-4 chip. Capcom developed it for the Mega Man X series for rotating and scaling wireframe 3D objects. To see effects like this in a Solar Jetman game would have been a really cool callback to the ZX Spectrum days. Yeah, the logistics would have been weird since Capcom owned the chip and all, but still, it would have made for a really interesting game. 
Here's kind of a goofy one. It's called Stanley, The Search for Dr. Livingston, and it's actually based on the real-life adventure of Dr. Livingstone, an explorer of Africa who got lost and was presumed dead. So in the game, you play as Henry Stanley, searching across various villages and temples looking for him, or at least looking for clues for his whereabouts. The reason I picked this one is because, well, it's actually a surprisingly neat game, although the platforming can get a bit wonky at times, but I get a Kawaii vibe from this one. You know, the same company behind all those strategy games on Super Nintendo, only this game kind of feels like if a Kawaii game actually had real-time action in it instead of the same old turn-based stuff, fighting snakes with your bare fists and all. I'm not the biggest fan of those SNES Kawaii games, but they did occasionally strike oil with neat ideas with games like Uncharted Waters or Anindo Way of the Ninja, and I think Stan the search for Dr. Livingston could have fit in right alongside those games if the quest were to continue on Super Nintendo. Next, there's Zen Intergalactic Ninja, and this is a Konami-developed title for NES that didn't arrive until 1993. And holy crap, I'd never known about this game until recently. It looks and sounds awesome. The music in particular is freaking great, but it's got some pretty major flaws. The first part of the game takes an isometric perspective, and it tries to do platforming. Throw in some big-time slowdown, and you've got yourself a recipe for disaster. Not that this game is bad. You do eventually get some traditional 2D platforming stuff here later on. It's just that there are a lot of spots where this game is really, really frustrating for the wrong reasons. This is a classic case of a game that was just ahead of its time. Isometric platforming certainly wasn't perfect on the Super Nintendo, but the nuts and bolts of a really good game are definitely here, and it could have been made much better on a 16-bit system if given the chance. In part 1, I talked about how Zelda 2 could have potentially been the beginning of something, rather than just a one-off 2D action RPG. Unfortunately, we never saw this format continue onto the SNES with Zelda, but we did see other games take up the mantle on NES, like Fazanadu, and like Battle of Olympus. This is a really well-made game that borrows a lot from Zelda 2, and yeah, it's definitely derivative, for better or for worse, but the action here is well done, and the game looks great for an NES game. This is a case where the game just needs a few modern amenities, like a battle save instead of a password system, and a less grindy format so you don't have to spend all freaking day grinding for olives. Still, this is a solid game that could have at least been as good as something like East 3 on Super Nintendo. Here's another action RPG on the NES, The Magic of Scheherazade, developed by Culture Brain, creators of the Super Chinese or the Super Ninja Boy series. That franchise made it to Super Nintendo, but this game was just one and done on the NES, and that's disappointing because this is another game that was way ahead of its time. It's a top-down adventure style format, but it features both real-time combat and turn-based battles, where you've got other characters helping you out, all while warping between different time periods, kind of like how you can shift between the light and dark worlds in Link to the Past. There's classes, there's tons of magic spells, they really crammed a lot into this game. But unfortunately, it's really slow paced, the menus are cumbersome, and there's a password system that's 48 characters long, ugh. Still, this is one of those cases where it was simply the best the NES could do at this point. If this series would have continued on Super Nintendo, it would have thrived. For instance, the controller would potentially be able to eliminate some of the menu stuff by being able to rotate through items or spells using the L and R buttons, and plus there'd probably be an actual battery save. But yeah, this is another case of a game that was just bursting out of the cartridge with so many ideas and so much stuff that the NES couldn't really execute everything in a player-friendly way. Finally, there's Joy Mech Fight, a Famicom game that stayed in Japan and was never localized, and it was developed by Nintendo R&D 1. As you can see, this is completely crazy and insane for an 8-bit console game. There's two game modes here, a single-player mode where you have to defeat eight enemy robots per level across four levels, and a one-on-one -on -one versus fighting mode. Every enemy you defeat throughout the single-player mode unlocks them as a usable character in the fighting mode, meaning there's 36 different characters here, and some of you may recognize a couple of them that made cameo in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. It's crazy to me that this game never received any kind of follow-up on the Super Nintendo considering how popular the fighting game genre was, and I can't help but see that as a missed opportunity. They could have potentially taken this idea and added additional processing power with a Super FX chip to create something way off the wall. And I'm not thinking big blocky polygons or anything like that, I'm thinking Yoshi's Island Earthworm Jim style craziness in the 2D realm. As it is, you can play this game now on the Switch's NES app so you can check it out yourself. All right, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.
Less drunk. Hello, thanks for taking time out of your day to watch part 3 of NES games that should have had sequels on the Super Nintendo. I was a kid that went straight from the Atari 2600 to the Super Nintendo when it came out in 1991. Sure, I played the NES at a friend's house here and there, but for the most part, I only got to know the catalog through the Super Nintendo. Like for example, I played Contra 3 before I ever played Contra, and I played Super Castlevania 4 before I played Castlevania. It was the later games that made me want to seek out the earlier games. So, as a result of that, there's a bunch of standalone alone NES games that never got any sort of follow-up or continuation on the Super Nintendo that I never got into until much later on, so this series of videos is a way to get to know a few of those games. In the past, I've talked about stuff like Crystallis, Metal Storm, Zen Intergalactic Ninja, and weird stuff like Stanley the Search for Dr. Livingston. But first, I want to mention a more popular game, the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game for NES. Or maybe popular is not the right word, more like infamous. This is one of those games that's got some fantastic ideas, like being able to switch between four playable characters in the middle of gameplay, and having a world map that allows the game to be approached like something out of the adventure genre. But the game is hampered by some serious problems. There is wonky jumping, wonky enemy design, wonky hitboxes, and wonky difficulty. It's just a big bag of wonk. The series ended up going in another direction entirely into the beat-em-up genre, and yeah, that was clearly the right thing to do. I mean, Turtles in Time is my pick for the best beat-em-up ever made. But if the Super Nintendo got a follow-up for the first Ninja Turtles game, it's an interesting thought experiment. Maybe use the shoulder buttons to flip between characters instead of a pause menu, and maybe, you know, not have whatever these things are as enemies? I do like the first Ninja Turtles game on paper, but it absolutely needed a bit more polish that a direct sequel could have potentially added. Thanks to Working Player 53 for this idea. Here's an interesting game called Destiny of an Emperor, and it was Capcom's foray into strategy role-playing games. You play as Liu Bei, who has to defend his village along with his friends Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, fighting an uprising from the Yellow Turban Rebels. If this sounds familiar to anyone, it's because it's based on the manga Tenchi wo Kurao, which itself is loosely based on the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novels. Now, this game may look like a Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy clone, but the combat here is handled differently. Each battle has you control up to five generals that each command their own massive army, with the number there representing the number of soldiers, which function as your hit points here. Instead of magic, you use tactics, where you consult a strategist who can restore your own forces or execute a special attack that depletes enemy forces. I'm only scratching the surface of this one. There's a lot to this game, and I wanted to bring it up because the Super Nintendo games that North America got that were based on the Romance of the Three Kingdoms books were incredibly slow-paced with clunky, unintuitive user interfaces. So, seeing a game like Destiny of an Emperor on the Super Nintendo would have really been a huge upgrade compared to those games. And yeah, I know this game did get a sequel, but it was for the Famicom and it stayed in Japan. I'm only saying, as good as the NES games are, the Super Nintendo could have expanded on the combat system even further, and it would have been a great alternative to the clunky Koei strategy games. Here's another more popular game in Rygar. It's a solid action-adventure title that switches between 2D side-scrolling and a top-down viewpoint, with some RPG elements here with the ability to level up. And this is a case of a game where I just want to see more of the Rygar world. There's plenty of lore here to expand upon, what with Rygar being an undead warrior and all, searching for gods that grant him items. Plus, the soundtrack to this game is freaking great. It reminds me a bit of Actraiser. I'd imagine Rygar would sound a little similar to that on the Super Nintendo. And of course, a Super Nintendo follow-up would also address the biggest flaw of the NES version of Rygar. There was no battery save and no password system. Ugh! A potential SNES edition would have definitely rectified that, at the very least. Sticking with 8-bit arcade ports, there's Astienex... Astia... How do you pronounce this title, anyway? Let's check the commercial. Twelve exciting levels of play. Astienex for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now that's some quality 80s production right there. A Styanax is a pretty solid action platformer, even though that title makes it sound like a prescription medication. The look and feel of this game reminds me a little bit of the legendary Axe games for TurboGrafx-16, but the thing is, A Styanax is a game that desperately needs more polish. It's got good qualities, the settings and backgrounds look great, the cutscenes feature some great pixel art, and the music is pretty dang good too, but the gameplay is just a bit sluggish, the enemy patterns are downright annoying, and the game is so intensely flickery, even for an NES game. The nuts and bolts of a solid game are here though, and a Super Nintendo follow-up would have given this game the polish it needed. 
Demon Sword, a 1990 game made by the same people who brought you Toxic Crusaders and Pinball Quest, is a game that does not waste any time getting going. You press start and immediately you're dropped into this jungle, you press up on the D-pad, and holy crap what the hell is even happening. You're zipping around treetops battling enemies with shurikens and your sword. It's like an 8-bit version of Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon. Still, this game feels almost too out of control, and as you continue to play through this one, it's clear the level design doesn't always match your insane abilities, which is a shame. Plus, it doesn't help that your sword attack is pretty weak. I can't help but feel like a Super Nintendo follow-up would have built on this game even further, providing larger levels and even more interesting enemy designs. The closest we got to a game like this on the SNES was Skyblazer, a good game in its own right, but a Demon Sword follow-up could have potentially topped that. Next, there's Worm Journey to the Center of the Earth. It's a story-driven game that sees you piloting a crazy, overpowered ship that can drill through whatever gets in its way, and it can also fly and shoot whatever these things are. Eventually, you come to a boss fight where the perspective switches to a first-person shooter. But what's goofy about this part is that you, uh, have to ask your crew about what to do? Yeah, you can't just fire at will. You have to increase your possibility meter first by talking to your shipmates. Sure, okay. As you continue to progress through the game, fuel management becomes a major factor as well, as you have to alternate between flying and roving around on the ground, having to shoot enemies to keep your fuel tank filled. This is a majorly ambitious game that combines horizontal, vertical, and first-person shooter perspectives that also has you try and manage a few different factors as well. It's a pretty fun game as is, so this is just a case where a Super Nintendo sequel or remake could have given this game even more possibilities to play around with. The Cryon Conquest was developed by Vic Tokai, but I don't blame you if you thought this was some sort of Capcom Mega Man spin-off of some kind, because geez louise, this game is shameless in how closely it replicates all things Mega Man. There's your main character sprite animations and their range of motion, there's different weapons you switch between, there's rush-style helper things, geez, even the death animation is a straight ripoff. But you know what? I'm totally fine with that. I love Mega Man, and while this isn't nearly as good as the real thing, the controls are definitely an issue, I still enjoy playing the Cryon Conquest to the point that I think it should have gotten a follow-up of some kind, preferably on the Super Nintendo. I mean, think of the Leap X made from the original series. Vic Tokai totally could have kept ripping off that series and made Cryon Quest Z or something, and I absolutely would have eaten it up. Last, here's one I've been interested in for years, ever since I first saw it in Nintendo Power, Princess Tomato in the Salad Kingdom. It just looked so bizarre to me as a kid. You play as Sir Cucumber, who along with Percy the Persimmon has to go rescue Princess Tomato from the evil Minister Pumpkin. The gameplay itself is like an old PC text adventure, only instead of typing, you have a long list of commands you can choose from that you scroll through using the D-pad. The main reasons I would have wanted to see a Super Nintendo follow-up to Princess Tomato are because, well, this game is so freaking weird, and because this format would have made great use of the Super Nintendo mouse. Or hell, let's make it even weirder and make it compatible with the Super Scope, blasting random vegetables off the screen Battle Clash style, hell yeah! But yeah, this is just another bizarre, ambitious title that needed more space for all its ideas, and the SNES would have accommodated that just fine. Alright, that's all for now, and I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day! Hello, let's take a look at some more NES games that never received any kind of Super Nintendo follow-up. For example, in past videos I've talked about popular stuff like DuckTales and Crystallis, and lesser-known stuff like Astyanx and Worm Journey to the Center of the Earth. With a lot of these titles, I think most people just wanted to see more of these games, kind of like what we got with Contra or Mega Man on Super Nintendo, but in many cases, some NES games were just ahead of their time and too ambitious for their own good that really could have used the extra space to flesh out their ideas on a 16-bit console. One game that straddles the line between both those talking points is Capcom's Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. Sure, the NES did get its own sequel, but on the Super Nintendo, we could have potentially seen more levels, bigger sprites, and an even better representation of the Rescue Rangers universe. The game was also ripe for bigger ideas, like for example, imagine a four-player version of this game where you could play as Chip, Dale, Monterey Jack, or Gadget. Yeah, the game probably would run a bit on the slow side if Capcom were able to pull it off at all, but hey, Konami was able to put together 
together a Tiny Toons four-player game that ran really well. Granted, it was just a series of mini-games in Tiny Toon Adventures Wacky Sports Challenge, but I'm just saying, the Rescue Rangers world really could have had a lot more going on if it got a Super Nintendo game. Speaking of animated TV series, Felix the Cat got kind of a surprising revival sometime in the early 90s and it led to a really solid NES game. It's a typical side-scrolling platformer, but as you collect these Felix icons throughout the game, he can upgrade his bag of tricks to go from a punch glove to a motorcycle to a tank, and some upgrades allow you to float around in mid-air and some allow you to swim. The catch here is that there is a time limit for how long you can stay in each form, represented by the hearts in the upper left. There's a lot of good ideas in this game that could have easily been expanded upon in a 16-bit version, and a lot of different directions you could go. You could either keep going with vehicle upgrades, with stuff like fighter jets or a submarine, or you could go full Kid Chameleon and give Felix a bunch of alternate forms he could turn into. Either way, this is a fun playthrough that's worth checking out and was definitely worthy of a sequel. Of course, I gotta talk about the infamous Little Samson. Unfortunately, the price of the loose cartridge of this one costs well over $1,000 and has become little more than a status symbol for collectors, but beneath all the nonsense, there's actually a pretty dang good game there. You play as four different characters that you can switch between at any time, and the level design does an excellent job playing to the strengths and weaknesses of all four. For instance, one character can walk on spikes but can't jump very high, another can climb walls and ceilings but doesn't have much health. You get the idea. Again, like Felix the Cat, this game's universe could have been expanded even further by introducing even more characters, or maybe even switch from a password system to a battery save, so each character could have their own stats that you could build up. Little Samson is great on its own, but a 16-bit sequel could have potentially been even better. Next, there's a game called Silent Service, made by Rare, and it's a submarine sim made by Sid Meier, the same guy behind games like Pirates and Civilization, so this game should be awesome, right? Well, yeah, it's pretty dang good on other platforms, but on the NES, it's a bit of a mess. You start the game, you get a list of scenarios to pick from, then, uh, what the heck is going on? Yeah, unfortunately, the user interface here is pretty crappy and not very intuitive, unlike the menu system that was in Pirates, which was pretty straightforward. This game is pretty dang cool once you get the hang of it, but I think both Silent Service and its sequel, Silent Service 2, would have been better served on the Super Nintendo. Amagon has you playing as a marine sent to investigate an island full of monsters. It's a side-scrolling run-and-gun that loves the color magenta for some reason, since your clothes, your hair, and even your bullets are straight from the old Crayola electric palette. In fact, Crayola.com describes this color as purple pizzas? I think they're going for pizzazz there, but anyway, Amagon is a strongly mediocre game, featuring one-hit deaths with the hook being that you can find a power-up that gives you a life bar and turns you into Super Macho Man from Punch-Out. Just press select and suddenly you're shirtless with Sergeant Slaughter's chin. The level and enemy design here is as generic as it gets, but still, there's enough weirdness and goofiness here that I can't help but think a 16-bit follow-up would have corrected some of the problems here and at least end up better than stuff like Realm or Time Slip. Ninja Crusaders is yet another side-scrolling action platformer where you play as a ninja, not to be confused with Ninja Gaiden, Shadow of the Ninja, Kid Nicky, Radical Ninja, Ninja Kid, The Last Ninja, Little Ninja Brothers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, so yeah, it's easy to see why this one was lost in the shuffle. This one was developed by NMK, who did some pretty dang good games for the Game Boy, like the two Roland's Curse games, and quality arcade shoot-em-ups like Zed Blade. And sure enough, this game is a pretty solid two-player co-op game that's got some oddball mechanics here, like being able to turn into a dragon or a scorpion thing, along with a couple other forms. The big problem with this game is that it is laughably difficult. I'm talking one-hit deaths, start the level over from the beginning, no checkpoints. Plus, there's tons of enemy respawning and lots of other annoyances. This game really could have used a 16-bit follow-up just to give it a little more polish, because the nuts and bolts for a good game are definitely here. Another solid NES title is Kickmaster, where you defeat enemies using kicks, of all things. I mean, of course you do. Would you think you use your face? This is a pretty ambitious title that features tons of items and power-ups. When you defeat an enemy, they give three different drops you can choose from before they disappear, and there's a ton of different moves you can learn as you progress through the game. There's a sliding kick, a roundhouse kick, they even work a knee drop into the proceedings, and you execute each move by pressing a direction on the D-pad along with both B or A. This game would have gotten a fantastic follow-up on the Super Nintendo because, hey, more buttons on the controller means more moves. Back forward then X could do some kind of crazy Street Fighter style kick, you could do a Liu Kang style bicycle kick. Seems like Kickmaster was just scratching the surface when it comes to educating your character's feet. 
Speaking of kicking, here's Kickle Cubicle made by Irem, another game predicated on kicking stuff and it somehow doesn't involve soccer. The gameplay has your character use their ice breath to freeze an enemy, turning it into a block which you can then kick to get rid of other enemies or more importantly form bridges to reach other parts of the map. Yeah, I know it feels like there's about a million phone games that have taken similar gameplay like this lately, but many of them lack the maps and the personality that Kickle Cubicle made. This is a puzzle game series that could and should have spawned a ton of sequels similar to how the bomb Man series went, featuring multiplayer and all sorts of different game modes, so I really think this game would have flourished on the Super Nintendo. Finally, A Boy and His Blob falls into the too ambitious for NES category. You play as a boy followed around by a blob from the planet Blobolonia. You feed it jelly beans to make it do different things depending on the flavor you give it, like vanilla turns it into an umbrella, tangerine turns it into a trampoline. It's a little bit like Kirby meets Pokemon, but not really. The thing is with the NES game is that there's a ton of unintuitive nonsense to deal with, and the level design isn't always up to snuff to deal with the blob's capabilities. A sequel, preferably on the SNES, NES would have gone a long way toward making this a really high quality puzzle platformer. Alright, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day. You already know all about DuckTales, DuckTales 2, probably even Chippendale Rescue Rangers, but how about Darkwing Duck? He's always been kind of the unsung hero of the old Disney Afternoon cartoon block from the 90s. Sure, everyone loved DuckTales, Rescue Rangers, and even Tailspin and Goof Troop, but Darkwing Duck was great, especially because it featured my favorite animated character of all time, Launchpad. Love that guy. So like its predecessors, Darkwing Duck also received the NES Capcom treatment. While I don't think this game is on the same level as DuckTales, which has really addicting gameplay, clever level design, and fantastic music, Darkwing isn't far behind. Yeah, it's a basic platformer, as simple as you'd expect, but what makes it good is the versatility of Darkwing. He shoots a projectile, has a nice range of motion with his jump, and the level design matches that nicely, as he can cling to and swing on things, he can block things with his cape, and he can shoot while ducking as well, which is something that's usually taken for granted in games of the era, but that small touch wasn't that common for the time. Like DuckTales, you pick the order of the stages, unlocking three levels at a time for seven stages total. There's almost a Kid Icarus meets Mega Man style to these levels. There's a definite Mega Man vibe with this section here. And there's a lot of hidden areas you can discover if you poke around a bit. I will say I don't really like the weapon power-ups in this game. One gives you two diagonal shots, which is just frustrating. Another upgrade has too short a range and reminds me of the Game Boy Mega Man 5 weapon for Neptune. I will say the arrow weapon is great though because you can use it as a platform if needed. The game does an excellent job representing the Darkwing universe, so to speak. The graphics here really look awesome, and the Darkwing gameplay sprite is really well done. And I know I'm biased, but this game needed way more launch pad, oh well. But all the pertinent bad guys are here, Quacker Jack, Liquidator, Wolf Duck, and they're all instantly recognizable thanks to the quality pixel art. I will say the soundtrack here isn't as great as the other Capcom Disney games, and part of that is because of the Darkwing Duck theme, it just doesn't lend itself that well to an 8-bit soundtrack. It's a great theme and it's easily recognizable, but it sounds just okay on the NES. The rest of the tracks too are just average. Anyway, people love to remember the old Capcom Disney NES games, but it seems like Darkwing Duck often gets forgotten, and that shouldn't be the case, as this is a top quality game. There's also a Game Boy port that's a very faithful representation of the NES game, if you're interested in seeking that out as well. But yeah, you want to be the terror that flaps in the night? You want to be the uh, wrong number that wakes you up at 3am? Then check out Darkwing Duck for NES, and let's get dangerous! That's drunk. Let's keep the momentum going with the NES. In case you missed it yesterday, I posted a Let's Play of Dusty Diamond's All-Star Softball, where I play against my friend Trav, who you might know as Nest Friend. And if you like that, there's an LP over on Nest Friend's channel as well, so go check those out if you haven't already. But in the meantime, here's Cobra Triangle, made by Rare in July 1989, and this is right around the time where the head honchos at Nintendo were really starting to notice the great work the Stamper Brothers at Rare were doing, because Nintendo decided to give this one the ultimate mark of approval for an NES game and publish this one themselves. 
In case you're unfamiliar, the Stamper Brothers were also the folks behind games like RC Pro-Am, Donkey Kong Country, and Killer Instinct. And in addition to those two folks, Rare also leaned on the talents of David Wise, who of course you'll know from Donkey Kong Country, but that guy also wrote a ton of great NES music as well. There's not a lot of music in Cobra Triangle, but what's here is good, and it's distinctly David Wise. I should mention quickly that Cobra Triangle is part of the 2015 Rare Replay compilation, so if you want to play this one today, that collection is a possibility for you. So what the heck is this game? RC Pro-Am on boats? That's pretty much what it looks like, but it's got a bit more going for it. Cobra Triangle is a combat racer with 25 total levels, and each of them have varying objectives. Sometimes it's as simple as winning a race, but you also have to save people from drowning, defuse bombs, or fight a boss. It's this kind of variety that vaults the game from just a mere combat racer to something a little more interesting. The first level simply has you race to the finish, just to help you get used to the controls. Then after that, you have to drag mines from one place to another while dodging enemy fire. Then you're protecting this crowd of people, apparently not from your own boat though, you can just plow over these people and they don't seem to care. After that mission is completed, you fight a huge frickin' dragon. You gotta love that. There's split paths in this game, so you could approach these missions in a few different set orders, and that helps add a bit of replay value to this one. It's not all just mindless shooting, however, there is a Gradius-style power-up system. You collect these pod things, and you can put them toward your rate of fire, a burst of turbo speed, a missile upgrade, or 8 seconds of invincibility. Just press the select button when you've collected the appropriate number of pods for what you want to upgrade. A weapons upgrade mechanic like this is always a welcome addition to a combat racer, at least for me. I actually prefer it to collect collecting money and having a shop where you upgrade stuff that way. And so goes Cobra Triangle. It pretty much just takes RC Pro-Am, adds combat, and a mission structure with a Gradius power-up system, and you can't really go wrong with that combination. But there is a caveat to all this praise, and that's the way this game controls. Most rare games of this era are not pick-up-and-play. Games like Battletoads, Snake Rattle and Roll, and Cobra Triangle play more like pick-up-and-practice, learn the controls, learn the levels, and die a million times. Once you get past that learning curve, this game is pretty dang fun. I know sometimes it's easy to dismiss games with wonky controls, and here the boat can feel kind of drifty at times, especially when you're trying to dodge stuff, and at first you just end up aimlessly spinning. This can be especially problematic when you have to race to the finish, and any time you bump into the wall, you take damage. I'm just saying, this game is worth the practice, even if it is stupidly difficult, just like every other game Rare made back then. A special shout out to these annoying waterfall levels, ugh. So yeah, to sum up real quickly, I normally don't like recommending something by saying, oh, it gets really good after you spend 20 minutes getting used to the controls, but when it comes to NES games made by Rare, I think that can be a fair assessment. They've earned the benefit of the doubt there. Rare are always ambitious. Their games are just a bit different than others of the era, so yeah, there's a bit of a difficulty curve in Cobra Triangle, but it's worth putting the time into. The combat is satisfying, and the level variety here is what makes this one especially fun and worth going back to. It's a very good game, it's aged really well, and it's maybe a top 30 game on the NES. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Never underestimate the importance of a good title. Take Operation Logic Bomb, for instance. I have no inkling of what this game is supposed to be based on the title. Is there some kind of military motif? Is it a sequel to the NES game Operation Wolf? Or am I a surgeon operating on people? And what the hell is a logic bomb? It sounds like something Neil deGrasse Tyson would say in a rap battle. Dropping logic bombs on your ass. Turns out this is a top-down run-and-gun arcade-style game that might remind you of something like Super Smash TV. Only the structure here is, as the box says, search and destroy. You have to wreck 
every enemy in sight in order to unlock the next area and progress with the game. And you can do that by using a multitude of weapons that you can fire in eight different directions, starting out equipped with just a regular machine gun and a spread gun, but you can also acquire a flamethrower, a reflective laser weapon, and missiles, as well as mines you can place. The best special weapon though is the hologram of yourself that you can set up to lure enemies, like something out of Total Recall. That's awesome. But yeah, the gameplay here is pretty self-explanatory. Just shoot and dodge, shoot and dodge. Your life bar is pretty huge, and you have a few continues here. And if you die, everything you destroyed stays dead, so that's convenient. In other words, the structure here is a bit like Soul Blazer, if you remember that game. Operation Logic Bomb's first couple levels are pretty forgiving and allow you to get used to the speed of projectiles and the pace at which to dodge and fire, but the game does get pretty damn tough later on though. Eventually there's just too much to dodge, so you have to use your surroundings to protect yourself. You can hold down L or R and lock your aim so you can hit stuff from around corners. The reflective laser gun is also going to be extremely useful for avoiding gunfire. The key here is to trudge ahead slowly, which kind of sucks, but if you're not careful, you'll get blown into smithereens in no time. No saves or passwords here either. This is a game you gotta beat all the way from the beginning. As you progress, you come across these computer terminal things that give you a map of the area, replenish your health, or give you a cutscene from this game's strange story. There's no dialogue here at all, so it's up to the player to piece together what the hell is supposed to be happening. Something about a tear in the space-time continuum that's allowing aliens to evade, and you're a super soldier named Agent Logan who's created to stop them all or something? I have no idea. This game could be about waffle and bacon sandwiches and I wouldn't notice or care. There's some interesting background on Operation Logic Bomb. It's actually the third game in a series which originated on Game Boy with a game titled Fortified Zone, which plays very similarly and is actually pretty good in its own right. It got a Game Boy sequel that only came out in Japan, and then it made its way to the SNES, its Japanese title being Ikari no Yusai, no relation to Ikari Warriors that I know of despite having similar gameplay. Anyway, yeah, is Operation Logic Bomb worth playing today? I'd say so, it's perfectly okay, it's a very short game, but the gameplay is straightforward. I like how progressing through the game is predicated on having a knack for geometry, and the hologram decoy thing is a cool feature. The thing is, Operation Logic Bomb doesn't really have the same intensity as other top-down shooters like Super Smash TV. You know, the kind of game where you're gripping the controller so hard you can hear the plastic creaking. So it's not a must-play or anything really that special, but hey, don't be fooled by the goofy title. Operation Logic Bomb is a perfectly fine playthrough. Mm -hmm. Let's Thanks to Matt for requesting this via a bottle of Ardbeg Oogiedale. B.O.B. or Bob is one of those games I always saw available for rent but never bothered to play it or even find out what it's all about. This is one of those games that just blended in with everything else with a generic sounding title and a generic looking cover. And as far as I know, the acronym B.O.B. is never even explained in the SNES version anyway, not in the game or in the instruction book, so if you know what it stands for, give me a link in the description that cites a source or something. So what is this game? Well, it's a story-driven action platformer. Now, 9 times out of 10 in a game like this, nobody cares about the story, but I bring it up here because in B.O.B., or Bob as I'm gonna call it the rest of the video, every maze-like level has a time limit. Bob is borrowing his dad's car on his way to a date, and of course he crashes, so he's gotta make his way all the way across this asteroid filled with monsters and creatures and other weird stuff in a desperate attempt to get to his date on time. And you do that by using lots of different weapons to make stuff go boom, like a spread gun, a flamethrower, or homing missiles, but each has limited ammo, so many Many times you're better off conserving what you have and just using the default weapon, or by using your giant fist attack, which is like something straight out of Battletoads. You can also collect these helper device things called remotes. You can float with an umbrella or fly around with a helicopter hat, and you'll have to to progress with the game in certain areas. There's also stuff like the flash remote that freezes all enemies on screen. Pretty simple to use all this stuff, just scroll through with the R button and activate with the X button. Bear in mind though, when you die, you lose all the stuff you've collected. There's no battery save here, but there are passwords. One interesting bit of trivia about Bob is that it's based on the same game engine as Wayne's World, which was released just a few months earlier by the same developer, and it's also one of the worst SNES games you'll ever play, or Genesis games for that matter. So yeah, the obvious question that comes to mind is, why the hell would I want to play something that was built using such a bad games engine? One big reason is the sprite animations, which are really detailed and really surprisingly well done. For example, when you climb across a hazard, you can see Bob's fingers skedaddle across as you move, or how he's able to scoot across the ground even while ducking. 
Bob is supposed to be some kind of ant creature thing, and they did a great job making him look like a fully realized character. A lot of the enemy and boss design here too is pretty inspired. I will say though, the overall presentation here is very, very 90s. The cartoony sound effects, the goofy soundtrack, the color palette, the level design. If you wanted to know what 1993 was like, here you go. But yeah, Bob or B.O.B. is a decent enough game. It also came out for the Genesis, but it's practically the same game. If there's any real flaw with how this game is put together, it's that it starts out pretty easy, you're cruising through the game, and then you hit a brick freaking wall with the difficulty. It's impossible not to take a ton of damage to get past certain areas, and the time limit does you no favors either. There's also these racing levels that show up here and there that can be very frustrating. The game just becomes trial and error at that point. So yeah, Bob isn't exactly going out of your way to play, but it's not that bad either. I think it's better than stuff like Jim Power, The Lost Dimension in 3D, but it's not nearly as good as something like Earthworm Jim or Super Turrican. Yes, John. Ever since I made that mammoth Super Nintendo, Super Famicom shoot 'em up video, I've been on the lookout for other shoot 'em ups in hard to find places, and I think I found a really good one in Sagia, or Sagaya. Bear with me because I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Anyway, Sagaya is an original Game Boy release that only came out in Japan. It's actually a port of Darius 2 for Sega Genesis, one of the all time shoot 'em up classics of the 16 bit era. And yes, I know the word port can scare some people off, especially if that word is preceded with the words Game Boy, but man, they did a hell of a job with this game. A couple of the levels and bosses are in a different order, so it's not a direct port of the game, but it's still great. Make no mistake, this is a Darius game through and through. And rather than haphazardly shove the Genesis version onto the Game Boy hardware, like what happened with games like Populous, Lemmings, or Mortal Kombat, they refit Darius 2 around the limited hardware here, and as a result, this game really feels complete and fully realized. The gameplay is smooth and responsive, the balance of speed here is excellent. The pacing can be a bit on the slow side, but it has some crazy variables here and there. The graphics are as crisp and as clear as you could hope for for an original Game Boy release. The bosses in particular are downright awe-inspiring. I can't believe I'm saying that when I'm talking about a Game Boy game, but damn, that really looks awesome, not to mention intimidating. Really, if you're like me and you were disappointed in the Super Nintendo Darius games, Darius Twin and Supernova, you're not going to be disappointed in Sagaya. Not only are the graphics and gameplay impressive, but the music gets better the further you get into the game. It starts out as you'd expect, frenzied and frenetic, to match the gameplay, but then you get to the underwater level and things kind of calm down, and by then you're in a shoot 'em up trance, so to speak, and it's just perfectly done. I love how the game is structured that way. Anyway, yes, once again, I have to admit that this video is a pathetic plea to get this awesome Game Boy port onto the 3DS Virtual Console. It seems like there are barely any shoot 'em ups on there, and Sagaya deserves to be checked out by a larger audience. Right now the game goes for close to $50 on eBay, yikes. But yeah, the Darius games on Super Nintendo were a letdown, but Sagaya for Game Boy makes up for those games quite a bit. Snastrunk. Operation C is the often forgotten third game in the Contra series, coming to the original Game Boy less than a year after Super C was ported from the arcade to the NES. Operation C is so forgotten that even the developers of Contra 3 The Alien Wars for Super Nintendo just skipped over it entirely and declared itself the third game in the series. Weirdly, that wasn't always the case, as the Super NES Player's Guide had Contra 3's original title as Super Contra 4, which would make sense since that game wasn't released until more than a year after Operation C, but instead they decided to just forget the Game Boy game existed. And that's too bad, because Operation C is a damn good game, especially considering it's a measly little Game Boy release. The game features five original stages, although many have similar features to Super C for the NES. Stages 1, 3, and 5 are your classic Contra side-scrolling levels, while stages 2 and 4 are an overhead view. The downside of the overhead view is that you can't jump, so that's a bummer. I gotta mention the Konami code real quick. It does work in this game, but instead of 30 lives, it allows stage select, so you can start on any of the five stages, so that's pretty cool. Operation C has all the usual Contra weapons, but this is the game that introduces the Hunter or Homing Gun, which is easily the most satisfying weapon to use in the game. I especially like that the default gun is the machine gun, so you can just hold down the button instead of tapping like crazy. Also, the spread gun can be upgraded from 3 to 5 bullets at once. That's awesome and very useful. 
While this game is really enjoyable and features the kind of gameplay you'd expect from any other early Contra game, Operation C is pretty easy. I will say Stage 4 is pretty dang tough, kind of similar to Stage 6 of Super C. Otherwise, the game doesn't present too much of a challenge, the levels aren't that long, and the inherent limitations of the Game Boy dictate that there can't be very much going on the screen at once, so that's a caveat you have to keep in mind. Anyway, Operation C is a very short but solid game that kind of got ignored in the grand scheme of things. It goes for an average of about $9 on eBay, so if you have a Super Game Boy or even a Game Boy Advance, I recommend checking it out. Smash Drunk? There are some games out there that simply do not need reviews, or in the case of NBA Jam Tournament Edition, the review could consist of four words. Look at this game. Look at it for God's sake, that's all you need to do, even if you don't give a crap about basketball. This game is incredible in its absurdity, and not to mention incredible in its 90s-ness. You got the announcer shouting incredibly dated catchphrases, guys jumping 30 feet into the air, the ball bursting into flames, you got the classic 90s players like Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman, and uh, Eric Montross? Okay. Not to mention the pathetic lineup of my hometown Minnesota Timberwolves, J.R. Ryder, Doug West, and Christian Leitner. Man, that's terrible. Anyway, NBA Jam brings all these elements together to form the ultimate arcade game. Now, you might be thinking right now, what's the difference between the original NBA Jam and Tournament Edition? In terms of the actual gameplay, absolutely nothing, it's nearly identical. But Tournament Edition just has more stuff, more players, and more codes. Codes like being able to dunk from anywhere on the floor. Seriously, this never ever gets old. There's tons of other codes too, like being able to block every shot, infinite turbo, slippery mode, speed mode, on fire mode. You can even enable hotspot settings, which can allow up to 9 points per shot. Reminds me of the old MTV Rock and Jock basketball game. The codes are really easy to enter in too, it's just a simple sequence you enter on the Tonight's Matchup screen. There's also tons of unlockable characters, everybody from Bill and Hillary Clinton, to a selection of mascots, to the Beastie Boys, the Fresh Prince and DJ Jazzy Jeff, and uh, Prince Charles. Sure, okay. These codes are a little trickier to implement. Anyway, I've got a link in the description to a GameFAQs page that has everything listed there for you. So is there any real difference between playing NBA Jam or NBA Jam Tournament Edition on Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis? Not really. Some of the unlockable characters are different between the two games, but other than that, both games are very similar. It's not like the EA Sports NHL games, where everything is much faster, smoother, and just more satisfying to play on the Genesis. So it really makes no difference what system you play it on. I play it on the Super Nintendo because I just like the Super Nintendo controller a lot more. Plus, this game is also compatible with the four-player multi-tab. The NBA Jam series eventually evolved into the NBA Hangtime series, and those games are also very good and have also aged well. I gotta mention NBA Jam Extreme, which was released in the late 90s, for PS1, Saturn, and PC. It lacks some of the charm of the Super Nintendo and Genesis games, but they're still good. And in 2010, EA Sports threw their hat into the ring by releasing a new version of NBA Jam for Wii, PS3, and 360, and NBA Jam on Fire Edition the next year. If you'd rather play this kind of game with modern players and some more polish, then those games are the way to go. Anyway, I've said this many times before, but the real brilliance of the NBA Jam franchise is that you don't even have to be into or even like basketball to like these games. It takes two seconds to learn how to play, and once you do, you just want to see more and more absurd dunks, and you want to hear what other ridiculous crap the announcer says. And unlike other sports games, NBA Jam has aged very well because of that. It's a weird and unique case where the game's dated 90s-ness actually lends it that much more charm, but most importantly, the gameplay is as fun as ever. So yeah, is NBA Jam Tournament Edition worth playing today? to quote my friend here. Oh, boop, shakalaka! Nice drug. Mega Man 7 is stylistically a direct sequel to Mega Man 6 on the NES, so if you were more of a fan of the NES games rather than the kind of alternate universe Mega Man X provided, then this game was made with you in mind. Personally, I really like that they did this. It reminds me of the X-Men comics in the early to mid-90s, when they had Uncanny X-Men, The Age of Apocalypse, and X-Men 2099. Three different universes and timelines all going at once. I'd like to see more game franchises take this approach, in fact, like Final Fight or Legend of the Mystical Ninja. I'm not saying give them soccer games or anything, just something different. Anyway, Mega Man 7 is the classic Mega Man experience, combined with some ideas from the Mega Man games on Game Boy, where you collect money, so to speak, to buy energy tanks and such in between levels. Rush's fusion ability is here from the later NES games as well. Also, just like Mega Man 4 and 5 in Game Boy, you start out with just four levels, beat those four and unlock four more. 
There's also two unpredictable characters, Base and Treble, which show up uh, evidently for no other purpose than to just confuse Mega Man. They're nice additions to the traditional Mega Man story, however. I do have to admit, I'm a little disappointed in the level design. It's kind of sort of bland at times, but it does have some interesting gimmicks. I did really like Blast Man stage. But yeah, this is just classic Mega Man controls, jumping, shooting, sliding with help from Rush. No wall climbing though, like the X series. My favorite thing about Mega Man 7 is that it just looks and sounds so nice. The music for each level is unique and memorable, each track sounds bright and clear as a bell, and the level themes all stand out and look really fantastic. Visually, this really does come across as a more beefed up version of the NES Mega Man games. The backgrounds, the foregrounds, the enemies, Mega Man himself all look razor sharp and alluringly colorful. This game really draws you in with its visual style. Seriously, it's like pixel art cocaine. The average price the original cartridge goes for on eBay is over $150, so yeah, you're not gonna want to do that. Thankfully, this game is available on the Virtual Console and about a dozen Mega Man collections across several consoles. And not only that, the Super Famicom version goes for about $20 to $25. That's what I ended up getting, and it works great. I do miss what's said in the exchanges with Dr. Light and friends, but some of the humor still gets across, like when Mega Man puts on the wrong helmet. Whoops. Anyway, I don't have any real profound analysis here, no grand sweeping analogies, I mean it's just Mega Man. You hear those two words, you've already made up in your mind what they mean and stand for, and this game won't change that, just enhance it. Although I will say that the comparison between Mega Man 7 and the X series is a little bit like the differences between Super Castlevania 4 and Dracula X. Mega Man 7 is aesthetically brighter and bouncier, for lack of a better term, and Mega Man isn't as overpowered as X, just as Richter wasn't as strong as Simon. It's really about what you'd expect from a classic Mega Man game, although I wouldn't rank it quite as high as the early games in the NES series, and personally, I like X's abilities and upgrades to be more fun. But still, you can't beat that classic Mega Man action, and Mega Man 7 has that in spades. Drunk. There are few games throughout gaming history as polarizing as Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link, and why is that? Because it's the goofy misfit of the Zelda series, it's a 2D side-scrolling action RPG instead of the top-down puzzle-solving adventure variety most of the other games are. But here's something I did not know about the early Zelda series. Legend of Zelda was released for the Famicom Disk System in Japan in February of 1986. Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link, meant to be a direct sequel, was released for the same system in Japan in January of 1987. That's six months before the release of the first Zelda in North America, so Nintendo had both games completely finished before Zelda 1 was even made available to the public here in the US. Now, there's a lot of conclusions that could be drawn from that fact. Maybe the Zelda series was originally meant to cover all sorts of different genres, maybe Link was intended to branch out in other ways as a character, Nintendo even made a point to bring in a completely different team of people to create Zelda 2, according to producer Shigeru Miyamoto. The point is, there was clearly no set Zelda formula yet. They were trying all sorts of different stuff to see what worked, and well, we all know what ended up working. The Legend of Zelda got its North American release in July of 87 and became a ginormous success. But interestingly, Zelda 2 also got the green light as is for a North American release in December of 88, and while that game sold 4.5 million copies worldwide, it wasn't perceived as much of a success as its predecessor. According to the April 2003 edition of Super Play Magazine, Miyamoto is even quoted as saying, in an interview that he considered Zelda 2 as quote-unquote sort of a failure, saying that while development went as expected, it was too much of a departure from his original vision, hence why Link to the Past went back to how the first game was structured. There's still a ton of unanswered questions regarding the ideas behind Zelda 2. Maybe there was pressure to make the series more like Mario. Maybe the North American sales numbers had something to do with it. Who knows? So Miyamoto evidently didn't think too highly of Zelda 2, at least as part of the Zelda series, but how is it as a game just on its own, and how does it hold up today? Starting with the overall structure, Link starts the game with six crystals that he has to put into six different palaces, in addition to completing a final dungeon, the Great Palace. And to do that, he'll need to investigate where to go and what to do. See, from a story standpoint, this may be a direct sequel, and yeah, it's the same Link as the first game, but according to the manual, it's not the same Zelda. This gal has been in a sleeping spell for hundreds of years. Turns out Zelda's just the name they give every Hyrule princess. In the meantime, while you're trying to resurrect this particular Zelda, there are evildoers out there trying to resurrect Ganon. Remember at the end of the first game how he just kind of disintegrated into a pile of ash? Well, apparently, if you mix a drop of Link's blood into those ashes, then presto chango abracadabra, you've got a new Ganon. 
As I said earlier, Zelda 2 is an RPG complete with a leveling system where you earn points by defeating enemies and completing dungeons. Once you bypass the experience threshold in the upper right there, you have the opportunity to level up a skill, whether it be your attack, your magic, or the amount of damage you can take. You can level up whatever is available right away, or you can cancel and wait for something that requires more points. You wander around in an overworld, running into random battles that warp you into a side-scrolling battle mode. Most of the time, you don't even need to defeat any enemies, you just gotta make it to the edge of the screen to move on. What's kinda interesting here is that the overworld has clear pathways leading you where to go. And if you fall into a random battle while on the path, there's no enemies there, you can just walk off the screen. If you wanna grind for experience, you can always veer off the trail and go find enemies. So how's Link supposed to figure out where to go and what to do? You gotta visit towns and complete little side quests in order to meet the town wise men who will grant you a new magic spell that'll help you with the upcoming dungeon. What I find surprising here is that the NPC dialogue is actually helpful. Yeah, it's limited, but it's not friggin' broken and useless like it is in a game like Castlevania 2, which is funny since that game came out nearly a year after this one. In fact, what I found interesting is that the I am error guy actually isn't an error because there's a guy you find later in the game named Bagu, which is Japanese for bug. Error and bug, get it? Programming jokes? Eh? Don't get me wrong, there's still plenty of cryptic nonsense you gotta manage, and it can be maddening at times. But maybe it's just because I was approaching this part of the game with low expectations, and I didn't find it to be all that frustrating, all considered. Anyway, you get your spell from the wise man, you learn some tips and tricks from the villagers, you learn a new attack along the way, you gotta love that down thrust, one of the best attacks in any game ever. And you find the palace, and find a helpful item in the palace, and defeat the boss, and put the crystal where it needs to be, and you repeat five more times before you get to the brutally difficult final dungeon. As with most RPGs, this is a game of management, so, you, so throughout your quest you gotta manage your health, your magic spells, and your magic meter throughout the game, as well as several different items you find along the way. What really sets Zelda 2 apart is the combat, and it's a big part of what makes this game so polarizing. I'll start with the positives. Fighting certain enemies in this game really feels like a battle, like a real one-on-one -on -one sword fight. Your enemy can strike or block high and low, and it really makes for a fun challenge. This part of the game is just exhilarating. I also enjoy that there's different varieties of combat here. The sword fights are just one part of it. You gotta approach each enemy a different way. The problem with this variety is that sometimes the difficulty becomes absurdly unbalanced. For instance, in sections like this, I mean, this is essentially a horizontal scrolling shoot 'em up at this point, and Link is just not equipped to deal with the sheer amount of stuff coming at him. It certainly doesn't help that his sprite is so big either. There's these infamous sections here, I mean, how on earth are you supposed to dodge all this? It just ends up being, equip the best defense spells you got, grit your teeth and just plow ahead and hope you have enough health and magic to deal with what comes afterward. And spoiler alert, you rarely do. The worst part of Zelda 2 isn't even anything exclusive to Zelda 2, it's the old bounce back you get anytime you're hit by an enemy or a projectile. Same as Ninja Gaiden or Castlevania. You involuntarily bounce backward when you're hit by something, and seemingly 99 times out of 100, there's a bottomless pit right behind you. Ugh! I should also mention that you have three lives here. When you die, you start near where you left off, but if you lose all three lives, which will happen often, you start all the way back at the beginning where that stupid sleeping princess is hanging out. Now, normally, a game that has that big of a time-wasting flaw like that will get a thumbs down across the board no matter what. It's just too big of a deal breaker because you waste so much time walking all the way back to the dungeon that you get to the point that you're wondering what the hell you're doing with your life. However, in the case of Zelda 2, this game is available on the NES Classic, so you can utilize save states, and that allows the player to make sensible decisions like, say, create a save state at the beginning of the dungeon, like this game should have originally. One other thing I want to quickly point out regarding Zelda 2 is the music. What an immensely tall order this game had to try and live up to the soundtrack of the first game, but I'll be damned if there aren't some awesome, memorable tunes in this game as well. The town theme is so peaceful, and the palace theme is so good that it's still used to this day in the Super Smash Bros. series. What's even more impressive is that Zelda 2's music was composed not by Kojo Kondo, but by Akito Nakatsuka, and yet somehow it still sounds like the next album from the same band, if that makes sense. So yeah, Zelda 2 is definitely outdated in a number of ways, the combat can really be unfair, the maze and Death Mountain can get extremely annoying, and having to wander all the way back from the princess to where you last died is a deal breaker for many people, but thankfully there are modern solutions available to fix that last problem. I don't recommend playing this one on original hardware, but on the NES Classic? 
Hell yeah, this game still has a ton of great qualities. I especially love the one-on-one -on -one sword fights, and the final boss here, Dark Link, or Shadow Link, is one of the best final boss fights in any game ever. It's the kind of fight so intense you can't help but notice the sound of your controller creaking because you're squeezing it so hard. There are few games that can match that kind of tension. I mean, as long as you don't do the thing where you crouch in the corner and beat them that way. So despite all its flaws, I still think Zelda 2 is worth playing today. Just make sure it's on a device that supports save states, because it'll not only save your progress, it'll save you tons of time and your sanity. And I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Outrun is one of the most popular and one of the most important arcade games ever made in the racing genre, and this is evidenced by the fact that there were something like 20 ports made on everything from the Sega Master System, the Amstrad CPC, the PC Engine, Commodore Amiga, Atari ST, and of course, the Sega Genesis. Now I haven't played many of these, but I do know that if you want a perfect arcade port, then the Sega Saturn port on the Sega Ages collection is what you want. But yeah, I'm just looking at the Sega Genesis game here. Outrun is simple, bare-bones arcade-style racing that paved the way for stuff like Top Gear and Cruisin' USA. There's no laps, no pit stops, no upgrading your car or anything like that. You just drive, hit the checkpoints before you run out of time, and don't crash. It's not as easy as it sounds though, you do have to dodge other cars, which can get complicated quickly, and there's no automatic transmission here, you have to shift gears when required, although there's really only two gears to shift between, but you don't want to get caught in the wrong one at the wrong time. If you're in a higher gear at a turn, you're risking a crash, and man, the crashes here are freaking violent as hell. You flip and roll your car as you and your compadre go flying out. That is nasty. But also, if you're in a lower gear on a straightaway, you're costing yourself some crucial time and you risk missing the next checkpoint. And the game doesn't exactly go out of its way to let you know you're running out of time. Wait, what? What the hell just happened? Before each checkpoint, you come to a fork in the road left or right, with each direction leading you to a different area, so that's kinda cool. You can take a different route for each playthrough, and that's important because this game isn't exactly meant to be an intense struggle or anything. The whole point is just to sit back, take a road trip through the world this game has laid out for you, and just enjoy the sights and sounds. In particular, the sound here is by far the game's biggest strength. Outrun is all about the music. It says a lot that the developers decided on muting the sound of your car's engine, and instead put the focus on the music and the relaxing sound of passing other vehicles left and right. It all comes together brilliantly. The music and the sound design here, and the direction behind it, all fit together as well as you could ask for. It's funny, if you look at any playthrough of this game, nearly every single comment is lavish praise of the music. You just don't see that kind of universal approval anymore. Outrun has a few sequels and spin-offs like Turbo Outrun, Outrunners, Outrun 2019, and Outrun 2 released over 10 years later for Xbox and PS2, but I'm not sure anything will top the appeal of the original Outrun. It's a different kind of racing game, and really a different kind of game altogether. It's rare that anyone would want to sit down and play a game to relax instead of blow stuff up or dismember your opponent or make your palms sweat from the stress of gameplay, but Outrun is like comfort food. It's really satisfying to just sit back in your favorite chair and go for a drive. One of the more inexplicable oddities of the Super Nintendo library is the game Donald Duck no Maha no Boshi, or Donald Duck and the Magical Hat, made by SAS Sakata back in August 1995, and for some weird reason this game never left Japan. I guess one explanation why it never got localized that I can speculate is that 1995 was just too late for any publisher to invest that much into a Super Nintendo game, since a lot of folks were already focused on the next generation of consoles. I've talked about this game a couple times over the years, and it's surprisingly good, better than I originally thought. And the thing is about games that stay in Japan, there's not always a whole lot of information out there. Case in point with Donald Duck and the Magical Hat, the way this game starts is with a series of mini-games. One has you racing around on a bicycle delivering mail while you're getting chased by dogs. Another has you competing in a game show where you have to complete an obstacle course set to a time limit. One has you sneaking around a house to rescue a bird. And the other has you, uh, washing windows. 
The reason you have to do all this is so you can buy a hat for Daisy, and if you didn't know any better, you'd think this was the entire game. Like, maybe that's why it never came out to North America, because it's just a simple game for kids, but after you complete the four mini-games, Donald Duck and the Magical Hat opens up as a regular old platformer, and it's pretty good. You get a health meter with three lives and three continues to get through five levels after the four mini-games, and there is a password system, and you don't need to know Japanese for this one. Even the passwords are English-friendly, although I should point out that there is an English patch available, made by Gorgie Rip, and there's a lot of story sequences here with some great looking graphics, so if you like what you see here, it's worth your time. Once you get past the minigames, you first have to clear ghosts out of a clock tower by luring them into these lights. Then the game shows an overworld map and your mysterious friend reveals he's the king of the Magic Kingdom, and he's been cursed by none other than Pete, and you have to complete four more levels to get to him. It's completely unexpected and the game gives no hint at the beginning that it opens up like this. And it's not like I can read the manual since it's all in Japanese, so you'll have to forgive me for missing all this. The platforming levels kinda sorta feel like a game in the Magical Quest series, although you don't get the same power-ups. Instead, the King of the Magic Kingdom helps you with his magical hat and allows you to turn invisible so you can dodge enemies, and you also get a diving headbutt for an attack. And that's about it. The gameplay is really simple, nothing all that different from many other action platformers of its time. It's just a slightly above average game that happens to look and sound really, really good. I do like this Mode 7 rotating level, and one of the levels is a race against a rabbit for a change of pace, and the final section before Pete does get a tiny bit challenging, which is nice. The gameplay may be limited and Donald's jump is a bit clunky, but the sprite animation and the backgrounds in this game are top notch, and that's really what carries this game. The big hang-up is, the mini-games at the beginning are just kind of annoying. In the section where you deliver mail, your bike automatically rolls forward and the town just loops over and over until you reach every house. But you've got dogs chasing you, cars that pop up out of nowhere. Yeah, this section looks great, but it's hard not to flail around all over the place. When you have to retrieve Grandma Duck's bird, you creep around and again the sprite animation is great, but the tiniest little thing can wake up the dog, and when that happens, you have to start over. Sometimes I wonder if these were purposely made annoying because it's an excuse to show Donald throwing a temper tantrum, and I can't help but sit there and be like, yeah, I can relate, dude. But still, if you want to skip to the regular platforming stages, you can just enter a password and play the rest of the game. But yeah, I think I would still recommend playing Donald Duck and the Magical Hat. It has enough going for it that it's an above average game, albeit a bit limited and kind of annoying at times. It's not as good as any of the Magical Quest games or the Illusion games on Genesis, but it's still a good time. The ending after you beat Pete is a surprising seven minutes long. It's kind of cool. Just don't be fooled like I was. If you want a regular platformer, then just use the password I showed earlier and you can skip past all those. This game was never released outside of Japan, so this is another game you'll have to play any way you can. All right, I want to thank you for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day. When it comes to the Super Nintendo library, folks in PAL regions unfortunately missed out on a lot of great games like Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy VI, and Ken Griffey Jr. Presents Major League Baseball, but they did not miss out on Hanna-Barbera's Turbo Tunes. This one was released by Empire Interactive in October 1994 in PAL regions only, and now we in North America are the ones teeming with jealousy. Alright, well, maybe not. The only other Super Nintendo game Empire Interactive had anything to do with on the SNES was Space Ace, one of the absolute worst waste of time games you'll ever see in your life, but mercifully, Turbo Tunes isn't that bad, it's just not all that good. I'll start with the positives, it's a top-down racing game made in the style of off-road and it features 30 different tracks with 6 different characters you can play as, and it's 5 player compatible. Just plug in a multi-tap device in the first controller port, and a controller in the second port. There aren't too many other games that could do this, so that's pretty cool. And to the game's credit, all the Hanna-Barbera stuff here is done well, every character looks just as they should with the 6 playable characters being Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hound, Quick Draw McGraw, Snagglepuss, Hong Kong Fooey, and Top Cat. You also see lots of other characters show up in the race to interfere. Each playable character has their own advantages and disadvantages, like for example, Huckleberry Hound is easier to control and is great at cornering, but his top speed sucks. 
Quick Draw McGraw is the fastest character, but his acceleration is really slow, so it takes a long while for him to get going. And that brings me to the actual racing. The controls are kind of weird. Everything is momentum based, so the only way to build speed is to not bump into obstacles or other racers. And if you do, and you will a lot, you'll spin out, and you have to build your momentum back up again from scratch. Personally, I can't say I'm a fan of this style. It depends too much on the shoddy hit detection. Sometimes there's just no way to avoid spinning out, while the fastest racers, Quick Draw and Snagglepuss, easily glide right past everyone. Seriously, in seemingly every race against the computer, or quick draw just blows past everyone like Usain Bolt. One annoying thing about this game I gotta point out is that at the title screen you're supposed to press select instead of start. Select brings you to all the game options and start just sticks you right into a race. If you didn't know any better, you'd think that's all this game is, but thankfully there's some other game modes here too. But unfortunately, this screen is a mess. What am I even looking at here? Thankfully, there's a scan of the manual that explains everything, so I'll read each row in order. The first row, starting with the dumbbell going left to right, starts with a training mode, then a single race, a five race league, and a challenge mode that's a race to be the first to collect 50 crystals. The second row selects either human players or computer players, with the human represented by someone who looks like the obnoxious waiter from Office Space. The third row is which league you want to race, or the difficulty really, with one more circuit you can unlock if you beat the first three. The fourth row is track selection, and the fifth row is where you put your password if you have one. Well, at least the controls are simple. It's just Y to jump, B to use a turbo, dictated by the energy meter on the scoreboard in the middle there, A to break, and that's pretty much it. The circuit races work the same way as any other racing game where you get points in each race depending on where you finish, and there's also a stat system here, believe it or not. Yes, that's right, it's Hanna-Barbera Turbo Tunes the RPG. Well, uh, not really. And again, the game does nothing to help explain how this works, so it's back to the manual we go. The white crystals you see on the track represent points that you can use to increase your turbo meter, your acceleration, your top speed, grip, or how well you corner, and fitness, which affects how fast your turbo meter drains. That is surprisingly a lot of stuff for a game like this, but the thing is, it's laid out on this screen like this. The color of each face button corresponds with each skill, the colors of course matching the old Super Famicom or PAL controller. Even if you're playing with a colored controller like this, or with like an ASCII pad or something, this is uh, not the most intuitive layout. Oh, and there's also a time limit on this screen. Why? Ugh, this is just aggravating. And the lack of music in this game does it no favors either. There's like four total songs in the entire game, and they're only about a minute long each. But still, Hanna-Barbera's Turbo Tunes is pretty surprising with the number of tracks and options available, and the game looks nice enough, but the menus and layouts are just such a pain. I get that you need the manual for this, but even with the help, it's just such an annoying layout. They couldn't even be bothered to put the words press select on the title screen. If you can stomach the irritation of actually setting up a race and figure out the stat system, then this is just a barely average okay-ish racing game at best. It's nice to play with a few other people, I guess, and I appreciate all the options, but I would give this one a pass. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. If you're subscribed to a channel titled SNES Drunk, then you probably already know what F-Zero is, but just in case you don't, it was a launch title for the Super Nintendo all the way back in August of 1991, in North America anyway. And for my money, it's one of the best launch titles for any console ever because it so clearly demonstrated a huge leap from the NES to the SNES, and it showed it was up to the task of keeping pace with the Sega Genesis. And all it took to show that was just one glance at the screen, it's that simple. Well, now glance at this screen. Suddenly we got F-Zero with like a million other vehicles and my mind feels like it's going to fold in on itself. This is just nuts. I love this idea, and it's a lot of fun to play. The basic idea behind this title is obvious. It's you versus 98 other racers racing with the same vehicles, tracks, and controls as the original F-Zero. But there's plenty of modern stuff added to update the game, like instead of getting one boost per lap, now your boost comes out of your energy meter. So not only do you have to manage the race and all this chaos, but you gotta keep one eye on your energy meter to make sure you don't boost too often or you're done. 
In addition, press the R trigger to do a spin that does damage to other vehicles, but similarly, you can't just spam it constantly. You have to wait for it to refresh every few seconds and pick your spots wisely when to use it. There's also these gold pieces that bounce around all over the place. They're generated by contact between vehicles. Collect enough and press the A button as you would to boost, and if the gold meter in the upper right is filled, you'll move to a track above the action, so you'll have a better chance to gain some ground and save your energy meter. Personally, I like to use these boosts to shortcut my way past more difficult areas of the track. You'll also run into these giant gold cars occasionally, but you'll want to run into them since they give out tons of gold grickles or whatever these are. Every other vehicle though, you'll probably not want to run into them too often. It is very easy to crash out in this game. There's usually about 20 or 25 cars that don't make it to the end of a race. The game does give you a good incentive to take a more combative approach with your spin attack, since if you knock out another racer, that will extend your energy meter, but uh, that's probably easier said than done. Hey, I never said I was actually good at F-Zero. It's still fun, but I think my best finish is like 20th. The game also randomly pits you against four different rivals in every race, and if you finish ahead of them, it gives you a better chance of increasing your overall rank, and you earn even more ranking points if you manage to eliminate them from the race, and it's always really satisfying if you're able to pull that off. And hey, if you have a hard time getting into this one, not to worry, you'll have plenty of chances to practice because the game doesn't waste much time getting you back into the action. I love how fast this game gets you into another race. I'm sure a big part of that is because a ton of people are playing right now, but it's very convenient to rebound from a crash out finish just to jump right back into another race in a matter of a minute. And if you'd rather familiarize yourself with the game in a more player-friendly setting, there is a practice mode, and for what it's worth, there's also a workshop where you can customize your vehicle, change your backdrop, and look at your lifetime stats. If you're looking for more of a challenge, there's special events on more difficult tracks, and there's a Grand Prix where the same group races four tracks in a row instead of just one. There's also a team mode that splits everyone into two different groups that go head-to-head, -head, with a score for each being added up at the end, kind of like they do in Splatoon. Really, my only criticism with F-099 is that there's only like five tracks for the lowest skill levels to rotate between. Each one is voted on before each race, but I'm already at the point where I don't even care what gets picked because I've already raced each one like a dozen times. I get why this is, it's to help separate skill levels, but as much as I appreciate the familiarity of racing old tracks, it'd be really nice if they got some new tracks on here, either bumped up from the original game or brand new tracks just for this game. So yeah, I mean, it should be obvious to anyone who's watched any of my content that of course I'd recommend F-099. It maintains the same graphics, controls, and sound of the original while adding a ton of stuff that modernizes it for the Switch. It's really difficult. I mean, I'm already seeing tons of videos with titles like How to Get Good at F-099, and if that's what you're looking for, then you've found the wrong video because I'm not very good at this either. But that's okay because it's still a lot of fun to play. I'm only left wondering what other first-party Nintendo games could benefit from the 99 treatment, like 99 Skydivers and Pilot Wings, 99 Bowsers in SimCity, or I don't know, 99 players on each team in Super Play Action Football. The original F-Zero already held up well enough on its own, but F-Zero 99 is exactly the kind of creative thinking that goes a long way toward helping translate the experience to a modern audience. Definitely check this one out. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. ActRaiser for Super Nintendo has long been one of the most interesting, unique, and ambitious games made for the system. You play as God, you fight demons and creatures and bosses, and with the help of this little angel helper, you guide your people to prosperity by helping them seal off monster lairs and by completing tasks that build up their faith by introducing farming, music, clothing, medicine, all sorts of stuff with the entire playthrough going back and forth between town-building simulation segments and side-scrolling action levels. It's a good time, it's a great game on its own, and it also felt like the start of a really promising series. There's just so much to build on and improve here. ActRaiser 2 was released a few years later, but that was a straight-ahead action platformer. It's still a decent game, but it just didn't feel like ActRaiser. It didn't really capitalize on the ideas of the first game. Well, here we are decades later with Sonic Power to developing ActRaiser Renaissance, published by Square Enix, available for Switch, PS4, Steam, Android, and iOS. 
And curiously, right away, you'll see the graphics appear to be pre-rendered. Okay, that's a choice, I guess. I don't really mind because, you know, that's kind of what I'm used to, but apparently when this game was first released, there were all sorts of stuttering issues with scrolling, but that's since been patched for the most part. But still, right away we're off to a bit of a shaky start, but hey, at least the music sounds awesome. The original composer, Yuzo Koshiro, is back, and as usual, his work does not disappoint. The game starts very similarly to the original, where you meet your angel helper, go down to the surface to kill some monsters, only in this game you get lots and lots of helper text, and lots and lots of dialogue from villagers. If you find this kind of thing annoying, keep in mind that the whole playthrough isn't this text-heavy, just the first few sections to introduce how stuff works. The game controls similarly to the original with a few extra inputs. Your sword attacks are a bit more varied, and you can quickly evade enemies, which comes in handy. After you beat the first boss, then it's up to you to guide your villagers over to these monster lairs to seal them up. In the meantime, you have to protect them with your angel helper by shooting these demons flying around, and that grants you points that you can use to eradicate the monsters for good. You also use those points to get rid of environmental hazards in the way, using a set of god powers like lightning, rain, sunlight, and so on. Your villagers slowly build up their town and provide you with resources to help defend themselves against more waves of invading monsters, so you gotta fly around, gather stuff, and place barricades, towers, gatehouses, and yup, suddenly you're playing a tower defense game. The monsters slowly wander in from off the map, you keep gathering resources and setting up defenses, and it's all very tedious and downright boring, and alright, I gotta rant for a bit, so excuse the editorial. Now, when playing the original back in 1991, even as a kid, I had somewhat of a reasonable understanding that the town building simulation is going to be limited. It's very basic stuff because, uh, it kinda had to be, but it still had its charm, especially when you had to help out individual villagers with specific tasks. The pipe dream, at least for me, was that any sort of sequel or follow-up was going to make the town building sim sections a lot more intricate, like maybe include specific building types, or create different types of soldiers, and have better resource management specific to wood, or gold, or food, or whatever, and just, you know, have a lot more stuff to do. But instead, the direct sequel, ActRaiser 2, just abandoned the town building altogether, a big disappointment. But hey, maybe ActRaiser Renaissance can right that wrong, bring back the town sim sections and make them closer to a real-time strategy game like Age of Empires, right? But no, that's not what happened. The town building sections are back, but they're pretty much the same as the first game, for better or for worse. Instead of adding a lot more detail to that part of the game, we get these long, boring tower defense sections, and yeah. I don't know about you, but I got a little burnt out on tower defense back in the 2000s when I was killing time at work playing desktop tower defense. I mean, to be fair, this is a lot better than Soul Seraph, a quote-unquote spiritual sequel to ActRaiser that was a total dud, but still, enough with the tower defense stuff, please. Alright, there are still plenty of positives in this game, though. Like, to give one example, I do like the addition of having a hero you can guide around in this mode, so you're not just left sitting around waiting for your setup to fall apart. But again, I would have liked to have seen a lot more of that to help make these sections more engaging. And yeah, the side-scrolling action levels are fantastic, especially the boss fights, and they offer just the right amount of challenge, and despite how often this game will interrupt whatever it is you're doing, I did appreciate the insights into the actual villagers that you're helping. And if you complete the game, there's also an extra world called Alka Leon that you can play for, so that's pretty cool. But yeah, ActRaiser Renaissance is a tricky one to recommend. The music is awesome, the action levels are great, the boss fights are fun, but the ratio between that part of the game and the boring tower defense sections is something like 30-70. One of the best things about the original game is how smoothly it was paced between the action and sim sections, but the balance here just feels completely off. I got real tired with the sim sections. But I did enjoy the rest of the game quite a bit, I just wish there was more of it. So I'll say, if you really, really enjoyed ActRaiser on Super Nintendo, then I think you'll enjoy this game. But if you're merely looking at this game as a curiosity, then I can't help but think that you're likely to find yourself bored and frustrated. Unless, you know, you're longing for those Newgrounds days of Bloons Tower Defense. I think ActRaiser Renaissance is at least a step in the right direction, but not enough of one, and in my opinion, there's still a lot to improve here. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for a follow-up that finally takes full advantage of all the great ideas in the original ActRaiser. Alright, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.
Next shot. At just about every used video game store you go to, you'll see an avalanche of sports games, of course, but buried in there among Super Caesar's Palace and Vegas Stakes, you'll almost always see Lagoon sitting there for a meager $5. Hey, it's a top-down adventure game. Those are fun. How bad could it be? Well, it's not that Lagoon is bad. If there's an adequate word to describe Lagoon, it's annoying. The game begins by shuttling you all over town. Hmm, these doors don't open. Oh, I see, the functional places have open doors already. Oh wait, never mind, some doors open. Let's go talk to the mayor at the church. Uh-oh, something happened, but the game kindly teleports you there, that's nice. Hmm, this guy got attacked, but they won't let me through without a sword. So I gotta walk my sorry ass back to town and get a sword. But wait, I gotta tell the cleric what happened. Let's go to the mayor's house. Why? Why can't we talk here? Fine, go to the friggin' mayor's house where I at least get some money. Let's go get a sword and go after those guys over at the shop here. Wait, what? Why aren't you open? Oh, there's another place to buy stuff. Fine, I've got the exact amount to buy all three of these things. Nothing is equipped automatically, okay. So let's... Wait, what? You equip one thing and it kicks you out of the menu. And so it goes for Lagoon, one big annoying game. This game is work. I will say they at least do a nice enough job with the overall presentation. The game looks nice enough, especially the intro here. The music is pretty good, and it's really surprising how good the soundtrack is here. It's well done. The boss designs are interesting, although the game for some reason forbids you from using magic against them? What the hell is that? And it's got the typical top-down adventure style gameplay, but the biggest flaw with that, as you can see here, is that your attack range is absurdly short. The gameplay is pretty similar to the early East games, where the movement is kind of the same and you heal automatically. It may be a top-down adventure game, but you do level up and manage equipment and items like an RPG, but seriously, it looks like I'm waving a toothpick at these guys. Come on! But yeah, your basic adventure game stuff is here, and I want to stress the word basic. The story is as generic as it gets. Some evil guy named Zera has mucked up all the water in the world and made everyone sick. So you gotta stop him before he's able to release some evil spirit hibernating under a castle. Woo lord. It warrants mentioning that Lagoon was first released on the Sharp X68000 in Japan in 1990. Look at this beast. I think the 68,000 is actually how many pounds that thing weighs. Anyway, that version has more cutscenes and the quests are in a different sequence than the Super Nintendo version. I haven't played it, but it doesn't necessarily seem better in any way. The cutscenes do look nice though. So yeah, Lagoon might serve as a starter adventure game if you don't want to shell out the dough for Link to the Past, but let's be honest, you're not missing anything if you don't play Lagoon. Stay strong. Over the years, Terra Enigma has attained a kind of mysterious aura to it. Some people consider it the lost classic RPG because it never got released in the United States, despite it being released in Europe. So first let's go over what most people do know about this game already. We know it's the third game released in the Quintet or Enix trilogy, following Soul Blazer and Illusion of Gaia. It's got the same top-down adventure style gameplay with some RPG elements mixed in, and by no means do you have to play the previous two games in the Enix trilogy to enjoy Terra Enigma. and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but if you like the gameplay in the previous games, you will definitely like Terra Enigma without a doubt. The story sadly, however, is not quite as bizarre as Illusion of Gaia, there's no suicidal pigs or talking flutes or vampires. It is a pretty strange story, just not as frickin' whacked out as that one. It's a little tricky to talk about the story in Terra Enigma because there's a good twist about halfway through that I don't want to spoil, but it's about as good as any storyline twist in any Super Nintendo RPG. I'm not saying it's Shakespeare exactly, but it is very good. Anyway, you play as Ark, a boy who lives in a village that nobody's ever left. One day he opens a forbidden door, and who'd have ever thought something bad would happen if you open a forbidden door? Shockingly, the entire town freezes except for one mysterious old dude who promptly tells you what you have to do. So Ark becomes the first person to ever leave his village, only to find everything is a frozen wasteland, and it's up to him to revive everything. Humans, animals, the weather, the wind, you name it. Until he finds out he's in a little too deep, and that's all I'll say. The story is the best part of Terra Enigma, in my opinion. I found myself enjoying it as much as Final Fantasy VI and the first Lufia game. That's all subjective, of course, but I'm just saying, it's an interesting story that clearly a lot of effort went into telling. And when you finish Terra Enigma, the story is the first thing you'll think of and remember when you think back on it. The gameplay takes what Illusion of Gaia did and adds a few things. There's a vast array of attacks and spells, and there's a new kind of magic system that's not exactly necessary, but it's still fun to have. There are some cleverly made puzzles to get past, and of course the sound of destroying an enemy is addicting as always. At its core, it really does play like an advanced version of Illusion of Gaia. 
The bosses can be challenging, and it can take a couple tries to figure out what to do and how to time things. There is one boss in particular, Bloody Mary. Oh my god, you really have to make sure you grind to a certain level before you face her, or you just use all the magic stuff you have, or you will be stuck on this part for a long time. So yeah, experience and leveling is a bit more open-ended than Illusion of Gaia, it's more important, and it's not just to unlock the next section like you did in that game. I will say I don't think the level design in Terra Enigma is quite as clever as it is in Illusion of Gaia, or Link to the Past, or Lufia 2 for that matter, but that's okay, there's still some good stuff here. And really, the incentive to keep playing Terra Enigma isn't just the gameplay, it's to allow the story to unfold, and not only that, it's to listen to this freaking awesome music. Every single track here is great, and I mean that. Literally every single piece of music in this game is freaking fantastic. This is one of the very best Super Nintendo soundtracks from start to finish. And you know that's high praise considering how many other games also have tremendous music. But this is right up there with Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger, Super Castlevania IV, Super Metroid, Secret of Mana, you name it, the Terra Enigma soundtrack belongs right there alongside it. There are two or three tracks in particular, like Light and Darkness and The Top of Saint Mountain, that are among the very best pieces of music from a technical and compositional standpoint from any game ever. My only real negative about Terra Enigma is that it's not always very balanced. If you are underleveled for the next area, the game will let you know immediately, and you will get your ass handed to you. But it's very easy to get overleveled as well, where everything dies in two hits or less, and you barely take any damage. It's almost like they didn't spread the level gradient far enough, if that makes sense. All it takes is to be one or two levels below what's required, and you just have no chance but the opposite is equally applicable. It's just kind of annoying is all, not a game breaker. Anyway, I know I've said more than once that you don't have to play the previous games in the Enix trilogy before you play Terra Enigma, but I do think if you want to keep your expectations in check, it actually does help to play Illusion of Gaia first. And while I don't think the level design is as clever, the extra gameplay mechanics and the story and the soundtrack are as good as you'll find on the Super Nintendo. And while I don't think it's exactly on the level of Final Fantasy VI or Chrono Trigger, it is still a tremendous game and a great experience. Go find Terra Enigma, go track it down, it's awesome. Snastrock. Operation C is the often forgotten third game in the Contra series, coming to the original Game Boy less than a year after Super C was ported from the arcade to the NES. Operation C is so forgotten that even the developers of Contra 3 The Alien Wars for Super Nintendo just skipped over it entirely and declared itself the third game in the series. Weirdly, that wasn't always the case, as the Super NES Player's Guide had Contra 3's original title as Super Contra 4, which would make sense since that game wasn't released until more than a year after Operation C, but instead they decided to just forget the Game Boy game existed. And that's too bad, because Operation C is a damn good game, especially considering it's a measly little Game Boy release. The game features five original stages, although many have similar features to Super C for the NES. Stages 1, 3, and 5 are your classic Contra side-scrolling levels, while stages 2 and 4 are an overhead view. The downside of the overhead view is that you can't jump, so that's a bummer. I gotta mention the Konami code real quick. It does work in this game, but instead of 30 lives, it allows stage select, so you can start on any of the five stages, so that's pretty cool. Operation C has all the usual Contra weapons, but this is the game that introduces the Hunter, or Homing Gun, which is easily the most satisfying weapon to use in the game. I especially like that the default gun is the machine gun, so you can just hold down the button instead of tapping like crazy. Also, the spread gun can be upgraded from 3 to 5 bullets at once. That's awesome, and very useful. While this game is really enjoyable and features the kind of gameplay you'd expect from any other early Contra game, Operation C is pretty easy. I will say Stage 4 is pretty dang tough, kinda similar to Stage 6 of Super C. Otherwise, the game doesn't present too much of a challenge, the levels aren't that long, and the inherent limitations of the Game Boy dictate that there can't be very much going on the screen at once, so that's a caveat you have to keep in mind. Anyway, Operation C is a very short but solid game that kind of got ignored in the grand scheme of things. It goes for an average of about $9 on eBay, so if you have a Super Game Boy or even a Game Boy Advance, I recommend checking it out. Nice Bart vs. the Juggernauts is an original Game Boy release that's emblematic of a completely different era of handheld gaming. This game is essentially just a series of mini-games, but not to cut corners, it was truly meant to be a portable game because of the start and stop nature of portable gaming back then. For example, one of my best friends growing up, I remember his dad had a Game Boy, but only owned two games for it, Golf and Tetris. I asked why he didn't want to try any other games, he said, I don't need any other games, I only play this when I'm taking a shit. 
So looking back on a game like Bart vs. the Juggernauts, a game with a specific purpose in mind, a pick up and play and put down kind of a game, you gotta keep those parameters in mind. Has it aged well in terms of substance? Absolutely not. The mini games are limited to say the least, and not particularly catchy or interesting. Everything is presented like American Gladiators, where each mini game gets you money and you gotta accumulate enough to advance to the next round. There's seven different games, a huge moving grid you hop across to put a ball through a hoop, and if you jump on the wrong square you get electrocuted. This game is the best of the bunch and is actually pretty good. There's a skateboarding ramp where you knock off a gladiator dude, there's an obstacle course, there's basketball, a shoving match, and good old-fashioned American Gladiator style fighting, with big oversized fungo bats. The real appeal of this game though is that it really does a nice job of maintaining the classic Simpsons sense of humor, and that comes in the form of commentary provided by Kent Brockman and Dr. Marvin Monroe, the latter in particular as he overanalyzes to death everything Bart does. There's also brief commentary from a character before you play each minigame. Nothing here is going to make you laugh out loud really, but there's some chuckles here and there. And really, I can't remember any other Simpsons game back then getting the humor down as well as this game did, with the exception of the Simpsons arcade game. Remember, this came out in 1992 when the show was still in its prime. Anyway, the Simpsons-styled humor is really all this game has going for it. It's definitely better than the other Simpsons games at the time, but that's really not saying a whole lot. Bart vs. the Juggernauts was designed for one purpose, and to paraphrase my friend's dad, play it when you're taking a shit. Hi there, today I thought I'd look at some of the best SNES ROM hacks I've played. Now there's like a thousand of these, so obviously I haven't played all of them. I just wanted to share what I've enjoyed playing. First I should explain that I'm talking specifically about ROM hacks, not homebrew games. A ROM hack is a person or a team of people modifying existing content. A homebrew means the programming code would be entirely original and made from scratch. Also it's worth pointing out that usually these ROM hacks are made by people who have put well over 200 hours into the original game, so the temptation is to stretch the game's capabilities to their limit and by proxy their own skills and as a result, the hack can end up way, way too difficult, and just not worth the aggravation. Yeah, I get it, a lot of these ROM hacks are made for a niche audience, but hey, if you want a challenge, I'd argue it's tougher to design new platforming levels that match your character's abilities while still being fair, and while still seeming new and keeping the spirit of the original game. That's why I want to start with the hack of Super Mario World called Return to Dinosaur Land. This is a ROM hack that comes reasonably close to capturing the same spirit of Super Mario World while keeping the game fair and balanced. Sure, it starts off pretty easy, but it features multiple exits on certain levels, so the emphasis here is on exploration rather than just surviving some insane, ridiculously designed world that would take like 30 minutes to get through just one level. Don't get me wrong, Return to Dinosaur Land still presents a challenge, especially once you get to the fourth world, but the game remains fair throughout and is one of the best ROM hacks I've played. There's also stuff like a very Super Mario World, which introduces some interesting ideas like bringing in a couple elements from Mario 3 and Yoshi's Island, as well as some new enemies and some interesting new music. It's a pretty decent playthrough. Of course, if you do prefer the sadistically difficult ROM hacked levels, there's stuff like Super Kaizo World, but personally, I would prefer guys like Proton John to suffer through that kind of stuff. Go check out his channel if you haven't. Of course, you can't do a video about Super Nintendo ROM hacks without talking about Super Metroid, which behind Super Mario World is probably the most hacked SNES game out there. There's two hacks that stand out. One is Metroid's Super Zero Mission. This has got to be the best ROM hack on this entire video, and even if you kind of like Super Metroid, you have to play this hack. It's so polished and intuitive, and it impressively has a similar kind of open-ended structure to it that rewards the player for exploration. Some puzzles are really tricky, but never unfair, and they're rarely sloppy or half-assed like you see in most ROM hacks. If you play any one ROM hack in this video, make sure it's this one. It's fantastic. It's as close as we'll ever get to a Super Metroid 2. It's that good. If you're looking for other Super Metroid hacks, there's stuff like Hyper Metroid, which reimagines the story entirely and gives the game a different kind of look. That's pretty cool. This is another well-made hack by someone who knows what they're doing. Here's a small example where you come to a barrier here, you go back and you notice this enemy moving against the ceiling, but it disappears. Hey, there's a new path up here. I know that's super obvious, but I just want to demonstrate that these hacks are made by competent people who know what they're doing for the most part. Hyper Metroid is another example of that. It's buggy here and there. It's certainly not perfect, but but I really enjoyed it. 
Of course, you know there's hacks of Link to the Past out there. One of the most popular and most impressive is the Parallel Worlds hack, which has a brand new story, design, layout, map, everything. There's even new pieces of music here and there. The problem here, though, is that Parallel Worlds isn't all that intuitive. You'll find yourself wondering where the hell to go often, and the difficulty here is just brutal. This may not be for casual players, but hardcore Zelda fans will love this one. Plus, it's inspiring to see such a thoroughly remade game. Clearly, a lot of work went into Parallel Worlds, but the amount of frustration here makes me think this game may not be for everyone. The Link to the Past Goddess of Wisdom ROM hack may be a bit easier for casual players because, well, it's more Link to the Past. It's the same basic design and everything is very familiar. It's just there's new puzzles and new layouts. Nothing too fancy here, but it's still pretty solid if this is what you're looking for. But again, like I said earlier, the problem with some of these ROM hacks is that they can be very buggy and glitchy, as you can see here. Next we have Oh No More Zombies Ate My Neighbors, and that's exactly what this is. It's More Zombies Ate My Neighbors. It's 55 levels of more of the same great top-down co-op action, and the same difficulty you've come to expect from the game. This is essentially an unofficial sequel, so if you want More Zombies Ate My Neighbors, well, here it is. Literally. Of course, I have to talk a little about the Chrono Trigger ROM hack called Flames of Eternity, not to be confused with Crimson Echoes, which was made first years ago, but Flames of Eternity is a more complete version intended to bridge the gap between Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross. It's pretty interesting, the music and artwork are modified a bit here and there, and you start the game, after a lot of text, as Magus, by himself on the surface of the planet after the collapse of the Kingdom of Zeal. Personally, I thought Flames of Eternity was just okay, it's certainly not terrible, but obviously it can't touch the original game. Still, it's a decent enough story using familiar characters, themes, and visuals. Last, but certainly not least, we have the infamous Earthbound Halloween hack made by Toby Fox, otherwise known as the guy who later went on to make Undertale. So yeah, if you enjoyed Earthbound and Undertale, well, I'll just say it's interesting and leave it at that. This ROM hack is... I'm not even sure what to say because I don't want to spoil anything. I'll just say it's super messed up. You play as a bounty hunter who has to track down a monster who killed and ate this girl's parents, and you come across all sorts of horrifying stuff. It takes place in a timeline where the four Earthbound characters did not succeed, so there you go. This ROM hack is very crude, but you gotta check this one out. Okay, so there's nine ROM hacks for you just to get started. So how do you play these games? If you really wanted to, you could buy a hacked reproduction cart with a fancy label and all that, but that's not really necessary. You just need an emulator or a flash cartridge if you insist on playing these games on your original SNES hardware. ROMhacking.net is a fantastic resource not only for these ROM hacks, but for how to implement them and to get them to work. There's a link in the description that explains how this stuff works in detail. To put it briefly, you just need the original game ROM, a ROM hack, which can usually be found at romhacking.net and comes with a .ips file format and a program called the SNES ROM utility to join the two together in either a headered or headerless format. I've got a link to the program that'll do that in the description as well. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for watching and have a great rest of your day. Struck. Hi there, a big thank you to everyone who watched part 1, which got a hell of a lot more views than I ever could have hoped for. To start out part 2, just a quick reminder that if you want more information about how to play these games, I talk a bit about it at the end of part 1. There's also a link in the description that will help you along the way. To sum up, you're just using a program to join a ROM and an IPS file together. It's pretty simple. I should also talk a little bit about how these ROMs are made, and that's through level editors. For example, the most commonly used program for Super Mario World is called Lunar Magic. Magic. So if you want to try your hand at your own Mario hack, check out the description and download it. Another example would be Smile, which stands for Super Metroid Integrated Level Editor, which of course works for Super Metroid. I should also mention stuff like the MSU1 patches. These files enable you to replace the original SNES soundtrack with CD quality sound, so you can do stuff like this.
yeah, that's right. You can play games like Link to the Past, Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy VI, Secret of Mana, all sorts of stuff, and have it set to high quality orchestral arrangements. Just so you know, though, this patching method only works with emulators like BSNES and Hygen, or the SD2 SNES flash cartridge. Just in my personal opinion, I'm not too crazy about this stuff because it just sounds too out of place, especially when paired with the original SNES sound effects. But still, it's a really cool feature, and you can even include full motion video in there as well. That's pretty amazing stuff. Alright, let's get to some more ROM hacked games, and this time I want to start out with sports games, most notably one of my favorite games of all time, Ken Griffey Jr. Presents Major League Baseball. This game has been updated with the 2016 rosters, I presume they're working on a 2017 hack right now, but yeah, this even has the Expos replaced with the Washington Nationals. The only problem is you can't really upgrade the stadium, so the Twins still play in the Metrodome, and the Nationals still play in Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Still, it's kind of badass to be able to play as Mike Trout and Bryce Harper in Griffey Baseball. NBA Jam Tournament Edition has also been updated with 2017 rosters. The Seattle Supersonics logo and uniforms are still here, but the Oklahoma City Thunder players take their places. So yeah, if you've ever wanted to play the old NBA Jam but with LeBron or Steph Curry, here you go. Tecmo Super Bowl 3 has also been updated with current NFL rosters, but no Houston Texans. Instead, they had to put the Ravens in the Houston slot, which is kind of goofy. I should also mention that the original Tecmo Super Bowl for NES also has an updated roster patch, so if you'd rather play that, that's an option too. EA's NHL series has long embraced its roots, to the point that NHL 94 was an optional game mode in NHL 14. In fact, there's an NHL94.com that hosts a huge community of players that still play the original NHL 94 on Genesis and SNES. There's organized tournaments, there's leagues with drafts, it's amazing. And of course, if you just want to play the NHL 94 game with updated teams and rosters, that's there too. I've also included a link in the description to a hack for the Sega Genesis version of the game, since people tend to assume associate these games with the Genesis more than the Super Nintendo. Finally, to wrap up sports games, a big shout out to Cyrus Annihilator on Twitter for letting me know about the updated team and roster patches for International Superstar Soccer Deluxe. I would love to be able to give you more information here, but uh, most of the content here is in Spanish, so I can't really give any specifics. I just wanted to make sure it was made aware that these patches do exist. Also, just to point out, for each of these sports games, no changes were made to the actual gameplay, so you're just playing the exact same game, just with current teams and rosters. Anyway, as I mentioned in part 1, one of the most commonly hacked games is Super Mario World, to the point that there's a substantial community dedicated just to that game at smwcentral.net. They have level design contests and all sorts of cool challenges, so check it out if you want more Super Mario World hacks. For example, stuff like the second reality project Reloaded. This game has an overhauled visual design, the Mario sprite is the same, but the Yoshi sprite and just about all enemy sprites are redone, and you can tell a lot of work went into this because it really looks great. The levels are balanced and not completely completely insane, at least not to start out with, and there's a total of 96 exits, just like the original game. This is a great hack that's well worth checking out, but just make sure you play it on ZSNES instead of SNES 9X. Super Mario Kart is another game that's frequently hacked, one of the most popular being Mario Kart R, which swaps out Toad entirely for Kirby, in addition to all new courses as well as modified graphics and music. This is well made and definitely still feels like Super Mario Kart, and playing as Kirby is a nice bonus. This isn't one of those annoying hacks that makes the tracks absurdly difficult, everything here has the same feel as the original Mario Kart. Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island also has its fair share of ROM hacks, like SMW2+, Plus, which features 54 brand new levels. And again, like I said about Metroid Super Zero Mission in the last video, this is another ROM hack made by someone who's clearly put a gazillion hours into Yoshi's Island, so you get the sense that they really knew what they were doing. There's not really any new features here, so to speak, but the level design is well done, the placement of red coins rarely feels cheap, and the placement of Yoshi's vehicle transformations is pretty clever. There's also a sequel, SMW2+, Two plus two that has 50 more brand new levels. So yeah, if you dig Yoshi's Island, you have to check out these two ROM hacks. Since I talked about Chrono Trigger and Flames of Eternity in the last video, this time around let's take a look at a couple Final Fantasy VI ROM hacks, starting with the Eternal Crystals. This one's been reworked several times over the years, but the latest version has brand new storylines, new music, new sprites, new espers, plus all sorts of tweaks like Gao having a selectable attack instead of rage, Edgar is now a dragoon that looks suspiciously like Kane, Cyan is now a dark knight, it's a little bit of a meld between Final Fantasy IV and VI in certain aspects. It's pretty dang expansive and really impressive. <laughs> 
The story centers around the traditional crystals rather than the espers, but it does have the same world of balance and world of ruin event shift that happens in the middle of the game. This is an impressive piece of work and worth looking into if you liked any of the Final Fantasy SNES games. If you'd rather stick with the traditional Final Fantasy VI experience, then I recommend the Brave New World ROM hack. This one's much more of a fix or an enhancement of the original game, so it's made the original game a little more balanced in terms of stats and leveling, and as a result, each character fits almost into like a class system here, in terms of what espers and equipment they're allowed to use. So more emphasis is put on what characters you use and when. You don't want to be caught in a boss fight with the wrong party or you're screwed. They even tinkered with most of the dialogue here, but unfortunately certain stuff they added is uselessly crude and unfunny, but still, if you want to play a quote-unquote fixed or enhanced version of Final Fantasy VI, you gotta try out Brave New World. Last, let's dive into some more Legend of Zelda ROM hacks, although you might not know it just by looking at them. This one actually uses the Link to the Past engine to create a sequel to the very popular N64 game Conker's Bad Day, titled Conker's Hyrule Tale. True to form, this faithfully captures the Conker universe, although in an unlikely setting. It's pretty weird to be playing a Conker game of all things in Zelda's clothing, and this game even makes fun of that fact. Anyway, Conker plays just like Link, the game is structured in a top-down adventure setting just like Link to the Past, but it's just very clearly a Conquer game instead of Zelda. You rarely forget that while you're playing it. This is a great ROM hack that demonstrates the sheer amount of possibilities out there when it comes to hacking older games. If you don't think that's weird enough, try this one. It's another Link to the Past hack titled Bruce Campbell vs. Ganon. It rewrites the story of Link to the Past to include Ash from the Evil Dead series. You gotta give points for originality there. Ash, of course, looks suspiciously a lot like Link, but hey, it's a thought that counts. Okay, so this may not be the highest quality ROM hack. There's tons of glitches and the puzzles can be wonky and frustrating, but this ROM hack is just all about having a good laugh at the dialogue. That aspect here is entertaining and well done. Again, it's just cool to see the kind of creative stuff people people are capable of coming up with. Anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Hello, let's take a look at some more Super Nintendo ROM hacks floating out there. I've already covered a lot of the more popular hacks, like Parallel Worlds and Conker's Hyrule Tale, and a bunch of Mario hacks, so watch parts 1 and 2 for a rundown on those. Quick reminder though that if you want more information about how to get these games to work, I talk about it at the end of part 1. To sum up briefly, you're just joining a ROM file and an IPS file together using a utility that can be found on romhacking.net. Let's start out with a fun one right off the bat. This is Hyper Street Kart, a Mario Kart hack that's replaced every character with someone from the Street Fighter universe. They've even got Dalsum in there instead of Lakitu. That is awesome! Thematically, this is one of the best ROM hacks out there. All the racers look fantastic, and instead of red and green shells, you get Hadouken fireballs. How cool is that? This hack does have all new tracks as well, but that's the biggest problem with this one. Some of the tracks are pretty wonky, but don't get me wrong, this is still definitely playable. I had a lot of fun with this one, it's absolutely worth checking out. I wish there was more stuff like this. I'd be remiss if I didn't take a second to talk about one of the most popular ROM hacks out there, the Link to the Past Randomizer. What this hack does in each playthrough is shuffle the location of every major item in the game. For example, you could find the Master Sword on Death Mountain, or the Ice Rod in a Chicken Coop, or what the hell, I got the Cane of Samaria right at the beginning? You can also switch the goal of the game from defeating Ganon to finishing every dungeon, as well as all sorts of other options you can tinker with. Link to the Past in particular is a perfect pick for this sort of gimmick because, while it goes without saying, that this is a beloved game, it doesn't have the greatest replay value because once you've figured out all the puzzles and you know where everything is, the experience gets kind of stale. The randomizer hack gives Link to the Past brand new life. It's a great idea and it's implemented pretty well, all things considered. Heck, even if you don't feel like playing this one, tons of people out there on Twitch, like Slackaholicus, play this pretty regularly. This hack has a ginormous community dedicated to it, so go check it out. Bear in mind this one's handled a little differently in terms of how it's hacked, so check the description for how to get started.
Next, there's Super Metroid redesign. Of course, I gotta talk about at least one Super Metroid hack on here since there are so many, and I can't believe I haven't mentioned this one yet. This one is ginormous in scope, the maps are huge, there's even knots to the original Metroid in certain areas. It's a pretty polished hack. Some people aren't gonna like what's done with the physics here, wall jumping is much different, and this game is really hard. Everything is bigger, stronger, and faster. It's like the Kaizo Mario world of Super Metroid. This is made for people who are really freaking good at this game and want even more of a challenge. Let's go a little off the radar for a few Sega Genesis hacks. This one is Vector the Crocodile in Sonic the Hedgehog. Vector appears as he does in Knuckles Chaotix for 32X and plays pretty much the same way. In a similar vein, there's also Sally the Acorn in Sonic the Hedgehog. She's a character from the TV series that never appeared in any of the Sonic games. Again, this is just a new character with new abilities inhabiting Sonic's world, but the sprite work here is really well done and blends in with the game almost perfectly. Okay, so we've got new characters visiting Sonic's world. How about Sonic visiting another game universe like Streets of Rage 3? Again, there's nothing all that new here from a gameplay standpoint. It's just funny as hell seeing Sonic kick some ass in this environment. So I'm just letting you know that this is out there. And hey, look, the Streets of Rage guys even return the favor and visit Sonic's universe in another hack. Now that's funny. There's tons of similar stuff like this out there for lots of different Genesis games. Back to the Super Nintendo we go with Chrono Trigger Prophet's Guile. This is a very interesting one because it picks up right after the conclusion of the first battle with Magus. Of course our heroes are thrown all the way back to 65 million BC, but here you play as Magus after he ends up in 12,000 BC when, spoiler alert, you play through the events as he becomes the Prophet of Zeal. And spoiler alert, this is a very short playthrough, but what I like about it is that it feels organic, and it fits in the original Chrono Trigger story nicely, so if you're a fan of Chrono Trigger, and who isn't, then this one is worth checking out. I've long described Super Mario RPG as a great gateway game for people that aren't into the role-playing game genre because it's easy to get into and the difficulty slants toward the easy side of things. However, if you've always wished there was more of a challenge to Mario RPG, then there's Super Mario RPG Armageddon. It rebalances the entire game and is made to be much more challenging, especially after you get past Moleville. And hey, did you enjoy the Kalex battle? There's even more Final Fantasy bosses here, so that's pretty cool. Going a bit off the grid here again with a ROM hack for Fire Emblem Seisen no Keifu, otherwise known as Fire Emblem 4. This one only came out in Japan, but it's one of the very best games to never make it to North America or to PAL regions. This hack, titled Fire Emblem Binary, just streamlines the experience a bit more. For example, more of the holy weapons are obtainable, there's a lot more skill granting items, and the dismount feature has been added so mounts can travel further. There's no changes to the story or anything, it's just a rebalancing of the combat system that's really well done and makes it much easier to get into the game, and it's well worth it. It's probably the best Fire Emblem game to never make it to the States. There's another hack for Final Fantasy VI titled Return of the Dark Sorcerer. This one has been a long time in the making and is a true community project, so it's cool to see it become as polished as it is today, and it's seriously one of the most impressive ROM hacks out there. This isn't a prequel or a sequel or a remake, it's an entirely new game with brand new characters, new movesets, a new script with new events, and thankfully and most importantly, not only is the encounter rate significantly lowered, but you can hold B to sprint on the world map. This is a hugely ambitious ROM hack that's taken years to develop and it's well worth checking out for yourself. Finally, there's an improvement patch for Mega Man X3 titled Zero Project. The game remains the same for the most part, but it allows you to play through the entire game as Zero. Hey, that's all anyone really ever wanted from this game, right? So that's pretty cool. Speaking of Mega Man, one last thing real quick, when I do these ROM hack videos, I get some people asking, hey, why is it always the same games? Why aren't there more hacks for Mega Man X or Super Castlevania 4 or Kirby or Star Fox? Well, the answer to that is, there aren't that many ROM hacks for those games. There are quote-unquote improvement patches out there, like for example, there's a mod for Super Castlevania 4 that removes all the candles, making the game much more difficult. And there is at least one other Mega Man X hack out there called Generations, but it's really rough around the edges and it's still being tinkered with. So I guess this is just a call to all the people out there that make these ROM hacks saying, hey, how about some hacks for some other games other than RPGs and Mario and Metroid? I can tell you there is hope on the horizon. Click on the description and you'll find a link to a Mega Man X ROM hack called Corrupted. And let me tell you, it looks freaking incredible. It's not finished yet, but I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it'll be featured in part four of this series. And I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.
Let's drunk. Hello and welcome to part 4 of this video series taking a look at some of the best Super Nintendo ROM hacks out there. In the video description below you'll find the tools you'll need to get these to work properly. To sum up, you're taking the normal game ROM and using a utility program to join it with a patch which modifies the game accordingly. Most of these are pretty easy to get to work, especially since all the links I have listed here come with a readme file that guides you step by step to make sure that you can get the game to work. In the past, I've talked about everything from Metroid Super Zero Mission, to Link to the Past Parallel Worlds, to Super Mario World Return to Dinosaur Island, just to name a few, and all sorts of other modified games like Super Mario Kart, Final Fantasy VI, in addition to randomizers for games like Link to the Past and Super Metroid. If you feel like I've missed something in this video, I recommend checking out earlier videos in this series to see if it's been covered there. Some of my personal favorite ROM hacks involve Super Mario World, mostly because I've put about a gazillion hours into that game over the years, so it's always fun to try new stuff with the same gameplay and physics and stuff. New Super Mario World 2 Around the World is made by Rilaru of Brazil, and here we've got 16 different worlds with over 90 different levels, with all new music, new boss fights, some tricky ghost houses, you can even wall jump in this game, which is really cool. Really, this is one of the best ROM hacks I've ever played, it really has a certain polish to it that makes it come across as an official release. Be forewarned though, like most ROM hacks, this game can get really difficult, but I still have a lot of fun with this one since I discovered it a while ago. The level design is really creative while staying reasonably balanced, and it's got a good pace to it. The enemy placement is just on the edge of being too difficult without being Kaizo level ridiculous. The game never really feels unfair or anything like that. Definitely check this one out. If you want something truly different in the realm of Mario, there's Super Mario Logic. This one was made by Final Theory, and it's nothing but single-screen puzzles that you have to solve, with the goal being to get the question orb, which is hidden away somewhere or buried beneath a pile of blocks or whatever. There's 94 total levels, and the game does a really impressive job of building from one puzzle to the next without resorting to cheap stuff. Most of the puzzles involve collecting the right number of coins so you can pass through a numbered block. Even Yoshi gets involved, which is pretty cool. The game starts out pretty dang easy, and it's pretty simple to figure out some of the basic mechanics involved here, but the further you get into this one, you start to see just how clever this one can get. There's even a nice quality of life mechanic here. If you get stuck or screw something up, just press start and select at the same time, and it'll reset the puzzle and you can start over. This is a really fun playthrough that does a fantastic job doing something different with Super Mario World. If you'd rather stick to more traditional Mario gameplay, there's plenty of that that can be found, like Mario & Luigi Cola Kingdom Quest made by Gamma V. This one's got a bit of a different art style, some interesting music, and a very cleverly designed user interface that deftly slides in and out of your viewpoint so it doesn't clutter up the screen. What I like about this one is that, like Mario World 2 around the world, it's not freaking impossible, and it's very approachable even for novice players. Sure, it gets pretty dang tough when you get toward the end of the game's 74 levels, but this this has a familiar feel to it, it's got that professional style polish to it that can be hard to find with a lot of ROM hacks, so I definitely recommend checking this one out if you want more Mario in your life. I should note that one major highlight of this hack is the music. It takes tracks from all sorts of other games and gives them kind of a Mario spin, everything from Sonic and Knuckles to Final Fantasy VII and even Chrono Trigger. Of course, it wouldn't be a proper ROM hack video without mentioning something related to Super Metroid, and here's a really interesting one called Super Metroid Arcade, or King of Crade, made by Tutel Lyoren. It's a randomizer with an arcade-style structure. Every door you enter will bring you to a completely different part of the map. It could be an upgrade, it could be an item, or it could be a boss fight. It's pretty crazy. When you enter the room, the door behind you locks, so there's no going backward. There's different game modes here, where you can play this way for a certain time limit, or you can do an endless run where you just play while trying to accumulate as many points as possible before you die. Endless mode in particular gets really tough after a while because enemy damage increases the more you play, and upgrades like the screw attack are temporary. There's a scoreboard that tracks the best scores on arcade.supermetroid.run, and there's even achievements you can unlock. This is easily one of the best and most creative ROM hacks I've come across. I highly recommend checking this one out. 
The original Star Fox is one of my favorite games ever, and yeah, certain aspects of it have aged like milk, but the Star Fox Exploration Showcase patch is so freaking cool and goes a long way not only with fixing certain issues, but adding a ton of options. First and foremost, you can play with a second player and it's not split screen. Look how freaking badass this is! There's even a mode that allows you to play with three other ships controlled by the computer. It is freaking awesome! There's a huge list of options here, like a god mode, infinite nova bombs, an endurance mode, there's new ships, new weapons, there's even a new game plus mode where you fight, uh, something called Mecha Luigi. Okay, hey bring it on, I'll end his skinny green ass. This hack is a massive amount of fun that adds a ton to the original Star Fox. Another game that has about a gazillion patches and hacks is Final Fantasy VI, and one of the most comprehensive is a hack I mentioned in a past video, Return of the Dark Sorcerer. This is a huge project with nearly four dozen people involved, and they're consistently putting out lots of updated content that keeps this one fresh. There's an all-new cast of playable characters with their own custom movesets, a completely different story, new overworld maps, new music, lots of new options when it comes to espers. It really is like a brand new game that just happens to take place in the same universe as Final Fantasy VI, and what's really cool is that they keep making updates to it. Even Cloud and Tifa show up, and hey wait a minute, what is that idiot doing here? But yeah, this isn't any kind of sequel or prequel or anything like that. Return of the Dark Sorcerer is entirely its own thing, and it's really freaking good. Here's another interesting one for Final Fantasy VI, T Edition. It's actually one of the more popular ROM hacks in Japan, but it recently received an English translation. Man, it's crazy enough that we're getting such great translations for regular ass games. Now we're getting translations for ROM hacks? So freaking cool. This hack isn't as crazy as Return of the Dark Sorcerer, and it stays much closer to the source material, but it does add a lot of new content, but it's all connected to the original story. There's new locations, new dungeons, new bosses, some new attacks and spells, along with some bug fixes that help balance the game a little bit. Bear in mind here, the ROM file you gotta use to get this one to work is the Japanese ROM of Final Fantasy VI, not the American version. But yeah, if you're looking for just more Final Fantasy VI, you won't be disappointed with the English translation of T edition. Edition. A Link to the Past is another game that's starting to get some momentum in the ROM hacking world. Of course, there's the hugely popular randomizer, but some folks are doing solid work with brand new puzzles and adventures, like Secrets of the Past, made by Super Scudge. Scoof Super Scudge? This is one of those that can be a little rough around the edges, but it's got a fantastic amount of creativity on display with the way some of the puzzles are laid out. It's still approachable without being ridiculously difficult, and it's got all new dungeons with a new overworld. Check this one out if you're looking to scratch that Zelda itch. Now, some folks out there are kind of sick of seeing the same games get modded, as evidenced by this video so far. Sure, certain games lend themselves much easier to being modified since the tools available are much more accessible, but hey, other games are on their way too, like Super Castlevania 4, with this remix hack made by Boga Boga. Man, you guys gotta start getting some normal ass names for once. There's not too much majorly different here, so it's not that far removed from the original game, and that's totally fine. It's just new level layouts, new enemy placements, some control modifications like holding the A button to run and the L button to moonwalk. This ROM isn't perfect, it's got some hiccups here and there, but hey, if you want more Super Castlevania 4, then here you go. Finally, here's another game that doesn't get too many mods, it's an endurance patch for Top Gear. I know this game is absolutely massive in South America, so I figured I'd give this game a shout out. This one was made by Gamehack Fan, and it increases the number of laps for each race, and rebalances the game as a result. You can't just overpower everyone with the red car here, especially on tracks with extra laps that don't have pit stops. There are some races that are up to 10 laps long, and it's always hilarious to see the computer AI opponent run out of gas and helplessly sit there like an idiot waiting for other cars to ram into it so he can crawl to the finish line somehow. Again, this hack isn't perfect, it could use a little tweaking since the computer is kind of a moron when it comes to how and when to refuel when that option is available, but hey, I love any kind of tweak that adds to the challenge of one of my favorite games ever in Top Gear. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day!
Hello, welcome to part 5 of the ROM Hacks video series where I take a look at some of the best Super Nintendo ROM hacks out there, with one major exception I'll get to in a little bit. In the description below, you'll find the tools you'll need to get these to work properly. It's pretty simple, all you're really doing is taking the normal game ROM and using a utility program to join it with a patch, and that modifies the game accordingly. Most of these are pretty easy to get to work, especially since all the links I have listed here come with a readme file that guide you step by step to make sure you can get the game to work. In past videos, I've talked about everything from New Super Mario World 2 around the world, which to this day is still one of my personal favorites, along with Hyper Metroid, Super Metroid Arcade, Link to the Past Randomizer, on and on. So let's take a look at some more. Here's another favorite I've found, built as a Super Mario World hack titled Super Boss Collection, and uh, all you really need to know is in the title. You boot up the game, and you're met with a huge menu of all sorts of bosses spanning across all sorts of different games. Everything from Zelda to Mega Man to Kirby, even some Donkey Kong Country and Secret of Mana bosses are here. And, of course, there's tons of Mario bosses spanning a bunch of different generations. There's 77 bosses in total, and you play as Mario, you beat whatever boss you choose, and then you're back to the main menu. It's pretty simple, but it's still really fun. This hack was a huge team effort that involved dozens of people, so kudos to them. It's a great time playing as Mario with typical Mario World physics against all sorts of different bosses spanning all sorts of different games. In the last ROM Hacks video, I talked about Super Mario Logic, and here's another one that's kinda similar, in that it's another single-screen puzzle game, Mario's Keytastrophe Rebirth Edition, made by SNN. There's 37 puzzles, with the goal being to get the key whichever way you can into the keyhole. If you get stuck and need to restart, just press L and R together and the stage will reset. This one gets complicated pretty quickly. There's nothing too ridiculous here, but it's still a challenge. There's also a timer on the world map so you can keep track of your best time, and there's even multiple paths if you want to try and find the quickest way to end the game. This hack is well done, and I hope to see more single-screen puzzle platformer stuff like this in the future. Here's one that's gotten really popular with over 20,000 downloads. It's Jump One Half, and it's a sequel to the original Jump ROM hack from years ago, made by Lazy, Six Corby, and LOL Yoshi. This one is a near-perfect blend between creative level design and brutal difficulty, and I know the latter is something that's gonna scare some of you off, but it shouldn't. This hack doesn't have that stupid, cheap, Kaizo-style difficulty. There's not a lot of insane jumps or tricks that require you to be pixel-perfect. It's a lot more than that, like this level here that starts starts out normal enough, until you accidentally touch what appears to be a death mushroom, I guess, but it doesn't kill you. Instead, it triggers a huge earthquake that speeds the background and timer way up. This is one of the most pleasantly chaotic Mario World hacks out there. The designers crammed a lot of neat ideas into this one, and it's a lot of fun to play. And there's also a ton of content here, with 130 exits, so it's easy to sink dozens of hours into this one. This next one is not a ROM hack. I repeat, it's not a ROM hack, but I wanted an excuse to talk about this project, so I'm putting it here to continue the Mario theme. This is a homebrew made by M. Nagler, and it's the original Super Mario Land for Game Boy, remade in the style of the new Super Mario Bros. games as they appeared on DS, but it was created from the ground up as a Super Nintendo game. There's lots of really impressive stuff here, and the game looks and plays great. Safe to say this would have set the friggin' world on fire had there been a Mario game like like this in the mid-90s. And yeah, bear in mind, this is a recreation of Super Mario Land through and through. There's even the goofy gray fireball that only bounces once and flies off the screen. But it's clear a ton of work went into this one, so check it out any way you can. Donkey Kong Country is finally seeing some decent ROM hacks these days, thanks to Simeon 32s DKC Resource Editor. This one is called The Kremlin's Revenge, made by Preposterify, and I recommend this one for anyone who's put a million hours into Donkey Kong Country. The first half of this one is a really solid challenge if you're already super familiar with how Donkey Kong and how Diddy control. You'll really enjoy it. But the second half of this one gets pretty ridiculous with how precise you have to be to make certain jumps. Even seasoned veterans are gonna have trouble with the later levels in this one, but if you're down to clown, this hack is up for it. Mega Man is also starting to get more and more love in the hacking community. This one is Rockman 7 EP, made by Purasabe. And bear in mind, this is a hack of Rockman 7 for Super Famicom, not Mega Man 7. This one is made by the same person that made Rockman 4 minus Infinity, and it's every bit as good, if not better. 
Everything here is upgraded. The weapons, the bosses, the level design, the music. I especially like the vehicle sections, or this boss fight here where he destroys the ground beneath you. That's really cool. This hack makes excellent use of all the pre-existing mechanics in the game, while inventing a few new ones that really add a lot. If you dig Mega Man, you gotta check this one out. One of my favorite things about doing these ROM hack videos is finding something for a game you wouldn't expect to see. I see it all the time when it comes to improvement patches, like for example, Arcana has the Seal of Rimsala patch and Super Double Dragon has the Return of Double Dragon patch. Now we're starting to see full-on ROM hacks of certain games, one of them being Gemfire of all things. This one is called Dawn of Ishmeria, made by Dragon Atma. Now for those unfamiliar, Gemfire is one of those old clunky turn-based strategy games made by Koei. Some of those games are hopelessly dated, but Gemfire has at least held up pretty well over the years, and this ROM hack includes new characters and officers, new scenarios, and even a new story that takes place before the original game. The author even went as far as to make certain characters appear younger in their portraits. Now that is dedication. This hack also rebalances things a bit as well, so if you dig games like Gemfire, or if you were ever clamoring for a sequel, or I guess in this case a prequel, then you'll really enjoy this one. But then we've got the opposite end of the spectrum. Here's a hack of Arkanoid Do It Again called Arkanoid Reblocked made by Svambo. Not every hack needs to be this huge detailed undertaking with new stories and characters and weapons and all that. Sometimes all you need to scratch an itch is to just have more of a certain game, and that's all this hack is, just more Arkanoid. I personally appreciate this one because I grew up playing a ton of Super Breakout for Atari 2600, so yeah, if you've finished Do It Again and you just want more breakout puzzles, then check out this hack. Finally, here's Goof Troop ST Space Treasure. Goof Troop has long been one of the most underappreciated games of its era, both because it's a puzzle game with accessible puzzles that aren't too tough but aren't too easy either, but it's also because it's two-player co-op. It's a real shame this game never got a sequel, but Goof Troop ST is as close as we can get to one. There's entirely new puzzles here, including some new graphics that make use of some unused stuff buried in the original game, and it's very much in step with how Goof Troop plays. Not too easy, not not too hard, and it comes across as just what many of us have wanted for years, just more Goof Troop. Alright, that's all for now, and I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day! Hello, this is part 6 of the Super Nintendo ROM Hacks video series, where I look at some of the best Super Nintendo ROM Hacks that you can find out there. In the video description, you'll find the tools you'll need to get these to work correctly, and it's pretty simple to do. Just take the normal game ROM and use a utility program to join it with a patch, and that modifies the game so you can play what you see in this video here. Most of these come with a readme file that guide you step by step to make sure that you can get the game to work properly. In past videos, I've talked about everything from Link to the Past Randomizer to hacks for games like Final Fantasy VI, like Return of the Dark Sorcerer and Brave New World, and there's even hacks for games like Gemfire and Goof Troop, just to name a couple, so let's take a look at some more ROM hacks. But first, I want to mention something a little different. One of the biggest changes I've seen happen over the past nine years I've been doing this channel project thing is how popular speedrunning has gotten. And because of that, now we're starting to see practice ROMs pop up for certain games, like Super Metroid, Turtles in Time, Super Ghouls and Ghosts, Super Castlevania 4, and even Final Fantasy 4 has its own practice ROM, and they're designed to provide time-efficient ways to practice specific parts of these games. For example, in Turtles in Time, you can press L and R together to switch turtles at any time during gameplay, and you can press Start and R together to skip ahead to the next level. There's also settings that allow bosses to respawn, so you can practice fighting them over and over without having to play the whole level over again. With the Super Metroid Practice ROM, you can hold Start and then press Select, and you've got an entire menu of settings that you can mess with. You can adjust your stats and your items, as well as boss fights and events. I've got a few links in the description where you can find some of these, and I think they're very useful resources if you're interested in getting into speedrunning. 
Let's move on to more traditional ROM hacking stuff, like Super Mario World 100 Rooms of Enemies, made by Daiso Divan. And, uh, yeah, the name says it all right there. It's 100 different rooms with a bunch of enemies you have to defeat. There's two different game modes. One gives you five lives for an entire playthrough, and the other gives you one life. It's similar to how the Pit of 100 Trials thing works in Paper Mario. This one starts out very simple, but by the time you get to around room 20 or 25, it starts to get pretty tough. Bear in mind you also have to eliminate shells in addition to enemies, so that adds to the difficulty a little bit. There's also custom music in this one, which is a nice touch, and you'll recognize it in the background from stuff like Pokemon, Sonic 3, Castlevania, even stuff like Gimmick. This is a fun one with a simple arcade-like approach that I really got into. Definitely check this one out. Sticking with Super Mario World hacks, this one is called A Plumber for All Seasons, made by Y, and it features 37 levels with 41 exits, all new graphics, new enemies and backgrounds, all new music, and the season theme here is really well done. There's lots of little touches here like Charge and Chuck throwing snowballs instead of baseballs in the winter levels. There's some really creative and stylish levels here, like this dark underwater level with a background that looks like you're swimming through something from out of this world. This is a really well-made ROM hack. The level design is laid out so well that the balance between challenging and frustrating is nearly perfect. There's lots to explore here too, and you're gonna want to because some of the pixel art that's specifically made for this one is spectacular looking. I mean, just look at Bowser here. That just looks freaking awesome. Not only is this a top three Mario World hack for me, it might be a top three ROM hack period. It's that good. You're definitely gonna wanna play this one. Let's get into some Super Mario Kart hacks. This one is called Epic Racers, made by OK Impala, Stifu, and SMK Dan. And this is one of those hacks that may as well be a completely new game. There's 20 brand new tracks, 8 new drivers that all handle a bit differently from each other, 4 new battle arenas, there's new items, and even the controls are tweaked a bit, so the driving is a bit tighter and a less drifty. This hack is 17 years in the making, going all the way back to 2003, before finally being finished in 2020 by a team of folks, and this one really has a certain polish to it that makes it play like an official release. You can also race as Loki or Jesus. Sure, okay. What I really like about this one is that the difficulty settings are done right. Easy is in fact easy, which allows you to get familiar with the tracks, and the hard mode is definitely hard. If you're a Mario Kart aficionado, you'd do well to check this one out. Another really good Mario Kart hack is Super Baldi Kart, made by Dirtbag, and again, this one plays like a new game entirely. There's 20 new tracks, 8 new drivers, a bunch of new items, but what makes this one really stand out are all the different themes for each track. Check out this one where you're driving on the moon, and even the music matches. Yup, that's right, that's the DuckTales Moon theme redone in the Super Mario Kart sound font. There's also a Tetris theme track, a Pac-Man theme, and lots of weird little Easter eggs to discover as well. And, as you can clearly see, this one is compatible with the HD16.9 functionality that you can use in the BSNES emulator. Bear in mind though, this one is pretty dang tough, but it's a lot of fun to play, especially with the second player. Even games like Clay Fighter Tournament Edition are getting ROM hacks. This one is called Ultra Clay Fighter, made by a group of people led by Zool. No, not that Zool. Uh, at least I don't think. This hack does a nice job updating the fighting system to make it a little more player friendly. For instance, launching and juggling are a little bit easier to pull off, there's reduced input lag, and there's restored sounds from the characters and the announcer that went unused in the original game. There's also some new special moves, new character color palettes, recolored backgrounds, and there's even some new end if you play this one all the way through in single-player campaign mode. The Clay Fighter games haven't held up all that well over time, but they're still a fun novelty, and this patch goes a long way to making this game a bit more player-friendly. Next, here's a great hack for Final Fantasy IV, called Final Fantasy IV Ultima, made in a group effort led by 8-Bit Fan. Normally, a hack like this would fall under the category of Improvement Patch, but this one is so incredibly thorough that it pretty much makes this game play like a new experience entirely. The main story is still in place, but there's new maps, new areas to explore, over 50 new weapons, over 60 new spells and summons, over 30 new bosses, lots of new graphics and animations, you can sprint on the world map by holding the 
the Y button. There's just tons of stuff here that makes this version of this game much more palatable. You know this one is good if you look at the user reviews on romhacking.net and there's nothing but glowing praise from like three dozen people. Without a doubt, if you want to revisit the Super Nintendo edition of Final Fantasy IV, you gotta do it with this patch. Of course, I gotta mention at least one Super Metroid hack since there's so many good ones out there. This one is called Ancient Chozo, made by Albert V, and this one serves as an expansion of the original game, with the map layout being mostly the same. But there's new routes to discover, and new game sequence breaks. This hack strikes a nice balance between the different approaches folks usually take to Super Metroid. You can speed your way through to the end as fast as possible, or you can explore anywhere and everywhere, and this game does a nice job rewarding both approaches. In addition to that, there's all sorts of new graphics and pixel art that help this hack stand out a bit aesthetically. I know there's about a gazillion Super Metroid hacks, and many of them are really good, but this one stands alongside stuff like Super Metroid Redesign, Hyper Metroid, and Super Zero Mission. It's a good time. I love me a good boss gauntlet, and here's a good one for Donkey Kong Country called Boss Blitz, made by Matt Trizzle. And yep, you just, you know, fight every boss in a row. Pretty simple. This one's got some nice polish to it though, with a timer in the upper left and the ability to keep track of your best times, including a leaderboard, which is pretty handy. This is one of those hacks that feels like an honest-to-goodness expansion or unlockable game mode that would have come with like a special edition of the game or something, and it reminds me of the arena in Kirby Superstar in that way. This is a very simple hack, but hey, sometimes simple is all you need. Finally, here's a couple of really impressive ROM hacks that are made from Super Mario World, although you would not know it based on the footage here. It's a series of games called Sakari. The first game is Sakari Remastered, and the second game is Sakari 2 The Brink of Time, both made by Yukavi. Both games are a complete and total overhaul of Super Mario World, and they are some of the most impressive works I've seen in any ROM hack anywhere. There's an original story with original characters, with both games featuring two playable characters who both play differently. There's original music, enemy patterns, power-ups, bosses, it's really freaking good. I especially like the second game, which features six worlds and two additional secret worlds that you unlock, making for 46 exits and seven unique boss fights. This is one of those ROM hacks that's as close as you can get to playing a brand new original Super Nintendo game these days, and I highly recommend checking both of these out. Alright, that's all for now, and I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. That's drunk. There are many things that suck about having a hobby that revolves around retro gaming, like the fact that there are so few genuine new homebrew games being made for Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis these days, but thankfully many fans are happy to continue to tinker with what's already out there. That's why I decided to make a video about some of the best and most useful improvement patches out there for Super Nintendo games. These are not to be confused with ROM hacks that create an entirely new game out of existing content, so to speak. With improvement patches, I'm talking about just that, improving performance, or tweaking things here and there. So, how do you use these patches? Each patch I talk about in this video has a corresponding link in the video description. Go there and download the patch, and it'll either be an IPS, BPS, or UPS file extension. From there, you use a utility program to join that patch file with a ROM of the game. The most reliable utility program I've found is called Beat, and there's a link to that in the description as well. Whether or not the patch ROM will work on your SNES Classic depends on what platform you're running on it. For more specific technical help on that, I'd recommend visiting a forum like the SNES Mini Mods subreddit. All I can say personally is that each of these patch ROMs all worked totally fine on my SD2 SNES flash cartridge playing on my original Super Nintendo. The absolute best example out there of what I'm referring to by Improvement Patch is this one, made by Vitor Vilela. What he was able to do somehow is apply a coprocessor chip to a game that never had one. He took the schematics of the SA1 coprocessor normally found in games like Super Mario RPG for example, and applied it to the programming of Gradius 3, and as you can see, the results are breathtaking. It's like playing overclocked Gradius, and it eliminates 99% of the slowdown you're used to seeing. It is incredible to play this now, and I highly 
recommend you check it out because it totally changes the game entirely, mostly because it makes the game really difficult. But still, it is really freaking cool to see this work. And for what it's worth, Vitor's made other patches similar to this for Super Mario World, but this patch for Gradius 3 is his best work yet, and all I can say is bravo! Vidar's method isn't the only way to eliminate slowdown in an older Super Nintendo game, there's also plenty of what are referred to as restoration hacks, and this one for Super Ghouls and Ghosts is one of the best I've found. It cleans up I'd say around 80-85% to 85 of the slowdown, which is obviously pretty dang significant. It's not as jarring as the Gradius 3 patch, but it's still pretty cool, and for the record I do not believe the slowdown actually helps you in games like this, the simple reason being that you have no idea when the slowdown will start and when it will end. Slowdown sucks, no matter how how you slice it. So I'm really thankful for restoration patches like this one for Super Ghouls and Ghosts because it helps people play through this one without all that nonsense. I should also mention, in addition to fixing most of the slowdown, the patch also puts back in certain stuff that was censored in the NTSC version, like crosses in the background and on the coffins and such, so that's pretty cool. There's also lots and lots of improvement hacks out there that fix flaws in games that have been well known for decades. Maybe the most infamous of these flaws is the screen scrolling in Secret of Mana. A lot of people really do not like the fact that you have to be so close to the edge of the screen to get it to scroll. This hack centers the viewpoint, so to speak, and yeah, it leads to some graphical glitches and weirdness here and there on the edges of the screen, but it still works great, and it does a great job preventing you from bouncing off of enemies that you can't see until the last split second. So, if you want to get into Secret of Mana but the screen scroll has always been a deal breaker for you, then try playing it with this patch. Sticking with Secret of Mana, there's also relocalization patches, and this game has one of the most popular. As many of you know, Secret of Mana was originally planned to be a launch title for the Super Nintendo CD peripheral, which ended up getting scrapped, so the game was kind of retrofitted back to the Super Nintendo, and as a result, the story and the dialogue suffered. Everything had to be significantly abbreviated, so the story kind of fell flat to some people. This relocalization not only improves the text, but it does a nice job keeping it in the same spirit as the original, and that's a tough balance to pull off, so kudos to the team that worked on this one. This hack also makes a lot of cosmetic changes as well, everything from adding lowercase letters to characters' names, to restoring what was censored in the NTSC version of the game after it was localized. If you're a fan of Secret of Mana, I highly recommend checking this one out any way you can. There's also just straight up retranslations out there, like for games like Breath of Fire 2, and thank god for that because the translation of the original release is by far that game's biggest flaw. It cleans up everything from dialogue to the names of spells, and the people doing the work here didn't try and shoehorn in any cutesy jokes or anything, they just straighten things out so they make more sense. Kudos to Ryusui for doing such a great job with this one, and if you've played Breath of Fire 2 but haven't played it with this patch, you're doing yourself a disservice. This game is much more enjoyable with the retranslation. There are also games with retranslation patches that you might not expect. I mean, RPGs would be an obvious target because of all the dialogue, but games like Cybernator also got cleaned up quite a bit. Technically speaking, this is really just a brand new translation of the original Japanese version of the game Assault Suits Vulcan, but yeah, this one came out of left field for me, and I appreciate that no stone goes unturned with the ROM hacking community. Just thought I'd point this one out as an example that retranslations aren't exclusive to just role-playing games. Everyone's excited about the recent collection of Mana package released for Switch recently because it's the first time Trials of Mana, or Seiken Densetsu 3, had been officially released stateside. One issue I've always had with that game, however, is that unlike its predecessor, it does not support three players. It's a two-player game at most. However, there is a patch out there that you can apply to the Super Famicom edition of the game that allows you to play with a third player. Obviously, this isn't going to work with the collection of Mana, but I'm just throwing it out there as a possibility if you have the Super Famicom Edition, because this game is a lot more fun with the second and with a third player. Another multiplayer hack that people may like is for Secret of Evermore. I remember being really excited when I found out your partner in this game is a dog, but subsequently bummed out when I realized that this game wasn't two-player. This hack produced by Fusoya changes that, and it's a welcome change that makes this game a lot more palatable. When it comes to action RPGs, the more players, the merrier. Finally, here's an improvement patch, so to speak, that has some very specific parameters. Thanks to Blaze Hedgehog on YouTube for pointing this out, it's overclocking the SuperFX chip in the original Star Fox using the RetroArch emulator. 
So just to explain quickly, RetroArch is like an emulator hub. It comes packaged with all sorts of stuff already built into it. So to run Super Nintendo games, for example, all you have to do is open a core, as the program refers to it, and in this case, you want to select a BSNES Mercury core. If it's not there, find the online updater and make sure you download it. Then go to Load Content and select your Star Fox ROM. Once it's running, back out and go to the Options menu, turn on Respect Accuracy Impacting Settings, make sure the special chip accuracy is set at HLE, and then you can set the speed as much as 10 times faster. Again, if you want more details on this, check out the Blaze Hedgehog video in the description. But yeah, once you get this going, holy crap, it is really crazy. Now, if you have RetroArch installed on your SNES Mini and you try this approach there, I don't think this will work because it requires a lot of processing power. But it works great on my PC, and it's a fantastic way to play an old classic. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hello, let's take a look at some more improvement patches for some Super Nintendo games, or quality of life patches as some people refer to them. These are not to be confused with ROM hacks, which are essentially entirely new games created out of existing content. Improvement patches just tweak things here and there. For example, in part 1 I talked about the SA1 patch you can use for Gradius 3 that eliminates virtually all of the slowdown in the game, or a scrolling fix for Secret of Mana that keeps your character closer to the middle of the screen so you don't accidentally bump into enemies. To get these to work, follow the corresponding link for each patch in the video description, download the file, and use a utility program like Beat or Lunar IPS to join together the patch file, which will either be an IPS, BPS, or UPS file extension, with the game ROM. If you need help troubleshooting, there's people on the ROM hacking forums that can help you out. Once again, I gotta start with an SA1 patch, another one made by Vitor Vilela, the same person who made the Gradius 3 patch, only this one is for Contra 3 The Alien Wars. Yeah, the slowdown isn't as blatant or even as noticeable in this game, but it's definitely there, especially when big explosions take up half the screen, or this example here with the wall climbing machine. What's happening here is that Vitor was able to take the schematics of the SA1 coprocessor chip and apply them to a game that never had one, and the resulting boost of extra processing power makes the game flow beautifully. Yeah, it's true, it makes this game really hard, as if this game wasn't hard enough, but I still really enjoy the hell out of being able to experience stuff like this, and it's well worth checking out for yourself, especially if you've played Contra 3 front to back a gazillion times like I have. Next is a patch that got mentioned a lot in the comments of part 1, it's for Mega Man X3 and it's referred to as Zero Project, which makes Zero a fully playable character throughout the entire game. Justin3009 and Metal Wario 64 are the two people credited for this one, and they really went all out making this one a way better experience than just vanilla Mega Man X3. There's a save system, a lot of the slowdown has been reduced, and they really made sure Zero played much differently than X. It's not just X with a new coat of paint, Zero really is his own fully realized character here. Also, the ride armors here are immediately available, you don't have to unlock them, and that's awesome because, well, you actually get to use them, imagine that. If you like Mega Man X3 but haven't played Zero Project, then this is an absolute must play. It's a massive improvement over the original. There's an improvement patch available for the Super Nintendo edition of Final Fantasy IV titled Naming Way Edition. Credit Rodimus Primal and Vivify93 for getting this one off the ground. It just cleans up the entire game, more or less, using modern names that better match the Japanese edition, and all items, jobs, commands, spells, and enemies are all renamed. Enemy stats are altered to fit the original Japanese version, and there's even a dash button that you can use on the world map. And most importantly, it cleans up the translation. So if you want to play Final Fantasy IV on Super Nintendo, I highly recommend doing it with the Naming Way patch. 
Speaking of Final Fantasy retranslations, there's also one available for Final Fantasy VI, referred to as the Ted Woolsey Uncensored Edition. Again, this is an attempt to restore the original intent of the Japanese translation, since there's quite a bit of stuff that was censored when it was localized. To quote the patch readme, the goal was to make the SNES version uncut and to clean up the script, but keep the nuance used by Woolsey in the original game's release, unquote, as well as uncensor the graphics, restore character class names, and rename monsters and items. There's a few bug fixes here as well, but no major balance changes or anything like that. Again, if Final Fantasy VI is one of your favorites, but you haven't played it with this patch, you owe it to yourself to try it out. Now here's a really interesting one for Super Mario All-Stars, and it just goes to show how detail-oriented certain ROM hackers are. It's specifically for Super Mario Bros. and the Lost Levels, and it has to do with how Mario rebounds after smashing a brick, and how it's not quite faithful to the original versions, since Mario somehow keeps going up even after smashing the brick. This patch fixes that, and not only are the physics corrected here, but the missing thump noise that's in the original game is brought back as well. Shout out to BMF54123 for making this one. It's a great demonstration of how no stone goes unturned when it comes to fixing, adjusting, and improving these old games. Here's a more simple, straightforward patch for the game's Seventh Saga, courtesy of Shatai. For some reason, when Seventh Saga was localized in North America, they decided to make the game really, really hard and totally unforgiving. The original Japanese version of the game is much more approachable and player-friendly, so this hack essentially just reverts the difficulty balancing back to how it originally was, and the game is a much better experience as a result, especially since once you meet your rival, whoever that may be, you actually have a chance in hell of defeating them, since this patch allows for proper balance. Thing. Seventh Saga is a pretty good game, and if you gave up on it because of the difficulty, try it out with this patch, you might change your mind. Here's an improvement patch for a lesser known title, Rockman and Forte. The Super Famicom edition never left Japan, but it was eventually ported to the Game Boy Advance where it was renamed Mega Man and Base. This game has generated a lot of mixed opinions, but this patch for the Super Famicom version allows you to switch between Rockman and Forte at will. Just press the select button, and that really goes a long way making this one a lot more fun to play. It's not perfect, there's some glitches here and there, and some balancing issues, but it's one of those things where it feels like this is how the game should have been structured all along. Thanks to Purasabi for this one. Here's a really fun one I found for F-Zero titled Eternal Boost made by Ninja Kira. And Eternal Boost is just that. Instead of having a regular accelerator, you just have a boost that never ever stops. Sure, winning races is pretty easy, but the further you get into the game and the tougher the course is, just merely surviving is the real challenge here. The health system has also been modified a bit to accommodate this so you don't freaking explode every time you hit a wall or whatever. So yeah, if you've played F-Zero to death and you still have all the tracks memorized, this is a fun one that's a fair challenge. Here's one I know lots of people have been clamoring for years. It's for Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island, and yep, you guessed it, it's a patch that turns off the crying baby sound. In fact, Mario doesn't cry at all. This patch fixes it so he just kinda floats around all chill. There's a few other minor alterations here as well, like changing the pitch of the alarm sound so it's a little less grating. But yeah, if you love Yoshi's Island but can't stand the sound of that crying baby, then this patch is for you. Finally, here's a mod that's not necessarily for a game, but for an emulator. A fellow by the name of Derkun has put together a mod for the BSNES emulator that performs Mode 7 transformations at up to four times the horizontal and vertical resolution. In other words, it's like HD Mode 7, and it's pretty dang cool. It's still in the beta stages, and it doesn't work with every game that utilizes Mo7, but it does work with Super Mario Kart, Pilot Wings, F-Zero, Contra 3, Hyper Zone, and many, many others. It is really cool to see stuff like this being made, especially for games like Pilot Wings, which are kinda sorta outdated, but with HD Mode 7, this truly breathes new life into it. Alright, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Mm, that's drunk. 
Hello, let's take a look at some more improvement patches for some Super Nintendo games, or quality of life patches as they're sometimes referred to. Now, improvement patches just tweak things here and there, no major overhauls, just fixes that keep the game itself largely the same. For example, in previous videos, I've talked about the SA1 patch that you can use for both Gradius 3 and Contra 3, and it eliminates pretty much all the slowdown in each game. It doesn't even need to be that significant. For example, in Part 2, I talked about a patch that fixed how Mario rebounded from breaking blocks in Super Mario All-Star. To get these to work, follow the corresponding link for each patch in the video description, download the file, and use a utility program like Beat or Lunar IPS to join together the patch file with the game ROM. If you need help troubleshooting, there's people on the ROM hacking forums that can help you out. First, I want to talk about MSU1 patches. I've talked about these before in a previous video, but I'll mention them again real quickly. MSU1 files enable you to replace the original SNES soundtrack with CD quality sound, so you can do stuff like this. You can play everything from Chrono Trigger, Killer Instinct, Link to the Past, Final Fantasy VI, all sorts of different games, and have them set to high quality arrangements. This patching method works with emulators like SNES 9X, BSNES, Hygen, as well as the SD2 SNES flash cartridge, and the Super NT supports it as well, just enable the EXT sound option. Now, just my opinion, I'm not that crazy about this stuff because it just sounds too out of place, especially when paired with the original SNES sound effects, but still, it's a really cool feature, plus you can even include full motion video in there as well. Check this out. Link! We are done for the day. Let's head home. All right, Uncle. Yeah, it's pretty amazing stuff that you can pull off. Credit to Bue for the MSU1 patch, and credit to the guys at Zeldix for the full motion video footage. Just the right color and shine. Here's one I really wish existed back in the day, it's for Link to the Past, and all this patch does is map the L and R buttons to allow you to switch weapons without having to press start every time. This always drove me nuts about this game. I mean, the L and R buttons aren't even used, and this seemed like a really obvious thing to implement. I will say, once you collect a lot of items, it can be a pain to find what you're looking for, but in the first half of the game, it's a really nice feature to have that saves a bit of aggravation. Credit Kazuto for their work on this one. Here's another quality of life patch that I really found useful for Zombies Ate My Neighbors. All it does is allow you to cycle through your items both from left to right and right to left. Just hold down the L button while scrolling. This is really nice to have because Zombies Ate My Neighbors is obviously one of those games where you have to react quickly to all sorts of chaos happening around you, so having those extra split seconds really pay off. This is one of those features that were already made available in ROM hacks like Oh No More Zombies Ate My Neighbors and Brutal Zombies Ate My Neighbors, so it's nice that it's available on the Vanilla Edition. It should be noted that this patch will work with the popular Bloody Disgusting edition of the game as well. Credit goes to Stanley Decker and Sloat for their work here. Killer Instinct also has a useful patch available. It allows the final boss idol to be a playable character right at the character select screen without having to put in a code. Normally to unlock idol, you had to go to the versus menu and select Cinder. Then on the screen before the fight, you hold right and press L, R, X, B, Y, and A. Kind of annoying. But with this patch, you don't have to do any of that, and idol is really fun to play as since he's ridiculously quick and strong as hell. I mean, of course he is. He's a freaking demon, two-headed cyclops monster thing with a huge weapon. The guy is ridiculously overpowered. Thanks to Justin3009 for their work on this one. Lufia and the Fortress of Doom has a restoration patch that's a must-have if you want to play through this game today. As most of you know, Lufia 2 is actually a prequel, but if you play that game before the first Lufia, there's a few continuity issues that come up here and there, and this patch fixes those problems. There's also tons of additional touches here that make this game a much better experience, like fully restored item names and descriptions, translation fixes, being able to walk much faster on the world map to avoid random battles, as well as everything carried over from the Decensored patch, like having alcohol served at bars instead of cider. The first Lufia game is still a bit rough around the edges, but this patch helps polish it up a bit. Thanks to D and Vivify93 for their work here. 
Since we talked Lufia 1, we might as well go over Lufia 2 as well, and the Fru Lufia patch. This one provides a full script update that removes any censorship, in addition to some minor rebalancing when it comes to a couple items, IP attacks, and a couple elemental changes to enemies. It also fixes all sorts of glitches from the original game, everything from backgrounds to equipment menu wonkiness, to the weird submarine shrine glitch that completely screwed up the map. All of that stuff is fixed, and credit to Artemis and Relinquished for their work on this one. Sticking with RPGs, Final Fantasy VI has a ton, and I mean a ton of patches, that fix or change various things, and there's a couple I liked in particular that I wanted to point out. One is the learnable Rage patch that changes the way Gao learns rages. You don't have to go to the Velt and do the jump thing and hope he comes back and all that. Gao can now learn any available rage anywhere. It's not much, but I thought it was pretty nice not having to bother with the usual process. Another patch I linked is referred to as the Sword Tech Ready Stance, referring to Cyan's Sword Tech Charge. Normally when you use this, you're stuck sitting there waiting for the charge to hit the ability you want, but with this patch, you can put the charge in the background, so to speak, and manage your party and select stuff for other characters while the charge is still going on. Again, this is just a user-friendly patch that makes better use of the player's time. Thanks to Hatsen08 for both of these, and I should mention that you can use both of these patches on the same ROM if you'd like. Here's one for one of my favorite games, Super Ghouls and Ghosts. It's called Super Arthur. Now, in part one of this series, I talked about the restoration patch for this game that eliminated a whole bunch of slowdown from this game, which really helped make it more playable for a lot of people, but I still got some comments saying, yeah, that doesn't really help. Super Ghouls and Ghosts is still ridiculously difficult. Well, with the Super Arthur patch, you can pair it with the restoration patch, and you'll find the difficulty a lot more forgiving. Now when you get hit, you go back to your previous armor, so if you're wearing gold, you go back to the green armor. Green goes back to silver, and so on. You also get to keep each weapon you find, and you can select between them using the L and R buttons. That's pretty cool. Your shield is also able to withstand a bit more damage, and it doesn't break right away. So yeah, if you find Super Ghouls and Ghosts too difficult, try it with both the Restoration Patch and the Super Arthur Patch. It's well worth it. Thanks to Lufia and SCD, respectively, for their work on those patches. Another favorite of mine that's received some good improvement patches is Super Castlevania 4. First, there's a patch that restores all the stuff that was censored in the western localization, like all the crosses in the background, blood instead of green slime in level 8, even updating the font. You can combine this patch with a really useful patch titled Don't Move. This allows you to use any unused or unmapped button to hold Simon Belmont still, so when you hold a direction down on the D-pad, he'll actually stay still instead of inching forward or backward while whipping. Yeah, I know Simon is already overpowered as hell, especially when compared to previous Castlevania games, but still, this is one of those common sense patches that feels like it always should have been there from the get-go. Credit Shadow1333 and Rain Poncho respectively for these two patches. Here's one of the very best patches out there, not specifically for Super Double Dragon, but for the Super Famicom version of the game, Return of Double Dragon. It's a collection of hacks made by Kensho, and combined, they really make the gameplay a lot smoother. Billy and Jimmy's attacks are now two frames faster, the dragon power meter charges a bit faster, you block by holding the R button, and you can hold the button down to block instead of it being a matter of timing, and it really can't be overstated how much more smoothly the game plays with these improvements. It was definitely evident that the initial release of this game was rushed, and the gameplay suffered a bit because of it, and this patch cleans up a lot of the issues, and it's easily the best way to play Super Double Dragon today, or in this case, Return of Double Dragon. Finally, I want to end this video by mentioning the HD Mode 7 again, available on the BSNES emulator, only because I wanted to mention a specific game that not that many people know about. Yes, this mode works great for everything from Pilot Wings, F-Zero, Super Mario Kart, and Contra 3, and even Super Castlevania 4 and Secret of Mana, but there's one puzzle game out there called On the Ball, where you rotate the screen using the D-pad to get a ball to fall through a maze. As is, just playing on a regular old Super Nintendo, the game is okay, if not a bit disorienting. I can't help but get a little dizzy playing this, but if you're able to play this while utilizing HD Mode 7, the game is way more player-friendly because you're able to see that much more of the maze, so you can relax your eyes a bit. It's a good example of a game where this enhancement took it from just okay to worth checking out. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.
Hmm. That's drunk. Hello and welcome to part 4 of this series where I take a look at fan-made improvement patches for Super Nintendo games. To give you an example of what an improvement patch is, in previous videos I've already covered patches ranging from Vitor Villela's SA1 fixes, which add processing power so to speak, and help remove the slowdown in games like Gradius 3, Contra 3, and Super Castlevania 4. There's also patches that give you more playable characters, like playing as Idol in Killer Instinct, and there's also simple quality of life stuff, like a patch that enables you to use the L and R buttons to scroll through all your weapons and link to the past, to use one example. To get these to work, follow the link for each patch in the video description, download the file, and use a utility program like Beat or Lunar IPS to join together the patch file with the game ROM. If you need help troubleshooting, there's people on the ROM hacking forums that can help you out. And hey look, I've got a convenient excuse to talk about my favorite game of all time, Chrono Trigger. Here we've got a patch that restores a huge amount of censored content from the original Japanese game made by Chrono Split. It cleans up the script a bit by combining it with the translation that the DS port received, and this isn't one of those pedantic accuracy for accuracy's sake type fixes. It still maintains the charm and personal touch of the original script, while also fixing the names of a lot of weapons, items, and gear. And there's the usual religious connotations that always got censored in the West, those are brought back as well. In addition to that, there's plenty of bug fixes here too. Not that there were that many in Chrono Trigger to begin with, but this patch does fix some issues with targeting AI. If you're jonesing for another Chrono Trigger playthrough, you do well to do so with this patch. And of course, when you talk Chrono Trigger, then you also gotta talk Final Fantasy VI, and this game has a ton of improvement patches, and most of them can be stacked in a way so you can take advantage of several at once. Here's one that makes an adjustment to the Colosseum called True Duel. Normally, this is a simulated fight between two opponents. Your character's commands are randomly chosen by the game, and that can be frustrating because the Colosseum is a great way to get some rare stuff. But this patch allows you to take control of your character, with the exception of Umaro. Well, nobody uses Umaro anyway, so who cares? But still, this is a useful patch that can help get some otherwise hard-to-get weapons, armor, and items. There's also a lot of much simpler quality of life patches for Final Fantasy VI. One I really found useful was one that condenses your spell list. It's a major pain to have to scroll through all sorts of empty space to find one spell, and this patch simply fixes that. But yeah, there's all sorts of patches that can be stacked onto the same ROM. Everything from randomizing the battle music, to always being able to sprint on the world map. And there's over 200 now on romhacking.net alone, so check them out. In the past, I talked about improvement patches for Link to the Past that add quality of life mechanics to the game. I mentioned earlier about being able to scroll through your weapons with the shoulder buttons instead of bringing up the menu every freaking time. But now, there's a patch called Link to the Past Redux, and it adds all sorts of different stuff that saves the player time and aggravation. There's the aforementioned menu workaround, plus you can collect up to 99 bombs and arrows, and you can change direction while dashing, which is really a lot of fun. I love zooming around Hyrule like this. I just imagine Link screaming at the top of his lungs as he runs around out of control. The menu also has been cleaned up and reorganized a bit, and there's quite a bit of minor touches that have also been fixed to reflect the rest of the Zelda series. Everything from changing the flute's name to an ocarina, to the color of Link's hair. This is a really fun way to play Link to the Past nowadays, so if you're a person that likes to crank through this game every so often, you should try it with this patch. Of course, no patch or hacking video is complete without Super Metroid, and not only is there a Link to the Past Redux patch, there's also one for Super Metroid, made by the same person, Shadow1333. Again, this one combines a lot of quality of life stuff from other patches, and includes all sorts of other convenient stuff. For instance, you can hold down a shoulder button to use your secondary weapon while firing, instead of having to switch and switch back manually. Also, the map has been improved so it shows what weapon you need for certain doors. Blue doors are already opened, but green doors require require a super missile, yellow doors need a super bomb, and so on. I really liked this touch. There's all sorts of little things here that help speed up the game too, like faster elevator sequences, faster transitions between rooms, that sort of thing. Again, just like the Link to the Past patch, if you're looking to replay Super Metroid anytime soon, I'd recommend doing so with this patch. It's a lot of fun. Here's another one for Super Metroid that keeps the game largely the same, only it's 16.9 widescreen. I should mention that this patch isn't finished and is still pretty buggy, but enough work has been done on it so far that you can see enemies ahead of and behind you as the game is scrolling, and it's just really freaking cool to see. What's a really nice bonus about this patch is that it can also be applied to ROM hacks like Hyper Metroid and Super Metroid Redesign, and the ASM files for those two in particular are included in the zip file that I've linked in the description below. Yeah, this one may not be finished, 
yet, but it's still really cool to see the kind of work folks are willing to do to make this kind of stuff possible. Secret of Mana also has a bunch of improvement patches, but none that are more comprehensive than Secret of Mana Turbo. The main thing this does is remove the stamina meter so you don't have to wait around between each attack. That might be the number one thing I hear people complain about when it comes to this game, so hey, you folks out there that hate that stamina meter, now you've got no more excuses. Try playing Secret of Mana with this patch. But yeah, this patch not only includes that major aspect, but it also rebalances the game a bit when it comes to enemy damage, experience points, and the amount of gold you earn when defeating enemies. Plus, there's seriously just a ton of other improvements, like being able to hold the A button to pause your charge when waiting to level up your attack. You can actually attack diagonally instead of in just four directions. And even if you're already a big fan of Secret of Mana, this one is well worth checking out. Even games like Seiken Densetsu 3, otherwise known as Trials of Mana, that has an extensive patch that rebalances the game as well, called Sin of Mana. Each class, stat, and spell has been adjusted accordingly, so nothing's too overpowered, but it's still effective throughout the game. There's been changes made to certain bosses in how they attack and react. The number for certain items was increased from 9 all the way to 20, and there's 5 different difficulty settings to choose from. It's pretty dang cool to play this one on a harder difficulty, because it makes you approach battles a little differently instead of just mowing right through them. I will say the Sin of Mana patch plays much differently than the original, but again, if you've cranked through this game before and want a different take on it, you're not going to do much better than this patch. Sometimes an improvement patch can be as simple as an updated translation, and that's what the War of the Goddess patch provides for the original Breath of Fire. I've always really dug this game, but I hated how bad the translation was. Everything from the dialogue to the item and spell names, it was a mess. Thankfully, this patch updates everything big time, so you can, you know, actually understand what people are saying and what items do what and all that. In addition to that, this patch also lets you hold the B button to run, which makes this game much less grindy. If you're gonna play the original Breath of Fire nowadays, you gotta do it with this patch. It's a massive upgrade and makes the game a lot more fun. I love to see the work people put into games that are not nearly as popular as the usual stuff, so it's really cool to see a game like Arcana get such an extensive patch, this one being called Seal of Rimsala. Arcana is a 16-bit dungeon crawler, so in other words, it's really, really slow. This patch speeds the game way up though, cleans up the translation big time, and fixes a couple of the mazes so you don't have to backtrack as often. Fixes like these allow the game's strengths to really shine through, like the great soundtrack, and just the fact that it's actually a pretty dang good game for a 16-bit dungeon crawler. If you're interested in playing Arcana, don't play it without this patch. I'd go as far to say it's essential if you're gonna play this game today. Here's another very comprehensive patch for a game that should be getting more love these days. It's called the Intuitive Ranch Master Patch for the original Harvest Moon. Anyone that's played Harvest Moon knows that game has some certain annoying flaws, like how you could softlock the game if you tried to sell an animal at the same time you tried to buy one, or the game penalizing you for shipping more than exactly 511 of any crop. This patch fixes all that stuff, and adds a lot more too, like actually being able to buy more than one bag of seeds at once, and not being required to rewater stuff if the soil is already wet. Seriously, the list of bug fixes and improvements in this patch is like a mile long. And just like Arcana, if you're going to play this game today, it's essential that you play it with this patch. Continuing with more obscure stuff, I'll finish up this video with two more Super Famicom games, the first being Makarov Scrambled Valkyrie, with the patch being called Overtech Edition. This one has your controller set up so you can transform into your mech form using the R button, and back to your regular ship as the L button. See, sometimes stuff like that is just so simple, it makes a difficult game like this that much more palatable. But this patch doesn't stop there, it also adds a new difficulty level for casual players, where you have more health, and it takes two hits to deplete your weapon power instead of just one. Yeah, I know, here's where all the shoot 'em up professionals roll their eyes, but hey, anything that makes a great game like this more approachable for folks who aren't great at this genre, and I'm one of them, I welcome any and all patches like this. If nothing else, it's a good practice mode that allows you to get better at this game. Finally, Clock Tower has a patch simply called Clock Tower Deluxe. And yep, this is another patch where if you're gonna play this game today, you gotta play it with this patch because it fixes a lot of bugs, adds mouse support for the SNES mouse, and allows you to actually run up the frickin' stairs. Sheesh, that drove me nuts when I first played this. This patch even adds stuff from the PlayStation version of this game, which is very unexpected and really cool. This is a genuinely creepy and weird game that I get a big kick out of, especially since there wasn't a whole lot of 16-bit horror stuff, so this is another patch that comes highly recommended. 
Whew, okay, all right, that's all for now. And I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hi, welcome to part 5 of this series that looks at fan-made improvement patches for Super Nintendo games. If you're unfamiliar, here's one great example of what an improvement patch is. This guy named Vidor Villela made a patch that utilized the Super Nintendo's cartridge-native SA1 processor fix, which removed a ton of slowdown from games like Gradius 3, Contra 3, and Super Castlevania 4. There are also lots of patches that give the player some simple quality-of-life improvements, like stuff that simplifies the list of spells in Final Fantasy VI, or maybe something that simply allows you to use the L and R buttons to scroll through items in Link to the Past, and instead of pulling up the start menu every time. To get these to work, follow the link for each patch in the video description, download the file, and use a utility program like Beat or Lunar IPS to join together the patch file with the game ROM. If you need help troubleshooting, there's people on the ROM hacking forums that can help you out. Now, here's a patch that people have been clamoring for for a long, long time. It allows you to play Jurassic Park for Super Nintendo, and you can save your game! Imagine that! This has long been this particular game's biggest flaw. It's a perfectly good adventure-style action game, but there's no save battery. There's not even a frickin' password system. Well, no more. Now you can save your way proper like you would any other game of the time by going someplace, getting killed by dinosaurs, rebooting your save, and getting killed by dinosaurs again. It's what everybody's always wanted. The creator of this patch, Yoshi Fanatic, provides some interesting insight as to why Jurassic Park never had a save feature in the first place. For whatever reason, this game keeps track of the state of every single sprite in the overworld all at once, so as a result, the save files were just too large to store on SRAM because it was keeping track of too much information. Well, we don't have to worry about that anymore thanks to this patch. And if you're not satisfied with just the vanilla Jurassic Park, guess what? There's a Jurassic Park randomizer. Wait, what? That's right, this patch shuffles around everything from your starting position to color palettes to the order you need to complete missions, which door leads to which building, different ID cards for different doors, and it also works with the Jurassic Park save patch I just talked about. It's pretty dang cool, but bear in mind, it can be a bit tricky to get this one to work. You edit an ASM file in Notepad, then you join the randomizer files with the ROM using a utility patch called ASAR, and even once you do that, you're stuck with just the one randomized version of the game. To get a different one, you'd have to do that whole process again, which can be a pain. But still, it's always nice to see new randomizers out there, and this game lends itself really well to the format. Both this and the save patch were made by Yoshi Fanatic, so kudos to them. I'll take any and every excuse to talk about Chrono Trigger, especially improvement patches. This one is called Enhanza Edition, made by Inuksuk, I guess is how you pronounce that. It's another rebalancing hack, but this one features over 80 enemy AI scripts that were rewritten, mostly to make enemies a little smarter and more aggressive. It makes the game more difficult than the original, but it's certainly not strictly a difficulty hack where the only goal is to make the game super hard. The main point here is that you can't just mindlessly mash the fight button in most battles. Yeah actually have to, you know, pay attention and try. In addition to that, all sorts of items and equipment were redesigned and some techs were modified, and it's all geared towards making battles more interesting, so you have to be more prepared with the right equipment, the right weapons, and the right party members for each section of the game, especially for each boss fight. This one is pretty cool, albeit it makes the game a little more time consuming to get through, but hey, that just means you spend more time playing Chrono Trigger. Final Fantasy VI is constantly getting tinkered with, and here's another one called Rose, which stands for Revised Old Style Edition. This one is expansive to the point that nearly every little thing has been adjusted to a certain extent, and it's an impressive balancing act between updating the game while maintaining the feel and pacing of the original content. There's also lots of quality of life features that have been added, like the ability to do a soft reset to your save file by pressing Start, Select, L, and R at the same time in the overworld or in battle. Also, the text has been reformatted to reflect 
reflect the style of later Final Fantasy games, and the names for enemies and items have been extended to up to 16 characters. It also stacks most of the bug fix patches that are out there as well, including the uncensored patch. All in all, this is another one that's just a massive team effort of nearly three dozen people, and if you're looking for a reason to visit the original Final Fantasy VI nowadays, this is an excellent way to do it. Here's a patch for Shadowrun that people have been clamoring for for years. All this patch does is simply add mouse support. That's it. Shadowrun is a unique game that has some great qualities, especially with the story and how it's told, but the combat has always been a bit suspect. It's rarely ideal to have to use a D-pad to move a small cursor around, especially when you're dealing with such small targets. But thankfully with the mouse support patch, you can either use the SNES mouse, which is uh, one way to do it, I guess, or you can use the optical mouse from Hyperkin, which makes life much easier. Or you can just play it on an emulator on your PC if you'd like. Bear in mind, the mouse has to be plugged into the second controller port, because you do still need some controller functionality here. You pretty much just use the first player controller with your left hand to hold down the L button when you need to get to your character's status screen. It works great, and whichever way you do it, this patch makes Shadowrun a much more player-friendly game. Thanks to Rain Warrior for this patch. Star Fox has a couple really good improvement patches as well, and seriously, if you only pick out one patch to try from this video, make sure it's this hack made by Sunlit Space 542. It's utilized to make use of fast ROM and an overclocked Super FX chip, so in other words, the game is sped up big time, and it's so much fun to play. There's also some cosmetic changes here, like using the display arrangement of Star Fox 64 and the character portraits from Star Fox 2, but the big appeal here is to just burn through this game as quickly quickly as possible thanks to all the performance improvements. I know a lot of people think Star Fox has aged poorly, and in a lot of ways it definitely has, but you'll forget about all of that if you play the game with this patch. Here's an interesting one for Final Fantasy V, and it's based on the Ancient Cave from Lufia II, which, if you remember, is a series of randomly generated dungeons where you start out at level 1 and work your way through as many dungeons as you can. This is a similar deal except with Final Fantasy V, and it works pretty well. However, the game itself can be kinda tricky to get to work. You have to patch the Japanese ROM, then apply the RPG-E English patch, then change the name of the SRAM file that comes with the patch to the same file name as your hacked wrong. You'll know it works properly if you see four save files when you start up the game, and each of them lead to the ancient cave, which you access by getting a random battle prompt on this square of desert here. Once you get to this room, you can talk, so to speak, to each of the items in the room, and they act as a menu so you can see all your stats, automatically organize your items, and adjust the difficulty. Then you head to the right and begin, and man oh man, this one is really hard. You've got a 10 minute timer on every floor, and like I said, the enemies and items you find are randomly generated, so yeah, this patch isn't for everyone since it can get brutally difficult right away, but it's still a fun one to explore. Thanks to Inu for developing this one. Here's one I like for Final Fight 2. It's a readjustment patch made by a game hack fan with the biggest change allowing five enemies on screen at once instead of just three. This makes a huge difference in streamlining the game for a better experience since enemies can spawn a lot faster. This patch also allows you and a second player to select the same character if you'd like. And this game really gets crazy when you've got two players and five enemies on the screen at once. And yes, this does work on original hardware with a flash cartridge. Whoa, I'm seeing double! Four Hagars! I wanted to show off Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 Deluxe, a patch made by Lucas Dexter, only Dexter is spelled with a 5 somehow. Anyway, this is one of those arcade ports that had a bunch of stuff stripped away to make room for the game to function on a Super Nintendo cartridge, and this patch restores a lot of the stuff that's missing. For instance, Shiva is a playable character, smoke can be selected on the character screen, Animalities are restored, certain arenas are unlocked and added like Goro's Lair and the Graveyard, and there's a 3 on 3 mode. It goes a long way to making this one look and play like the arcade original, which is pretty cool. Finally, over the years, there have been patches made to improve great games like Super Metroid, Link to the Past, Star Fox, and now finally, here's a patch for, uh, Dennis the Menace. 
Yes, that's right. It's made by Billy Time Games, and this is a rebalancing patch that curbs the absurd difficulty this game has, like resetting the timer after you die, giving bosses fewer invincibility frames, and just making collecting weapon upgrades and items, uh, you know, actually worth it. Seriously, this game is terrible. It's laughably difficult to the point of being unfair, and it's just not good enough to make the frustration worth it. And yeah, even with this patch, you're still playing friggin' Dennis the Menace. But at least the game is a bit normalized, so to speak, instead of comically unbalanced. I just wanted to show this one off so you could see that even games like Dennis the Menace are getting improvement patches. Alright, that's all I got for today. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day! Hello, here is part 6 of this series that goes over some fan-made improvement patches for Super Nintendo games. To give an example of what an improvement patch actually is, there's a bunch out there that help fix the notorious slowdown that was so prevalent in early Super Nintendo games, and that covers everything from Super Ghouls and Ghosts to Super R-Type to Star Fox. There's also simple quality of life improvement patches, like in the last video I mentioned a patch that actually allows you to save your game in Jurassic Park. Imagine that! I mean, some people even make patches for some Something as simple as changing the colors of the buttons on a Super Nintendo controller in a Star Fox menu screen. Alright, that's cool I guess. To get these to work, follow the link for each patch in the video description, download the file, and use a utility program to join together the patch file with the game ROM. Each patch comes with a readme that should help guide you to make sure that they work correctly. I gotta start with one of the coolest stories involving retro gaming in the last while. A couple months ago, Unlisted Cheats on Twitter somehow uncovered a way to unlock a two-player mode in Super Punch-Out. Yes, that's right, one player can play as anime Jim McMahon here, while player two can pick from any of the fighters on the Super Circuit. It is really cool. The way to access this is through a series of button inputs on the second player controller, but now there's a patch that simplifies things a bit, where all you gotta do on the second controller is just hold start, and then press start on the first controller, and you do the same thing again once you reach the opponent info screen. It's seriously a blast to try out each character, and to actually be on the other side of a punch-out game. It's also comical how absurdly overpowered some of these guys are. Just two hits, and anime Jim McMahon is out like a light. This one is definitely worth checking out if you haven't already, especially if you're into Super Punch-Out. Thanks to Doc Rowe for putting this one together. Next we got Chrono Trigger Plus, made by The Great Ben and Mauron. And no, sadly the title Chrono Trigger Plus is not actually a streaming service. Instead it's a patch that adds a ton of cut content back into the game, and allows you to explore areas that were previously not able to be accessed, like you can wander around in 1999 and look for Savage Garden or something. Yeah, there's not a whole lot to do here, but as someone that's put in a gazillion hours into this game, it's a fun novelty at least. There's also a few balance tweaks here, and there's other stuff like how certain triple techs no longer require an accessory, so you can keep that slot open for something else. And plus Marley and Luca's physical attacks are buffed a little bit, so they're not completely useless if they run out of MP. Just real simple stuff like that, nothing too major. I like this hack because it almost feels like having a no clipping mode where you can go almost anywhere, kind of like ID clip and Doom. So yeah, if you're a fan of Chrono Trigger like I am, you'll enjoy this one. Of course, there's always tons of Final Fantasy patches to sort through. This one is for Final Fantasy IV, titled Free Enterprise, and it opens up the entire Final Fantasy IV universe all at once. You start with an airship, and you can complete any number of quests in any order. This is also a randomizer patch, where you can upload a ROM to the site I have listed in the video description, and it allows items, characters, and shops, among other things, to be put in random spots, with the ability to customize all sorts of different things, like if you want to turn off random encounters entirely, or if you want to start the game with a specific party, or if you just want to be a crazy person and have every treasure chest be empty and have shops sell nothing but cabins. If you're one of those folks that's put in a gazillion hours into Final Fantasy IV in any carnation, then you're really gonna enjoy this one. It's a huge ongoing community effort that even has its own wiki, so check it out. 
Final Fantasy V now has a patch that was just created a few weeks ago thanks to a huge team effort of about 15 people, and it's titled Final Fantasy V Tweaks. It combines the most recent iteration of the English translation, along with the ability to sprint on the world map, there's some better equipment for certain jobs to make them a little more useful, and there's fixes like learning blue magic without actually having to equip the learn ability. This is really just a huge compilation of tiny tweaks and fixes, like to the menu and item names. The readme file lists a gigantic list of stuff that goes into this patch, and as far as I can tell, it's all sensibly done and doesn't take away from the core gameplay experience whatsoever. This is one of those patches where, if you want to play Final Fantasy V today, you should do so with this patch. Here's two patches for Mega Man X. One is called Mega Man X Hard Type, and one is Mega Man X Soft Type. Both are kind of self-explanatory. Hard Type redesigns the levels and rebalances things a bit, so enemies take more hit points, even with boss weapons. But if you're not into that, there's also Soft Type, which despite the name, is a bit of a in-between difficulty between Vanilla and Hard Type. Either way you play this one with both patches, the enemy AI has been adjusted, both for regular enemies and for bosses. Ammo for boss weapons has been reduced a bit, so you have to be smarter about when to use it, and enemies have had their HP rebalanced as well. I'm one of those weirdos that's played Mega Man X about a million times, so playing with a patch that scales the difficulty like this is pretty cool, and it makes you approach the game a different way, so I really appreciate patches like this. This is an interesting one for the death and return of Superman. We're used to seeing patches that increase difficulty, patches that were made for players that have put thousands of hours into certain games and wanted more of a challenge. Well, this person named Nintenja decided to go in the opposite direction. This patch is called Resurrection, and it gives Superman infinite lives, invulnerability, and an unlimited number of special moves. In other words, it's a more quote-unquote realistic depiction of Superman kicking the crap out of these flunkies instead of actually taking damage from them. I mean, come on, he's Superman. How would any of these nobodies even land a single punch? This patch lets you do typical Superman stuff instead of worrying about health and enemies surrounding you and not being able to do a special move. Here you just crush everything that moves without breaking a sweat like you're using a Game Genie code. Yeah, some people might find this one kind of boring, but I appreciate seeing something a bit different like this. Even games like The Adventures of Kid Cleats, also known as Soccer Kid, games like that are getting improvement patches too. I made a video about this game back in August of 2022, and I pointed out that the camera was a bit of a problem. It's just way too shifty to the point that it can make some people nauseous, and at the very least it's just plain annoying. Well, fast forward a few days, and boom, someone named Maxwell Olinda managed to create a patch that actually fixes the camera issues, centering your character and not having your viewpoint bounce from side to side when you change direction. And what do you know, it makes the game much more palatable. I mean, you're still playing the adventures of Kid Cleats, but still, it's nice to see that sometimes certain annoying flaws can be easily fixed, and it allows you to look at a game differently, so I appreciate that. One of the better turn-based RPGs that never left Japan is a game called G.O.D. Growth or De-Evolution. It's a strange story that's well told, and it includes real-life locations and real historical figures who help the main character fight some aliens. I swear this game will get its own video someday, but in the meantime I do want to mention an easy mode patch made by M-Team, and it works with the English translation patch as well. Easy mode cuts down on grinding, so you're not getting into a random battle every two seconds, and it also doubles the experience and gold that enemies drop just to streamline the whole experience so you can get to more of the story without having to slog through the same battles over and over again. Some of these JRPGs can be a bit of a serious ask considering how long they are, and the grind in a lot of these games can push some people away, but with easy mode, however, you got no excuse. You gotta check out Growth or De-Evolution, and uh, that includes myself since I'm only a couple hours into it, but so far so good. It's a good time. Finally, there's the Goemon series. One really cool thing about these games is that they usually feature another entire game within itself, like how the first game enables you to play Gradius at the fair. In the fourth game, Ganbari Goemon 4, which never left Japan, there's a version of Time Pilot you can play. It's an old arcade game from 1982, and it's a pretty simple multi-directional shooter. But in Ganbari Goemon 4, you have to complete the game 100% to unlock it. No more, since there's now a patch that makes Time Pilot a standard standalone game. The game itself really isn't anything that special, it's still just a bare-bones Super Nintendo version of an arcade game, but it's pretty dang cool how a standalone game was buried in an unlocalized title from 25 years ago, and it's now finally been unearthed to play on its own.
Alright, that's all I got for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Drunk. Alien 3 is a polarizing movie. It certainly looks cool, it appropriately sets a creepy mood and creates a really cool atmosphere, and it features both Charles S. Dutton, otherwise known as the groundskeeper in Rudy, as well as Charles Dance, who was the bad guy in Last Action Hero. Man, it's like they were collecting badass dudes named Charles. I think the movie would have been better had they made room for Charles Mingus or Charles Nelson Riley. But the film was a complete mess behind the scenes. The script was rewritten several times by about a dozen different people, they switched directors in the middle of production, and as a result, the story is flimsy and the movie is all over the place, and it's nowhere near as good as the two previous Alien movies. Gotta believe Charles Nelson Reilly's presence would have fixed all that. Alien 3, the game for Super Nintendo, however, well, this is the rare case where the game is actually better than the movie. You play as Ripley in a 2D side-scrolling action platformer trying to get through six levels on one life with a password system. And to do this, you use an assortment of weapons like a flamethrower, a pulse rifle, and grenades, complete with a handy dandy motion tracker that allows you to see when enemies are nearby. What's cool here is that rather than flipping between each weapon, instead each face button is assigned to one. Y is your flamethrower, X is your grenade launcher, and A is your machine gun. In each level you find a computer terminal and it gives you a list of missions to complete and you pick to complete them in any order you'd like. The missions have you rescuing prisoners, repairing power grids, sealing off doors to prevent more aliens from coming in, destroying alien eggs, fixing up busted computers, and of course, boss fights. Yeah, it's kinda lousy that you only get one life, but come on, it's Ripley. She can take a ton of damage, and there's plenty of health replenishments throughout the game. Okay, before I go any further, some of you may have noticed on the box art that's used for the thumbnail here that there's an ominous logo on the right side. Yes, that's right, this game is published by LJN. But you know what else was? True Lies, and that game kicks everything's ass. It's super fun. Alien 3 isn't quite at that level, but this game isn't exactly fit to be angry video game nerd material like the NES game was. For one thing, this game is structured to be very player friendly. Each computer terminal allows you to see a blueprint of that particular level, and it points out where you need to go and how to to get there. You can both let the game show you where to go, and look around the blueprint yourself. It's really nice. It's rare when a game back then gave you this much freedom to choose not only what order you want to complete each mission, but what route to take to complete them, either the quicker route with more enemies, or the longer, more stealth route. And the gameplay is solid, typical run-and-gun shoot-everything-that-moves kind of stuff. All of the different weapons you get are fun, especially the flamethrower, but there's limited ammo which can be kind of a pain to manage, so you can't just go balls to the wall and hold down the fire button like you would in Contra. The main problem with the gameplay is the jump. Ugh. It's one of those floaty jumps where you just kind of hang in the air for a bit, it's not all that responsive, and it's just slow. It doesn't match the speed of anything else going around you. This game doesn't have that much platforming, so it's not a huge deal, but still, it's definitely annoying. Also, to duck and fire, you just tap down on the D-pad instead of holding it down. That's one of those things you just gotta get used to. Another flaw I have to point out is that this game is long, and that's because of the level design. Not only can it take forever to reach certain areas, but it's easy to get lost, even with the map, and that's because everything looks the same. So as a result of that, this game can feel like a bit of a slog at times. It's a bit tiresome to see the same three or four backgrounds over and over in every level. The good thing is, though, Alien 3 takes advantage of the best thing the movie had going for it, and that's the mood and atmosphere. And the music here plays a huge part in that. It's pretty nerve-wracking going through these air ducks just waiting for stuff to jump out at you so you can blast it. And the lighting effect on this first level here is well done. This kind of stuff goes a long way in helping this game stand out among the rest of the pack. Now, there's like a half dozen other games based on Alien 3, including a game for Sega Genesis, which is nothing like the Super Nintendo version, and it's got nothing to do with the movie, for better or for worse. There's no saves or passwords, there's an annoying time limit, there's no map, and it's lose all your lives and start from the beginning. The NES game is laid out pretty much the same way too, and both are okay games, but they've got some really annoying hindrances that make them pretty aggravating to play. The other versions of the game, for Commodore 64, Amiga, Game Gear, and Master System, are all based on the Genesis 
version of the game more or less, while the Game Boy version is its own thing entirely. There's also a badass Alien 3 arcade game that's a rail shooter, but that will have to get its own video someday. So yeah, Alien 3 for Super Nintendo is surprisingly well made in certain ways, and predictably annoying in others. For example, the password system uses regular words so you don't have to take a picture of your TV with your phone. The hit detection is solid, and I love the user-friendly layout being able to scout each mission before heading out there. No, it's certainly not perfect, the game gets repetitive, and the jump, uh, well, the jump sucks. But I still think this is a solid game that provides a lively and intense atmosphere. All right, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. When it comes to the Super Nintendo library, there's different tiers of games. You've got your Nintendo-developed stuff that's almost always high quality, you've got third-party developers like Capcom, Konami, and Squaresoft making outstanding games, then you've got lesser-known developers like Natsume, Quintet, HAL Laboratory, and the like, who might have a misstep here and there but usually put out good stuff. Underneath that are even lesser-known games made by developers nobody had ever heard of, games like Run Saber or Skyblazer, for example. And underneath that, you've got games that you can't even say were forgotten because they weren't remembered in the first place. Stuff you never saw for sale or for rent or even advertised in any gaming magazines. I've covered a few of those games here and there and it's always fun to find them. Stuff like Time Slip or Gun Force or Zardian, Young Merlin, She Ends Revenge, I could go on and on. This time around it's Metal Morph, developed by Origin Systems. Hey, at least I've played something they had a hand in. They handled the Super Nintendo port of Wing Commander, which is surprisingly pretty good. Metal Morph, on the other hand, eh, not so much, but it wasn't for a lack of trying because believe it or not, this game is actually pretty dang ambitious. It starts out as an action platformer with an emphasis on exploration, with your character's gimmick being that he can morph into a metal blob by pressing R, and you run through pipes or warp points that are very conveniently placed throughout each area. When you're in blob form, you can't be hurt, but you can't attack either. After you complete that, you switch to a rail shooter section that sees you traveling to your next location, making stuff go boom along the way, before eventually arriving at the planet's surface and making more stuff go boom. I gotta say, I think that's actually a pretty cool way to structure a game with a sci-fi theme like this. You have five lives, or continues as the game calls them, to get through eight levels, and in most areas you're trying to locate morph balls, which increase your character's capabilities. There's also the typical weapon power-ups here, like homing missiles and smart bombs when you're flying the ship. However, unfortunately, when it comes to the gameplay here, Metal Morph is incredibly cheap, and I mean that both about how cheap the enemies are and how cheaply this game feels to play. First of all, there's classic one-hit death stuff here, but as an added bonus, enemies can shoot you from off-screen. Oh, that's just lovely. To be fair though, you can hit enemies off-screen too, so I guess it goes both ways, not that that helps anything. And to say this game lacks refinement is putting it very kindly, like how there aren't any frames for when you transition from jumping to standing when jumping on these platforms, or how both your character and each enemy makes the same scream when they're killed. <laughs> Or how when you fire your weapon while jumping, you'll fire in any random direction you may or may not be facing in midair. It's just sloppy as hell. I mean, look at this. If you just tap left or right on the D-pad, it'll look like you're just kind of hovering. And the thing is, you'll want to do this because the second enemies appear on screen, they are shooting directly at you. So you gotta both dodge and shoot them as quickly as you can. The rail shooter stages also feel like they were thrown together in like 30 minutes. The controls are incredibly loose and you get the same enemies over and over with your destination awkwardly appearing in the background like a wart on your big toe. The thing is though, this game does just barely enough to make it just barely an okay playthrough. And by barely okay, I mean it's on that same tier I talked about earlier with other run and gun games like Time Slip, which is pretty much just a category of, yeah, don't go out of your way to play this or anything, but it's not gonna occupy a spot on the 30 worst Super Nintendo games or anything. I mean, for one thing, the music here is really cool. Okay, they're obviously blatantly ripping off Vangelis and the Blade Runner soundtrack, but I still really like it. And hey, check it out, they even emulated the THX sound thing.
Some of the settings are really cool looking too, like this underground level here, and some of the alien bases also look sharp. The Mode 7 planet surface levels usually look nice, especially this one here. And of course, what 90s sci-fi action game is complete without a wacky story? The year is 2214 and you've been chosen as an ambassador to the galaxy known as Other Side? Yeah, I'm sure that's right next to Galaxy somewhere over there and Galaxy some other place, I guess. Ugh, the font they're using here makes my useless graphic design associate's degree scream in agony. Anyway, your unique shape-shifting abilities are what enable you to travel through a portal that takes you to this particular galaxy, and you meet your alien ambassadors and they ambush you, and oh gosh, who could have possibly seen that coming? But yeah, I mean, just look at this title screen here. Yeah, that's some quality 90s right there. So yeah, if I could be totally honest here, Metal Morph falls firmly in the category of guilty pleasure. Now, I would never recommend this game to anyone. <laughs> Certain gameplay basics like firing when jumping or getting killed by an enemy off screen are definitely deal breakers. But I just like the music, I like the look, I like the gameplay variety, and I guess I'm just a sucker for games that swing for the fences like this, even if they fail. This seems like the kind of game I would have rented as a kid, and while it would have been frustrating to play, I still would have found a way to like it somehow. Maybe I just have a soft spot for this kind of stuff from this era. But yeah, don't listen to me. I may enjoy its campiness and its ambition, but chances are that you will not. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. It wasn't just licensed games that got ported to anything and everything under the sun, it was games like Pinball Dreams, too. This one was originally made for the Amiga in 1992 and was ported to... <gasps> DOS, Game Boy, Game Gear, Game Boy Advance, Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC, GP32, Atari Falcon. The hell's an Atari Falcon? Well, what's really interesting about Pinball Dreams is that many of those ports have come this century, like the Commodore and Amstrad versions. There's also an iOS version, and the game made its way to the PlayStation Network once upon a time. So, what is this game? Well, I'm a Super Nintendo guy, duh, so let's take a look at the Super Nintendo port, and it's a pinball video game. Just, you know, pinball. Not a lot of frills or extras here, what you see is what you get, for better or for worse. There's four different tables you can choose from. There's Ignition, which has a space theme that's probably the easiest of the four to manage. Steel Wheel has a Wild West motif that's the most creative of the four boards, and my pick for the best one in the game. Beatbox has a music theme where the music changes every time the ball hits a flipper, and Nightmare, which features lots of horror stuff, and is probably the most difficult to manage since it has all sorts of different oddball angles. Really, the only other notable feature here is that you can have up to eight separate players take turns as the game keeps track of score for each player. The action here is decent, and there's plenty of stuff to try and attain on each table, but it's not nearly as interesting is games like Devil's Crush or even Crewball on Sega Genesis. Pinball Dreams is fine for what it is, but yeah, it's pinball, not much else to say. So, that being said, what the heck, let's take this opportunity to look at all the other Super Nintendo pinball games. Pinball Fantasies was made by the same folks who made Pinball Dreams, Game Tech, and it's, uh, more pinball. Imagine that. I would say the four tables featured here are a little more interesting than Pinball Dreams. Here we've got a carnival theme in Party Land, a race car theme in Speed Devils, a game show motif in Billion Dollar Game Show, and another Halloween-type table with Stones and Bones. The viewpoint is a little more zoomed out here, which helps, but otherwise this is really just more of the same as Pinball Dreams, so if you liked that, you'll like this. Moving on, since it was the 90s, of course Banpresto had to make a Compati Hero pinball game. This one simply titled Battle Pinball. This one never left Japan, as you could probably guess, but it features all the usual suspects like Ultraman, Gundam, Kamen Rider, and the like. There's all sorts of stuff you can smash and all kinds of moving parts you have to contend with, so this game does have plenty to do and plenty of personality, which is nice. The screen is split up into parts here instead of scrolling, so that may bother some people. But yeah, this game is fun for what it is. Be forewarned though, there's plenty of Japanese text you'll have to manage in the menus. Super Pinball Behind the Mask was actually developed by Technos, of all people. It only features three different tables, but there's two game modes, split between multiplayer and conquest mode, which is just single player trying to quote-unquote defeat each table. There's a Jolly Joker table that has kind of an evil clown motif. There's Blackbeard and Iron Men, which has a pirate theme. And Wizard, which has a Mr. Wizard theme. No, I wish. It's just a regular old fantasy theme. What's interesting about this one is how zoomed out the viewing angle is compared to the previous games, so you can actually 
actually see the entire board at once. But there's two issues with that. One is that it's harder to see detail, obviously, and two is that the board itself is smaller. But in the case of a video pinball game, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I prefer seeing this to my eyes getting tired from the viewpoint itself whipping around. There's also Super Pinball 2 subtitled Amazing Odyssey, but it stayed in Japan and was never released elsewhere, and this feels like DLC for the first game because it's almost exactly the same, just more tables. This time there's a spy theme, a space sister theme, I don't know, some kind of Barbarella knockoff I guess, and there's a cross-eyed clown theme. Seriously, what the hell is wrong with this guy? Maybe he's just not photogenic or something? Anyway, these games are fine for what they are. One game I should mention very quickly is Timon and Pumbaa's Jungle Games. It's just a collection of five mini-games, but one of them is a pinball game, and it exists. So, yeah. Back to actually interesting pinball games, here's an American Battle Dome, and it's four-player pinball, with the goal being to have the fewest number of balls to get past you within a time limit. This one's kind of a fun multiplayer game for a little while, and there's at least five tables to choose from, so it's a neat novelty, if nothing else. Again, like Battle Pinball, there's a bit of a language barrier here, so be prepared for that if you play this one. Saving the best for last, here's Jackie Crush. Come on, tell me you don't want to play this one after seeing that. As you might have guessed, this game is part of the Crush Pinball series, and it's the third game coming after Alien Crush and Devil's Crush for TurboGrafx-16. This game does not disappoint. There's plenty of crazy-ass visuals here, with the idea of the table being to depict hell as it was perceived back in ancient Japan, and the artists here really went nuts with it. There's tons of action all over the place. The table is split into three sections that all scroll together, and when you level up from a table, so to speak, there's no telling what the hell is gonna happen. Happen. Like here, I'm suddenly fighting this giant transforming face? Good god! Yeah, when it comes to pinball video games, there's the Crush series and then there's everything else. This game is well worth checking out any way you can. Alright, that's all for now, and I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day! SEGA DRUNK! Surprise! Gonna start posting a Saturday video every now and then so I can get a little caught up on these requests. This one's from my longtime friend the Jesus, who wants me to look at Crewball of all things. Yes, Crewball, with crew being spelled C-R-U-E, as in the band Motley Crew. This game came out for the Genesis and Mega Drive in 1992, which is pretty interesting timing, considering Motley Crew were nearing the end of their run as a noteworthy band getting any kind of airplay. Their most successful album, in terms of sales anyway, Dr. Feelgood, had been out three years before this came along, so this definitely feels like a blatant cash-in to use someone's, anyone's name, to sell what is essentially a video pinball game. Now granted, this is actually a pretty good video pinball game, it was originally titled Twisted Flipper, and the game would have been totally fine on its own, but I guess the suits at Sega saw an opportunity to do something else with it. Celebrity and athlete endorsements were kind of Sega's thing back then, like Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, or any number of pro athletes ranging from Joe Montana to Evander Holyfield. The thing is, though, Rock Band Pinball machines have been a thing forever. Tons of bands from Guns N' Roses to ACDC to Ted Nugent to Aerosmith to Metallica. So hey, why not a Rock Band pinball video game for Sega Genesis? So I get why they attached a Rock Band to this game, I just don't get why they picked Motley Crue. Maybe they were cheap? Maybe they were paid in just cocaine or something? I don't know. The thing is though, when you play those authentic pinball machines in person, they're actually really creatively designed with all sorts of cool and interesting traps and triggers. So Crue Ball by comparison is really dialed back, as you could imagine. For instance, they only licensed three songs for the soundtrack, Home Sweet Home off Theater of Pain, Livewire off of Too Fast for Love, and the title track off of Dr. Feelgood. And you don't hear any of the songs during the actual pinball levels, so the whole Motley Crue thing not only comes across as a dumb choice for a band, but the way their music is utilized defeats the purpose of licensing the songs in the first place. Let's be positive for a second though, here's the thing, the way the music is programmed in the game is pure Sega Genesis. If you really love that grindy, distorted Genesis sound, then you're really gonna dig this game regardless of how you feel about Motley Crue, because all the music here sounds freaking great, and is as good of a showcase of what the Genesis sound chip could do as any game is. The actual pinball in the game is well done too, if you've played games like Alien Crush then you get the general gist of Crue Ball. There's multi-layered sections with multiple flippers, using the ball to smash monsters, skulls, mutants, and all sorts of creatures, as well as being able to smash through a breakout style wall. For a video pinball game, the action here is pretty solid, and most importantly, 
mean, the pinball physics here are fairly consistent. They're not perfect, but after playing for a while, you do get the hang of the timing and how to aim for things. There's nine levels to play through, and each one switches the table layout, and to progress through each, you either destroy all the enemies or knock down all the targets to unlock a section further up the screen so you can move the volume knob up a notch. So yeah, if you ignore the title and the whole Motley Crue aspect of the game, Crew Ball is actually a good enough video pinball game. I get why Sega went out of their way to get some star power to spice up the game library or whatever, and that makes Crew Ball kind of a peculiar piece of gaming history. In the end though, their inclusion is nothing short of half-assed and irrelevant. Still, Crew Ball was a perfectly fine video pinball game. It's nowhere near as fun as something like Alien Crush or Devil's Crush, but it's got its strengths like the sound design, and if you're into these kind of games, it's worth checking out. Drunk. The Game Boy Advance has one of the strangest game libraries out there. There's at least 10 or 12 games that'll make you say, wait, that exists? I've covered a few of them on this channel, like Tony Hawk 2 and Max Payne, and there's plenty more to get to, like Tomb Raider, Oddworld, Tekken. Yes, those do exist on Game Boy Advance. But for now, let's do a quick rundown of Pinball of the Dead, a horror-themed pinball game made by Sega AM1, released in June 2002. So I would have been 20 years old when this first came out, and to be completely honest, I would have narcally dismissed this game at the time had I known it existed, I would have perceived it as a cheap lazy cash-in benefiting from a successful franchise. Fast forward to now, I'm 42 years old, and after playing this one, my opinion has shifted to, heck yeah, get all that cash! Pinball of the Dead is a true pick-up-and-play portable game, made back when there was more of an emphasis on that for handheld games, so there's not a lot to dive into here. You just have three different tables with a battery save for your high scores, and a password system for the bosses, and there's a structure here similar to other pinball games like this, namely Jackie Crush and Devil's Crush. Each table has at least three sets of flippers, or three levels, and while you can just play each table individually for a high score, there's also a challenge mode where you can quote-unquote beat a table after reaching the boss room and defeating him, with the game featuring six different bosses, all taken from House of the Dead 2. And yeah, as you can see here, this game uses the visuals and lore from House of the Dead 2. What I really like though is that there's so many different enemy types. It's not just the same three or four zombie sprites. There's skeletons, ghouls, a bunch of different bosses, you got a giant zombie head that pops up. This table has hands for flippers and chainsaws for bumpers. It's clear that the dev team had a ton of fun with this one. And it's fun to play, too. The pinball physics are pretty solid. The L and R buttons control the flippers while everything else nudges the table. And this one's pretty forgiving. You're not likely to tilt too often, which is nice. I know at a glance this game might look kind of bleary and the colors are just a wee bit loud, but they kind of have to be. You need heavy contrast for a small Game Boy Advance screen, so it's understandable. My only real nitpick is that the ball can be a bit floaty, where it's almost like it's moving in slow motion, but hey, that's better than it moving too fast to keep up with. Plus, there's also an option to adjust the ball speed to your liking, which is nice. The camera viewpoint is steady, the ball bounces consistently, and it's not too tough to get a feel for aiming, so you can collect all the typical pinball bonuses. Like here, you can earn an extra ball if you keep hitting this area, which will spell out escape, and this giant head will pop up and offer some easy bonus points. That's just one small example, each table has a bunch of different things to unlock and events you can play through. Like save the civilians, you hit all the letters to spell out chaos, then help civilians cross the board from one point to another while protecting them from an oncoming horde of zombies. There's a surprising amount of stuff you can unlock, it's pretty cool. So yeah, I know spooky season has come and gone, but I haven't been able to stop playing Pinball of the Dead. Sure, it can be a frustrating game sometimes, same as any other pinball game, but the gameplay is consistent enough and reliable enough to keep coming back to. And hey, if you're gonna make a pinball video game, then you might as well go all out with all sorts of stuff you can't do on real pinball tables. Although, man, can you imagine if these could be real tables somehow? Oh, I guess if that were possible, all the blood, guts, and gore would mean you'd need to include a Cleaning of the Dead minigame. But hey, I'd play that too. This is a surprisingly fun and entertaining game, and since it wasn't released anywhere other than Game Boy Advance, this is another game where you're gonna have to play it any way you can. And that is all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.
mess drunk? I'm willing to bet if you clicked on this video, it's because of the thumbnail. This is some of the strangest cover art for a Super Nintendo game. It's for Time Cop, based off of the movie starring Jean-Claude Van Damme and Ron Silver. But uh, why did they put Cyclops firing a gun on the cover? I know Time Cop is based on a graphic novel, but come on, you can't tell me that's not Cyclops. The movie, meanwhile, is actually pretty decent considering it's Van Damme. He plays a cop who takes out people who are abusing time travel to steal money and, I don't know, unopened copies of Little Samson. Time Cop was Van Damme's highest grossing movie that he starred in, and it actually got good reviews. You'd think a successful action movie like this would lend itself well to a 16-bit video game, and you'd think wrong. Time Cop was released in April 1995 and developed by Cryo Interactive for Super Nintendo, and it's the only official game the movie ever got. There was a project planned for Sega CD, but only a demo was released before it was cancelled. Although a complete version of the game was found and put online back in 2007, so if you like crappy licensed Sega CD games, then you can go find that and have a day. As for this crappy licensed game, it's just a mess. As you can see, they went for photorealistic rotoscoped characters, and you presumably play as Jean-Claude Van Damme, but really this looks like it could be just about anyone. I will say the puffy jacket with rolled up sleeves is definitely a choice. You get three lives and two continues to get through five levels split up into four or five stages each, and I'm not sure why anyone would want to do that because this is one of the ugliest games I've ever seen. Each level background looks like a jumbled mess of random nonsense. What am I even looking at here? And it doesn't help that your character, the enemies, and the projectiles all kind of blend together. It's like the artists were so proud of how ugly these backgrounds are that they forgot to mute the colors a bit so the actual gameplay can stand out. You got this level here, which looks like an endless boiler room. This level looks like everything is stained by cigarette smoke. And then there's whatever this is. I feel like I'm stuck in the giant spaceship from the movie Space Mutiny. It's B to jump, Y to fire your weapon, X to punch, and A to kick. Yes, that's your punch. Who punches like this? And here's your kick. What, are you trying out for the Rockettes or something? And yeah, as you can see, some of your attacks are several frames, so you have to sit there and wait for your attack to wind up and wind down. So at least the game makes up for being incredibly ugly by being a pain in the ass to play as well. Seriously, the controls in this game are some of the worst that I've ever played. This is what happens when you simply try and turn around. Your character actually stops and you watch his slow ass turn around, leaving you vulnerable to take damage. Plus, the attacks and the hit detection are so bad here that the most effective move in your arsenal is to duck and kick everyone's shins. Oh well, at least enemies can kill each other, which is pretty funny. Let's take a look at the instruction manual, and uh-oh, you know a game is bad when the manual is only seven pages long and double-spaced like a college term paper. Even Nintendo Power gave Time Cop a bad review, saying the controls are awful, and they never said stuff like that. Even with games this bad, I still try and look for something, anything, redeeming, but Time Cop is one of the most irredeemable games I can remember playing. Even the music is annoying. This sounds like something from NFL Quarterback Club. So yeah, of all the games that have been made over the years, Time Cop is in fact one of them. I wish it weren't. Time Cop comes across like a fake video game, like something you'd see in a movie or a TV show. You know how some fast food places will have ice cream but they're not allowed to call it ice cream because technically it's a frozen dairy dessert and there's nothing resembling actual ice cream in it? That's what I think of when I play Time Cop for Super Nintendo. This shouldn't be called a video game, it's more of a video game product. But what are you gonna do? I guess if there weren't any bad games, we wouldn't appreciate the good ones as much. So you're gonna want to avoid this game any way you can. All right, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Oh no, I have to talk about Terminator 2 Judgment Day for Super Nintendo? <sighs> okay, buck up, here we go. There are different flavors of bad games. The one I looked at last week, Frantic Flea, is the annoying kind of bad, where the controls and the platforming make you feel like Walter White under his house laughing maniacally because you can't believe how bad it is. But this week, it's Terminator 2 Judgment Day, and this is the crushing disappointment kind of bad. 
I talked about this one a long while back as part of the video that goes over every Super Nintendo game based on an action movie, and I've been afraid to go back to it ever since. Like many of you, I love Terminator 2. It's one of my four or five favorite movies ever, and to the movie's everlasting credit, the makeup and the special effects still hold up remarkably well even today, and you don't need me to tell you any of this, it's just an awesome movie. Now, to give you some history on my part, I did not own an NES, but I was at least kinda sorta familiar with the fact that movie-licensed games always kinda sucked. I mean, there was a reason when my childhood friend Dan rented games, he got stuff like Mega Man 3 and Super C instead of crap like Back to the Future. But by the time the Super Nintendo rolled around, I was at least hopeful that movie-licensed games would be at least a little better. After all, it was a Super Nintendo. Everything is supposed to be better than the NES, right? But that's before I played Terminator 2 Judgment Day, developed in 1993 by Bit Studios and published by LJN. Yes, that LJN. First of all, just look at this. This is a Terminator game? After watching the biggest action blockbuster movie of the year, this is the video game it gets? Bit Studios also made Last Action Hero for Super Nintendo, and apparently they had trouble capturing Arnold Schwarzenegger's likeness, because in that game he looks like Shane McMahon, although video game Arnold has much better punches. Here comes the money! Here we go! Money talks! Here comes the money! And in Terminator 2, Arnold looks like Hank Hill. Boy, I tell you what, you gotta come with me if you wanna live. The graphics in this game are just so friggin' basic. This game could be anything. It's a huge letdown after how great the movie looked. I mean, this isn't even great value Terminator. This is gas station Terminator. You get one health meter and zero continues to get through eight levels with no battery saver password. And to the game's credit, it does follow the movie pretty closely. You start out at the bar, you go looking for John Connor at the mall, you go to the mental hospital to get Sarah, and the game concludes at the steel mill. It's just, the gameplay is so bad. The T-800 is ridiculously slow, and you've got John and Sarah following you around, so you have to make sure they keep up, and believe it or not, this is how the Terminator jumps. How is this normal? Is this a motion capture from someone that actually worked on the game? Did they think this is how jumps looked? The T-800 is apparently just your 52-year-old uncle who can't get his skinny jeans off. But what makes this really hilarious is how the gameplay is set to this music. It's such a contrast, I can't help but laugh. Let's replace the music with something from Bubsy and see how it looks. That just makes the game look like a wacky platformer where you're a naked dude looking for his clothes. The point is, the visuals of this game look incredibly cheap, and the over-serious, hard-driving music makes the game look even worse, because they don't go together at all. Like, ten seconds into this game, and you're already like, this is just bad, it's just terrible. So what you're supposed to do in this game is complete objectives, like in the first level you find John Connor's address, as well as these things called future objects? Uh, why exactly is this important, and how is it related to the movie? Who cares? It's kind of amazing to me how badly this game is screwed up. Seriously, all you need to do is make a weapon-based beat-em-up, where you're the Terminator and just crushing people left and right like you see in games like Batman Returns or Final Fight. But no, instead it's a mission-based game with confusing objectives, terrible graphics, god-awful hit detection, and even worse controls, and boring monotonous gameplay. Oh, but it gets even worse because you have to drive Arnold around from place to place, and the driving controls are laughably bad. You get one button to accelerate and one button to turn? Why wouldn't you just use the D-pad? You can't even change it in the options either, it's just not available. How stupid is that? It's such a miserable experience, and I would not blame you if you just quit this game right here. It's, it's just that bad. Go play T2 the arcade game instead. So yeah, I'm not gonna waste any more of your time with this piece of crap. Terminator 2 Judgment Day on the SNES is one of the worst games I've ever played, and it has close to zero redeeming value, so this is a game you're gonna wanna avoid any way you can! Alright, I wanna thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Mm, that's drunk.
When it came to renting games for the Super Nintendo, it was always kind of a hierarchy where you had your first choices, and for me it was usually Mega Man X or Contra 3, or a role-playing game like Breath of Fire or something, but in the event that they were checked out, and they almost always were, then you had to move to the second tier of games. For me it was usually something like a less popular fighting game like World Heroes, or maybe a beat-em-up I'd never played before, or a puzzle game like Lemmings. The Super Nintendo has two Lemmings games, with the second game titled Lemmings 2 The Tribes. No, not those tribes. Believe Believe it or don't, Lemmings was originally developed by DMA Design, otherwise known as the place that would eventually become Rockstar North, and it was originally made for the Amiga back in February 1991 before getting a port to seemingly every single electronic platform that's ever existed. Everything from 3DO, PlayStation, PC Engine CD, Amstrad CPC, the CDI, Atari Lynx. I mean, you're seriously better off listing the platforms that somehow didn't get a Lemmings port. I wouldn't be surprised if they figured out a way to get this game on a dot matrix printer or a fax machine or something. The Super Nintendo port was released in March of 1992 by Sunsoft, and it's probably the best Amiga port on the system. Not that that's saying a whole lot, but Lemmings is still a fun time and it's held up really well over the years. The way the game works is simple, you have to guide as many Lemmings as you can to the goal reaching a certain percentage, and you do that by assigning Lemmings with one of up to eight jobs, everything from climbing, floating, digging, building a bridge, or just plain exploding. To start the game you only get access to a few jobs, but as you progress, the game opens up a bit more with some impressively large and complex maps, so you can get creative with how you want to approach each level. There's 30 maps total, as well as four different difficulty settings you can switch between on this screen using the select button, so there's plenty of content here. Each lemming walks in one direction by default, so you have to herd and manage these guys so they don't fall to their deaths, or get trapped, or drown, or get burnt up. Seriously, the number of ways lemmings can die is pretty impressive and it only adds to the charm of the game. A lot of maps come down to timing, like here, I have to time this lemming explosion so he blows apart this wall here, and I failed. What's great though is that if you do screw up, you can just blow up every lemming and start over. I used to do this for fun, it's total carnage, and there's something hilarious about this happy, upbeat music playing as lemming guts splatter everywhere. Seriously, the visuals and sound in this game are surprisingly really good. I really like the underground settings like this one here. Each lemming has a good amount of detail to the point that you really have to be dead on exact pixel perfect to get past certain maps, and that is a challenge. I do have to point out quickly that the first Lemmings game on Super Nintendo is not compatible with the SNES mouse. That didn't exist yet when this was made, so you have to use the D-pad. Still, when you get things right and everything falls into place, it's so satisfying. Even doing something like building a huge bridge like this, when you get it perfectly straight, it's like I seriously just want to sit and admire it for a bit. Alright, maybe I'm just a weirdo, but still, this game has a vibe that you won't find anywhere else. It's a challenge, and it can get pretty dang frustrating, but it's a lot of fun. When I was a kid, I used to put in a password and just screw around with each job, building all sorts of weird nonsense. If that's not enough for you, there's also a two-player mode with player one controlling the blue lemmings and player two controlling the green ones. And this mode can get pretty crazy very quickly. If you want to know more about lemmings and the work that was put into the game behind the scenes, there's a link in the description to the complete history of lemmings that goes into detail how the the game was developed. It's a great read. The sequel, Lemmings 2 The Tribes, was also made by DMA Design for the Amiga, with the Super Nintendo port being released in November 1994, and the game is just what you'd expect. More lemmings, more jobs, more maps, and more stuff. Here there's 12 different tribes you play as, each needing to complete 10 different maps with the scoring system being tweaked a bit. You're only required to get just one lemming across the finish line, but if that's all you can manage, then that's all you'll have for the next level. This game is a lot harder than the original, but there's a whopping 43 different jobs. There's archers, flamethrowers, rocket launchers, swimmers, kayakers, skaters, and on and on. You can also turn your cursor into a fan so you can use things like balloons and hang gliders. It really does a nice job building onto what the first game started, and you definitely get your money's worth with this one. There is a lot of content. I should also mention that Lemmings 2 is compatible with the SNES mouse, so you can feel free to use that if that's more comfortable for you. And not only that, but you can also use the Super Scope to play. Well, kind of. All you do is use Lemmings as target practice and that's it. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get this to work because I don't have a Super Scope, but I still have to mention it in case some of you out there want to try it out. There's also lots of quality of life improvements in this one, like being able to pause by holding down the A button, scrolling through each Lemming by pressing X, and a fast forward button so you don't have to sit there waiting for your Lemmings to complete the map. 
So yeah, Lemmings is an easy recommendation. It was one of my favorite weekend rentals, and it's held up really well over time. And if you like that game, then you'll dig the sequel, which has tons more jobs and even bigger maps. They're two of the best puzzle games of the 90s, and up there with some of the best puzzle games of all time. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. That's strong. If you watched my favorites video, you might remember seeing Paperboy for NES on there. Recording footage for that was the first time I'd played it in years, so I figured, hey, what the hell, I want to keep these Thursday videos coming, so why not do a quick video about Paperboy? It's an extremely short game, with as basic a premise as you can get. You have to deliver a newspaper to your subscribers, come hell or high water. Literally, I mean, death is waiting for you right there, waiting to drag you to hell if you fail. But in the meantime, you know, he's just hanging out. Oh hey Death, what's up? How you been? Paperboy was originally an arcade game that was ported to about 20 different systems and platforms, including the NES, which is where I played it. And on the NES, it looks really goofy and plays really clunky. They kept the isometric viewpoint, which was really ambitious at the time, and it still looks okay. The controls take a bit to get used to, but none of that is important. The true appeal of this game is its absurdity. When you start the game on Monday, stuff is pretty calm. There's just your random citizen here and there, or a runaway, self-propelling lawnmower in your way. But as you progress through the week, things get absolutely chaotic. I mean, just look at this. The entire town wants this kid dead. What the hell did he do? I mean, besides trash the houses of people who dare not subscribe to his newspaper. Oh, you don't want to subscribe? We'll have 10 newspapers anyway. Yeah, yeah, I know. I already made that joke in the other video, but I just freaking love that. You also got this guy who decided to try and pull on his tight hipster pants in the middle of the sidewalk. You've got this psychotic woman who is ready to chase after you and fuck up your shit if you don't deliver her goddamn paper. I love how she just keeps running even if you get her a paper. Ah, you son of a bitch, I'm gonna- oh yeah, I was just gonna go this way the whole time, I swear. Anyway, you get the idea. I love crazy games like this. Does it hold up today? Well, it still makes me laugh today. Honestly, I've never played any of the other bazillion versions of this game, just the NES version. And it's really just one of those games you bust out once a year, have a good laugh for about 20 minutes, and put it away again, while wondering what in the hell possessed the residents of that town. Nice job. When I heard about the idea of the Game Boy Advance back in the day, it was described as a portable Super Nintendo. Instantly the thought crossed my mind of playing some of my favorite Super Nintendo games on the go, but with some games they one up that and redid some aspects and even added some new features. That's exactly what's been done with Final Fight 1. Stylistically, it's still a lot more like the Super Nintendo port than the original arcade game. The enemies and backgrounds are all the same, but with a little more polish. Poison and Roxy from the arcade game remain missing, sadly. It's still Billy and Sid, but the first two bosses, Damned and Sodom, kept their original names over Thrasher and Katana. Guy is a playable character here, along with Cody and Hagar. He is by far the most fun character to use in my opinion because he's so fast. And the game also has multiplayer functionality with the game link. They were, however, able to include the industrial area level from the arcade game, so that's pretty cool. Although that level is hard as hell. In fact, the entire game is much harder than the Super Nintendo port, and that's because there's five enemies at the screen at once now, instead of just three. That really makes for some enjoyable chaos, but it can be frustrating. My favorite addition to the game are the hilariously goofy cutscenes before every boss battle that contain dialogue that sounds like something out of a Steven Seagal movie. I will beat your face in! Shut up! Another change that made me laugh was changing the voice of the poor guy sobbing over his car being demolished. Oh my god. So they gave him a northeastern accent? Oh my god. I don't know, I just thought that was funny. One really nice thing I like about playing this game, and the functionality of the Game Boy Advance in general, is that it has a resume feature. You can just shut off the game, and it'll save what level you're on. Granted, it doesn't save exactly where you are in the level, but at least you're allowed to resume your game. No need to go to a menu to save or anything like that, it's all automatic. Hey, that was high-tech stuff 12 years ago. The one con about this game is that the music and the sound both suck. The sound of kicking someone's ass was the most fun part of the Super Nintendo version. C 
see, it's just not as satisfying. Anyway, other than that, there's not much else I can say here. The game is pretty straightforward. Did you like Final Fight for Super Nintendo? Then you should check out Final Fight 1 for Game Boy Advance. It's a more beefed up version of the original Super Nintendo port. Steam Drunk? If you're watching this video, there's a 99% chance you know who the angry video game nerd is. And maybe you've played one or two games based on that character, but I can tell you, none are as good as the angry video game nerd adventures. This is a game that transcends its subject matter, meaning even if you don't like the nerd or don't even know who he is, this game is still a fantastic playthrough. But if you do know who he is and you are a fan, this game is that much better, because there's tons upon tons of hidden characters, bonus material, and running gags from the series. There's Guitar Guy, Motherfucker Mike, even Super Mecha Death Christ. I'll admit, I've been a little burnt out on the nerd character, I just think we've seen the best the character can offer at this point. There's only so many ways you can call a game terrible. But I gotta say, I really enjoyed the humor in this game. I like the nerd phrase randomizer that appears every time you die. The sheer randomness of words here consistently make me chuckle. Anyway, this isn't just a fan-made game created just for the novelty, and I don't mean because it's a game based off of the nerd, I mean that this is a retro-styled game. There can be a tendency with some of these games to be lazy and sloppy, just coasting on by on the retro gimmick, but Angry Video Game Nerd Adventures is really well made by people who really know what they're doing. The level design is balanced and well done, you can shoot in 8 different directions, switch through weapons, even a really shitty one which is played up for laughs. There's a full screen attack, tons of weapons and power ups, and the game in classic nerd fashion is hard as hell. It's really frustrating at times, but for the right reasons. It's got that early Mega Man Castlevania style difficulty, but the gameplay is so well done you just want to keep playing. I will point out an exception to this is the Atari porn level. The bouncing gets so freaking annoying after a while. That's the one level where I said fuck it and went back to play the other levels, but that was the lone exception for me. People will definitely hate the death blocks, but really, I enjoyed the challenge because it didn't seem too impossible. I always managed to inch just a bit further than before on each life. That's the thing here, this is the kind of game where you die a lot. The key is don't just see it as failure, it's just how you're supposed to progress. Super Goals and Ghosts is the same way. You die a ton, but you inch a tiny bit further in each life, and once you start to see the finish line, you just want to keep going. Ultimately, the difficulty is going to make or break your opinion of this game. I think the level and enemy design, plus the variety of your character's abilities, makes it a lot of fun to play despite how hard it is. So yeah, if you've subscribed to this channel, that obviously means you like NES and SNES games, so you should check this game out. Even if you don't care for the nerd and particular, give this game a chance because it's far beyond a novelty theme game. It's really well made, and a rewarding experience. Angry Video Game Nerd Adventures goes for about $10 on Steam. So yeah, add it to your wishlist and wait for it to go on sale and pick it up. It's awesome. Snowstruck. One Super Nintendo accessory I never fully took advantage of as a kid was the Super Game Boy. I did have a Game Boy and a few games, but I never got all that wrapped up in that universe because, well, I had a Super Nintendo. My mentality was, why would I want to play lesser versions of these awesome Super Nintendo games? Screw that! So the Game Boy games I ended up having were just like Tetris, WWF Superstars, Bart vs. the Juggernauts, Roger Clemens MVP Baseball, stuff like that. Just simple pick up and play games that were easy to play in the car or while your older brother was hogging the Super Nintendo by playing some total crap game like Bill Lambeer's Combat Basketball. Oof. Now, what I stupidly ignored is that many of these Game Boy games served as extensions or complementary pieces to the Nintendo and Super Nintendo classics. So here's a list of those particular Game Boy games that were spin-offs, so to speak, of their Nintendo and Super Nintendo counterparts. So yeah, no Pokémon on this list, please control your anger. Now keep in mind, only original Game Boy games work with the Super Game Boy, so no Game Boy Color. Let's get the obvious ones out of the way first. The first game that comes to mind is Link's Awakening. I already reviewed this one, but I'll say it again, I like this game better than Link to the Past. I like the silly story, I love being able to jump, the piece of power is a lot of fun, and the way the map is slowly unlocked the further you progress is cleverly done. Another obvious game I'll get out of the way real quick is Super Mario Land 2 and the Six Golden Coins. This game was a quantum leap ahead of the first Super Mario Land. Seriously, it's like going from the first Super Mario Brothers to Super Mario World. And it's still obviously an outstanding game today. Plus, how can you beat Bunny Mario and Wario making his debut as the main villain? If you like Super Mario World, and who doesn't, then you'll like Mario Land 2. It's available for cheap on the 3DS Virtual Console, so check it out. Sticking with the Land theme, there's also Donkey Kong Land 2. It's impressive how it manages to cram in the traditional Donkey Kong Country graphics onto a tiny Game Boy cartridge. 
Like Donkey Kong Country 2, you play as Diddy and Dixie, but it features completely new layouts for each level. It's a bit easier though, to be honest, but it's still well done, especially if you're jonesing for a game in the Donkey Kong Country universe that you haven't played to death already. Mega Man 5, not to be confused with the NES Mega Man 5, also features original content with new music and new bosses, all named after planets in our solar system. Even you, Pluto. Sadly, this game does have some slowdown problems and has kind of a goofy jump glitch, but the gameplay and level design is as good as you'd expect from any other Mega Man game. I'm a huge fanboy of the NES Mega Man games, and I think this game is on that same wavelength. So if you love Mega Man, you gotta check this one out. The cartridge of this one is kinda rare, but thankfully it's available on the 3DS Virtual Console. Operation C is of course way more like the original Contra or Super C for the NES than it is like Contra 3, but this game did get kind of ignored a bit. It's got five original stages, but it does borrow some elements from Super C. This isn't to be confused with the Contra Alien Wars port, just FYI. It's got that classic Contra gameplay, although it does play a bit easier since the Game Boy limitations make it tough to have a lot going on the screen at once. I really like that the default gun is a machine gun, so all you have to do is hold the button down instead of tapping it to death. Anyway, this game is usually pretty cheap on eBay, and I think it's well worth it. Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge is another game that's closer to a complementary piece for the NES titles, but this game also has some surprising similarities to Super Castlevania IV in terms of atmosphere. Yeah, you heard me, an original Game Boy title manages to create a real atmosphere. The sound design goes a long way toward that, and the overall presentation here is really impressive. It's really worth checking out. There's four castles you can play through in any order. There's rock, crystal, plant, and cloud, and they all have distinct music and backgrounds. The game might not be as hard as the NES games, but it's a fun playthrough that lives up to the Castlevania legacy. Next, there's Metroid 2 Return of Samus, whose mission is to eliminate all the Metroids on their home planet before the space pirates show up. This game is kind of polarizing. Some people love it, some people hate it. It's nowhere near Super Metroid. But if you enjoy the 2D Metroid universe, you might like this one. The sound and graphics of the Game Boy don't always lend themselves well to a game like Metroid. But to be honest, I kind of like the soundtrack. The dissonance reminds me of an Atari 2600 game, or even Earthbound at times. Anyway, the usual Metroid combat style is here, with upgrades, energy tanks, and missile packs. It might not appeal to everyone, but I think it's worth a shot. Next there's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Fall of the Foot Clan. At first glance, this game looks super limited and really easy. I mean, it's a Game Boy beat-em-up, looks pretty basic, and for the most part it is, but it is capable of getting somewhat chaotic at times. You can choose to be any of the four turtles to crank through five original levels. Bebop and Rocksteady are here, Baxter, Shredder, Krang, the Technodrome. It's a short game, but it's not a bad way to spend a half an hour. Next there's Gargoyle's Quest, which in my opinion is better than its Super Nintendo counterpart, Demon's Crest. I know I might be in the minority on that, but seriously, if you like Demon's Crest, you should absolutely check out Gargoyle's Quest. The level design better fits Firebrand's capabilities, and it makes you be a bit more precise. You also have a limited time in which you can fly, a feature that I think would have gone a long way in the Super Nintendo game. There's an overhead map where you can fall into random battles too, as well as the usual side-scrolling levels. It is easily one of the best original Game Boy games. Alright, let's close this out with a bang. Two more games that are on a much bigger scale. First, Final Fantasy Legend 2, also known as Saga 2 Hiho Densetsu. One of the better games in the Final Fantasy universe, the gameplay is pretty standard, four characters in your party, choosing between humans, mutants, robots, and monsters. Exploring a world map with random encounters where you fight monsters. Simple stuff for the most part, but you can control what stats level up to a certain extent. Physical attacks increase your strength, and magic attacks increase your mana. There's also minor stuff like tanking, which is a nice touch. The story is that your dad one day leaves to go find the Magi, which are 77 shards of a broken statue of a goddess. Years go by, and you decide one day to go looking for him. It surprisingly gets pretty interesting, with parallel universes, other gods fighting for power, ancient civilizations, and without spoiling anything, things don't always go as planned. The best part of the game, however, might be the music. I love the battle theme in this game. So yeah, Final Fantasy Legend 2 is deceptively simple. There's more than meets the eye with this game. Last, there's Harvest Moon, the second game in the series after the Super Nintendo version. This is basically a more affordable port of the wildly expensive Super Nintendo game. Yeah, it's pretty limited, there's not as much variety as the original, and stuff like the mountain isn't in this game, sadly. But I always really enjoyed the Harvest Moon universe. You have one year to become a ranch master, before your dead grandpa's spirit returns to, uh, judge you, I guess. The fundamental gameplay stuff with the farm is all here, clearing the land, plowing it, and planting crops. You can also buy and raise chickens and cows, which of course produce eggs and milk. If this sounds painfully boring, then uh, I don't know what to tell you. 
I like the Harvest Moon games, though. And while this one might be a bit limited, it's way more affordable than the Super Nintendo version, and it looks surprisingly nice as well. Alright, there you go, that's 11 original Game Boy games for the Super Game Boy accessory for the Super Nintendo that are all worth checking out. One last thing I want to point out real quick is this handy Super Game Boy guide that comes with the accessory. It gives good pointers on how to customize what colors and borders you want to set for each game. You can look up most of the stuff online nowadays, but it's still pretty cool and it's worth grabbing if you can get it for cheap. Thanks for watching, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Just run. In a couple weeks, I'll be posting a Super Game Boy video about original Game Boy games that best utilize the Super Game Boy accessory. One game I discovered while doing that research was Mega Man V, or Mega Man 5, I guess. I'm gonna call it Mega Man 5, not to be confused with the NES Mega Man 5. Calling it Mega Man V is just awkward. Anyway, this game is such an impressive piece of work that I really felt I had to give it its own video. The best way I can describe this game is inspired. Sometimes it seems like the tendency with original Game Boy games is to just throw a new coat of paint on an old watered-down idea. For example, the previous Mega Man games were nice enough, but the flow of the game was just kind of blah, and the bosses and weapons were the same as the NES games. It was kind of like getting half of an NES Mega Man game. But Mega Man 5 has some really sharp level design, some original ideas, and that classic Mega Man difficulty, and the music is as great as ever. The arm cannon is a little different. Instead of just being able to charge and fire, the arm itself detaches to hit an enemy, then it comes back to you. That's your default weapon, the mega arm, so that's pretty cool. Rush is there to help, of course, but you also get Tango, who turns into a buzzsaw and attacks enemies. The bosses have a planetary theme called Star Droids. I know that sounds kind of dorky, but I think it's cool as hell. Each boss in Mega Man 5 is based off of a planet in our solar system, although I'm still awaiting word from Capcom about whether or not Pluto has since been demoted to a, uh, dwarf planetoid? Poor Pluto. But yeah, eight original bosses and stages here. You start only being able to choose between four, but after defeating them, you unlock the next four. And those next four stages are where the game gets really good, in my opinion. Like I said earlier, the level design here is inspired. The game is pretty hard in that classic Mega Man method. Some of the boss weapons are pretty dang nice, like the Grab Buster and Break Dash, which are fun to use. And some of them not so much, like Salt Water and Bubble Bomb. Those can be frustrating. Also, just like the previous game in the Game Boy series, there's also a trading system to get E-Tanks and other items, which was a pretty smart idea because there's only so much real estate on the screen to hide stuff within the levels. So instead you collect P... things. Insert your own joke here and use them as currency to buy E-Tanks, upgrades for the Mega Arm, and other stuff. The flaws in this game are very few, there's some slowdown here and there, and there's a strange jump glitch that comes up every once in a while. But other than that, the game is surprisingly smooth. The original Game Boy cartridge is hard to find, and I mean that literally, not in that desperate eBay seller kind of a way. Rare! Vintage! God, I hate that. Anyway, the game goes for over $60, that's steep. But mercifully, the 3DS Virtual Console released this not too long ago, and I highly recommend checking it out even if you kind of like Mega Man. Of course, I'm a big Mega Man fanboy, so I'm conditioned to like this game. But in every objective sense I can muster, I can say this game is surprisingly awesome. Snestra. What I enjoy the most about making videos for this channel is seeking out and discovering halfway obscure and forgotten games. A great example of this is the game Avenging Spirit for Game Boy. This actually started out as a two-player arcade game with really fun and inventive gameplay, but it only received one port to... Game Boy? What a strange choice. Although I guess it could be attributed to how weird this game is. You start out as a ghost, but not for long, because you have to find a physical form to possess to progress with the game, and there's an energy meter that acts as a time limit that ticks away the longer you're in your ghost form, and if you can't find anyone to possess and your energy meter runs out, it's game over. You can take the form of everything from random dudes to vampires to kangaroos, yeah, pretty weird. You stay in these forms until either you get hit or until you decide to abandon them, at which point they crumble to the ground leaving only a skeleton. Wow, okay. But yeah, this game is very much like something out of the Kirby series. It's really fun to just putz around and possess random people just to see what abilities they have. The level design here is just okay, it's not great, but it occasionally allows for some interesting flexibility, like leaving your body behind and racing the clock as you fly as a ghost through a more difficult part of the stage, and just cross your fingers and hope there's somebody sitting there afterward that you can possess and save your ass. Avenging Spirit also has a massive amount of replay value because you can choose different things to possess on each playthrough. Very cool. It should be noted though that the boss battles for the most part are one-on-one, -on -one, so you have to be wary of who you choose to fight in those battles, and no, you can't possess a boss. 
us, sadly. If the gameplay itself sounds weird to you, the story is even weirder. You and your girlfriend are mugged by some gangsters. You are shot dead while she is kidnapped. However, her dad happens to be a scientist specializing in ghost energy, so he summons you to go get her back somehow. But the gangsters actually have a motive here. They're also researching ghost energy and are extorting Mr. Ghost Energy Scientist Guy for information. Because yeah, the Mafia always had an interest in ghosts and stuff, right? Remember Al Capone and Vito Corleone always going on about ghosts and spirits and possessing things? No? Okay. Anyway, Avenging Spirit is really a surprise. This is a fun game, and good news, it's available on the 3DS Virtual Console for only a few bucks. If you're tired of the usual platformers and are looking for something a little more creative, check out Avenging Spirit. In 1992, Nintendo teamed up with HAL Laboratory to create Kirby's Dream Land, a brand new first-party franchise exclusively for... Game Boy? This is kind of an oddity at the time, as the Super Nintendo was in full swing, and the NES still had some life to it as well. But here we are. The treacherous King Dedede, or is that pronounced Day Day Day? Anyway, he's stolen all the food from Dreamland, just because he can, and resident hero Kirby is after him to get it back, although it's not clear whether or not Kirby actually needs food, per se, considering his primary ability is to inhale anything and everything in sight. I guess he does just spit them right back out as projectiles, so it's unclear how much of them he actually digests. Sorry, got off track there. The point is that Kirby's basic skill here is fun to use. For a side-scrolling platformer, it's nice to see another mechanic added to the usual projectile you see in games of this nature, so you're not just running around and shooting stuff and jumping on enemies like some cheap Mario or Contra clone. I also like that Kirby can inflate himself and fly around just by pressing up on the D-pad. My first instinct with games like this is to just say, well, I'm gonna fly over everything just because I can, but this game does a nice job filling up the screen with a variety of enemies. Which brings me to the level design and layout here, which is not unlike Super Mario Bros. 2, where you search through various rooms in each level. Don't be fooled by the dull, straightforward first level. That's just designed to get your feet wet with the game mechanics. The second level is where the game really picks up steam. However, I do feel like Kirby is a little too overpowered at times, and the game got kind of tedious because of that. The trouble with the original Kirby's Dream Land is that it's been done much better later on, and that brings me to Kirby's Dream Land 2, which is a classic sequel in every sense, in that it improves on the original in just about every area. In this game, King Dedede is back, this time using dark matter to steal rainbow bridges. Sure, okay. There's two major improvements made in the core gameplay in Kirby's Dream Land 2. First and most obvious right away are Kirby's companions. There's Rick the hamster, who you can ride, he's much faster than Kirby. There's Kine the sunfish, who can swim underwater. And there's Ku the owl, who can fly and allow Kirby to do his normal attack in the air. The second mechanic is that Kirby can absorb certain enemies' abilities after inhaling them by simply pressing the down button. This mechanic was originally introduced in Kirby's Adventure for NES, but I'll be damned if it doesn't work fantastic in Kirby's Dream Land 2. I love how this is done here, and along with Kirby's new companions, these new features give this game a ton of variety, and the level design is up to the task as well, providing a bit more of a challenge than its predecessor. Don't get me wrong, the original Kirby's Dream Land is still fantastic. After all, it has probably the best Game Boy soundtrack ever. It's just that in this day and age, we've been spoiled because we're already so used to Kirby's unique abilities. They were seen as a novelty in the original game, so while it still has its charm, it's not going to age as well. Kirby's Dream Line 2 is a lot more polished with more variety. Anyway, you obviously can't go wrong with either of these two games. They're both available on the 3DS Virtual Console. Kirby's Dream Land is a classic that introduces some unique ideas into a 2D platformer, but Kirby's Dream Land 2 really stands out as something special, and as a result has got to be a top 5 original Game Boy game. It's absolutely worth going out of your way to play it. Drunk. If you grew up playing games in the 80s and 90s, then you love a good cheat code. Whether it was the old Konami code, or something you learned from a friend that gave you infinite lives, or a stage select, or using the game Genie and hoping that your game wouldn't corrupt or crash. Hell, I still have the notebook that I made in elementary school which contains tons of passwords and cheats and tricks, and of course, plenty of Genesis slander. Genesis duh, Nintendo does. That's about as clever as I would ever get in my life, it's been downhill ever since. But yeah, I wanted to go through this and just talk about some of my favorite secrets, cheats, passwords, and glitches in the Super Nintendo games that I grew up playing, and I want to mention very quickly that yes, all of these codes do in fact work on the SNES Classic, even if you've had it. 
Of course, I gotta start with the old Contra code. We all know it. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, start. The code itself is so well known that it has its own Wikipedia article. The most infamous use of this was probably for Contra on NES since it gave you 30 lives and it made a brutally difficult game at least a little more forgiving. But for whatever reason, the code does not work in Contra 3. But it does work in another Konami game, Gradius 3, except, uh, it kills you instantly. Well then, they actually throw you a bit of a curveball here. If you replace left and right in the code with L and R while the game is paused, you'll get full power-ups. This code works in other Konami games as well, like Batman Returns, you can go to the options menu and enter in the code with the Player 2 controller, and that'll get 9 lives for each continue. Turtles in Time does the same thing, just go to the options menu with the second controller, enter the code, and you'll have 10 lives at your disposal. There's a few other non-Konami games that feature a variation of the code. For example, in Final Fight 2, if you do an inverted version of it on the title screen, meaning down, down, up, up, right, left, right, left, then L and R, you and a second player can both play as the same character. In Smart Ball, at the title screen, if you enter the code and hit select before hitting start, you get a stage select screen, so you can start just about anywhere in the game. In Mortal Kombat 3, at the menu screen, it's up, up, down, down, left, right, A, B, A, and you unlock a third menu option titled Cool Stuff, which is a separate list of options that includes this bizarre little Galaga-type shooter that can be played with a second player. Bear in mind this code does not work for Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, just the regular MK3. I'm sure there's other Konami code variants out there, but these were the best ones I was able to find. Let me know in the comments if you know any others. Speaking of midway games like Mortal Kombat, NBA Jam also has a ton of codes, especially Tournament Edition, which features 37 different characters that you can unlock. For example, if you want to play as the Big Hurt Frank Thomas, at the name entry screen, get the cursor over the S, and then hold start and press B, then place the cursor over O and press A, then move to X and hold start while pressing A. Pretty simple, really, and each hidden character has you do something similar to this to unlock them. Whether it's former President Clinton, DJ Jazzy Jeff, Heavy D, or any number of NBA mascots. Tournament Edition also has a crazy number of codes that you can enter when you reach the Tonight's Matchup screen. Everything from Infinite Turbo, to being able to hit threes from anywhere, to dunking from anywhere on the court. And it's usually just a simple six-button input. Like if you want to be on fire the whole game, just press down, right, right, B, A, and left when it says tonight's matchup. Bear in mind for these codes, you gotta input pretty quickly, almost like you're doing a special move in a fighting game. You'll know it works if you see some text pop up right at tip-off, like fire enabled or something like that. One of my favorite cheats when I was a kid was the money cheat in SimCity. Let's face it, SimCity can be a pretty tough game, especially if you're playing as a kid with no concept on how to run a city. I mean, all I really wanted to do was just build stuff, and the money cheat at least allowed me to screw around enough that it gave me an incentive to crank through all the scenarios. Getting the money cheat to work is a little involved, though. First, you have to make sure you have zero dollars heading into December of your first year, and you gotta make sure you spend that money on police stations and fire departments and some roads. Seriously, just put those there and don't worry about it. You can bulldoze it later after you have a million dollars. Next, go to the tax screen and lower all four percentages to zero. After you've spent all your money, wait for December to roll around when you get to the tax screen prompt. At this point, hold the L button and continue to hold it through the next couple steps. Click go with figures and wait for December to turn into January. While still holding the L button, go back to the tax screen and raise every percentage as high as it will go. Go back to the main screen, let go of the L button, and abracadabra, congratulations, you're a millionaire. Go spend it on nothing but airports. Another really fun cheat is for Street Fighter 2 Turbo. You know how you can adjust the speed of the game with the stars on the main menu? Well, what if you could turn that into 10 stars? Yes, that's right, you can turn Street Fighter 2 Turbo into Street Fighter 2 Ludicrous Speed. The only thing missing is making the screen go plaid. To make this work, you use the second player controller, and right when the Street Fighter 2 logo appears, you press down R up L Y B X A. Go to the main menu, and you'll find that you can now add up to 10 stars for speed and, uh, yeah, this is just a wee bit faster than what you're used to. This is one of my favorites because of how impressive it is that this game is still mostly playable even in this form. You can still do special moves and everything. But yeah, obviously this game gets a heck of a lot harder, especially against faster opponents, so if you go and try beating the entire game in this mode, you've got your work cut out for you. 
Here's a funny trick for a game you probably haven't thought of in decades, if you've ever thought of it in the first place. It's for Brett Hull Hockey, the original, not the 95 version, and it removes the computer's goaltender from the game entirely. All you have to do is pause the game at any time, go down to goaltender in net, press right on the D-pad on the second controller, and suddenly you've got an open net for an entire game. This just seems like a simple programming oversight, if anything, but it's still pretty funny that something so simple can cheese a game so badly. I really love Super Ghouls and Ghosts, but that first level is rough to the point that I don't blame people for losing their patience with it quickly, and that sucks because this game is full of tons of great visuals, enemy design, music, and crazy gimmicks like rotating rooms. Therein lies the appeal of stage select codes. If you're an adult with actual stuff to do, then maybe you don't have time to dedicate hours to getting good at certain games, so a code like this will allow you to see the rest of the game, at least partially. Just highlight exit on the options screen with the player 1 controller, then hold L and start on the player 2 controller while pressing start on player 1. That takes you to a secondary menu where you can choose the level and the checkpoint you want to start at along with a sound test. Now there's nothing in your way to get effortlessly killed by these red demons. Ugh. Now, these next few aren't really codes, they're just secrets hidden within the game. The best example would be before you face Dracula in Super Castlevania 4. You start at the edge of a cliff with a stairway going up, but of course you don't take the stairs. Instead, you make a leap of faith and walk down to the lower left corner where you get all three whip upgrades, the cross, and a ton of hearts. I like stuff like this because if you want to fight and beat Dracula with max weapons, you can do that and it gives you some incentive to go back and try and beat him without the invisible staircase for a bit more of a challenge. Super Empire Strikes Back has something similar to this, but at the very beginning of the game, you come across a chasm, press down and B to get off your tauntaun, and there's an invisible platform here with a series of other platforms to the left. Just swing your lightsaber around and various power-ups and extra lives will appear. Here's another one of those hidden things that I found funny. In Link to the Past, if you dash into a tree, sometimes you'll see some apples falling out, or a fairy, and sometimes you'll upset a swarm of bees and they'll come after you, except for one bee, which is referred to as the Golden Bee. You find it near the same place you get the ice rod in the southeastern part of the map. Go into this cave here and dash into the statue and a bee appears. Catch it and keep it in a jar, then release it and watch it go nuts on enemies. Maybe this is old news to some of you, but I had no idea this was a thing until years after I first played this game. It's a pretty dang cool secret, and it even works against the Moth boss in the third crystal dungeon in the Dark World. But bear in mind, if you use your bee helper there, you have to go back to the same place to get him again. Still, it's worth it. I'd like to see a hack or a patchery play this entire game as the bee. I have no idea if that's even within the realm of possibility, but it would be pretty funny. I also have to mention a trick you can do in Final Fantasy VI that really comes in handy if you're getting sick of random battles. It's referred to as the Vanish Doom bug, or the Vanish X-Zone bug. And it only works in early versions of this game, but it does work in the game on the SNES Classic as well. All you have to do is cast Vanish on an enemy, then cast either Doom or X-Zone, and voila! Enemy defeated. This even works on certain bosses as long as they're not immune to status spells. So yeah, tired of those Zone Eaters and Intangirs taking forever to fight? Then just vanish and X-Zone or doom them away. Finally, here's a glitch in Link to the Past that allows you to beat the game in about three minutes, and it's pretty easy to do as far as glitches go. All you gotta do is start a brand new game and proceed as you normally would. You head into the main room of the castle with the double doors, go up the stairs, and jump off this spot right here, hit select, and save and quit. When you resume, you're back where you got the sword from your uncle, and then head back to where you were before, avoiding every soldier, but this time head to the upstairs door on the left. Go to this window and charge your sword attacks so it taps the wall, and keep leaning to the left. That'll get the guard's attention, and he'll attack and push you into the wall. Now you can keep going up past the next room, but stop once you get to the room after that, and head to the right. You can kind of see Link's head there, and you want to walk all the way up the right side this time, past all of these rooms. Oh hey Ganon, what's up? Hey, I'm just gonna take this Triforce over here, alright? And yep, just like that, you have completed Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past in three minutes. Alright, that's all for now. I know there's about a gazillion codes and cheats out there, so let me know what I'm missing in the comments. I hope to do a part two of this video and include some Game Genie stuff, so until then, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.
Snatch Drunk. Hello and welcome to part two of the best cheat codes on Super Nintendo, this time focusing on the one and only Game Genie. You used to be able to plug this thing into your console first, then plug the cartridge into the Game Genie. It essentially acts as a bypass between the cartridge and the console, with the Game Genie having the unique ability to manipulate the code to a certain extent within whatever game you have plugged into it. So for example, if a game like Super Star Wars is being a giant pain to play through, and it usually is for just about everyone, then you can enter in an 8 character code that gets you 99 lives, or 100 continues, or maybe twice as much health as usual, or you start the game with every available power up or whatever. The way codes work is twofold. The first four characters refer to the number of items or lives you want changed, and the last four characters refer to the location within the game's code. I'm aware that's a very crude way of describing it, I just wanted to briefly sum it up, with the point being that you, yes, you watching this, if you were so inclined, could make your very own Game Genie codes through a little research and trial and error. They even sold codebooks way back when that helped guide you through how to make codes for certain games, like this comment here from Daniel explains, who says that he and his brother made a code for Super Mario World that allowed you to pass an entire level with just one jump. Now that's great. The problem, however, is that many, many codes end up crashing the game. It's not permanent or anything, it just means the code you're using isn't compatible. Still, that's not gonna dampen these totally righteous dudes' enthusiasm. Game Genie! We tell you when it's over! With Game Genie, I decide how many lives I get! I use it when I wanna live forever! Play to the end! And win! Maybe I wanna start on level 15! No problem! It makes cool games like Street Fighter 2! More exciting! Less frustrating! With Game Genie, it ain't over! So we say it's over! Excellent! Game Genie for NES, Super NES, Sega Genesis, and Game Boy. Codes from many popular games, each sold separately. Alright, it's gonna take all my power not to talk exactly like those guys the rest of the video because they're super radical, tubular, outrageous dudes, but anyway, the Game Genie had devices made for the NES, SNES, Genesis, Game Gear, and Game Boy, but for this video, I'm just focusing on the Super Nintendo. I also want to quickly address the infamous lawsuit from 1992. Nintendo sued the creator of the Game Genie, Galoob, citing that their device illegally creates derivative versions of copyrighted games that Nintendo had the rights to. California District Judge Fern M. Smith eventually ruled that the Game Genie did not violate any copyrights, comparing it to coming up with your own rules for a board game that you purchased, or fast-forwarding to certain parts of a videotape that you bought. Nintendo actually had to award Galoob over $15 million in legal fees and lost sales, and you want to know what's really funny? Sega took the complete opposite approach. Not only did they not sue, they actually encouraged Galoob and gave the Game Genie their official seal of approval for both the Genesis and Game Gear editions. Alright, enough of all that, let's get to some of these codes. They're each going to be displayed at the bottom of the screen so you don't have to listen to me read them out loud. They're also listed in the video description if you want to find them there. Starting with Street Fighter 2 Turbo, this is probably my favorite fighting game ever so it's pretty fun to mess with the game and all sorts of different stuff, like being able to do special moves in mid-air. Some moves are really difficult to pull off, like the moves that require you to hold down a direction on the d-pad for a while, like Guile's Spin Kick or Sonic Boom. But quicker moves like Hadoukens, Yoga Flames, and Chun-Li's Fireball are really easy to do mid-jump. You can even do E-Honda's 100 Hand Slap and Chun-Li's Rapid Fire Lightning Kick while jumping, but they don't last too long. Bear in mind though, like most of these Game Genie codes, they're not perfect, and there are a couple moves that will crash the game, like Vega's Wall Jump. There's a ton of character-specific codes here as well, like for example this one that has Ryu jumping from one side of the screen to another almost instantly. Now that's funny. Especially when you manage to land a kick that just obliterates your opponent and sends them flying as well. There's also codes that make certain moves just ridiculously overpowered, like Sagat's Tiger Uppercut, which nearly launches him off the screen, but the code I really like slows projectiles way, way down, so they just kind of linger on the screen for like 5 or 6 seconds. They don't hurt you, but if you're playing a faster opponent that jumps around a lot, like Chun-Li, it's pretty funny to see them inadvertently back into a Hadouken that's been lingering on screen forever. You can also stack some of these codes so you can have multiple cheats at once, although that's always a bit risky since since you can potentially crash the game that way. Still, it's always worth a shot, because when these work, they're so much fun. 
Other Street Fighter games have their share of fun codes as well, like Super Street Fighter 2, where every strike you land causes your opponent to burst into flames. The same applies where you get hit too, so there are instances where you both go down engulfed in a fireball, which is pretty funny. I love this one because I'm pretty sure I've seen some old Godfrey Ho Kung Fu movies from way back when, where a simple sweeping kick would cause someone to somehow scorch off all their own flesh or something. Bear in mind there's two codes for this one you have to enter, one on top of the other, and if fire isn't your thing, there's also a pair of codes that have your opponent get electrocuted on a simple punch. You gotta love that. Even games that aren't as action-packed have their share of codes, like Pilot Wings. It's always fun to mess with simulation-style games like this, like this code here that increases your jetpack power three times stronger so you can zoom around way off the map without worrying about running out of fuel. There's also codes that can either reduce or increase the gravity throughout the entire game, which adds a bit of a challenge. SimCity has some helpful codes as well. There is one where for every single thing you build, you get exactly one dollar. Nothing costs any money, you just get a dollar every time you put something in your town. This is a nice alternative to the money cheat I talked about in part one, since that one can be a bit complicated to get to work properly. There's also a code that addresses what might be the biggest issue with the Super Nintendo edition of SimCity, the passage of time. Even the fastest time setting just seems way too slow, to the point that when back when I was a kid, if I wanted to see any real growth with my city, I'd just leave the game on, turn the TV off, and go to bed, and by the time I'd wake up, a few years would have passed. And yeah, sometimes half my city would be on fire, but that was simply the easiest way to see some real progress in this game. Thankfully, there's a Game Genie code that speeds up time even more, so months go by in a matter of about 10 or 15 seconds, so it's perfect for just hitting pause on the timer, building a bunch of stuff, then starting it up again and actually watching your city grow, instead of going to bed and hoping it doesn't burst into flames. Link to the Past is another game that has dozens of Game Genie codes, everything from getting the best sword and armor right away, to infinite bombs and magic, to something as simple as free fortune telling. One of the most fun, though, is being able to warp between worlds freely. Just equip the magic mirror like you normally would, only you're not bound to the one place you warped from. Now you can just wander around and press the Y button, and you'll flip over to the other world. This is really fun to play with, especially since you can very easily warp to a place where you're not supposed to go. Like, if you end up in the water in the Dark World, you can swim up here where the game starts to lose its mind and glitch out. It's always fun to just wander around and see what kind of trouble you can get into like this. Another more useful code keeps the first bottle in your inventory filled with an infinite amount of health and MP potion, just in case you want to make your adventure a little easier. But there's also a code so that some shops won't accept your money if you want to make your playthrough a bit harder. I've had some codes recommended to me, and I have to admit, some I just don't get. Like this one for Mega Man X, which is referred to as the Brain Damage Code. If you take damage at any point, the turbo function of the Start button gets activated, and it does not stop, ever. You're just stuck playing the game like this. This is about a thousand times more annoying than it is challenging. Maybe this was something you just did to annoy your younger sibling or something. Thankfully, there's much more fun codes in Mega Man X, like this one that allows you to do the Hadouken Fireball at any time, multiple times, even in mid-air. I love this section here with the end of Armored Armadillo stage where you're riding on the cart. You can just spam the screen with tons of fireballs. It's great. There are some great quality of life Game Genie codes out there, particularly for Earthbound. Now, one downside of this game, or really any old RPG, is how much you have to grind and how many random battles you gotta sit through. Well, this code allows you to automatically win most random battles you come across. Normally, the game does this when your party has demonstrably better stats than the enemy you encounter, but this code will activate that mechanic for most battles regardless of stats. Of course, it won't work for boss fights, but I should mention that it also won't work if another enemy sneaks into your encounter. Still, it's really nice to have this as an option to cut out some of the more monotonous grinding. If that's not enough for you, the Game Genie has a series of codes that allows you to access the debug menu. It's three codes you have to enter, then go to an ATM, and you're met with this menu here. And, uh, yeah, this is just a bit confusing. There is a guide you can look up to help out with this if you're so inclined. You can mess around with what items and weapons you have, where you are in the game, who's in your party, and so on. 
So far, I've covered nothing but popular games, so what about some lesser-known stuff? Well, to be honest, there's not that much out there outside of the usual codes that simply give you infinite lives, invincibility, max hit points, and every item, and all that kind of stuff, but there are a few interesting codes for some games out there that you might not have thought of very often, like Arrow the Acrobat 2. This is actually a pretty good game, but unfortunately it's hampered by the fact that the arrow sprite is momentum based, so it takes a bit for him to speed up and slow down, which really gets annoying in a faster paced platformer like this. Thankfully, there's a code out there that eliminates Arrow's momentum entirely, which makes this game much more player friendly, and it also helps steady the camera viewpoint a little bit. Like I said, most games will have an infinite lives code, but if I had to recommend just one of those to use, it'd be for Pocky and Rocky. This game is really freaking good and a lot of fun, but unfortunately it's just brutally difficult with enemies and projectiles coming from any and every direction, with the intensity increasing the further you get into the game. But thankfully, with a code that gives you unlimited lives, you can actually see the whole game, or at least get to the, some of the crazy bosses, or the heart-wrenching setting where you see all your animal friends being held captive. Now if that doesn't inspire you to get good at this game, then nothing will. And this game is very tough to get good at, but at least an unlimited lives code can help you practice. Bear in mind there's separate codes for both Pocky and Rocky, so make sure you use the right one, depending on who you pick. Finally, how is it I've gone this long without talking Ken Griffey Jr.? Well, unfortunately, there aren't many interesting codes for Griffey Presents MLB, my favorite sports game ever. It's all stuff like walk on one ball or only needing two outs instead of three. But the sequel, Ken Griffey Jr.'s Winning Run, has a code that has you hit a home run every single time you take a swing. I've been hard on this game over the years because I've never liked that the cartoony graphics of the original were replaced with a dark, semi-realistic presentation, but hey, you can't beat going yard every single time you come up. You can still strike out, of course, and the problem with this code is that uh, it works for the computer opponent too, so it's either strike the guy out or give up a home run, there's no other options. It definitely brings a new level of difficulty to the game while still keeping it fun. Alright, that's all for now. I hope to someday do a video dedicated to action replay codes, but until then, I want to thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day! Hello and welcome to part 3 of this video series where I talk about cheat codes and Super Nintendo games, one of my favorite things to talk about. When I first got into gaming as a kid, I was obsessed with collecting cheat codes and passwords and learning about tricks and secrets and stuff. Nintendo Power was a goldmine for a lot of this, obviously, especially the classified information section, but there's still some oddball quirks out there that even that magazine never covered. Sometimes these codes can be really useful and make the game even more fun, and sometimes they can be just plain weird. I'll give you an example of what I mean. There's a code in Konami's International Superstar Soccer Deluxe that turns the referee into a dog. Yes, that's right, just enter the Konami code on the second controller at the title screen, and you'll know it works when you hear a dog barking. And uh, that's all this code does. No real power-ups or benefits or anything, just uh, the referee is a dog. You gotta love that. And it appears to be a good boy, kind of like a certain Clyde dog that I know. The way these codes were implemented can be kind of funny too, like in the game Cool Spot. At this screen that says Virgin Games, hold L and R and press select 30 times before it disappears, and you'll get access to a stage select menu. The Super Nintendo library is littered with codes and secrets like this, so let's take a look at some more. Starting with Donkey Kong Country, here's one code that's a huge help to folks that are new to the game or if you just get sick of running out of lives. On the main menu, highlight where it says Erase Game, then enter B-A-R-R-A-L on the controller or barrel. And just like that, and you start out with 50 lives, and this works on both a brand new game and on any battery save files you might have. Another code you can enter is Diddy, or D-Y-D-D-Y, -D -D -Y. just enter down Y, down down Y while the intro is playing, and you'll be sent to a menu where you can practice some of the bonus games. There's also a code that allows you to switch freely between characters when playing with a second player, B, A, down, B, up, down, down, and Y, which spells Bad Buddy. And again, you enter that one when highlighting the Erase Game option on the main menu. 
Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island is another game that has a code that unlocks mini games you can go practice. Go to the level selection screen, hold select, and press XXYBA. You can do this at any time as long as you're on the level select menu, and it unlocks a secret menu that lets you play the mini games you occasionally run into on your playthrough. One game has you fighting over coins against a computer opponent, another has you spitting and dodging watermelon seeds, and the other has you playing Simon Says within a time limit. And what's really cool is that the latter two games are compatible with a second player. This is the rare cheat code that doesn't make you overpowered or let you skip levels, but instead unlocks not one, but two multiplayer minigames. You gotta love that. In a previous video in this series, I talked about the SimCity Money Code, where you play out this convoluted process over the course of an entire in-game year in order to get a gazillion dollars. There's another code for this game, you can either start a new city or load a saved one, and immediately go up and quit your game. When you see the See You Soon screen here, take controller 2 and enter left, A, right, Y, up, B, down, X, select, start, start, select, R, R, L, L. And just like that, you've got access to the debug menu. You can turn off disasters, build stuff without paying for it by turning on the needless money option, maximize the demand for residential, commercial, and industrial zones, and my favorite, being able to bulldoze water. Just set the memory option to set and reset your Super Nintendo and all those options are now available to you. If you want to deactivate them, just go back the same way and change the memory option to clear. I love this one. It's so satisfying being able to finally play on a map that has zero water in the way. This next one is for Star Fox, and I've talked about it before, but I want to talk about it again because it's one of my favorites. It's more of a secret than a cheat code, but, well, it's a secret that very much functions as a cheat code since this trick allows you to leap ahead in the game or even leap over to different paths. I'm of course talking about the Black Hole. You find it in the second level on the easiest path in the Asteroid Belt. To get the black hole to show up, you have to blow up these asteroid windmill things, and you have to do it way up close or it won't work. After blowing apart all three, you'll see a silver asteroid with a troll face on it. Naturally, you're gonna want to shoot it, and when you do, a black hole appears. I don't remember how I found out about this secret, but the first time I did it, I could not freaking believe what I was seeing. I love that the black hole itself is just this junkyard of enemy ships, with cannons misfiring, creatures from Sector Y glom onto you. It's really cool. You have three different warp points here. The first ring takes you to Sector Y, the second ring takes you to Sector Z, and the third ring takes you straight to Venom on the easiest path. So if you're looking for a faster way to crank through Star Fox, then here you go. The Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse is one of those games that features a weird random secret that you'd never guess in a million years. The trick is you break yellow blocks until you find a small heart, but don't pick it up right away, pause the game, then hold start and select on both the first and second player controllers, then pick up the heart. You'll hear the Capcom logo music, and you'll get full hearts, 999 coins, 9 lives, and 990 seconds on the timer, and you can do this trick any time during the game, but there is a cost. For some reason when this happens, the music just uh, stops playing entirely. At least until you get to a boss fight, then it comes back for whatever reason. Weird stuff like that is littered across all sorts of games, and sometimes not all the codes make sense as anything useful, like this one in Super Turrican. You can pause the game at any time, and press up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, and then unpause, and, uh, your controls are reversed. I'm not entirely sure what purpose this serves, but it's there. Nothing beats a good password that makes you overpowered as hell, especially in a racing game, and in Top Gear 3000, it is the easiest password to remember. It's all Bs all the way across, and you get a gazillion dollars to get all the top upgrades so you can blow past any other car in your way. I love simple passwords like that, that are easy to remember. It's like an extra game mode you can switch to anytime you want. Passwords and codes that spell things out are always welcome too, like for example in the Super Nintendo port of Wing Commander, there's a stage select code at the title screen. You just enter B-A-B-Y-B-Y-L-A-R-A, -A -A, then start. That's right, the code spells out Baby by Lara. Well, congratulations on your baby, wherever you are, Lara. I know there's tons of passwords out there that spell things out like that. Let me know which ones I'm forgetting in the comments. As a kid, I always appreciated having a code that would help ease into a more difficult game. Like, for example, in Battletoads and Battle Maniacs, at the Trade West Presents screen, you press and hold A, B, and down while pressing Start, and you get an extra two lives and two continues. 
Same thing with Super Smash TV, just press down, L, R, and up on the player select screen and you'll be able to add a few lives and continues. It's nothing that makes you super overpowered or has you cheat the game or anything, it's just a small thing that helps make the most of your time as you practice and get better. Speaking of difficult games, here's an unusual code for Hagane. It's an infinite continues cheat, but the trick is to go to the configuration screen, highlight the music option, and play tracks 9, 8, 7, and 6 in that exact order. Sheesh, how do they come up with this stuff? Sometimes, however, you want to make an already difficult game even harder, and if that's what you're into, look no further than the gamer difficulty mode in UN Squadron. Just go to the options menu, hold X and A on controller 2, then press right on the D-pad twice on controller 1, and abracadabra, you've earned the right to die three dozen times in about 20 minutes. Seriously, gamer difficulty is relentlessly tough, but if that's what you're looking for, then here you go. Well, all right, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. That's drunk. One thing that sucks about having a hobby that goes back three decades is that there is a lot of misinformation out there and no real way to prove what's true and what isn't. Hell, I'm guilty of obliviously peddling some misinformation. I mean, I don't know any better. Just because I'm sharing my hobby through a YouTube channel doesn't make me any kind of authority on anything. I'm some guy trying to do the best I can. But there are some bits and pieces out there that need to be flushed out, like turds in a toilet bowl, factoids that don't really have any hard evidence to back them up. A good example of this is the myth surrounding the game Hagane. Somehow, some some way, this game got saddled with the label Blockbuster Exclusive, meaning it was only available for rent through Blockbuster Video, and only available for purchase if they decided to sell it to dump some inventory. The first instance I can see of this floating around is from a CGR video from 2009, which has since accumulated 48,000 views, but then the story really blew up when it was brought up on Mike Matei's Super Nintendo Hidden Gems video, which has well over 2 million views. Well, let's put this one to bed right now. Here is an actual Blockbuster Exclusive game cover for the game Final Fight Guy. It says right there on the cover with a huge logo, Blockbuster Exclusive. Let's look at Hagane's cover. Huh, no mention of Blockbuster whatsoever. In fact, on the back cover, it says this game is for sale. And sure enough, there's a bunch of mail order listings out there where you can buy Hagane for the same price as just about any other game. Let's check out Nintendo Power's six-page review of the game. Surely that's gotta mention something. Nope, not a word about any sort of blockbuster deal. Same with Game Fan and Game Pro's reviews. So yeah, don't believe the nonsense about Hagane, because it doesn't appear that that story is based on anything. Unfortunately, that hasn't stopped the meteoric rise in the price of the cartridge. Hagane remains one of the most expensive Super Nintendo games out there, and that leads me to the BS surrounding cartridge rarity. Let's face it, nobody knows anything about how rare a game really is, despite what an eBay, Craigslist, or Amazon listing might try and tell you. Sure, there are some instances where production of a game like Uniracers was halted due to a lawsuit, and there's proof written in court records saying the game had to be limited to its initial run of 300,000 copies, so that much we know. And of course, we know certain games have sold a ton, like just about all of Nintendo's first-party titles. But after that, there's not a lot of hard information to base anything on, simply because too much time has passed and a lot of game publishers of the time have since folded or have been bought out, leading to a lot of data being lost. To give you an example, when I was trying to find out more information about Hagane, I had to contact Konami. Hagane was published on the Super Nintendo by Hudson Soft, but they were bought out in 2011 by Konami Digital Entertainment. I sent them an email asking about Hagane's publishing run, and they responded two days later essentially saying, I don't know. And realistically, how would they know? I'm probably talking to some overworked, underpaid customer service rep who just wants me to go away. So unless someone out there with a lot of resources does a deep dive into this thing, nobody really knows anything, and that's just how it is. However, not all is without hope, and collectors out there are making do with what information is still out there. For instance, the folks at NintendoAge.com have created what's considered a rarity guide. Now, this is still based on a lot of anecdotal information, but it's at least provided by a large group of people who have been in the SNES collecting game for decades. It ranks the cartridge, instruction manual, and box individually, and it comes to some pretty interesting conclusions, based on scattershot information, personal experience, and informal tidbits like how often this stuff is actually seen in the wild. It is far from perfect, but it's better than nothing. I just thought I'd throw that out there. 
Anyway, moving on, thanks to Twist C from the SNES Drunk Discord chat for pointing this one out. Another rumor that's lingered for years involves Donkey Kong Country. There was a quote that had been floating around for years that Nintendo producer and game designer Shigeru Miyamoto saying, Donkey Kong Country proves gamers will put up with mediocre gameplay if the art is good. That quote spawned all kinds of nonsense theories like that Miyamoto resented Donkey Kong Country's success and thought his vision for Yoshi's Island was far superior, or whatever. It was ridiculous. It turns out the quote was a complete mystery translation from Japanese to English, and Miyamoto was actually closely involved with the development of the game, providing feedback to Rare at every turn. And to this day, Miyamoto remains involved in the development of the modern Donkey Kong Country series. Thanks to LHC Greg from the chat for mentioning this, it's one that I myself have gotten wrong for years. Remember that Final Fight Guy game I mentioned earlier? I've always thought this game was just the exact same game as the SNES port of Final Fight, only with Guy replacing Cody. You know, whoop de doo who cares? But they actually did make some subtle improvements in the gameplay, a lot of it just from simply fixing most of the slowdown. There's four different difficulty modes as well, and the enemy placement reflects that. There's also small touches here and there that help the game align with the original arcade version. For instance, now there's one up and invincibility power-ups and barrels, and there's some subtle visual changes as well. Yeah, this game is definitely still flawed and still a missed opportunity. It's still censored, there's no checkpoints, it's still missing a level, and there's no two-player co-op. But Final Fight Guy is actually a better playthrough than the first SNES Final Fight port. And even better, if you get the Super Famicom version of the game, it has Roxy and Poison instead of Billy and Sid. So there you go. Here's one pointed out by Kulor from the chat, and it comes from the Super Mario 64 Wikipedia page. It says that Miyamoto considered using the Super FX chip to try and develop a 3D Mario game for Super Nintendo, as he told Nintendo Power in January of 1996, and so began the myth that there was a 3D Mario game in development that was never released. After all, the code name for the Super FX chip was Super Mario FX, and the chip has the name Mario printed on it, but this was never the case. The always rock-solid and reliable SNES Central took to Twitter and straight up asked former Argonaut engineer Dylan Cuthbert about it, and he would know since he was the lead coder for Star Fox, and should anyone be chosen to work on such a Mario game, it would, in all likelihood, be him. However, he flat out denied that there was any development, saying that Super Mario FX was just a code name. To end this video, I want to address a few talking points regarding certain Super Nintendo games. Now, these obviously aren't factual statements, they're just things that many people have come to a consensus on over the years. And one of them is that Shaq Fu is not only the worst Super Nintendo game ever, but the worst video game ever, period. Yes, that's right, I've come to bat for Shaq Fu, but not because it's good. Just because, you know, it's not that bad. In fact, it's not even in the top three worst fighting games on the Super Nintendo. There's crap like Rise of the Robots, Street Combat, and of course, who could forget Pit Fighter. Shaq Fu at least has good looking sprites and good music. Yeah, the combat sucks, but I still feel like the game isn't even half as bad as people say it is. I think people hate the idea of Shaq Fu more than anything else. Like, Shaq in a fighting game? Yeah, that's pretty stupid. But there is so much worse out there. There's another talking point that everyone just kinda agrees on, and that's that the Sega Genesis has better sports games than the Super Nintendo. This one's always been kinda interesting to me, because if you remember when the Genesis launched back in 1989, it relied heavily on name recognition. It invested a lot of dough in names like Joe Montana, Mario Lemieux, heavyweight champion Buster Douglas, Pat Riley, Tommy Lasorda, on and on. Many of those games were fine at the time, and definite upgrades over their NES contemporaries, especially in terms of visuals and sound. But playing them today, your mileage varies big time. Another part of the sports game argument is EA Sports. Let's face it, a lot of EA games on Super Nintendo frickin' suck. The FIFA series is a disaster with crappy controls and a bad frame rate, most of the Madden games are a mess of nonsense, and the NHL series simply plays better on Genesis. All that leads people to believe that the Genesis undisputedly has the advantage when it comes to sports games, but I think it's pretty stupid to jump to that big of a conclusion. There's still the Tecmo Super Bowl games, there's still NBA Give and Go, there's still Extra Innings, Super Baseball Simulator 1000, Ken Griffey Jr. presents Major League Baseball. The point is, the gap is much smaller when it comes to sports games than people think. Alright, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S S
A few weeks ago, I posted a video about myths regarding the Super Nintendo, mostly dealing with stuff that had been accepted as fact over the years like Hagane being a blockbuster exclusive, spoiler alert, it's not, or the existence of a 3D Mario prototype on Super Nintendo, spoiler alert, it never existed. What I didn't consider for that video, which was brought up in the comments and on Twitter, was the sheer amount of rumors that originated at school, or maybe something your friend made up, or maybe your friend's friend whose dad's second cousin's former roommate who worked at Squaresoft totally knows how to unlock General Leo as a playable character in Final Fantasy VI. I'm referring to those total nonsense rumors that took a life of their own and spiraled off into gobbledygook crazy talk. Everybody has their own BS rumors they'd been told as kids, so I'll just start with a couple of mine. One of the major ones for me was that Darth Vader was somehow an unlockable character in Super Empire Strikes Back, and it had to do with losing your battle against him in a way that would glitch the game, and you'd start the game over playing as Vader. This is, of course, total crap, but man, it was so fun to imagine. Back when this game came out, you never got to play as the bad guy, so daydreaming about this possibility was a lot of fun. Of course, there are plenty of cheat codes that can have Luke start with all the force powers, or access the debug mode, or even skip straight to the Vader fight. And there's plenty of Game Genie codes out there too, but there was nothing that allowed you to play as Vader. Moving on, another schoolyard rumor I was subject to concerned Mega Man X. When you come to the end of the opening level, you face Vile for the first time, and it's a battle you're supposed to lose. Vile doesn't even have a health meter, but that of course didn't stop a certain annoying 6th grade kid in my school from bragging about how he actually defeated Vile and skipped the appearance of Zero altogether. This is of course total crap. Vile can kill you, albeit it would have to be kind of by accident, but you cannot defeat Vile at the beginning of the game. How do I know this is true? Well, for one thing, there's no evidence of it actually actually happening, and also it makes sense to lose to Vile because it introduces Zero and sets the story in motion, so it's easy to deduce that Vile would be made invincible to keep that chain of events in order. Speaking of Mega Man X, there's also some nonsense floating around out there about X being able to do a Hadouken. Well, pff, that sounds way too awesome to be real. There's no way that's... Actually 100% real and it's freaking badass as hell and anyone can do it. You have to have every heart upgrade, sub tank, and weapon and you have to head to the end of Armored Armadillo's level with 100% health and at least 5 lives. You jump dash above the door and promptly kill yourself 4 times in a row. The 5th time you head up there, you should see the upgrade capsule where you get the incredibly powerful Hadouken. You gotta be at full health to be able to use it, but you can pretty much just one shot bosses. It is incredibly badass. One of the most common rumors from back then involved the Super Nintendo version of Mortal Kombat and the infamous Blood Code. This existed in the Sega Genesis edition of the game, just press A-B-A-C-A-B-B, or Abacab, after you boot up the game and you come to the screen that mysteriously references a code of some kind. Once that's entered, you get blood and uncensored fatalities unlocked. Even the Master System and Game Gear editions of the game had a blood code of some kind. The people that owned the Super Nintendo edition, however, were out of luck. Despite whatever rumors you've heard back then, there was no such blood code because there's nothing to unlock. The developers never put the uncensored fatalities in there in the first place. The best you can do on the SNES is use the Game Genie code that turns the gray quote-unquote sweat into blood, but it's just not the same, and plus the fatalities are still censored. I should mention that there's a ROM hack that's been made since that does a bit better of a job restoring the blood than the Game Genie does, but it's still kind of lame. Mortal Kombat was subject to a ton of rumors back then, and not just the blood code. For example, who's this mysterious guy who looks just like Scorpion in Sub-Zero, only he's wearing green? That's right, you can actually fight this dude in the arcade, Genesis, and Super Nintendo editions of the game. You have to be fighting at the pit in a one-player game, get a flawless victory in both rounds, and finish with a fatality. Then you move to the bottom of the pit to fight Reptile. That's pretty cool. Okay, it's clearly just a green palette swap using Scorpion and Sub-Zero's moves, but still, kinda neat. The rumors didn't end there though, soon enough there were stories about unlocking Reptile as a playable character, and unfortunately that's BS. We had to wait around until Mortal Kombat 2 for that. But yeah, there's all sorts of weird stuff that still surrounds the original Super Nintendo Mortal Kombat, everything from Goro being a playable character to a code that makes Sonya naked. Pretty ridiculous stuff, and none of it is based on fact. Maybe the most infamous fighting game rumor came courtesy of Electronic Gaming Monthly regarding Street Fighter 2. 
Now, this deals with the arcade game and not necessarily the Super Nintendo edition, but I still have to talk about it because it's just too funny. It all started with a mistranslation of Ryu's Shoryuken. When Ryu wins a fight, he's quoted in Japanese as saying, if you cannot overcome the Shoryuken, you cannot win. Because of a mix-up between Japanese characters and Chinese pinyin, the English arcade edition was translated to, you must defeat Sheng Long to stand a chance. Wait, what? Who the hell is that? Doubling down on the weirdness is the Super Nintendo instruction manual for Street Fighter 2 listing Ryu and Ken as students of Master Sheng Long. So, EGM humorously took that mistake and ran with it in an April Fool's prank in 1992, revealing a phony method to quote-unquote unlock Sheng Long in the arcade game, creating a method discovered by W.A. Stokens. Waste tokens, get it? Supposedly, if you don't take any damage in an entire playthrough using Ryu, just play M. Bison to a time limit draw, again without taking any damage, and repeat this M. Bison battle 10 times, and then Sheng Long would appear from nowhere and toss Bison out of the way and fight Ryu himself. This, of course, spread like wildfire since Street Fighter 2 was so dang popular, but a couple months later, EGM revealed that they made it all up. They did a similar stunt for April Fools in 1997 when discussing Street Fighter 3, this time going as far as providing artwork and screenshots. People still clamor for Sheng Long, and there's multiple fan-made videos floating around out there depicting what he would look like and how he would play, but make no mistake, there was never a Sheng Long in the original Street Fighter 2. Another rumor that's persisted for years involves Final Fantasy VI. Now, if you haven't played this game, you might want to skip ahead to the next part of the video at around 8 minutes 10 seconds, because there's some spoilers here. Ready? Okay. Toward the middle of the game, a non-playable character named General Leo is killed by the main villain, Kefka. There's been a rumor floating around for years that General Leo can be revived if you do something ridiculous like kill 4,000 dragons in the forest east of Gao's house, which makes a golden dragon appear and drop what's called a revive potion or some resurrection ability, and you go to Leo's grave and revive him. This is all nonsense. Leo's definitely not a playable character, and he definitely can't be revived, because none of that stuff can be found in any other programming code, as pointed out by many Final Fantasy fans over the years on all sorts of forums, ranging from GameFAQs to old Final Fantasy forums from way back. There is no golden dragon in the monsters list of the game coding, and there is no revival potion. They just simply don't exist. You would actually have to modify the game's code itself to make this happen. So yeah, this rumor is BS. But thanks to Dandy Roddick on Twitter for bringing it up. One Final Fantasy VI rumor that's actually not BS, however, is that... Okay, again, there's more spoilers here. Skip to 810 if you don't want to hear this. Ready? Okay. You can actually save Sid from dying. Thanks to Sir Chadley OC on the SNES Trunk Discord for bringing this one up. When Sid is on his deathbed and you're playing as Celis, Sid will actually have an unseen health counter that goes down anytime you're not on the world map. So just spend as little time in the house as possible and keep bringing Sid fish. It usually takes about 10 or 12 to save him, and they can't be slow moving or rotten fish either, or that'll just decrease his health. They have to be medium or fast moving fish. Once Sid is feeling better, he'll get up and open the door to the raft and he just hangs out outside and watches you leave. I just thought that was kind of a neat touch. Finally, I want to end with one that happened to me as a kid, and I was able to recreate the same thing recently. Even if you don't care for sports games, I think you'll get a kick out of this one. Alright, so when you're a kid playing a game by yourself and you die or get defeated or whatever under some dubious circumstances, what's your first thought? It's that the computer cheated, right? This was especially common thinking in sports games, at least in my experience, where the computer AI just decided it had enough of me winning, so I'd inexplicably drop the ball or something like that. It was BS, of course, but it was nothing outside of the actual rules of the game. But one day when I was finishing my season in Madden 95, I was playing a playoff game and I was comfortably ahead running out the clock and the computer keeps calling timeout to stop the clock so they can get the ball back. Makes sense, that's normal behavior. But then the computer runs out of timeouts and it starts calling teams? What in the hell is that? Los Angeles calls Oakland? What, are they gonna make a last second trade or something? And they still counted as timeouts and stopped the clock. Seriously, the computer called Carolina, Jacksonville. It just decided right then and there to just use as many timeouts as it wanted. I still ended up winning the game, but it was hilariously strange, and it proved to me a theory that I've long had since I was a kid. Sometimes the computer really does cheat. And with that, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.
drunk. Hello and welcome to part three of this series where I talk about old rumors and such, primarily regarding Super Nintendo games. Like for example, in the past I've talked about how Hagane was never actually a blockbuster exclusive, or how there's no actual blood code in the Super Nintendo version of the original Mortal Kombat, or even nonsense rumors like how you can totally play as Shang Long in Street Fighter 2 if you beat the game with Ryu without taking any damage or whatever. The thing is though, with a lot of these schoolyard type rumors, there's no actual way to disprove a lot of them without actually digging into the programming code itself and saying, see, there's nothing there. So in the meantime, you're always gonna have weird rumors like how there's a secret platinum sword you can find in Link to the Past if you throw just the right sequence of stuff into the fairy pond. Guess what, it's not true. Or how you can unlock Luigi as a playable character in Super Mario RPG because hey, come on, he's right there in the parade at the end of the game. So there must be a way to unlock him. Nope. It's never happened. I'm sure someone out there has made a fake video of it, but there's no actual way to do it. Or here's one that was really popular at my school when I was a kid. You can unlock all the bosses in the SNES version of the original Street Fighter 2. All you gotta do is some absurd sequence that also happens to unlock Chun-Li's secret fireball attack. Again, there's no real way to disprove any of this without tearing apart the code, but even then you'd need an adequate way to explain and demonstrate what you're actually looking at. Then you'd need to explain what that kind of code would look like, and it's just an endless rabbit hole. All I can tell you in the meantime is there's no Platinum Sword, there's no way to play as Luigi in Mario RPG, and there's no Chun-Li Fireball. It doesn't show up on Super Nintendo until Street Fighter 2 Turbo. These were just stories made up by kids at school just because they're fun to imagine, and it was an easy way to deal with all the limitations we had to deal with back then. There's even goofy stuff out there in the emulation world that simply comes from someone ripping a ROM and naming it something weird like Rockman and Forte, mislabeled as Rockman 9 or something like that, and there's also random weird stuff that people insist on tossing around as fact, like, quote, Nintendo did not allow most third parties to use custom sound drivers or make their own samples. Only certain companies were allowed. Meanwhile, there's just no evidence of that whatsoever, so I don't understand that one at all. Thanks to Kular for pointing that one out. Let's get back to stuff that can actually be disproven, like this story about how the US and NTSC regions were supposed to get Secret of Mana 2, otherwise known as Seiken Densetsu 3 and now known as Trials of Mana, but instead we ended up getting Secret of Evermore as a replacement. This is complete crap, and it was not an either-or situation. We were getting Secret of Evermore no matter what. According to an interview on Nintendo Life with the game's lead programmer, Brian Fadrow, Square put together a team out in Redmond, Washington to specifically work on Secret of Evermore and nothing else. Nobody else on the team even touched Seiken Densetsu 3. So, why didn't the US get that game? According to the February 1996 edition of Next Generation Magazine, it was scheduled for a North American release, but it was cancelled because of programming bugs they deemed too costly to fix in a timely manner. The February 2011 issue of Retro Gamer elaborates that fixing the issues wouldn't have been worth it because by the time it could have been ready for release, fifth generation consoles like PlayStation, Saturn, and even the N64 would have been in full swing. This is just pure speculation on my part, but if I had to guess what the issues were, it's the actual text and translation. According to the team that worked on the fan translation of Seiken Densetsu 3, they had to create a brand new kind of text editor from scratch just to get past all the layers of compression. And even then, the fan translation wasn't ready to roll until 2000 due to the amount of work it required. Anyway, the point here is, the reason the US didn't get Secret of Mana 2 is because of time and money, not because someone thought Secret of Evermore would make an adequate replacement. We were gonna get that game anyway. There's a similar story out there regarding Final Fantasy V and Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. Now, some people resent the existence of a game like Mystic Quest, not just because it was made for a particular audience, namely people that were not already familiar with turn-based RPGs, but because some people were under the impression that Mystic Quest was a replacement for Final Fantasy V. Again, these two games were completely separate projects made by completely separate teams. The June 1994 issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly states that Final Fantasy V wasn't going to get localized in North America America because Square deemed it to be too difficult and too complex for the time. Ted Woolsey, Square's go-to English translator at the time, said in a 1992 issue of Ogopogo Examiner Newsletter, quote, that the game just wasn't accessible enough for the average gamer, unquote. Regarding Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, Woolsey said in that same interview, quote, action-adventure players tend to be younger and like the idea of jumping straight into the action with a sword in their hands, but with more traditional RPGs, it takes a good 15 or 20 hours of playing before you're finally hooked, unquote. In this particular case, I can see how this could have been an either-or scenario based on the US market at the time, but the fact remains that the US was getting Final Fantasy Mystic Quest anyway, and it wasn't a replacement for Final Fantasy V. 
Now here's a really goofy one that I don't even know how it got started. It involves Star Fox and unlocking some kind of secret level in the asteroid section of the hard path where you just shoot at this random asteroid on the right side until it blows up and it warps you to another dimension where you fight a giant slot machine? I mean, come on, that sounds totally made up and holy crap, it's actually real. What the hell? Yeah, you blow up that asteroid and out comes an egg in front of you. Something hatches and this bird warps you to another dimension where uh, you fight paper airplanes planes and letters. But yeah, you can actually beat this slot machine. You keep shooting the arm on the right and hope that you get three sevens in a row and it self-destructs. It's one of the most random what the hell was that things I've ever found in a game and I needed to point it out here. So yeah, if you ever hear about a slot machine in Star Fox, it's a real thing, believe it or not. Speaking of Super FX games, here's another weird, unsubstantiated rumor regarding the game Vortex. When the Super FX chip first launched, it really got people's imaginations racing as to what was possible on a home console. For instance, this sort of 3D format could have lended itself perfectly to a franchise like the Transformers, and in fact there was a game that was briefly in development based on Transformers Generation 2. However, what we ended up actually seeing on the shelves was this game, Vortex, and as you can see, it has nothing to do with Transformers. Some people were under the impression that Hasbro pulled the license because they didn't like the game, but Vortex and the Transformers game were completely separate projects and the Transformers game was simply cancelled, as confirmed in a 2015 interview with Argonaut Games programmer Michael Wong Powell. So yeah, Vortex is not a quote-unquote failed Transformers game, it's just kind of a uh, mediocre 3D shooter platformer hybrid, I guess. Last but not least, here's a really funny one from NBA Jam. I like to end these videos on sports games because anytime you're playing against the computer, you always get the feeling that it's just messing with you and it can win anytime it wants, right? Well, in NBA Jam for Super Nintendo, it's not just a feeling, it's reality. It was confirmed by lead programmer Mark Turmel in an interview with ESPN a few years ago that when you play as the Chicago Bulls against the Detroit Pistons, Scottie Pippen's ratings would drop across the board. His dunk rating, his three-point shooting, everything. He just absolutely sucked against the Pistons and only the Pistons. And not only that, anytime, and I mean anytime the Bulls had the ball with time running out and they'd take a shot from anywhere on the court, even from close range, it never went in, but only when they were playing the Pistons. Why? Because Turmel was a Pistons fan and he hated the Bulls, so he actually wrote a special code in the game just to screw with them. Man, the first time I read this, I was like, I knew it! I knew the programmers were doing stuff like this. And it proves once again that yes, sometimes the computer really does cheat. All right, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hello, it's time for part 4 of either proving or debunking long-time myths regarding the Super Nintendo and or Super Nintendo games. In the past, I've looked at total BS rumors, like Hagane not actually being a blockbuster exclusive, and looked at things that turned out to be true, like being able to earn a Hadouken fireball in Mega Man X. This time around, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Super Nintendo console itself. Now, for those of you out there that own an original Super Nintendo, what color is it? Is it gray like it's supposed to be, or is it kind of a weird yellowish beige color? I'm willing to bet a lot of folks watching this have a yellow Super Nintendo, and I bet a good number of you folks were told that the reason it turned yellow was because it stained from cigarette smoke. I'm also willing to bet that many of you who were told that were immediately confused by that information if nobody in your family smoked, and you'd be 100% right to be skeptical because cigarette smoke is not the reason Super Nintendo's turned yellow. Bromine is, according to Adam Savage's Tested.com. See, many electronics manufacturers use a plastic called ABS, or acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, but one of the main problems with that plastic is that it's got very poor resistance to UV rays to the point that it can become combustible, 
One popular solution was to work a flame retardant into the plastic mix, and in the case of Super Nintendo, that was bromine. But there was a side effect. When exposed to enough light for a long enough period of time, the chemical bonds in the plastic begin to erode, and as a result, the bromine in the plastic begins to oxidize, thus turning your Super Nintendo into a sickly yellow color, kind of similar to the way an apple would if you took a bite out of it and left it someplace. But hey, if you're stuck with one of those weird yellow SNES consoles, it doesn't have to stay that way. I mean, sure, you'll have to take apart your Super Nintendo and remove the plastic casing to clean it properly, but if you've got some hydrogen peroxide laying around, that should do the trick. In fact, there's plenty of people out there that have used a fantastic product from Billy Mays called OxyClean that'll do the trick just as well. But yeah, the yellow in the casing comes from bromine, not from your Aunt Gladys's packs of Virginia Slims. I also want to talk a bit about the Super Nintendo CD peripheral that never got released, because it sure seems like there's a ton of misinformation out there. Philips screwed it up, Sony screwed it up, Nintendo screwed it up, so what really happened? I should mention the information I'm going by here is from David Sheff's 1999 book Game Over, and it's well worth checking out if you can find it. Anyway, Nintendo had a deal with Sony going back to 1988 when they developed the SPC 700 sound chip for the SNES, and that eventually led to talks of both a CD add-on to the Super Nintendo, as well as a hybrid console that reached a prototype stage that I'm sure many of you saw was sold at an auction for $360,000. So, why wasn't this put into full-scale production? Because Nintendo felt it didn't have enough control in its agreement, since Sony was using their own format called a Super Disk that they had the rights over, which allowed them to do other stuff with it outside the Nintendo umbrella, like putting out movies and music. Well, Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamashi said, Nope, we're Nintendo, we're gaming royalty, and we can do whatever we want, so they decided to go to Philips, another electronics manufacturer and a competitor of Sony's, and they ended up getting much better terms on their deal. Oh, and Nintendo never bothered to tell Sony anything, so when the Philips deal was announced at the 1991 CES, Sony was just as surprised as anyone else. Sony eventually told Nintendo to F off and ended up releasing their console as their own thing, a little gizmo called the PlayStation. So why didn't the Philips CD attachment ever get released? Well, apparently you can blame the Sega CD for that, since that sold so poorly it scared Nintendo away from ever releasing any sort of Super Nintendo CD attachment. And that was that. So yeah, Nintendo's hubris bred a competitor in Sony that they're still tangling with to this day, just because Nintendo was butthurt that Sony had their own format that they could claim the rights to. So ultimately, the deal fell apart, and as Marge Gunderson would say, it was all for just a little bit of money. Now, this next myth involves The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, and it's existed for years and years regarding this completely random dude who somehow, for some reason, has his own hidden room in the game. I mean, come on, what are the odds of that? Hey, wait a second, who the hell is Chris Houlihan? Yup, it turns out this one is 100% true. Back in 1990, Nintendo Power held a contest with the prize being to have your own name featured in an NES game. All you had to do to enter was to encounter a war mech in the first Final Fantasy for NES, take a picture of the screen, Screen and mail it in. That's easier said than done, since a war mech is the rarest enemy in the game by far, but Mr. Houlihan was able to find it and win the contest, except for some reason, his name didn't appear in an NES game, but in a Super Nintendo game, and friggin' Link to the Past. Now that's cool. So, how do you find this room? Well, there's a few different ways, actually. One is to place Link at the bottom of the screen, place a bomb and blow yourself up, then immediately dash south using the Pegasus boots. Somehow this causes the game to go into kind of a debug mode, so to speak, so the next hole you fall down will be the Chris Houlihan room, where he kindly greets you and awards you with 45 rupees. Hey, that's pretty cool. Thanks, Chris. Here's one that's really confused me over the years, and it has to do with the cover of Earthbound. So here we've got a Starman Super, one of the strongest enemies in the game. At a glance, you can see that it looks like Ness is actually inside the Starman and piloting it somehow, which implies at some point in the game you can take over one of these things and crush other enemies with it. Well, if you've played through Earthbound, you know that's not true, because that never happens, so what's the deal with the misleading cover then? Well, the thing is, if you look closer, Ness isn't inside the Starman, that's actually his reflection. The Starman Super is actually looking down at Ness, and Ness is looking back up toward it. You'll also notice what looked like levers or controls at Ness's side are actually, uh, his arms. So yeah, the cover isn't actually misleading, it just looks a certain way at a glance. It's just Ness's reflection as he gets ready to cheerfully smash the bejesus out of this Starman. 
This next myth goes back to 2006, but it might as well have come from my elementary school playground because it sounds so ridiculous. Okay, so stay with me on this one. Everyone knows about the top secret area in Super Mario World above the Donut Land ghost house, right? Well, what if there was an extra super duper tippity toppity top top secret area that was above that top secret area? And get this, the power up you get there is a laser suit and... <laughs> I'm sorry, but Mario looks utterly ridiculous like this. So yeah, this fooled a few people back in the day, but as you might expect, this was just a ROM hack created by someone named K Phoenix. And while I appreciate the effort here, Laser Mario just kinda sucks. He can't duck in this form, the projectile is flimsy, and the sprite glitches to all hell when you try and fly. But yeah, there is no Laser Mario in the original Super Mario World. Super Tennis is one of my favorite sports games, and many people don't know about the extra character you can play in this game. If you complete a circuit and win all four majors, you unlock an event on this tiny island in the middle of nowhere where you play against a dude named Don J. And yeah, as you might expect, this dude is freaking impossible to beat because he's so freaking fast. Seriously, he's like twice as fast as any other player. Now, I'd heard that there was a trick to unlocking this guy to make him a playable character, and I've seen videos that show people playing as Don J, but even after beating Don J, I don't see a way to do that unless there's a ROM hack floating around out there somewhere or something like that. What you can do is go to the character select screen, press L five times, then X once, then R seven times, and X once, and you'll hear the music change so you know it works, and whatever character you select will have the same attributes as John J. In other words, you'll be ridiculously fast and utterly crush anyone in your path. Unfortunately, this does not work on the Nintendo Switch version of the game for whatever reason, so that's kind of lousy, but still, it's a fun code to use. Alright, that's all for now, and I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day! Hello, thank you to Astrodog from the SNES Drunk Discord for this idea. Here's a video about some games that are still worth playing today that are featured on consoles or computer systems that time may have forgotten for one reason or another. Let's start with an obvious example. The Nintendo Virtual Boy wasn't exactly a sterling success, and only 14 titles were released in North America. One of them, however, was actually pretty good, titled Virtual Boy Wario Land, and it fits right in with the rest of the Wario Land series which normally appeared on Game Boy and on Game Boy Advance. So if you liked those games, you'll dig this one too. Even if, you know, it's a friggin' Virtual Boy game. Thankfully, due to stuff like emulation, you can play this one on PC or a Raspberry Pi device or whatever. And no, you're not beholden to the dreaded Virtual Boy Red. There is a grayscale mode available if you play through the Beetle VB core on the RetroArch emulator. I just stuck with the red for this video just to hammer home the point that this is a freaking Virtual Boy game. This is what it looked like originally, and it's still actually pretty good. Like I said, it's like the other Wario Land games where it's a side-scrolling action platformer only with a 3D gimmick shoehorned in where you can explore each stage in both the foreground and the background. It doesn't really add a whole lot to the gameplay and it comes across as kind of gimmicky, but hey, at least the 3D effect makes for some cool boss fights. You've got four lives and a handful of continues, and the typical Wario-style gameplay is here, featuring three power-ups in the form of hats. The bull hat increases Wario's charge attack and allows him to butt-stomp, the eagle hat allows him to fly, and the dragon hat gives him a flamethrower, but it disables his charge attack. You can even combine hats for even more power-ups, which is pretty cool. There's 14 long levels here, there's multiple endings, and if you 100% this game, you unlock a second quest that's much tougher, which is definitely a good thing because, let's face it, this game isn't the most challenging out there, but still it's a surprisingly good playthrough on a platform that went absolutely nowhere. Next, let's take a look at the Amiga, a PC brand in the 80s made by Commodore, and they were hugely successful all across Europe, but particularly in Germany and the UK. The thing about Amiga games, however, is that, well, they had a certain kind of look and feel to them, especially side-scrolling platformers. But then there's stuff like Rough and Tumble, which is like the Amiga version of Metal Slug, only two years before Metal Slug was made. Holy crap, where did this game come from? Thanks again to Astrodog for pointing this one out. It was programmed by one person, a dude by the name of Jason 
Jason Perkins, and you run and gun your way through four huge worlds, collecting marbles that unlock exits. And you got your typical slate of weapons here, lasers, missiles, flamethrowers, and the level design here is excellent and keeps the game interesting. The boss fights, once you finally get to them, are also a lot of fun, and provide a cartoonishly huge explosion. You gotta love that. So yeah, if you want to make stuff go boom on the Amiga, play this one any way you can. Here we've got another surprise on the Amiga, it's Yo-Jo, made in 1993, and yes, in the visual department, when it comes to art direction and layout, this is what I'm referring to when I talk about the typical Amiga look and feel. However, what stands out about this one is the music. It is freaking awesome! The game itself is pretty good as well, but that soundtrack, damn. When I was a kid, I didn't know a single person who owned an Atari Lynx. It was supposed to be Atari's answer to the Game Boy and Game Gear, and while I'm sure it's a perfectly decent piece of hardware on its own, it just got lost in the shuffle, mostly because there weren't that many good games for it. There is one, however, titled Blue Lightning, the Lynx's answer to Sega's popular Afterburner series, and man oh man, this game seriously looks amazing for it being made on a handheld console in 1989. It's a pretty traditional flight sim rail shooter type hybrid with nine missions for you to complete, with the usual machine gun and a limited number of missiles you have to use to bring down enemies, and yeah, I admit the gameplay gets a bit repetitive here, but really, I just want to give both the Atari Lynx and this game its due, because this looks impressive as hell, and it plays pretty well too. It's surprisingly forgiving, providing six lives, so you've got plenty of time to get used to the controls and actually get through the first few levels and get a feel for the action. This one's a bit more of a curiosity than a must play, but I just thought it made for a good fit for this video because it's an out of nowhere title that really surprised me. Before the iPhone and the iPod, Apple was experimenting with stuff like the Pippin. No, not that Pippin. That's right, Apple got themselves into the home console racket back in the mid-90s, creating the wildly overpriced Apple Pippin in 1996, launching at a price of a whopping $600 in the US. It flopped, and it only produced 18 games, but there's one I want to point out thanks to Cooler from the SNES Drunk Discord. It's Super Marathon, a compilation of two games originally made for the Macintosh, made by a dev team by the name of Bungie, who went on a few years later to develop a little series you might have heard of called Halo. Here we've got a story-driven first-person shooter taking place in the year 2794, and you're colonizing planets, blasting aliens, and yup, it's pretty much just Doom with a new coat of paint, but still a lot of people really dig these kinds of games to this day. There's a certain simplicity about them that I can appreciate, and to the Apple Pippin's credit, this is pretty decent for a home console first-person shooter. I mean, if you compare this to the original Macintosh version, they look almost exactly the same. And at the very least, this is still just an interesting look at what Bungie was up to before Halo. Another failed home console from the 90s was the Panasonic 3DO, but unlike the Apple Pippin, this one actually had a few good ports and some decent games on it, like Return Fire. And again, just like Rough and Tumble earlier in the video, this is another game where you just make stuff go boom, only in this case, it's vehicular mayhem. You can control a tank, a helicopter, a jeep, and a mobile rocket launcher, with each having their own varying stats when it comes to firepower, armor, speed, and fuel consumption. And yeah, you just destroy anything that moves, and the sound design here is freaking fantastic. When I say make stuff go boom, stuff goes BOOM! What else could you ask for? Plus one odd wrinkle here is that this game uses public domain music for its soundtrack, which on the surface sounds pretty lame, but the music they picked is perfect. It's everything from Ride of the Valkyries to Flight of the Bumblebee. It's tremendous! Return Fire on the 3DO is a fun time all around. Let's go back to more familiar territory, like the Game Boy Advance. Now, Doom has received about a gazillion ports, as you probably know. The Super Nintendo even got one, but it's, uh, not good. The analogy I used when I reviewed it was, if Doom was a Ferrari, then playing Doom on the Super Nintendo is like driving a Ferrari underwater. Yeah, it's impressive that it can run, but that doesn't mean you should play it. The Doom games on Game Boy Advance, on the other hand, believe it or not, they're actually pretty dang good. Sure, the games aren't much to look at, and the blood is taken out, but the sound design is surprisingly 
amazingly fantastic, and the music sounds good, which is saying something for Game Boy Advance, and all the content is here, all the weapons, items, enemies, bosses, levels, they're all here, and the game runs really smoothly. However, they did have to make some sacrifices in order to make it run smoothly, like once you kill an enemy, it disappears, it doesn't stay there, but that's fine. And yes, visually the game is kind of a mess, but the name of the game here is Performance. Both of these games play so much better than I ever would have expected. Anyway, the point is, I would not have imagined either Doom or Doom 2 to amount to much on the Game Boy Advance, but they're both well worth adding to your collection. They're surprisingly faithful ports and very good playthroughs. Let's stick with PC ports, this time with the Sega Genesis and Sid Meier's Pirate's Gold. And man, oh man, what a surprise this game is. It's one of the earliest examples of an open world game executed properly on a home console. And the resulting game here is maybe one of the 10 best Sega Genesis games ever. You play as a pirate, duh, and you pretty much do whatever you want, however you want to do it. You can trade goods and earn money properly. You can capture cities and command fleets into battle. You can pillage and plunder other ships. There's tons of missions to complete. You can duel other characters seek out buried treasure, and tons more. So yeah, on the surface, you may not think a PC port on a home console from the 80s would be any good, but Sid Meier's Pirate's Gold is absolutely worth playing on the Sega Genesis. Finally, let's go back to the old Super Nintendo, and it's funny, I made a video on Super Nintendo Street Fighter games like four years ago, and I still get the occasional comment from someone saying, wow, I had no idea that the Super Nintendo had Street Fighter Alpha 2. And yes, while it does require the help of the SDD-1 chip, one of only two Super Nintendo games to do so, this game actually does exist on the Super Nintendo, and not only that, it actually plays surprisingly well. No, it doesn't touch the PlayStation or Saturn versions, not to speak of the arcade edition, but still, it features 18 characters including Akuma, different turbo speeds, and tons of combos including special moves represented by the charge meter at the bottom. I wouldn't think so on the surface, but it is a good playthrough, and this game is as impressive a piece of work as you will see on the Super Nintendo. And I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. drunk. Hello, thanks for watching part 2 of Good Games in Unexpected Places. First, I want to clarify the title, because some people think that by Unexpected Places, I'm saying that the platform the game is on sucks. That may be the case with something like Virtual Boy or the Apple Pippin, where you can find cool stuff like Virtual Boy Wario Land and Super Marathon, respectively. But no, if I'm talking about something on the Sega Master System or TurboGrafx-16, for example, I'm not saying those platforms suck or anything like that. It's really just an excuse to start digging into some more platforms, and it's in addition to what I usually cover on this channel, and finding certain ports or even original games that you may not expect to find otherwise that are still worth playing today. A good example of this is Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber. Now, the N64 isn't exactly known for role-playing games. I mean, how many RPGs are even on that system? Like, six? And how many are actually good? But then here we are out of nowhere with a freaking Ogre Battle game on the system, a semi-real-time tactics-oriented RPG, and it's really freaking good. This is a sequel to Tactics Ogre, Let Us Cling Together, but the gameplay is a lot closer to the game before that, March of the Black Queen. So if you like how the battles are structured in that game, then you'll really dig this game. The combat is all about managing your troops and putting the right units in the right places at the right time to put them in the best possible position to succeed. And you have plenty of options at your disposal to work with. What's kinda cool here is that the characters make their attacks in semi-real time, meaning multiple characters can act at the same time, so you really have to stay on your toes. If you dig games like Final Fantasy Tactics, or any other Ogre Battle game for that matter, then you'll love Person of Lordly Caliber. Here's a surprising one for the PC Engine, known in the US of course as the TurboGrafx-16. It's a port of Street Fighter II Champion Edition, and it's really well done. In fact, I'd say it's definitely better than the Super Nintendo port of Street Fighter II The World Warrior. Since this is Champion Edition, you can play as all four bosses, and all the bonus stages are here for what it's worth. The game plays surprisingly really well. I was able to execute special moves with ease, and the action was really smooth. Yeah, the sound here isn't the greatest, and you have to press a button to switch from punch to kick, but I wouldn't call that a deal breaker. I just wanted to point this one out for anyone that digs the PC Engine or Turbo Graphics. This port did stay in Japan, so you gotta play this one any way you can. 
In part one, I talked about Sid Meier's Pirate's Gold, a PC port to the Sega Genesis, and it's quickly become one of my favorite games since I started this channel. So I thought I'd do my due diligence and also mention that this game also made its way to the NES? Yeah, that's right, it's an 8-bit open world game developed by Rare, and it's really well done. It is pretty limited, and I mean it kinda has to be, but the nuts and bolts of a great game are all here. The open world exploring, the character customization, different time periods to choose from, plundering other ships and entire towns. It's a great time, and it's really easy to sink tons and tons of hours into this one, so if you're into NES collecting, or just NES games in general, definitely check this one out, it's well worth it. Sticking with real-time strategy games, here's one on Game Boy Color, surprisingly, named Warlocked, and it's got all the stuff you'd expect from a traditional real-time strategy game. There's resource management, where you assign tasks to characters, whether it's gathering wood or gold. You build stuff, there's a hero system, there's even a fog of war mechanic here, meaning you can only see parts of the map that you uncover by exploring. There's only two different races you can play as, and only three different environments, but there's tons of character types you can obtain, everything from wizards, which can produce all sorts of different spells, from sleeping spells to spreading a friggin' plague. There's necromancers, dragons, elves. I can't believe they crammed all this onto a Game Boy cartridge. It's not a perfect game, but it is surprisingly really well made, and it's worth a look if you dig strategy games. Let's move on to the Sega Master System, and here's one of the best looking games I've ever seen for that platform. It's the Lucky Dime Caper starring Donald Duck. It's kind of like the 8-bit counterpart to Quackshot on Sega Genesis, and you travel the world looking for Magicka Dispel, who's stolen Scrooge McDuck's Lucky Dime and kidnapped Huey, Dewey, and Louie in the process. This one was developed by Sega themselves, and it also has a Game Gear edition, but I mean, just look at the sprite animation here. It almost perfectly represents the Disney source material, and the game controls really smoothly while throwing in some inventive level design. This is a fantastic game, one of the very best on the Master System that I've found, and it also has a sequel titled Deep Duck Trouble that's a worthy follow-up, so if you're into Disney games but somehow haven't been able to play these two, you gotta try them out for yourself. Here's a game that was first developed for the Sharp X68000 computer back in 1994 called Mad Stalker Full Metal 4th. It's a side-scrolling beat-em-up and it's strictly 2D action here, reminiscent of something like Ninja Warriors. Do you like giant mech suits punching stuff till it goes boom? Well then this is your kind of game. It's fast-paced and you can execute Street Fighter style commands to do all sorts of special moves. Plus there's a dash, double jump, grappling moves. It's a classic case of a game where your character is way overpowered and you just smash everything in your way. It's really fun. This game did get a re-release on PlayStation titled Mad Stalker Full Force in 1997, so that would be the most common way to play this one today, but I just get a kick out of highlighting these old computer systems, just in the hopes that they won't be forgotten. Also, the original music really sounds awesome. Back in the mid to late 90s, my family was lucky enough to have a Compact 486, so I spent a lot of time playing Doom Engine and Build Engine games, everything from Duke Nukem 3D to Blood to Heretech to Hexen. But here's a Doom Engine game I had never even seen before called Strife. It's one of the last commercially released PC games to use the Doom Engine, and holy crap this game is impressive considering when it was made. It's a story-driven first-person shooter with RPG elements, and there is a lot going on here. Way more than I can sum up in just one paragraph. The weapons here are awesome, and the dungeon design is fantastic, featuring a lot more than just the usual find a key and unlock an area type thing. If you dig games like this, you will not be disappointed in Strife. There is a remake available on Steam, listed as the original Strife Veteran Edition, which is an upgraded version of the game featuring a few convenient modern addendums. The Panasonic 3DO didn't get too many standout games, but there's one that's kind of interesting that I should mention called Lucienne's Quest, and it's the only JRPG in the 3DO library. You play as Lucienne who has to watch over this tower while her boss is away, before this werewolf dude shows up searching for a cure for his condition. So Lucienne, for some reason, says, hey, what the heck, let's look for a cure, and on their journey they do the cliched JRPG stuff of helping out random strangers in towns and all that stuff. Okay, this isn't the most original game ever, the combat is also the usual turn-based thing, but I just thought I'd point this game out because it may scratch that JRPG itch for some people. It's not the best game, but it's something fans of JRPGs may not have found out about otherwise, so I had to give it a spot in this video. 
Finally, I wanted to share a game I read about in a book titled Replay, The History of Video Games, written by Tristan Donovan. And what's great about that book in particular is that it's not dominated by American and Japanese gaming. It also touches on the European gaming scene throughout the 80s, and what I found really interesting in particular is how many different countries or regions put their own cultural spin when it came to developing games. For instance, the French weren't satisfied with simple arcade-style gaming. Developers like Froggy Software created text adventure games that touched on serious subjects like drug addiction and mental illness. Illness. They really made a point to differentiate themselves from American, Japanese, and British gaming. And let me tell you, nothing could be more different and more out there than Captain Blood. This game was first released in 1988 for the Atari ST, but made its way to tons of other computer systems. And this game is just nuts. You're supposed to track down five of your own alien clones, but to find them, you have to integrate yourself amongst different alien cultures by speaking their respective languages. You do that through this interface of 150 different icons, and each alien race has their own language created specifically for this game from scratch. Oh, and if that wasn't daunting enough, the longer you take to identify a clone, the more your health deteriorates, and when that happens, you have a harder time actually controlling the mouse cursor. It starts to shake and go nuts, and oh my god, this game is crazy. I mean, just look at this. It's some kind of H.R. Geiger-inspired nightmare. But yeah, I just thought it was really interesting how some cultures approached gaming in a completely different way, leading to some truly off-the-wall ideas like what you see in Captain Blood. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hello, thanks for taking the time to watch part 3 of Good Games in Unexpected Places, where I try and seek out decent games or even just interesting games on obscure or forgotten consoles or computer systems. And a big shout out to all the commenters out there that continue to point me in the right direction with some of these games, so thank you all for that. But to start this episode, I went with a game that's not only unexpected, it's outright hidden. It's the Game Boy port of Space Invaders, made in 1994, and it's one of the few games out there that actually has built-in enhancements if you play the game via the Super Game Boy on the Super Nintendo. The Super Game Boy unlocks what the game calls an arcade mode, complete with 16 color graphics and even some transparency effects, featuring the Super Nintendo's full screen resolution as well, instead of one of those borders you usually see with the Super Game Boy. I mean, this is pretty much just a Super Nintendo Nintendo version of Space Invaders packed onto a Game Boy cartridge. It's a pretty cool novelty. I wish more games took advantage of the Super Game Boy. Sure, a few games here and there had different music or sound effects, but there weren't any other games that pulled off what Space Invaders did. Next, let's go to the Sega Game Gear with Tails Adventure. Tails, of course, being Sonic's sidekick. And yeah, here he is in his own game, and it's surprisingly pretty dang good. Yeah, I know the Game Gear resolution here isn't always going to be that clear. In my experience, Game Gear visuals have always been a bit of an issue, but Tails Adventure plays fantastic. This isn't just a Sonic game with a different character. The game is structured and paced much differently, featuring a bit more of a non-linear Metroid-style approach, where you find items that allow you to unlock new areas. Tails can't even run, but he can fly, so the structure here works well with his abilities. There's a total of 26 items you can find spread out across 12 huge stages, and this might actually be the best Game Gear exclusive game ever made. I definitely recommend checking this one out. Sticking with the Sonic universe, here's Sonic the Hedgehog for Sega Master System. Now, that console wasn't all that popular in the States, but it was massive in places like South America, so this may be a super obvious game to some of you out there. But for me, the first time I played this a few years ago, I was shocked at how well this game played. Sure, it's scaled back a bit since it's an 8-bit game, but the level variety here is fantastic, and the game embraces its limitations, making this one more of a standard platformer instead of the usual Twitch controls you'd expect from a Genesis Sonic game. So yeah, if you check this one out, don't expect the usual Sonic fare here, but what's here is very well done. I should mention that there is a sequel simply titled Sonic the Hedgehog 2, and that both games were ported to the Sega Game Gear, so if you're into Game Gear stuff, those games are well worth checking out on that platform as well. Speaking of handhelds, I wanted to also very quickly point out a surprisingly good game for the Game Boy Advance. It's a handheld remake of Max Payne. I did a video on this one not too long ago, but I wanted to mention it again because number one, it fits the very definition of unexpected. I mean, it's a Game Boy Advance title that features bullet time. And number two, it's actually a pretty solid game that uses most of the same locations as the original game. So if you're looking for an interesting title to add to your Game Boy Advance collection, then definitely check this one out. 
let's take a minute to talk about a game for the Philips CDI. Yeah, that's right, it's the console that had those goofy Mario and Zelda titles, like Hotel Mario and Link the Faces of Evil. Here's another goofy one, only this one is, uh, well, it's pretty dang out there. It's called Laser Lords, a point-and-click adventure title that sees you playing as a regular Joe who's been called upon to defeat the evil Sarpedon, and he's trying to obtain some mystical crystal thing that can condense the entire universe inside of it somehow? Anyway, your classic adventure mechanics are all here, visiting planets, talking to people, managing items and all that, but the story is freaking crazy, featuring prostitution, assisted suicide, and drug addiction, complete with a mission that features you scoring drugs for a junkie, among many other things, across seven different planets. And this game wasn't just half-assed or thrown together either, this is a fully realized universe, complete with goofy-ass voice acting. Our mother Sisis is our source, she blesses, heals, and feeds. So yeah, if you're jonesing for a 90s full motion video adventure game for whatever reason, then try out Laser Lords for the CDI. Next, let's go way back to the Atari 2600. Hey, this is the console I started out with as a kid. I remember playing games like Adventure, Centipede, the crappy Pac-Man port, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I never totally figured out how to play until I was like 24 years old. Anyway, I wanted to point out Tunnel Runner for the 2600 because I still can't believe they managed to pull this game off at the time that they did. Yes, that's right, this is a first-person perspective game where you navigate through an endless series of mazes against a time limit while avoiding these ghostly-looking bad guys called Zots. There's two game modes, one that's kind of a campaign mode, and another where the mazes are all randomized. This game is still legit fun to play today, it's almost like taking the viewpoint of Pac-Man himself, and the sound effects here are so great. Usually with 2600 games, it's almost impossible not to say something like, Well, you kinda had to be there. But with Tunnel Runner, you didn't. This game still holds up really well. Yeah, it's limited, but it's still a fun playthrough. Moving on from the 2600 platform to Atari 8-bit computers, here's another interesting game called Excalibur. And again, yes, the user interface here is limited to say the least, even for a game made in 1984. You just move this crown up and down to move between screens so you can see all your options. But yeah, this is a resource management strategy game with the goal being to unite all of Britain under King Arthur, and the sheer amount of depth and the amount of stuff you can do to accomplish that is really impressive. You can invade other kingdoms, reward knights who are loyal to gain favor, or banish them if they're a-holes. You can raise taxes, gather news from around the world, and there's also battles you can fight. You can even recruit Merlin to send plagues to screw up other kingdoms. It's great! This game was way, way ahead of its time, and really deserves its due because it's clear a lot of work went into it. Thanks to Robert for pointing this one out. Staying with Atari, Rescue on Fractalis is a title made in 1984 for the 5200 platform, and yeah, kinda like Tunnel Runner, this game is just, I mean, how is this a cartridge game for Atari 5200? It's freaking crazy! The gameplay is just like Defender, except from a first person perspective. You're just looking for people stranded on this planet. You land on the surface and let them in, and take off and look for the next person, all while shooting down anti-aircraft guns on the surface, and later on, enemy ships. This is one of the very first games made by the Lucasfilm Games Department, headed by Peter Langston, who of course went on to make tons of popular games, including another rail shooter you might have heard of called X-Wing. But yeah, I just wanted to show off this game because, I mean, just look at this. This is running on an Atari 5200. It's pretty crazy. Sticking with Lucasfilm Games, the next year they came out with two similar games, The Eidolon and Coronas Rift, made for both Atari 8-bit computers and for Commodore 64. And these games build upon the fractal technology first introduced in Rescue of Fractalis, and with The Eidolon, in a rather clever twist, they simply just flipped the mountains upside down and had you exploring underground caves. There's a lot more enemies in this game that pop up right in front of you, and there's more options for weapons as well, making this a bit more of an action game than its predecessor. Coronas Rift again sees you traversing mountains, but this time on a surface rover, and there's quite a bit more to the gameplay here. You have to navigate mazes, you're looking for discarded parts that you can use to upgrade your own vehicle, you're blasting enemy saucers. It's surprisingly in-depth, and again, the game looks amazing for its time. If you're into learning about the history of video games and development and all that stuff, don't forget about the early Lucasfilm games. They were ahead of their time and are still interesting to play through today. 
You know what, let's just go back to shooting stuff, kill everything that moves. I have a real soft spot for 90s first person shooters on PC, everything from Blake Stone to Rise of the Triad to Hexen. And here's another one made for the Amiga CD32, it's the fourth game in the Alien Breed series made in 1995, titled Alien Breed 3D. And yeah, as you can see, it's not the best looking game, it's just a wee bit jagged and pixelated here and there, but yeah, there's plenty of blood, gore, and carnage in typical 90s fashion, and the music and sound design here are top notch. It's not the best FPS of the 90s by any stretch, but I hadn't heard of this one, and I had a good time playing it, so I had to mention it here. Finally, I like ending these videos on weird games. Part 2 ended with Captain Blood, one of the most intensely bizarre games I've ever seen. And here's another ambitious game from 1984 titled Below the Root. And this game is one of, if not the first game, that attempted what is now commonly known as the Metroidvania formula. Okay, so it's not going to win you over in the looks department, but it's a side-scrolling action platformer with a huge map to explore, and it also works in text adventure elements as well, with tons of actions and choices available to you. The story is based on a series of books called the Green Sky Trilogy, written by Zilpha Keatley Snyder, and you have five characters and two different races to choose from as your character. You can pick to be a Kindar who live on the surface, or an Erdling who live underground, and both have completely different value systems and ways of life. I love finding older games like this, in this case, this one was made for a Commodore 64 as well as IBM PCs and the Apple II, and while this game may be rough around the edges, it's a fascinating experience with an interesting story that blends together all sorts of different gameplay elements. So again, if you're into video game history, I'd recommend giving this one a try. Okay, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. That's drunk. One of my favorite videos to work on are these Good Games in Unexpected Places videos because it gives me an excuse to go looking for stuff that I wouldn't go near otherwise. Like in the past I found a good Wario Land game on Virtual Boy, a pretty good port of Marathon on the Apple Pippin of all things, and interesting games like Laser Lords on the CDI. I've also used these videos as an excuse to find surprisingly advanced and polished games like the Lucky Dime Caper starring Donald Duck on the Sega Master System, as well as a great port of Pirates on NES. And there's also downright bizarre stuff like Captain Blood on the Atari ST. Man, I love that game. So let's continue along that path with an arcade laserdisc game called Firefox. Yes, that's right, before it was an internet browser, it was a majorly ambitious arcade game made by Atari back in 1983, based on the film of the same name. Now, when most people think of arcade cabinets that utilize laserdiscs, they'll think of stuff like Dragon's Lair, otherwise known as the game that featured the artwork of former Disney animator Don Bluth. Firefox takes a bit of a different approach, using backgrounds captured on film with the graphical overlay that features all of the gameplay. The effect is still pretty dang cool to this day, and I can't imagine what this would have seemed like to witness back when it came out. I should warn you, it could be kind of tricky to get this game to work properly on MAME or FB Alpha, but if you dig Afterburner-style games like this, it's still pretty good, and something a tad different. Let's go over some handheld games that not many people may know about, starting with the Neo Geo Pocket, which actually got a Sonic game titled Sonic the Hedgehog Pocket Adventure. What stands out immediately about this game is the performance. It really does feel like a classic Sonic game, with the kind of level design that makes you rely on memorization and Twitch controls. Granted, this game does have its drawbacks, like for instance, when you take damage, only a few rings come out of you, no matter how many you've accumulated, so you can very easily go from 70-something rings to just two or three in the blink of I. Even so, this game is fantastic, and it even has the over-the-shoulder bonus stages. I feel like the Neo Geo Pocket isn't talked about enough in general, especially games like Sonic Pocket Adventure. Sticking with Sega, the Game Gear also has a few games outside of the usual stuff that are still worth your time today. Sylvan Tale is a game that was only released in Japan, but it's a top-down Zelda-style adventure game that's held up extremely well. The graphics here are sharp and distinct, the music is great, the enemy design is clever, the boss fights are fun, and the puzzles are interesting. Unfortunately, since this one was made in 1995, which is pretty late in the Game Gear's lifespan, it was never localized in the US. However, Aeon Genesis made an English patch for this one so you can follow the story, but yeah, if you dig games like this, then Sylvan Tale is absolutely worth checking out any way you can. 
One other Game Gear game I want to point out is Fatal Fury Special, and this one was made available outside of Japan, and holy crap, the sprite animation and the scrolling backgrounds here are really impressive. And even more surprisingly is that this game plays perfectly fine as a fighting game despite having just two attack buttons. There's nine characters here, and all their moves are just as they are in the Neo Geo version, and everything works very smoothly. If you're into collecting Game Gear stuff or just handheld stuff in general, then you gotta pick this one up, if nothing else than to get some real use out of the Game Gear D-Pad, easily one of the most underappreciated and underutilized D-Pads in gaming in general. Alright, let's check out something really interesting on the good old Game Boy. It's James Bond 007, and it's a top-down RPG. Yep, that's right, this one plays like if Link's Awakening had a leveling system and starred Sean Connery. And yeah, I mean the Connery version of Bond because this game is a bit of a throwback to those days, playing up the humor with a bit of a tongue-in-cheek vibe with both the story and the dialogue. Maybe I've been living under a rock, but I was stunned at how good this game is. I guess I shouldn't be though because the original Game Boy has always been full of surprises. James Bond 007 was released in early 1998, nearly nine years after the Game Boy's launch, and folks were still making high-quality games for it. Definitely check this one out. It's surprisingly in-depth and a lot of fun. Moving on to the Game Boy Advance, here's Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith. This one's a 2.5D side-scroller with two story modes, where you can play as either Anakin or Obi-Wan, and as you can see, the art style here has a bit of a cel-shaded thing going on, making it kinda sorta look how the Clone Wars animated series ended up looking, which is pretty cool. This is a really well-made action platformer with some great sprite work and some fun mechanics to play with, like force abilities that can be upgraded. Although, if you play as Anakin, one force ability you start with is called Vader's Wrath. Gee, I wonder how the story will end in this one. Anyway, this is another game that kinda snuck up on me. And even if you're not into Star Wars, this game is good enough to be worth your time. Wouldn't be a proper video of this nature if I didn't talk about something on the Sega Master System, and here we are again with Spellcaster. This is an interesting one not just because of the gameplay, but because the story has an interesting way of being told. There's a lot of pixel art here, and instead of coming across as a cheese fest, it's actually a pretty interesting story involving medieval Japan and the underworld and all that good stuff. Yeah, it's certainly not the only game about that, but hey, the Master System is a big blind spot for me, so when I find stuff like this for other people, I gotta tell them about it, and this is a pretty good game. Finally, here's something that's been around for a while, but, you know, I'm about 30 years behind on games, and I don't keep up with stuff, so forgive me if I haven't heard of this weird-ass Halo homebrew that someone made for Atari 2600, of all things. And yeah, this is pretty dang cool. It's actually made on a 2600 cartridge and everything. You just run around and shoot stuff, get hit, and you start at the beginning. Pretty dang simple. The map is laid out in a similar way to a game like Adventure, and that stuff runs together, which is pretty cool. There's no actual requirement to shoot stuff. You just gotta survive, find keys, and unlock areas. There's 64 screens in total, and hey, sometimes simple is better, and I can dig that. Alright, that's all for now, and I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Drunk. Hello and welcome to one of my favorite kinds of videos I like to do on this channel. It's about finding good games in places you wouldn't expect, taking a look at any and all consoles or handhelds to see if I can find anything worth playing today, or at least something weird enough to show off. For example, in the past I've talked about games like Street Fighter 2 on TurboGrafx-16, which is surprisingly good, as well as diving through the rubble of consoles like Virtual Boy, the 3DO, and CDI to find games like Laser Lords or Return Fire, just to name a couple, as well as finding some interesting stuff on Game Gear or Neo Geo Pocket, like Sylvan Tail. I also keep my ear to the ground for interesting stuff from the arcades, like in the last episode I mentioned a Laserdisc game called Firefox. And here's another one titled Interstellar Laser Fantasy. Yeah, that's a bit of a generic title, but believe it or not, this game was made for arcades back in 1983, and just like Firefox, this one combines background effects via Laserdisc with a traditional graphical overlay. There's not much to the gameplay here, it's a regular over-the-shoulder style shoot 'em up but yeah, this one just looks really freaking cool. And if I had seen this in the arcades at the time, I would have lost my mind, especially at this later level with the asteroids coming at you left and right. 
Like I said, this game is nothing new as far as the gameplay is concerned, but when it comes to the presentation, it's something much different than what we are used to seeing. Finding old handheld stuff is always a good time, especially for platforms that completely eluded me when I was a kid, like the Atari Lynx, so it's fun to find stuff like Battle Wheels. Yeah, this game looks pretty rough when it's played on an emulator, but damned if this game isn't fun. It's a first-person view where you drive around shooting missiles at enemies in a Mad Max-style setting, and not only do you take out other cars, but there's also random dudes showing up to try and stop you, but you don't even have to shoot these guys. You can just friggin' run them over and they go flying like in a Road Rash game. It's friggin' hilarious. There's all sorts of little touches in this game that help set it apart, like the damage to your windshield, and the fact that your car actually rattles and shakes around when you run something over. The sound design also adds a lot here. It's really simple, but really effective. Here's another Lynx exclusive, Electrocop, made by Epix, the same folks behind games like Jumpman and Impossible Mission. And yeah, again, this game looks pretty rough when you're playing it on an emulator, but like Battle Wheels, this one is pretty dang impressive in scope for a handheld game made in 1989. It's a third-person shooter that has you exploring mazes and blasting enemies set to a time limit complete with traps, timing-based puzzles, weapon upgrades, and it even has a ridiculous story that takes place in the year 2069 where you have to rescue the present president's daughter from the evil criminal brain. I guess maybe they're the second cousin to Mother Brain? But yeah, they crammed a lot into this one, including the music and sound department, which is top-notch for a handheld. What the heck, let's stick with handhelds, moving on to the Game Boy Color, which, believe it or not, received a port of Dragon's Lair in 2001. Wait, what? Yes, that's right. The Cinematronic arcade game from 1983 was still getting ports nearly 20 years later, this time on a handheld. And holy crap, this actually looks pretty good? The gameplay here is faithful to the original game, only the full motion video scenes are redrawn to fit the parameters of the Game Boy Color, and the result here is a way better game than it has any right to be. The animation here is stunning, and it's clear a lot of effort went into this one. But I'll admit, as a game, it's not the greatest. There's a ton of trial and error, and once you figure out the right sequences to get through everything, there's not a lot of replay value here. But as a pure exhibition of what the Game Boy Color was capable of, this is a really impressive title. And just on a personal note, if you happen to have an analog pocket, this is a great example of a game that looks incredible on this screen. The original Game Boy has some surprising titles that hold up really well today, like in the last video of this series I talked about James Bond 007, and here's another licensed game that has no business being any good, yet somehow it is. It's a game based on the movie Hudson Hawk. And uh, yeah, that looks closer to Kid Chameleon than it does Bruce Willis, but the sprite animation here is really smooth. You have both a projectile and a melee attack, and there's a lot of interactivity within the levels themselves, where you have to move stuff around to reach certain areas. The film Hudson Hudson Hawk was a box office and critical bomb, but since then it's become a bit of a cult classic, and while the NES game sucks out loud, the Game Boy game is actually pretty decent. Here's an especially weird one that got a release on Sega Saturn and PC, but it was originally made for the 3DO back in 1994 called The Horde. It puts SimCity-style city building in a real-time strategy format, so you're alternating between a build phase, so to speak, where you gather resources, build walls, and set up traps and stuff, before you get invaded by enemies, where the game moves to an action phase, which essentially is just a top-down beat-em-up. If you're familiar with this channel, you know I love super ambitious games like this that combine genres, and this one does a solid job of streamlining two completely different modes of gameplay. But, like I said, uh, this game is a bit strange, since you play as a character named Chauncey who was raised by a herd of wild cows, and he's not coincidentally played in the full motion video sequences by Kirk Cameron. Yeah, that's some pretty good casting there. But as far as the game itself though, the Horde is pretty interesting and worth checking out. There's weird like that, and then there's Mutant Rampage Body Slam for the Philips CDI. Now, just describing this game in terms of how it plays, it's pretty normal. It's just a side-scrolling beat-em-up with three playable characters. You get a health meter with four lives to get through four long levels. But, uh, okay, yeah. With body slam, we got a new team on the block, the Naturals. 
Yeah, you could say when it comes to the style and execution of this game, it's more 90s than a Phil Plantier rookie card in a Trapper Keeper. You might recognize the animation style here, it's done by the same people that did the goofy animated cutscenes in the CDI Zelda games, except this game takes place in some futuristic post-apocalyptic game show where you get cutscenes like this. Ooh wee! The naturals left those mutants bleeding in the dust. What's your hit on these naturals? The free radicals are mutant whips, Al Wolf! Wait till the naturals face somebody tough! The thing is though, as weird as this game appears, it's actually pretty good. In addition to the three playable characters, there's about a gazillion enemy types, a ton of bosses, and some really nice looking settings, so it's clear that the folks that worked on this game put some elbow grease into it. I found myself playing through this one just to see what bizarre enemies would show up next. Yeah, this game isn't going to measure up to stuff like Streets of Rage or Turtles in Time, obviously, but Mutant Rampage Body Slam is an interesting curiosity, and it's one of the most intensely 90s games of the 90s, for better or for worse. Finally, here's an impressive title released for PC in 1997 called Claw, or Captain Claw, and it's a 2D action platformer made during a time when pretty much everyone at the time was done with those and jumping headfirst into 3D stuff, so games like this just kind of fell through the cracks. Sure enough, reviews at the time from magazines like PC Gamer and PC Powerplay wrote this game off, with the latter misguidedly comparing it to Mario 64 and Tomb Raider, saying, why wasn't this game a 3D platformer instead? Uh, probably because it's awesome the way that it is? Uh, seriously, the visuals, sprite work, and sound design here are absolute top notch. And yeah, there's nothing all that new or innovative here, but who cares? The controls feel great, the level design fits your character's capabilities well, and it's a tough challenge without coming across as cheap. This one was made by Monolith Productions, who later went on to make games like Fear, Shadow of Mordor, and Matrix Online, but before all that stuff, they made a surprisingly high-quality 2D platformer during a time when hardly anyone was making those anymore. But hey, that's what's neat about retro gaming as a hobby. You get to find and play old stuff like this that otherwise would have just stayed forgotten. So you definitely want to check this one out. Alright, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day! Hello, here's a bonus Friday video where I'm going over some of the weirdest, strangest, most bizarre Super Famicom games that never left Japan. Well, with one big exception I'll let you know about. Now, I'll be honest with you, the only reason this is a list is because, well, the internet loves lists. So I cobbled together a ranking just based on my initial reaction to each game. In other words, don't put a lot of stock in these rankings. I just wanted an excuse to talk about and show you guys some weird-ass video games, and a list just makes it an easy structure. Also, no, I have not played played every Super Famicom game, so there might be some bizarre stuff out there that I missed. In addition, I also wanted to make sure this list mostly included games that are English friendly, so each one of these games you can play as is without any patching involved. 13. UFO Kamen Yakisoban Kettler no Kuroi Inbo. The title roughly translates to UFO Mask Yakisoban Kettler's Dark Conspiracy, and the gameplay here seems normal enough. It's a pretty standard beat em up, walk to the right and beat the crap out of everything. The thing is, your character is powered by instant ramen noodles, particularly UFO Yakisoban noodles, and you play through the whole game as the product's goofy superhero mascot. Apparently a princess was kidnapped, and you have to get her back from the evil Kettler? I don't know if Kettler's a competing brand or or what, but you have a health meter and one continue to get through five levels, and some of the enemy design here is just, what the hell are these things? It's a pretty short playthrough and it's easy enough, and hey, as far as mascot games go, it's not as good as Cool Spot, but it's not terrible either. 12. Yu Yu Hakusho Tokubetsu Hen. Here's a game that isn't weird because of the content necessarily, but because of the structure and the presentation. This is obviously a licensed game based on the Yu Yu Hakusho manga and anime series, but Tokubetsu Hen is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game developed by Namco that takes place from kind of a cinematic perspective, if that makes sense. 
The way it works is you press a direction on the D-pad to take action, forward delivers a punch, back defends, up will let you use a skill move, and down lets you use a spirit attack. While you're holding down a direction, you see the red bar charging, at which point you hit one of the four face buttons that will dictate the effectiveness of your attack or defense. Yeah, it's pretty dang weird, and it's hard to get used to, but it's pretty cool once you get the timing down. There's a whopping 18 characters you can play as, so if you're a fan of the show, you'll love this game, and even if you've never heard of Yu Yu Hakusho, this game is well worth checking out just because it takes such a wildly different approach for a fighting game. Eleven. Battle Tycoon Flash Hiders SFX. Here's another fighting game that's not just weird when it comes to content. I mean, there's all sorts of strange settings and strange characters here, but it's also weird in terms of structure. You pretty much just wander around the city, fighting in arenas, on the streets, or just wherever, and you win money you can use to upgrade your equipment, or even bet on other fights. There's a day-night cycle you gotta deal with. It's really kind of presented like an open-world one-on-one fighting RPG in some ways. It's just that the RPG stuff here is really limited, but still, this game stands out as something different, especially when there's like two dozen generic fighting games out there that play exactly the same, so it's nice to see a fighting game that tried to be unique. Ten. Ghost Sweeper Mikami Joriishi Wa Nice Body. I did a video on this one a few months back, and it's another licensed game, this one being based on a manga and anime series about a team of exorcists for hire that go around fighting ghouls, spirits, and other things out of the supernatural. The subject matter, of course, lends itself really well to a video game format, and sure enough, this game is pretty dang good. It's one of the best in this video. You have a health bar with three lives, and unlimited continues to get through seven levels featuring a handy dandy wand mechanic that allows you to flip around all over the place in order to defeat enemy design like this. Kind of unsettling. Ghost Sweeper Mikami is a great representation of that mid-90s anime vibe with a horror motif. You'll see all sorts of crazy enemy and boss design, like these weirdos, or these disembodied hands, or this boss here. Good god. So if you like what you see here, then definitely check this one out. Nine. Gegege no Kitaro Fukatsu Tenma Dayo, another licensed platformer based on a manga and anime series, and even more weirdness here, you fight flying goobers by shooting needles out of your hair. I read a while back that it was lice, but I guess that's not right, but yeah, needles sure makes a lot more sense, right? This is another game where all you gotta do is just sit back and look at some of this enemy design, whether it's this first boss here, or these guys here, or this cyclops boss, I mean look at this, you're being carried by crows and shooting needles out of your hair at the giant face of a fire-breathing cyclops. It's like a Miyazaki story on a bad acid trip. You have one life bar and Unlimited continues to get through 15 levels, although most of the levels here are pretty dang short. This game plays more like a boss gauntlet than anything else. There aren't a lot of other Super Famicom games out there that look or sound like this one does, so again, if you like what you see here, check this one out. Eight. Amelin no Violin Hickey. This is one of my personal favorite games that never left Japan. It's a bit of a puzzle platforming side-scroller where you play as Hamel, a traveling violinist who's a bit of a jerk as you can see, since the main gameplay mechanic here is how he treats his traveling companion named Flute, using her as a stepladder or a battering ram. It's obviously played up for humor, and the pixel art and sprite work here is so, so good. Flute also has the ability to change costumes, so to speak, and she can take the form of up to 15 animals that all have different abilities a bit like a Kirby game, and the level design here complements these characters really well. The catch here is you can't directly control Flute, and that may frustrate some people, but it's really just a simple matter of pressing the X button to get her to stay still, and X again to get her to move along with you. This is a really fun game that's definitely something a bit different. Seven. Shoaniki Bakuretsu Rentoden. Yes, it wouldn't be a proper list of weird games without at least one Shoaniki game. This one features the usual ridiculous character models that are the series trademark, and this game for Super Famicom is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game featuring eight different fighters, everyone from this ship with three flexing dudes on its back, to Adam from the Sistine Chapel riding what appears to be a half moon, and this green guy? What even is this? I mean, I don't even have to say anything here, just look at the backgrounds in this game, it's just freaking ridiculous. How do people even come up with this stuff? Anyway, beyond all the humor and wackiness, this is actually a pretty decent fighting game, and it's good for a laugh with a second player. Six. Gourmet Sentai Barayaro. Here's another game that got its own video on this channel not too long ago, and it's kind of sort of related to the Shoaniki series, and you can definitely see its influence at the very least. It's a side-scrolling beat-em-up with a face button dedicated to just flexing. It serves no purpose at all, it's just to stand there and pose. Okay, sure. 
What really makes this game weird though is that you only get one life and no continues to get through this entire game and your health doesn't automatically replenish when you finish a level. Wait, what? That's ridiculous. The catch here is you collect food that's dropped by defeated enemies and you use that food to create a meal in between levels and that's how you replenish health. And each one of the three playable characters all have their own peculiar tastes and preferences. So yeah, not only are you kicking the crap out of everything in a typical beat-em-up fashion, you're cooking up recipes. Yeah, this game isn't for everyone, there's a lot of trial and error here, but this game is definitely weird as hell. Five. Zigzag Cat Ostrich Club Mo Osawagi Da. Okay, I'm cheating a bit here since this game really does need an English patch to understand how to progress, but I needed to include it in this video because it's so freaking weird. It's like a combination of a top-down adventure game and Breakout, with the ball doubling as the title character Zigzag Cat. First of all, what a weird idea for a game, and second, what is even happening here? I'm destroying ostriches and angry cartoon pigs, then I'm wandering around talking to randos. Apparently this game is a twist on a game that was scheduled for release in the US but was cancelled and never finished, and it was titled Corn Buster. That one eventually got a release in 2015 from Pico Interactive, so if you've played that game, then you get the general idea here. I'm not sure if you're better off playing that one over Zigzag Cat, but I just wanted to make sure I pointed this one out, because the gameplay, combined with the art style, makes this one pretty dang strange. Four. Majuo. Now we're talking. This game is messed up. We've got some of the craziest enemy and boss design ever, and the color palette used here makes this game look like it was directed by Dario Argento. You play as a character who has to journey through the depths of hell in order to rescue his daughter. You use a gun and a powered up Hadoken attack to destroy these weird ass enemies, and you eventually earn the ability to change forms, like this laser shooting pterodactyl or this blue dragon thing. Sure, okay. This is a game where you just sit back and say, what the hell is this thing? Or this thing, what even is this? How do you even begin to imagine something like this? So if that's what you're looking for in a 16-bit action platformer, then you've found it with Majuo. Three. Dae Tonosama Apare Ichiban. No, this isn't quite a Choaniki game, despite the appearances, but it's in a similar spirit, what with the comically overly detailed muscular physiques of some of the sprites here, as well as some of the crazy enemies and off-the-wall settings. As you can see, this one's a top-down Pocky and Rocky-style run-and-gun with two playable characters, and their names translate to Lord Stupid and Prince Stupid. You gotta love that. The action here can get chaotic at times, to the point where I don't even know what the hell is happening or what I'm even looking at. There's also bizarre game mechanics that I can kinda sorta make sense of, but not really, like this TGR gauge that can turn your character into a Hulk Hogan sized brute, but only temporarily I guess? That mechanic seems to have a mind of its own, but it's just as well since this game is so frenetic that I wouldn't expect anything less. But yeah, the best way to describe this one is enjoyably confusing, and I really like it a lot. Two. We have a four-way tie. It's all four Goemon games that never left Japan. I'm talking about Ganbare Goemon 2, 3, 4, and the puzzle game starring Goemon's pal Ebisumaru. No, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the Japanese titles of those games because it would take me about 20 minutes and I'd still be butchering them, and I've butchered enough Japanese in this video so far. So for the uninitiated, only one 16-bit Goemon game made it out of Japan, and that was Legend of the Mystical Ninja, and these games are the sequels. Again, I'm kind of cheating a bit with these because they definitely definitely could benefit from English patches, so you know what you're buying from the stores and such, but you can still manage decently enough to make your way around, even if you do miss most of the story. You really can't go wrong with any of these games, they're all really crazy in the best possible way. My preference is Ganbare Goemon 4 because it's got the best graphics and sound of the four games, plus boss fights like this soccer ball robot thing, and you're driving a snowmobile, you're fighting a boxing match, and then there's bonus levels like whatever the hell this is, I don't even know. There's even a puzzle fighter style bonus game, it's awesome. So yeah, if you like Legend of the Mystical Ninja, the sequels are way more out there and way crazier and well worth playing. One. Once again, we have another tie. Hey, I told you this list gimmick was ridiculous. This time it's three games, and of course it's gotta be the three Parodius games. Now, the first Parodius did get released in PAL regions, so those folks are already familiar with this variety of insanity, but the two sequels stayed in Japan, and if you dig Parodius, then prepare yourself for a lot more of it, because that's exactly what those games are. Parodius on a cocktail of steroids and crack. Again, for the uninitiated, Parodius is a parody of Gradius. Gradius, parody, Parodius, get it? Ah, ah. 
Anyway, they're horizontal scrolling shoot 'em ups and they're all brutally difficult, but they're also incredibly entertaining. Just tons upon tons of stuff happening on screen at once. Just pure insanity from beginning to end. The third game is especially crazy since it introduces the much needed feature of having an old Japanese man shout at you. I wish more games had that. Can you imagine playing Ken Griffey Jr. Presents Major League Baseball and in the middle of a play some old guy shouts something unintelligible at you? Man, what a missed opportunity. Anyway, if you're into crazy stuff in video games, you gotta check out all three Parodius games. There's nothing more I can say here that you can't see for yourself on the screen. It's like staring into a bowl of fruity pebbles while tripping on LSD. In fact, more accurately, these games make you feel like you're on drugs without taking any drugs. Maybe they make you wonder if you accidentally took something without remembering. And that's really the best endorsement that I can give. Alright, that's my list. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. When people talk about Mega Man on NES, it's usually only about the first three games. The first game set the stage, but is comically difficult. The second game is one of, if not the best action platformer ever made. And the third game is a perfectly worthy follow-up of the second game, introducing stuff like Rush, Mega Man's helpful dog. By the time we get to Mega Man 4 and the games after that, a formula had been well established. And maybe I'm wrong, but it sure seems like people were ready and willing to just move on to Mega Man X after the third NES game. Mega Man 4 came out in December 1991 while the Super Nintendo was in full swing and by that time we'd already seen three NES franchises make the leap from 8 to 16-bit, with Gradius 3, Super Castlevania 4, and Super Mario World making huge improvements all across the board, building on the strengths of their predecessors, and that's with stuff like Contra 3 and Legend of Zelda Link to the Past right around the corner. So maybe I'm wrong, but I think the reason Mega Man 4, 5, and 6 tend to be overlooked a bit is because people felt like they were familiar with the NES Mega Man formula at the time, so we were all just waiting to see what kind of Mega Man game the SNES would get. A good example of this same effect is Donkey Kong Country 3, a really good game, but it's the third in the series and it came out really late in the SNES lifespan, and for the most part, people were just ready to move on to bigger and better things. Well, turns out Donkey Kong Country 3 is a damn good game, and Mega Man 4 is as well, bringing some new ideas to the franchise as well as a new villain, Dr. Kosak. Well, he's Russian, so of course he's evil. The big change here, though, is the debut of the charged shot, which is a big point of contention amongst the Mega Man fan base. Just hold the B button down and you get a powered up arm cannon blast, just like we later got in the X series. There's two sides to this change. One is that it makes the game a little easier, and yeah, this game is pretty damn tough, even by Mega Man standards. I think it's more difficult than the second and third games. But on the other hand, it completely de-emphasizes the value and importance of the weapons you earn from defeating a robot master. I get both sides of the argument, but I mean, you could always, you know, not use the charge shot if you didn't like it. But on the other hand, the Robot Master weapons here really aren't all that great in Mega Man 4. That's probably the biggest flaw in this game. The villains are just kinda lame. I mean, Dust Man? Ring Man? Plus, look at this Toad Man battle. Come on, that's it? Are you serious? And that's just with the arm cannon. I will say I do like Feral Man and his weapon, and the Bright Man weapon can be abused like crazy since it's like Flash Man's weapon, but you can still fire your arm cannon. But overall, the bosses are not the greatest. But at least the level design is still up to par. It's exactly as clever and as fun as you'd hope. Toad Man's stage has you contending with water flows and wind. Bright Man's stage has you playing with the lights and robotic grasshoppers. The Dust Man's stage in particular is well done. I know I mocked him earlier, but hey, he keeps a nice level. What can I tell? I like carving out your own path while trying to avoid being crushed to death, that's pretty cool. Or this part in Drill Man stage, where you have to activate the floor in front of you by flipping these switches. To help you contend with all these obstacles, you get back the three forms of Rush, Marine, Coil, and Jet. Although the Rush Jet isn't as overpowered here, you also get this little flip top dude that occasionally stops by to give you a random item. And you can pick up a special balloon weapon that's very similar to the propelling platforms in Mega Man 2, as well as a grappling arm that allows you to cling to the ceiling. That's all well and good, but like I said earlier, there's not that much incentive to use most of the Robot Master weapons, because most of them aren't all that good. Feral Man, Drill Man, and definitely Bright Man's weapons are useful, especially Bright Man's, which is up there with Metal Man's weapon from Mega Man 2 in terms of how much you can abuse it, but most of the fun in the Mega Man NES games is using these weapons throughout each level, and there's just not that much of a use for them most of the time, and that's not even bringing the charge shot into consideration. Now, that's definitely not to say that Mega Man 4 is a bad game. It's way better than your average action platform 
platformer, I'm just trying to explain why it falls a bit short of the second and third games, since those games make great use of the Robot Master weapons. Anyway, throughout the game it's clear one point of emphasis Capcom wanted to get across was the improved visual presentation of the game. Everything from the cutscene intro, the huge mini-boss fights like this snail or this whale guy, the weapon get screens. It's interesting how they changed very little about the gameplay visual and the Mega Man sprite itself, but they went balls to the wall with all the other visuals. It's pretty telling how they felt about the gameplay, like they deliberately said do not fix what's not broken. It's too bad they didn't stick with that reasoning over the next few years after this. Anyway, yeah, Mega Man 4 is a perfectly good entry in the NES Mega Man series. I mean, all the stuff you'd expect from a Mega Man game is here, the visuals, the great music, and the challenge. This is definitely a really tough game. The Dr. Kosak stages are so damn hard. The second stage boss here is a really strange room that slides apart. You have to time it right so you can get inside to destroy it. It's one of the more strange bosses I've ever seen. But I mean, yeah, you can't really go wrong with any of the NES Mega Man games. This is just kind of a reminder of that, and I wanted to call some attention to the fourth game since it doesn't get as much love as the others, and in the coming weeks I'll be looking at 5 and 6 as well. So yeah, I may not think the bosses or the boss weapons of Mega Man 4 are as good as the second and third game, that's still kind of nitpicking. This is still a great game and an excellent action platformer. Last month we looked at Mega Man 4, so now it's time to take a look at the next game in the series, Mega Man 5, released in 1992, still a year before Mega Man X for the Super Nintendo came out, and it's got a lot in common with the fourth Mega Man game. The charge shot is still here, Flip Top is back, Rush Jet is back, but they did away with Rush Marine, and Rush Coil got kind of a makeover as it's able to kind of jump with you? It's pretty goofy. There's also the Super Arrow, which allows you to create your own platforms and scale walls. It can also damage enemies, so it's kind of like the arrow power up from another Capcom game at around the same time, Darkwing Duck. You can also ride it in midair, which is a nice touch. Also new are these M tanks, which not only replenish health, but all of your weapon energy. The catch here, however, is that you can only carry one M tank at a time. Another new twist is collecting a letter in each Robot Master level that eventually spells out Mega Man 5, or Mega Man V. What, did they get confused with the Game Boy game or something? Anyway, that unlocks a new character named Beat, who's a bird that flies around hunting enemies and pecks away at them. It seems silly and pointless, but the game rewards you for unlocking Beat by making it really effective against the final boss. So yeah, that's all the new stuff in Mega Man 5. So what about the Robot Masters and their levels? Well, just like the fourth game, they're hit and miss. Overall, the levels themselves seem a little more polished and a bit more creative, especially Gravity Man stage, where you get flipped upside down, Wave Man stage, where you commandeer a vehicle for a while, Star Man stage has you jumping around in low G, and Stone Man stage has a lot of hidden areas you can discover. The backgrounds of Mega Man 5 especially seem lively and colorful, and a big upgrade over the last game, which sometimes settled for just plain black backgrounds. Now before I start to criticize Mega Man 5, I have to remind everyone that yes, any Mega Man NES game is going to be considered a high quality action platform platformer by objective standards, but I'm comparing it to the best games in the series, not the stuff like Karnoff or Totally Rad. Where Mega Man 5 falls short of the best NES Mega Man games is with some of the Robot Master weapons. Some of them are pretty crappy, but see, the problem with reviewing these games in order is that now I feel stupid for slagging the boss weapons in Mega Man 4, because they're not that bad compared to some of the stuff here. Stone Man's weapon is just three rocks that just fly wherever and it's impossible to aim. Napalm Man's weapon just drops small bombs like you drop change into a homeless guy's coffee cup. And the charge kick might be the worst weapon in any Mega Man game. It doesn't even fire a projectile. It's only used while sliding. It's awful. On the bright side though, I do think Mega Man 5 does a better job of handling the charge shot than Mega Man 4 did. It just feels like the developers had a better feel for its capabilities. And as a result, many of the enemies are much tougher to contend with, like this big dude in Gravity Man stage, or these tigers in Napalm Man stage. However, despite this, Mega Man 5 still feels easier overall if you're going by Mega Man NES standards. Some people might see that as the game being more accessible and a friendlier stepping stone to getting into the series, while other people may see it as a disappointment since a big part of Mega Man is the challenge. 
But anyway, considering the burnout and overexposure the Mega Man NES series was beginning to face at the time, Mega Man 5 is an admirable effort. They really tried their damnedest to expand the series while keeping the core gameplay intact even working some story elements into it, like this time around, Proto Man is the villain, or is he? Gee, I wonder. This is, of course, another great action platformer, however, it falls just a bit short of the better Mega Man NES titles. That's not a bad thing, those are some insanely high standards to live up to. But yeah, despite some really lame boss weapons, I think I'd give a slight nod to Mega Man 5 over Mega Man 4 at the very least. We've looked at Mega Man 4, Mega Man 5, now let's take a look at Mega Man 6, the last game of the series on NES which was released in March of 1994, a few months after Mega Man X hit the Super Nintendo. So yeah, at the time, people were kind of over the NES Mega Man series for the most part, partly because of burnout, I mean this is the sixth game of essentially the same thing, and because people were just ready to move on to something bigger, faster, and more advanced. I mean Mega Man X was freaking incredible for the time, and it still is today, so it's understandable why something like Mega Man X would be largely ignored. But just like the fourth and fifth games, Mega Man 6 is still a perfectly good action platformer that fits in with the series just fine. I personally don't think it's as good as 2 or 3 or even 5, but it's still a very good game on its own. Let's start out and list all the things different in 6, so you know what you're in for here. First, Rush isn't a dog anymore, but a suit you can wear. There's a jetpack and a power adapter which you use to blast through larger obstacles in your way. You can use each in intermittent bursts, and the energy bar automatically replenishes. It's kind of like flying in Gargoyle's Quest 2, another Capcom NES title. Beat the Bird is back too, and you still have to collect letters, this time it's only four, spelling out beat. This time, however, you find the letters by going down alternate paths that lead to alternate bosses, similar to the way you can find and fight Surges, Violin, and Agile in Mega Man X2. This aspect is fun if you're into 100% runs and if you're a completionist type, but ultimately the beat stuff is kind of pointless, and it's not at all necessary to beat the game. That's about it for differences, I mean they did leave a couple things out from the previous game like the M-Tanks, but that's it. There's not too much that's unique here in Mega Man 6, so yeah, it's easy to skip this one. There is an interesting bit of trivia here though, this batch of Robot Masters was submitted by fans. There were over 200,000 submissions from all around the world, then 6 from Japan were chosen and 2 from North America were chosen. Some of these are pretty cool, like Nightman and Centaur Man, but stuff like Wind Man and Flame Man are just rehashes of previous bosses, and Blizzard Man. I mean, this guy just looks kind of ridiculous on his little skis. Anyway, you guys are probably sick of me harping on the boss weapons in these videos, but hey, they're what make Mega Man Mega Man, you know? So the better the boss weapons, the more fun it's going to be. The weapons in Mega Man 6 aren't that bad, so to speak, they're just derivative of weapons we've already seen. Of course, that's understandable since this is the sixth game in the series, and I will say Nightman's weapon is pretty cool, as well as Tomahawk Man's, but there's another Flashman type weapon, Wind Man weapons is practically the same as Air Man's, Flame Man's weapon is reminiscent of Heat Man's, on and on. Like I said, they're still already right, but there's no new ground being covered at all anymore. A similar sentiment could be said about the level design. There's the token ice level, the token water level, you get the idea. I do like the split paths, that's an interesting touch, and there are some really cool ideas here, like the upside down water in Centaur Man's level that affects your jumping, or Flame Man stage here, where there's pits of oil that get lit on fire and lead to an instant death if you're not careful. Those parts are pretty cool. It's just that, like I said, there's not a whole lot of new stuff here. So yeah, to sum up, of course Mega Man 6 is an bad game, it's just clear that the NES series had run out of steam at this point. I do think 6 is better than 4, but I think I prefer 5 over 6 personally. I just think overall, if you've played 1 through 5, or even if you've only played a couple Mega Man NES games, you're really not missing a whole lot if you haven't played Mega Man 6. It's still a fantastic action platformer, but it's probably the least essential of the 6 games. Struck. In 1994, the world is enjoying this badass new retooled Mega Man game called Mega Man X. It's universally praised and enjoyed and almost immediately becomes one of the best games on the Super Nintendo. But wait, here comes another Mega Man game down the pike. What, already? Yes, that's right, it's... Mega Man Soccer. Uh, wait a second, is this real? This isn't a joke? Mega Man Soccer is a real thing? This was my reaction as a 12 year old kid at the time. Excitement that a new Mega Man game was coming around so quickly, immediately followed by pure bafflement and abject confusion.
confusion. Remember, this was years before stuff like Mario Tennis or Mario Golf and even Super Mario Kart still seemed like not only a novelty but as an exception because it was such a great game. Mega Man Soccer is just... Why soccer? Why Mega Man? I mean, what's next? Street Fighter skiing? Breath of Fire Badminton? Castlevania Croquet? Okay, so forget all the reactions and the confusion and the jokes. How does the game play? Is it any good? Eh, it's okay-ish, I guess, but it's really not all that good. While Mega Man Soccer is not without its charm, it's not anything to write home about as a soccer game. I'll admit up front, I'm not a big soccer guy. I don't know it secondhand like I do many other sports, but I do know a good soccer game when I see one, like Sensible Soccer or International Superstar Soccer Deluxe. A big part of what makes those games good is the ability to see so much of the field, and a good balance between speed and pacing. And that's the biggest flaw of Mega Man Soccer, you just can't see enough, so you just end up staring at that grid with the dots on the top of the screen. Plus the field overall just seems too small compared to how big the players are, and the controls are sluggish and don't always feel very responsive. I guess that word best sums up the gameplay, sluggish. And because of that, the balance of the gameplay suffers, it's a chore to get the ball downfield. Another huge flaw is that you're often at the mercy of the computer teammates' AI, and that is really frustrating because your teammates are idiots that don't know how to get open. There are some positives here though, like the laugh out loud attempt to somehow tie this game in with the Mega Man universe with a story that has Dr. Wily's Robot Masters hijack a soccer game, and of course the only way to stop them is for Dr. Light to form his own soccer team of Mega Mans. This is like the plot of a bad 1980s Sylvester Stallone movie. But hey, if you play the regular exhibition mode, you can form your own team of robots. From a selection of guys like Cutman, Woodman, Skullman, and Feral Man, just to name a few. You can see how each of these guys stack up with this status screen here, which divvies up skill based on speed, kicking, tackling, and defense. You can pick your formation at the beginning of the game, and even make substitutions at halftime. Plus, each robot has their own special move, like a Fireman robot can make a shot that sets the ball on fire, or Cutman can turn the ball into a pair of clippers. See, there are some good ideas here, it's just that the gameplay itself isn't all that great. To be fair, Mega Man Soccer does at least go the NBA Jam route of ignoring most of the rules so you can recklessly slide into guys and all that. But again, everything here just feels like they slapped this game together in a few weeks. And not just from the gameplay, the most telling evidence of how half-assed this game was put together is that there's no ending. You beat the championship mode and it just boots you back to the title screen. There's not even any credits. So yeah, Mega Man Soccer sounds like a weirdly intriguing idea, but the game is a disappointment thanks to the listless gameplay and the half-assed execution. This game could have been pretty good. Fan sites like Rockman Corner have discovered unused code in the game that indicates that the development team was planning on having Mega Man Soccer be 4-player compatible. Now that would have made this game totally worth it. The way Mega Man Soccer turned out though, it's hard to justify playing today. drunk. Here's another arcade game I had no idea existed until recently, this one made by Capcom, and it's a Mega Man boss gauntlet. Man, where has this been all my life? It's called Mega Man Power Battle, featuring one-on-one -on -one fights with robot masters, with the art style, settings, and music done in the same style as Mega Man 7 for Super Nintendo, with Mega Man Power Battle being released only a few months after that game. The structure is of a one-on-one -on -one fighting game, and you can play as three different characters, Mega Man, Proto Man, and Bass. And just like Monster Maulers, this is another fighting game where you can play with two players, which is awesome. The game is divided up into three paths. The first path has you fight six robot masters from Mega Man 1 and 2, the second path features six robots from Mega Man 3, 4, 5, and 6, and the third path is six robots from Mega Man 7. You can select the first boss you want to fight in each, but after that the order is randomized. In the first two paths, after defeating all six robot masters, you unlock two more fights, the first being against the Yellow Devil, also known as the Rock Monster, before you fight two different forms of Dr. Wily. What's cool here is that the Rock Monster will take a different form depending on which path you take, and that thing is really tough to beat on both paths. In the Mega Man 7 path, you fight that goofy jack-o'-lantern thing from Mega Man 7 instead, before fighting Wily. Now, on the surface, this game may look pretty easy. I mean, it's a fighting game where you shoot a projectile, and each character can charge their weapons as well, so you can keep your distance and focus on dodging and just blindly fire away. But man, oh man, this one gets really tough, especially the Mega Man 7 path. Even just the regular robot masters are brutal. Thankfully, this game includes one of the main mechanics that makes Mega Man fun, and that's the boss weapons. That's right, you still collect boss weapons 
weapons in this game, and the same rock-paper-scissors logic still applies here. For example, Iceman is weak to Gutsman's weapon, Heatman is weak to Iceman's weapon, you get the idea, and that helps with the difficulty a little bit. And yeah, even playing with a second player, you both get the boss weapons, so that's pretty cool. Unfortunately, you can't charge the boss weapons, so keep that in mind. There are a few things I have to point out here that feel like missed opportunities. One is that there really isn't much difference between the three playable characters. Sure, base can jump slightly higher, and Proto Man is kinda sorta barely a little bit quicker, or maybe that's just my imagination. But yeah, it really doesn't matter who you pick to play as. You can press down and jump to do a slide or a dash, but while it may look like Proto Man has a shield, he doesn't, it's just cosmetic. Each character does feature a different ending, so that's a nice bonus. Another thing I should point out is that there are no platforming stages here at all. Don't get me wrong, I like the fighting game structure, but it does get a bit old after a while, and I start to miss what Mega Man does best. And that, of course, is the action platforming stuff, so if you're looking for that here, you won't find it. On the positive side, I mean just look at this game, it looks freaking awesome. It is so dang cool to see the older bosses like Cut Man and Gemini Man and the like all get tweaked, not just with a more polished design, but with extra frames of animation too. The backgrounds also look great with all sorts of stuff going on. They even revamp the music for each Robot Master, but there are some instances where they just use someone else's music for some reason. Like for example, Iceman's theme is actually Freeze Man's music. It still sounds cool, but it's just kind of a weird decision. But yeah, the overall point I'm trying to make is that this game is made for Mega Man fans, and if you love the series, you'll get a huge kick out of the look and sound of this game. Even better is that there is a sequel to this one, Mega Man 2 The Power Fighters, which came out a year later, and it's really just more of the same. You get Duo as a playable character in addition to the original three, and there's more robot masters to fight, and this one's a bit more story driven, with Dr. Light showing up to give you hints about which boss weapons work against which robot masters. So, how do you play these? Both games were ported to home consoles in North America in 2004 as part of the Mega Man Anniversary Collection for PS2, GameCube, and Xbox, although they do have to be unlocked. But hey, that's better than nothing. So yeah, if you're a huge Mega Man fan and you haven't played this, well, what are you waiting for? Yeah, it's pretty limited, and there's no platforming action here, but both Mega Man Power Battle and Mega Man 2 Power Fighters are such a blast to play, especially if you're familiar with the source material and have played the older Mega Mans to death like I have. It's just fun seeing these old bosses reinvented with new sprites and new animation, and the music is awesome too. And of course, it's that much more fun with a second player. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Last week I looked at the arcade fighting game Mega Man Power Battle, and I briefly mentioned the sequel, Mega Man 2 The Power Fighters, and I just kinda said it was more of the same, and I have to admit that was a mistake on my part. After spending more time with Power Fighters, I decided it needed its own video, because if you liked Power Battle, or if you just like Mega Man in general, then you will love Power Fighters. It's everything a good sequel should be. It's just a lot more of what made the first game so much fun. And yes, I have to point out right away that this game, just like Power Battle, is two-player co-op. In Power Fighters, the multiple paths are still here, but rather than dryly splitting them apart by game, instead they're split up into three different stories. The first path has you go after Dr. Wily, of course, but the second path has you rescue Roll, and the third path has you look for parts that were stolen from Dr. Light's lab. Yeah, it kinda goes without saying that each of these paths eventually lead to a fight with Dr. Wily no matter what you do, but the appearance of Roll, plus some additional cutscenes here, really help flesh out the Mega Man universe. Normally I don't care about that kind of stuff when it comes to Mega Man, but I make an exception when it comes to these arcade games, if only because everything looks so freaking cool, and the music throughout is fantastic. Mega Man, Proto Man, and Bass are all back as playable characters, only now you can play as Duo from Mega Man 8, who functions as the big strong Zangief style character. Unlike the first game, there are some notable differences between each character, mostly in the form of a special move. Just charge your blaster and press up to execute it. Mega Man will do a dragon punch, Bass does a flash kick reminiscent of Guile, while Proto Man has a close range fireball and Duo has an uppercut that'll launch your opponent into the air. 
You also get help from Rush if you play as Mega Man where he rockets around or allows you to use him as a jump boost, plus Beat shows up to give shields to Proto Man and Duo, and Treble also shows up to help base, but there's not really any telling what triggers this, they just show up in the form of a power-up. The gameplay itself is mostly the same as Power Battle, defeat six robot masters in a one-on-one -on -one fight before moving on to face either the Rock Monster, the Mech Dragon from Mega Man 2, or the Mad Grinder from Mega Man 7, before you eventually face Dr. Wily. All the robot masters in each story path are all mixed together in varying order. For instance, one path has you face Cutman, Stone Man, Shade Man, Elect Man, Dive Man, and Slash Man. So right there, we've got Mega Man 4, 5, and 7, along with the first game, all represented here. During and after each fight, you get weapon and health replenishments, which is nearly unheard of for an arcade game, considering the goal of every arcade game is to, you know, eat your quarters. The boss weapons are all still here, and I should point out that, unlike the first game, both players can not use the same weapon at the same time. Whoever gets the last shot at the boss gets the weapon, and that's pretty cool, if only because it introduces a little bit of competitive aspect to the game. The rock paper scissors structure is still here as well, although it's not as immediately as intuitive as it is in the regular Mega Man series. For instance, Shade Man is weak to Elect Man's weapon, and Stone Man is weak to Shade Man's weapon. Thankfully, and a really nice touch, Dr. Light will give you hints in between fights as to which weapon works best against certain robot masters. One oddity here is that some boss weapons, like for Pharaoh Man and Centaur Man, they had to be changed just for this game, I guess to make them more apt for a fighting game, and they both worked pretty well. So yeah, I just wanted to make a quick video about this one. I love Mega Man stuff, so I really dig this game. The pixel art here is even better than the first game. The special moves for each character are awesome. The robot masters are great. The boss weapons are fantastic. And this game definitely feels a bit smoother and a little bit more balanced than Power Battle. If you want to play this one today, it's featured on the 2004 Mega Man Anniversary Collection for PS2, GameCube, and Xbox, albeit as an unlockable option. But yeah, if you're a fan of Mega Man, definitely seek this one out, along with Power Fighters. They're both fantastic. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. There are so many great sequels in the Super Nintendo library, great games that were oftentimes made even better the second time around. ActRaiser, still a fantastic game to this day, was released in Japan in 1990. ActRaiser 2 was released in 1993, so with three years to brainstorm, tinker, and improve on an already quality piece of work, you'd think ActRaiser 2 would be an instant classic. But instead on improving on the original ActRaiser, the developers Enix decided to just go in another direction. They abandoned the town building aspect of the game for better or for worse. In fact, it's rumored that the American Department of Enix specifically requested this because they felt the town building stuff was holding the game back and that it was too hard to understand. Whether that rumor is true or not, I totally disagree, obviously, as ActRaiser is a perfectly good game, even to this day. But I won't slag its sequel for something it isn't. Taking a look at it here for what it actually is, and what it is is a beautiful looking, but extremely difficult platformer. What stands out about ActRaiser 2 right away is how it looks. The art style is beautiful and detailed, and a decided improvement on its predecessor, which looked pretty good in its own right. Seriously, the graphics in ActRaiser 2 would make my top 10 for the Super Nintendo. It's up there with Earthworm Jim, Super Mario RPG, Yoshi's Island, and the like. But don't spend too long gawking at the pixel art and animation though, because you'll die, and die again, and again, and again. This game does not let up for a second. Right away in this first level, you've got like six enemies coming at you from all directions. And when I mean all directions, I mean any direction at any time. Some patterns here are impossible to predict. The biggest problem with ActRaiser 2 is that your character does not match the speed of its enemies. Everything is too fast, and your character is too slow to keep up. You can fly and float a little bit, but that can be really frustrating because you can't control yourself when you're in the air. And the hit detection on your flight attack never seems to register, or at least it didn't very often for me. Sometimes your best bet is to just take damage and keep going. Move on to the next part. Fuck those guys. You are given magic at least. You charge up your attack by holding the button like the X Buster in Mega Man X, but you still have a limited amount of times you can do this. Given the capabilities of flight and magic, and you know the fact that, you know, you're god, it's very tempting to try and power your way through this game, but if you try and do that, you will hate this game. You have to be slow and deliberate, like your character, really. And you have to take things slowly and let things come to you, but on some levels there's just no advice that'll work. The sheer amount of enemies here, for example, is absurd. And this is on the easy mode, by the way. And on the surface, this seems ridiculous. I mean, you're god, but you're taking damage from dragonflies? That makes no sense. 
as brutally hard as this game is, it is playable. I've read places call this game broken, but I don't think it's that bad. It's just absurdly hard. But its best incentive it provides to endure the frustration and keep playing, to be quite honest, is just to see what the next level looks like. Seriously, this game is so damn cool looking, that was my main motivation to get to the next level, to see what it looks like. For the story, it's kind of vague. There's hints that this could be a prequel, or a true sequel since it hints that Tanzra, the main villain, was resurrected. But it may be a separate world entirely, because everything here is new. Anyway, you again play as a god that has to go down to Earth to vanquish demons, presenting themselves in the Seven Deadly Sins. Fight your way to Tanzra, or Satan as he's called in the Super Famicom version. Like the first game, the levels are in two acts, but in Act Razor 2, both acts are platforming. They still have you float around above the world with your assistant, but you do have to finish each stage somewhat in order. Anyway, it's hard to know to recommend this game or not. If you're looking for a challenge, go for it, but don't be fooled by your character's capabilities. You can't play this game like Sonic or Sparkster or even Castlevania. Act Razor 2 is a slow, deliberate game that's hard as hell. If you're up to the challenge, then check it out. You can make a solid argument that ActRaiser is a top 20 game on the Super Nintendo. For those unfamiliar, ActRaiser was a very early SNES title made by Quintet, and it was otherwise known as the goofy game that combined action platforming with town simulation stuff. The game got a sequel a few years later, ActRaiser 2, and while it's definitely got some of the best graphics and art direction on the Super Nintendo, the game was a disappointment because Quintet decided to do away with the town simulation mode entirely. It's just a regular old action platformer and a dreadfully difficult one at that. And it's just not all that fun to play. Fast forward to 2019 and we get a trailer for a game called Soul Seraph, and the reaction was unanimous. Hey look, it's modern ActRaiser, it's a side scroller with town sim stuff, only with more fleshed out real time simulation mechanics. Yeah, I know I'm a bit late getting to this one, but my backlog is ridiculous right now and I'm sorry I didn't get to it sooner, only so I could have been more timely when I tell people that this game is a total stay away. Sure, it's nice to see that games like ActRaiser haven't been forgotten, but Soul Seraph completely misses the point of what made ActRaiser great. See, ActRaiser was unique not just because of the gimmick of having two genres mashed together, it was the rhythm between the two gameplay modes that worked so well. The pacing was spot on. Soul Seraph does not have anything close to a similar rhythm. The time you're in RTS mode goes on seemingly forever, and some of the quote unquote stages in the side scrolling mode are like 15 seconds long. And that's before I even get to what a mess these stages are. The first introductory level is whatever, it's pretty standard stuff, and it's clearly wearing its ActRaiser influence on its sleeve with the same proportions and a similar layout, only with modern addendums like a double jump and a charged up attack, as well as a ranged attack with your bow and arrow. But geez louise, everything just comes across as thrown together, like all this side-scrolling stuff is just there for the sake of being there. I don't know, maybe I'm too far in my own head, but it really comes across like blatant pandering, like hey folks, remember ActRaiser? If it were remade today, I think it'd look a little something like this. And that's the end of it. There's no actual substance here. The worst of it are these abrupt stages where enemies just materialize from nowhere. I mean, come on, really? There's plenty of stuff here that's frustrating for the wrong reasons, like these goblins that shoot you with arrows the mere split second you appear on screen. Just ridiculous. The enemy patterns in general here are just generic, and like I said, thrown together. The town simulation mode, or the real-time strategy mode, boils down to a simpler tower defense game. You set up your town structure, making sure you have enough food and wood to supply your army, and it's the same as about a gazillion other tower defense games, you just sit and wait out all the waves. Throw in some deity powers that are mostly cosmetic, and you go build a temple by the enemy spawn points which activates the side-scrolling levels, and you've got something that can kinda sorta call back to ActRaiser. But as you can see, the overall presentation here is really no different than a mobile game. The fact that they're charging $15 for a half-baked platformer combined with a simple tower defense game you'd find for like a dollar on your phone is pretty inexcusable. It all comes across as just being thrown together in a very short time, and as a result, I can't help but feel like this game is just pandering. I will say, I think the RTS stuff is fine for what it is, but again, it's like, why am I paying $15 for this? I think the most positive thing to glean from Soul Seraph is the lesson that games like ActRaiser don't grow on trees, and there's a reason that they're more than the sum of their parts. It's because they get stuff like pacing and flow down correctly. Soul Seraph doesn't even come close to getting the individual elements correct, let alone big picture stuff like pacing. If you're hoping to find something close to a quote unquote spiritual sequel to ActRaiser that's actually worth playing, I think the best you'll find is one of the Dark Cloud games, because unfortunately, Soul Seraph is a stay away. All right, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.
That's drunk. There are three things you should never do in life. You don't spit into the wind, you don't tug on Superman's cape, and you don't ever underestimate the number of generic one-on-one -on -one fighting games that were directly inspired by Street Fighter 2. I'm telling you, that game was so massive, seemingly every single dev team either thought they'd try their hand at one, or some poor, under-equipped, and underqualified dev team was tasked by a publisher to push out some piece of crap, hoping that parents would get confused enough to be like, What was that game that little Timmy was talking about again? Well, this cover looks like something he would like, right? Seriously, look at this guy on the right. What is wrong with this dude? His legs look like they're pregnant with a family of Gila monsters. But then, check out the Japanese cover. You got that guy cutting off the head of a demon, yeah. Meanwhile, Shakira is there hanging out with some knives, and I can't decide if that's Jan Michael Vincent or Dermot Mulroney back there. Sadly, you could put the best cover ever conceived on this game, and it wouldn't matter because it sucks. And that's actually a bit of a surprise since this one was developed by ICOM, who made some really good NES games like Vice Project Doom and some decidedly average NES games like Astyanax, Totally Rad, and The Muffat Conspiracy, the sequel to the super ambitious game Golgo 13. So you start this one up and... okay, they evidently put Danny Trejo's face on Arnold Schwarzenegger's body. Not sure if that's a promising start or not. There's two game modes here, Hero Mode, where you progress through the story as one guy, which is your typical avenge your father and win a tournament to defeat some demon to become the king of whatever. And there's Battle Mode, which is one-on-one -on -one versus, with six playable characters, including some guy that looks like Baraka, some altered beast-looking thing, the guy from Blackthorn, the woman from the video from Michael Sambello's Automatic Man, and Sebastian from Stardew Valley if he dated Abigail and dyed his hair purple. What's funny here is that before you fight in this mode, you get a guy that yells at you about cheating. I don't think I've seen a game do that so overtly before. Wow, Baraka needs to lay off the hamdingers and mix in a salad or something. He is slow as hell. Let's try the regular dude. Okay, he's pretty quick. In fact, this game does cut a pretty quick pace. It's not a floaty, sluggish piece of crap like Fighting Masters for Sega Genesis, so at least it has that going for it. Well, kind of. This game has some inexplicable slowdown that pops up here and there, but the real problem comes with the controls, or lack thereof. It's B to jump, and Y to attack, and that's it. X, A, L, and R do not do anything. That's right, it's a fighting game that plays like a beat-em-up, and it's a fighting game where up is not jump. Despite that, each character is capable of at least four special moves, like the main guy here. Jump and press down and Y and you can hit your opponent on the way down. Press up and Y while in midair and you do a spin kick. Press forward twice and you'll do a dash attack. And if you manage to get right next to your opponent, just press against them and press Y, which does a stronger attack. That's as nuanced as it gets here, folks. No secondary power meters, no desperation attacks, no unlockable characters, no customizable stats, no combos, no nothing. But whoa, this guy throws a projectile with a sword. And since there isn't anything extra in this game, as far as the combat goes, this one just ends up being a total button masher. If a fighting game could be store brand instant mashed potatoes, it would be Battle Blaze. Anytime a publisher tries to sell a total dud as something interesting, it's always fun to look at the back of the box, like here, where it says, Warriors of a chaotic land await to challenge brave opponents. Only one worthy contender will be the master of the realm, and then skip down a bit where it says, Courageously roam the countryside. What? You don't roam anywhere. And that's when I realized that the italics here weren't meant for emphasis, they're meant for air quotes. You know, roam the countryside to find a worthy contender. So yeah, there's stories about how this game was delayed by various circumstances which put off its US release a couple years, but even if this thing came out in 1992 when it was supposed to, then so what? This game is still just a big bag of blah regardless of its time and place. And that includes then, and it includes now, to the point that if you ever end up playing this game for whatever reason today, you really gotta use your imagination to have fun. Like here we've got John Redcorn on the right getting the crap kicked out of him by Olivia Newton-John. If you're into that, then hey, this game is for you. If you're not, then then avoid this game. All right, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.
That's drunk. Let's keep going with more Super Scope games, this time with Yoshi's Safari, and this game is right up there with Battle Clash and Metal Combat Falcon's Revenge as the best stuff the Super Scope has to offer. Uh, not that that means a whole lot, but still, Yoshi's Safari has quite a bit going for it. I mean, for one thing, this is a first-person Mario game where you play as Mario, equipped with a Super Scope who rides on Yoshi all across the Jewelry Kingdom, which has been commandeered by Bowser and all the Koopa Kids. So yeah, while this may not be the Mushroom Kingdom, it's still pretty cool to be able to play a Mario game this way. I should mention, however, that the Super Scope is the only way to play this one. No controller or mouse functionality here unless you play in two-player mode, which I'll get to in a bit. You get three lives to get through 12 total levels. The first seven, you can choose whichever order you'd like to complete them before unlocking the next four, and then finally unlocking the final boss fight, which is of course Bowser. The game plays just about as you'd expect, you just fire at anything that pops up onto the screen while you're automatically propelled down each path. There's a couple extra things here, first is that you can jump by pressing the cursor button underneath the front sight on the Super Scope. The game throws some timed jumps in your way, just for the sake of some variety I guess. You also collect coins, with the magic number being 60 to get an extra life. There's also items you can collect, some you can use during the level, while some you can only use during a boss fight. The level items include the mushroom and and Fire Flower, only in Yoshi's Safari they help you recover your life, which you can see up top, or increase the length of your power gauge, which you can see underneath the life meter. So you can't just fire away non-stop, you can run out of power, as dictated by that meter, at which point you'll be helpless. And Goombas and Koopas come at you pretty dang quickly, so you really do have to be cognizant of the power meter. There's also items that you can only use during boss fights, like Nuts, which reduce your damage by one half, and a Clock, which gives you an extra minute of time. Now, the action here gives me a couple different impressions. One is that I really dig how the game utilizes the entire screen. It seems like with a lot of light gun games, I usually have to concentrate on just the middle or just a certain section or whatever. But Yoshi Safari has enemies popping up even at the very edges, so that's pretty cool. But on the other hand, the enemies in this game get real repetitive real quickly. The first level sets the tone. Hope you like seeing lots of flying Goombas and stuff, because that's all you're going to see throughout the first few levels. The game does get off to kind of a slow start. Thankfully, Yoshi's Safari gives you plenty of incentive to keep going through this one, and that's because of the great looking boss fights. There is some really impressive pixel art here, both from the bosses and from Yoshi itself, like where he gets hit by this hammer brother. He looks back at you like, ah, what the hell are you doing? You gotta shoot that stuff, man. You also fight all the Koopa Kids, which usually have two forms. Some have their own mechs, like Iggy and Ludwig, while others have a setting that reflects their stage in Super Mario World, like Wendy Koopa popping out of pipes, tossing bombs at you while a flying anvil shoots horseshoes at you? What? This fight in particular is tricky because not only do you have to dodge bombs and horseshoes, but the only way to do damage to Wendy is to shoot the anvil when it's flying above her. It's kinda neat and it requires a bit of patience. Again, the good qualities in this game are met with equally annoying flaws. For instance, Yoshi's Safari is a great case of a game that just gets better the further you progress, and it's really cool to see what kind of form each boss will take, or who you'll run into next, and the Bowser fight at the end, in particular, really looks great. I really dig how this game looks overall. The problem, however, is getting to that point, because this game can drag and drag. A full playthrough of this one can last easily over an hour, and in my opinion, that's way too long for a light gun game with such limited energy enemies and repetitive gameplay. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the two-player mode. Player 1 uses the Super Scope and the other controls Yoshi with the controller, giving him a bit more functionality like having him duck or slow down so you can shoot more bad guys. Heck, even if you're playing by yourself, you can try and control Yoshi in two-player mode with your feet if you're feeling up to the challenge. Hey, okay, maybe that's just me, but it's still an option for you. But yeah, Yoshi's Safari is pretty dang good, it's absolutely worth getting if you own a Super Scope. Yeah, it's repetitive, but the way the Mario universe is depicted here is really cool. Plus, you get to see Mario walking around, toting a big plastic bazooka, I mean, you gotta love that. I just wish the levels had a little more enemy variety, but still, this one's right up there with Battle Clash and Metal Combat as must-haves if you own a Super Scope. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Drunk.
Here's another Super Scope game for you. It's Bazooka Blitzkrieg, and if you think that name is a bit much, the Japanese edition was simply titled Destructive. Yeah, check out that cover art. Now that's what I'm talking about. Unlike previous Super Scope games I've covered in recent weeks, Bazooka Blitzkrieg is a tad bit different. While stuff like Battle Clash, Metal Combat, and Yoshi Safari primarily centered around one-on-one -on -one boss fights, Bazooka Blitzkrieg is a side-scrolling and sometimes vertically scrolling gallery shooter. Sure, there's boss fights here, but most of the game has you taking out robots and stuff as you automatically scroll through each level, kinda like T2 the arcade game. You even get robots that jump right up in your grill, just like that game. You get one big health bar, and Unlimited continues to get through five levels. The first level has you slowly cruise down the streets while making a bunch of robots go boom. The second level has you out on a highway shooting motorcycles and helicopters before a giant ship straight out of Contra 3 comes down to attack you. Level 3 is back to slowly scrolling along shooting robots. Man, you move so slowly here. I'd like to think you're shooting from one of those motorized grocery cart things. Level 4 has you moving vertically up this tower, shooting even more robots and helicopters and level 5 is, you guessed it, you're back on your sit-down grocery cart firing away at somehow even more robots before you get to the final boss. I should mention quickly that, yep, this is another game where you can only use the super scope, no controller or mouse support here. There's two default weapons. One is a machine gun that comes with unlimited ammo, and it's usually reserved for protecting yourself from projectiles. And the other is a missile launcher, but you have a limited amount of those, so you gotta save them for bigger enemies or for boss fights. You can also pick up items like bombs and a protective shield, but this is one of those annoying games that also punishes you for collecting everything, since there's some items here that do damage to you, like T that stands for toxic waste. What, do these robots all work for the Springfield nuclear plant or something? There's two game modes. The Blitzkrieg mode is just the regular game, progressing through five levels, and boot camp mode allows up to four players that take turns, pretty much just doing target practice for points. In other words, it's nothing too fancy. What's weird about this game is the visual presentation. For some reason, everything just looks washed out, like this game was left in the sun too long or something. I don't really have any explanation as to why the colors in this game look so faded. But yeah, what you see on the screen here is how the game really looks. I suppose you can always mess with your TV settings to make it look better, but come on, you shouldn't have to do that. One thing I do really like here is that it's not just enemies that go boom, everything goes boom. Glass windows, beer cans, trash cans, street lights, street signs? Hey, the more explosions the better, I'm all for it, even if it makes absolutely zero sense. So yeah, there's really not much else to say about Bazooka Blitzkrieg, there's not much to it. But I will point out this funny bit in the manual that says to consult your physician if you experience lingering discomfort from using the super scope, which includes your shoulder, eyes, neck, arms, or any other body part. I mean, geez, am I playing a video game or helping someone build a barn? Don't get me wrong, this game is fine for what it is. It's a short and mostly harmless playthrough. I do wish the boss fights were a little more interesting, but eh, the exploding street signs kind of make up for it. Still, getting this game instead of Metal Combat or Yoshi Safari is like your hockey team's front office saying, you know, we wanted to go after Curtis Joseph, but we settled for Tim Shevelday instead. Now, Tim Shevelday wasn't bad, but he was a backup most of his career for a reason, and Bazooka Blitzkrieg is in the same boat. It isn't a bad game, it's fine, but it's firmly behind the other decent Super Scope games, which, you know, isn't really saying a whole lot. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Drunk. Developer Kemco decided to get in on the fun of the Super Scope, developing X-Zone back in 1992, and yep, this is another game that only works with the Super Scope. No controller or mouse support here. And once again, the story here involves you playing as some kind of super soldier, definitely not made up to look like Samus or Iron Man or anything, nope, no siree. And you're taking out all sorts of out-of-control robots and stuff. I mean, you gotta give Super Scope games credit when it comes to story. They didn't mess around, it's just shoot anything and everything and it's almost always out of control robots of some kind. 
There's no wacky misunderstandings straight out of a Frasier episode where it's all a dream, but wait, you're actually in an alternate dimension and Robert Urich is there, but he's playing goaltender for the Minnesota North Stars. Oh, that's actually my fan fiction, sorry. If it seems like I'm avoiding talking about X-Zone, it's because I am. Well, this game has four levels split into two areas each, and you get one health bar with three continues to finish the whole game. And as an added bonus, your health does not reset between levels. That is a substantial problem because this game is ridiculously hard. Now, I appreciate a light gun game that isn't afraid to use the entire screen, but in this case, we've got both enemies and projectiles appearing from any and all spots, sometimes seven or eight things appearing all at once. How the hell are you supposed to deal with that? I mean, look at this crap. This would be cool if this were a two-player game, but you're out here fending for yourself, on your own. You just gotta pick your spots here and go into defensive mode. You can't possibly shoot everything, so shoot at missiles and projectiles coming at you instead. If you happen to hit an enemy, so be it. This is the kind of game that's pure survival. You'll be mashing all the buttons on your super scope so much that you'll have to swap out batteries between levels. Okay, I'm exaggerating a bit, but only a bit. X-Zone does at least get off to a good start. The first level here has you taking a bird's eye view as you presumably parachute down outside an enemy base with all sorts of crap flying at you. Hey, at least the viewing angle is something different. It's better than the uh, horizontal scrolling levels that slowly crawl by, which is what the next two levels are. First, you're in a desert, then you're fighting to get inside the enemy base, then you're in the base itself for level four, and whoa, this would be seriously awesome if the background weren't so freaking choppy. I admire what they tried here, but take a look at a game like Accelibrid. This isn't a Super Scope game, but it might as well be. It's a Super Famicom game that never came out in the US, but it's got a similar style of gameplay, and the approach here is to use an extremely low-res loop for the background. Yeah, it's not the greatest looking, but on a CRT TV, it's actually pretty cool. Especially, you know, if you're squinting or if you're just really stoned. I much prefer this approach than, say, this here. I mean, come on, Kemco, you developed Top Gear. You should be able to put together something better than this, right? Oh, no? Well, okay then. So yeah, X-Zone is about on the same level as Bazooka Blitzkrieg, which I looked at last week. Just kind of a dull, run-of-the-mill light gun game with only a few highlights and not much else. For me, the highlights here are the music, which is pretty good throughout the game, plus the fact that you can cause damage to pretty much everything on screen, and some of the bosses look kind of neat. Plus, like I said, that first level is at least something different. Other than that, though, there's just not a lot here that X-Zone has to offer. The game is just brutally difficult, even on the easiest difficulty, so it's easy to just throw up your hands and ask what's the point, especially when there's other light gun stuff you can play like Metal Combat and Yoshi Safari. I admit, I did get pretty bored and frustrated playing this one, to the point that I wondered if developer and publisher Kemco ever thought of tying this game in with Phalanx, so they could make this infamous old dude the main character so you could imagine yourself as him in the not Samus suit causing all sorts of chaos and destruction. Now that would be cool. But yeah, as it is, X-Zone just isn't worth the aggravation. Alright, I want to thank you for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day. That's drunk. Hello, Halloween is coming up again, so let's take a look at the best horror-themed arcade games. In the past, I've covered the best Super Nintendo Halloween games and the best Super Nintendo Halloween ROM hacks, but for sheer carnage and insanity and gore, it's hard to beat the arcade. This list is going to span from the early 80s all the way to 2015, so I'm going to try and cover as much as I can. I should mention quickly that most arcade horror games tend to be light gun games, so there's a lot of flashing lights in this video, just to let you know. But we'll start with Splatterhouse, made by Namco back in 1988, and this is a super obvious one, and for good reason. It was one of, if not the first game, to have crazy, gory visuals like this, whether you're slicing these monsters in half, or smashing them against the wall in the background, or shooting rabid zombie wolves, or kicking whatever this baby thing is. This game is a great time just for the spectacle. The gameplay is really simple, but it's still a lot of fun. It's available through the Arcade Archive series on Switch, Xbox One, PS4, and Windows.
If you're looking for more of a Final Fight type game, there's Night Slashers, and this game is freaking awesome. Right off the bat, you're in a van running over a herd of zombies before you and your robotic arms get out to punch vomiting armless zombies so hard that they melt. And uh, I don't know if I'd eat a hot dog on the ground in a graveyard next to a bunch of pools of blood and various other fluids. That bread might get a little bit soggy. This one was made by Data East back in 1993 and received a Nintendo Switch port a few years ago, and a remake is in the works as well. So keep an eye out for that, but really, you can't go wrong with the original game. It's got some of the best pixel art of the era. Here's a couple more older games that I want to include, the first being Make You Hunter G. And if this game looks familiar, that's because it was reskinned in the US as the real Ghostbusters back in 1987. This is the original game, also made by Data East, and it's a top-down directional shooter that can get pretty difficult, so if this kind of challenge is what you're looking for, then here you go. I like the original game, but the Ghostbusters reskin isn't too shabby either, and it's much more forgiving when it comes to that brutal arcade-style difficulty. But now, let's go all the way back to 1983 with Sinistar, made by Williams Electronics. Hey, wait a second, what's so scary about this game? It's just kind of an Asteroids clone and... Beware, I live. Oh dear god. Imagine playing this at the time when you're used to stuff like Pac-Man. Hell, I'm playing this now and that voice is still haunting, and it doesn't help that this game gets ridiculously hard, too. Sinistar is available on Super Nintendo as part of the Williams Arcade Greatest Hits compilation, but there's a lot of other places you can find this one. Alright, let's get slightly more modern. Here's a couple third-person action arcade games, starting with Zombie Revenge, developed by Sega in 1999, and it's a spin-off of the House of the Dead series, which I'll get to in a bit. But the general gist is that a secret US government project has gone awry. They had the brilliant idea of raising the dead so they could be used as soldiers. I guess someone in charge just finished reading Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King or something, but surprisingly, things don't go so well, so the US government doubles down with another brilliant idea, sending exactly three secret agents to take out an entire town of zombies. Thankfully, the game is a lot better executed. This is a really fun one that's reminiscent of other Sega arcade games like Dynamite Cop, and it got a Dreamcast port in 2000, but if you can't find that, then this is one you'll have to play any way you can. Here's another game with a similar gameplay style called Chaos Heat, made for arcades in 1998 by Taito. This one has much more of a sci-fi horror motif, where you use machine guns, grenades, and flamethrowers to fight your way through a biotech laboratory. And that's where you fight giant bugs and monsters that look like they're made entirely of denim. This is a really impressive game, though, that's well worth your time with just the right amount of challenge. Unfortunately, Chaos Heat never left arcades, so this is yet another game you'll have to keep your eye out for. Now let's move on to the light gun shooters, starting with The House of the Dead. There's a whole bunch of these games, there's four games in the main series, and a few spin-offs like Typing of the Dead and Pinball of the Dead, but I can't help but like the original the best because I've played it so much. And it's the easiest to find where you might see arcade games, and hey, what do you know? In this game, the zombies can actually run and actually have some, you know, beer league quickness to them. I don't know if this is the best game in the series, but it's the one I've spent the most time with, and it's never a disappointment, especially with a second player. House of the Dead got a remake in 2022 that's available on all modern consoles, but if you find a way to play the original, I recommend doing so. It's a good time. Let's go in. Sure, why not? Let's drop back to 1990 real quick with Space Gun. Is that name generic enough for you? It was made by Taito, and this is another one where the pixel art is just awesome, where you have to rescue hostages stuck in walls of alien egg slime or whatever this is. What's interesting is that this arcade cabinet also featured foot pedals, like a racing game, which is pretty cool. At first, it's easy to abuse backpedaling anytime you get to an enemy, but the time limit makes that tough. It's a bit tricky to play today, but I like this one as a bit of a change of pace. Next is Zombie Raid, made for arcades in 1995 by American Sammy, and this one's a little different too. It's a scrolling light gun shooter as opposed to on rails like you see with House of the Dead, but you're also tasked with finding four items randomly placed throughout the game in order to get the proper ending, and doing that is not easy. 
This is among the most challenging light gun games I've played. Everything happens so quickly. It feels like you need about 12 cups of coffee just to keep up with this game. I can't help but love the style of the graphics here though, so I needed to make sure I mentioned this one. Zombie Raid was never released outside of arcades, so this is another one where, yeah, I've already said it a couple times in this video, so you get the idea. Evil Knight, otherwise known as Hell Knight, was made in 1998 by Konami, and 90s Konami games are usually pretty well made, and this is no different. And what makes this one stand out is that it's up to three player compatible, with players one and three wielding handguns, and player two wielding a shotgun, and I'm willing to bet everyone was shoving each other out of the way just to get to the shotgun. Evil Knight was made in a similar spirit to House of the Dead, but it didn't catch on, and it's since faded away over the years, but if you can find it, it's a fun playthrough. That wasn't Konami's only foray into the genre. A few years earlier, they also made Crypt Killer for the arcade in 1995. It got ports to Saturn and PlayStation, and this game is just ridiculous. We're fighting skeletons, mummies, creatures from the Black Lagoon, Captain Picard shows up to give us some instructions, then you got serpents and pharaoh things, and it's just a huge grab bag of random stuff, and I guess it's considered horror? So I had to include it here, because it's just big dumb fun in the most 1995 way possible. Here's one based on Alien 3, called Alien 3 The Gun, made in 1993 by Sega. It's got settings you'll recognize if you've seen the movie, and geez louise this one is hard, but hard in a good way. And plus, the Alien franchise just lends itself perfectly to video games, and especially arcade games. Everything is really fast and intense as hell, similar to other Sega light gun games like Rail Chase and Jurassic Park. Games like this make me wonder if it's not too late for arcades to make a comeback, because this game holds up so well. And again, there's no other way to play this one since it was never ported anywhere. Now, if you're looking for a scary game that maybe your kids could play, there's Luigi's Mansion Arcade. Yes, Luigi's Mansion got its own arcade game back in 2015, made by Capcom. And it's based off of the 3DS game made a few years earlier, Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, featuring the same settings featured in that game. It's still your typical light gun shooter on rails, but it's a fun, inventive game that takes a long while to complete. The game starts out really easy, but gets surprisingly tough later on, and if you've been to a Dave & Buster's recently, you might have seen this game there. And since this hasn't been released on any Nintendo platform, that's going to be your best way to play it. Another option for kids is Ghoul Panic, made by Namco in 1999, and this one is set up as a series of mini-games that you have to complete against a time limit. It's probably not as good or as interesting as other games in this video, but hey, it's a cute, harmless shooter. This one got a PlayStation port in Japan and in Europe, so if you like what you see in this one, that's probably the best way to go play it today. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Namco churned out Dark Escape 4D in 2012, and yeah, this game is intense as hell. If you're looking for more of a modern horror-themed light gun game, then this one has what you're looking for. You're trapped in a dungeon full of mutant zombies and whatever the hell these things are, and of course you've got a villain who helpfully drops by to hang out once in a while. But yeah, this game is insane. Dark Escape hasn't gotten a home console release, but this game is a hundred times better at the arcade. It's a sit-down cabinet with air vents behind you, so you can feel zombies creeping around. So if you happen to see this cabinet anywhere, definitely check it out. Here's another out-of-nowhere arcade game that I had no idea existed until recently. It's Silent Hill the Arcade Game, made by Konami in 2007. Wait, what? Yeah, this obviously does not play anything like the other Silent Hill games of the time. It's yet another light gun shooter, but this one is slower paced, which, after playing the other games on this list, actually makes it kind of creepy. And it's got Heather from Silent Hill 3 and Pyramid Head and, uh, well, not a whole lot else. But it's still a nice playthrough. This one never made it to North America, but it's a fun curiosity if nothing else. I saved my personal favorite horror-themed arcade game for last, Beast Busters Second Nightmare, made by SNK back in 1998. The original Beast Busters is fine, but this game is way over the top, with lots of spines and brains and blood and monsters and zombies and explosions, and it's just non-stop. It is gloriously ridiculous. They shoved everything they could into this game. 
The only problem is, once again, you have to play this one any way you can, and it can be kinda tricky to get it to work properly. The audio kept flaking out on me, so I didn't even get the full experience. But even with janky audio, this game is still so much fun because it's so ridiculous, and it's the game I go back to the most out of any on this list. Definitely check this one out. All right, that's 17 games for you, and I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Once you move past the great SNES games everyone already knows about, the Marios and Zeldas and Metroids and Chrono Triggers, you get to the undiscovered category of games that just weren't all that well known in their time, stuff like Dragon View and Blackthorn and Metal Marines which I looked at last week. After you move past that category, then you get into the oddball hit or miss games that remained undiscovered for a reason. Either they're too niche, or they're just plain bad, or maybe there's just not much to them. Out to lunch is like that. This is an 80s style arcade game with as simple of gameplay as you can get. You play as a chef traveling to different countries, recovering recipe ingredients that have escaped from the fridge. Yeah, the food is alive. You catch them by jumping onto the food to stun it, catching it with a net, and then dropping it into this cage thing, all while beating the time limit. That's really all there is to this game, it's just pure platforming, you just jump and jump and jump some more. So how does the game control? It's not perfect, but it's not bad either. Since everything is so bare bones here, it's easy to get a feel for the controls, so this is a good game you can just pick up and play and get the hang of very quickly. I will say as kind of a disclaimer, your character is very slippery. He slides around a lot and doesn't come to a complete stop when you let go of the D-pad. Every platform might as well have ice on it, while the ones that do have ice on them are insanely slippery, so bear that in mind when you play this one. One thing that bothers me about the controls is that you don't get much wiggle room in mid-air. I don't know, maybe I'm just used to Mario games or something, but since the character moves so quickly on the ground, you'd think he'd have a wider range of motion in mid-air, but that's not so. That took a bit of getting used to, but it's certainly not game-breaking or anything, just kind of annoying. The hardest part of this game doesn't have anything to do with catching food or getting the hang of the controls or anything, but the time limit. The further you progress into the game, you have to get more and more efficient with your movement. Any wasted motion in this one will get you penalized. You have three lives here, miss the time limit, and you die, so to speak. Miss the time limit three times, and it's game over. The food can stun you too, which costs you some time, and if you're stunned while carrying food, you'll lose it all and you'll have to catch it again. There are enemies here too, and they can also cause a game over, but they can usually be taken care of with just a couple jumps to the head. Also, this other chef shows up to mess with you just to be a dick, I guess? I should also mention that the food is actually trying to get away from you. Once something sees you, it runs away as quickly as it can, so sometimes you have to be careful about how you approach them. You can hide behind other obstacles, for example. There's 48 total levels here, but there's no saves or passwords. That's kind of a bummer since this game would have definitely benefited from at least a password system. There is at least an advanced option you can select, which moves the starting point to much later on in the game. The only other real highlight of this game is the backgrounds. They look really nice. Other than that, there's not much else to say about Out to Lunch. It's okay for what it is, it doesn't try to be anything other than an arcade-style platformer predicated on getting a high score and beating the time limit, and that's fine. I mean, there are a handful of secret rooms you can find, but you don't have to find them to progress with the game. This isn't any kind of super obscure hidden gem of gems or anything like that. It's just a really simple game, and sometimes that's just fine. Snestruck! I just finished doing that Super Star Wars video, and man, those games take a lot out of you, so I'm gonna take it easy for a bit with a simple single-screen puzzle game called Bust a Move. Many of you might know this one better by its Japanese title, Puzzle Bobble. It stars the two little characters from Bubble Bobble and features a lot of the same themes and art design from those games. Bust a Move is one of those games that's gotten a gazillion ports and sequels, sprawling all over the place from 3DO, Sega Game Gear, Wonder Swan, Neo Geo, Neo Geo CD, on and on. Maybe the most famous of these games are the arcade sequels. They are crazy as hell, and if you like puzzle games, I recommend busting out the MAME emulator and playing through a couple of those. But for this video, I'm sticking with the Super Nintendo cartridge, which is pretty scaled back and simple, but not in a bad way. This is still a perfectly okay port. The way the gameplay works is your character shoots colored bubbles from the bottom of the screen to the top, matching a group of at least two of the same color to eliminate them, the goal being to get rid of all the bubbles before they accumulate past the end line at the bottom. The catch is, there's a time limit, both to fire off your bubble and to finish the stage, since the 
ceiling is always moving downward. The controls are very simple. Press B to shoot and aim with the D-pad with that helpful arrow there, but it can be really tough to shoot into tight corners like this. What helps though is that you can use the L and R buttons to move the arrow pixel by pixel if you need to. The further you progress through the game's 100 rounds, the more colors you have to deal with, the shorter the time limit, and the trickier it is to make certain shots. You can use the walls to bounce the bubble off and reach spots you couldn't otherwise, and there's also special bubbles that create certain effects when you reach them, like the flame bubble. Shoot a bubble at it and it'll wipe out every other bubble of the same color in the general area. You get 7 continues here, and there is a password system, so you can skip to a certain level if you'd like. There's also a versus mode here, not only against a second player, but against the computer. There's a total of 10 different computer opponents you have to beat in a series of three games each. And man, let me tell you, you may not believe it, but that computer fellow is actually pretty dang good. Yeah, these levels get absurdly difficult after a certain point. The key component to getting ahead of your opponent in versus mode is creating dropped bubbles, meaning you pop a group of bubbles that are placed further up the screen which results in a few other bubbles falling. This fills a gauge on your opponent's side that sends up even more bubbles making things much more difficult for them. This aspect is what puts the game over the top as a really good two-player game and it makes life hell for your opponent, and conversely it's frustrating as hell to deal with. Or maybe you'd rather approach Bust a Move as a classic single player arcade game where you just want the highest possible score, and this game can accommodate that as well. The drop to bubble mechanic is just as important there too, since each drop bubble starts at 20 points and doubles for each subsequent bubble. My only real problem with the Bust a Move SNES port is you're stuck with the same music looping again and again and again. At least the versus mode has different music to get sick of, but I mean, they couldn't have put at least one other song on here? Jeez. So yeah, Bust a Move, or Puzzle Bobble, is a perfectly good single-player or two-player competitive puzzle game. It's not as crazy or insane as the other more advanced ports, or the arcade sequels, which are incredibly addictive, or the more recent 3DS game, Bust a Move Universe, which offers a ton of different game modes. No, the SNES port is very humble. It's simple by design, and that's totally fine. It's a good game for what it is. That's drunk. Let's keep plugging away at those single screen puzzle games. This one is called Pushover, developed by Red Rat Software. They usually publish stuff for platforms like the Amiga, games like Wild Wheels and Screaming Wings, and sure enough, Pushover is also on the Amiga and the Atari ST. Turns out this is the only game they developed for the Super Nintendo. Pushover has some weird trivia associated with it though. The Amiga and Atari ST versions were sponsored by a British snack called Quavers, and the story of the game revolves around finding lost bags of the stuff. These things are not in North America, and as far as I can tell, they look like puffy potato versions of Fritos? The Super Nintendo version, both in North America and PAL regions, does not have anything to do with Quavers. Instead, the story's been changed to some rat stealing all your money or something. You play as an ant, GI ant to be exact, some kind of super soldier ant, I guess, and its mission is to dig down into this cave, level by level, to get the money back that Captain Rat stole. Boy, they really got creative with the names here. Thankfully, the gameplay is a bit more creative. Your task is to manipulate these dominoes into a sequence that ends with this trigger block that has three stripes. Like most puzzle games, you're given very simple stuff to solve at first so you can get the hang of the game, and you'll need that practice time because the controls here are a little odd. There's a bit of a 3D effect going on here where you press up behind a certain domino to get behind it and down to get back out in front of everything. You can pick up, move, and put down any of the blocks by pressing B, except you can't move the final trigger block. You gotta set up a sequence that leads to that spot, and you gotta do it within a time limit. First, you get behind a block by pressing up, then press Y, Y to push to the left or A to push to the right. That's an important distinction that took me longer than I'd like to admit to figure out. There's tons of special dominoes here too, each with their own particular function that activate either when pushed or knocked into. There's an ascender block with one vertical stripe that floats upward until it hits something. There's a splitter block which knocks over blocks in both directions. There's a stopper block which stops everything coming toward it. And the tumbler block which is inconsolable and goes on the internet to write about how difficult it is to be a teenager in the United States. No, I'm just kidding. It keeps going until hitting a stopper block or falling off a ledge. There are nine total special blocks, and already you can see the problem with this arrangement here. They're all red and yellow. What, was the visual designer a big Hulkamaniac or something? This game would be a lot easier if each domino had its own color or something to make it a little more distinct, because the entire time I played this, I was constantly going back to the start menu to remember what was what. The stripes didn't really help me a whole lot, and with the incredibly short time limit here, every second counts, so the quicker you learn the domino patterns, the better. There's a hundred stages 
stages here spread out over nine different worlds, and the backgrounds and sprite animations here are pretty nice. The platforming here is reasonably well done, but again, that's provided you're able to quickly get used to moving your character from the foreground to the background, and how you get used to placing blocks exactly where you want them, because you have to be fast here. That's another flaw in my opinion, the time limit is just way too short. The game does reconcile this by allowing you to earn tokens. Each time you complete a level within the time limit, you earn a token, and you use that to erase the time limit on a level you're having trouble with. So yeah, you're not locked into the timer, even if it runs out, you can still finish the level. Also, a hint appears on the pause menu once the timer expires. If you're able to finish and you've got a token left over, you can consider it completed, so that's cool. And there is a password system here as well, which is handy. I will say this game does a nice job in gradually introducing new elements and platforming pitfalls the further you progress. It's a gradual difficulty curve rather than just hitting a brick wall. It's just that, like I said, it's kind of tough to remember on the fly what block does what, especially when you've got three or four of them in one level. It's a bit irritating to have to pause the game to bring up the menu every so often. And like most puzzle platformers like the Lost Vikings and Krusty's Super Fun House, this one gets really tough later on beyond just knowing what sequence to set up. You have to act and react with flawless timing to get through some of these puzzles. So yeah, Pushover is a pretty decent but pretty frustrating puzzle platformer. I really wish they'd done a better job differentiating the special blocks, but whatever, maybe you'll have an easier time getting used to it than me. I should also mention this game is single player only. It'd be nice to have a split screen competitive mode against a second player, even the computer, but it's not here, oh well. Still, if you're looking for a creative puzzle game with platforming elements, Pushover is pretty decent. Snestruck! There were a lot of Super Famicom games that were never localized in North America, many just because they might have been seen as just too dang weird at the time. There's stuff like Energy Breaker that involves allocating balance points and resource management and all sorts of complicated weirdness. There's Chaos Seed, which sees you try and feng shui the earth. And there's Maju Uo, which is just plain messed up. You could say the same about Dark Half, a strange but unique game that has no problems delivering you right to the slobbering mouth of hell. I mean, just look at this cover here. That is cool as hell. Dark Half is a turn-based RPG where you play out two storylines at the same time. You alternate between playing as Rukyu, who's pretty much Satan, and Falco. No, not that Falco, or that Falco, but he's the latest and greatest savior of humanity. You play out each storyline in alternating chapters. Rukyu is generally just evil and pissed off all the time, while Falco is, uh, well, you know, he's there too. There's the usual stuff like having a world map and walking into towns and random battles and all that, but the main difference between the two storylines is in the combat system. The turn-based grid format is the same for both, but Rukyu recruits other enemies into his party and in the process gains additional magic. The big problem here, however, is that Rukyu's allies are all AI-controlled and they are idiots. They approach at bad angles and use magic that their opponents are clearly immune to. Jeez, no wonder this guy is so evil and crazy, surrounded by incompetence. Falco, meanwhile, has the usual good guy storyline path where he runs into other party members, but you can also recruit mercenaries, and that's pretty cool. The Falco party's abilities and magic spells improve by winning battles and such, but in addition, Falco also has to harvest rays of light or hope from the bodies of Rukyu's victims as he passes by. Both Falco and Rukyu are bound to what's called a soul meter in the upper left that you have to keep stocked. Falco does this by selling artifacts, and Rukyu does it by eating souls. This meter drains with every step your character takes, so you gotta be efficient and you can't explore too much. If it hits zero for either character, it's game over. I love that a game like Dark Half has the balls to try something like this, where you play as both the hero and the villain. It's great how one storyline affects the other. You can eat this dude's soul with Rukyu, or you can leave them alive for Falco to interact with. That part of it is really cool. But there's a bit of an imbalance here. The villain's storyline is great, and after playing all these different JRPGs over the years, it's a lot of fun to play as someone cartoonishly evil. But on the flip side, the villain's battles kinda suck, you're usually just sitting there watching and bailing out your idiot AI-controlled allies. Conversely, the hero's battles are a lot more interesting, but his storyline is just the same old stuff. And I wanted to just fast forward and get to Ryuku's story. Anyway, I don't think I'm spoiling too much by saying that the game leads to an endgame showdown between the two characters. That should be obvious to everyone, right? So while certain parts of the game may be a drag to sit through, I was determined to get to the end and see which one of these characters would prevail. Another interesting tidbit is that this game is made by West One, the same people behind the Wonder Boy and Monster World series, and it's their only game made for the Super Famicom. It's funny just how dark and twisted this game can get, but meanwhile they're cranking out colorful and cheerful looking stuff like Monster World 4. 
Sadly, I don't think Dark Half reached its full potential in terms of visuals or music. I mean, the music is okay, the backgrounds and sprites are a little bleary, maybe even deliberately so, but considering this was made late in the console's lifespan in 1996, its contemporaries like Lufia 2, Bahamut Lagoon, and Fire Emblem 4 were running circles around Dark Half. The presentation isn't bad, don't get me wrong, it just feels a bit like a missed opportunity. So yeah, Dark Half is unique to say the least, and I think it's worth checking out if you're tired of the same old JRPG stuff. The cause and effect balancing act between the two storylines is really cool and gives the game a lot of replay value, but you might get bored and frustrated with managing the soul meter, solving the game's numerous puzzles, and dealing with the dumbass computer AI. There's also some really heavy themes going on here that I don't want to spoil, I'll just say this game gets dark as you might expect, but it's dark for both sides, which is something I was not expecting. Dark Half isn't perfect, but it's a still a worthwhile playthrough, if only because there's not another 16-bit JRPG like it. Many franchises that originated on the NES made the leap to the SNES with great fanfare, everything from Mario to Castlevania to Mega Man to Tecmo Super Bowl, but one series that people were a little hesitant about was Double Dragon, because the last entry on the NES Double Dragon 3 The Sacred Stones was a total flop. You get one life, no continues, and the game is way too hard, plus the beat-em-up gameplay is too much of a departure from what makes Double Dragon great in the first place. Thankfully the developers Technos Japan went back to the series roots with Super Double Dragon, this is much more like the first two NES games rather than the awful third game, to the point that they even use rearranged themes from the first game on certain levels. That's pretty cool. This is traditional beat-em-up gameplay here, but arranged in that unique methodical Double Dragon style. Y is punch, A is kick, B is block, and X is jump. I know that sounds a little weird, but there is a reason for it. Progressing in this game is predicated on blocking your enemy's attacks. Press B when your opponent swings at you, and it allows you to grab them. It's not like in Final Fight where you just walk up to a guy and grab him, for instance. This game makes you work for it by timing your enemy's attack properly. Once you've got an enemy, you can press Y or A to beat the crap out of them in a nice bit of sprite animation or press B again to toss them to the other side of the screen. You can still fend off enemies if you've got a hold of someone by pressing the opposite direction on the D-pad while kicking, and that's a nice touch. In addition to that, you can also hold L or R while attacking, and that'll deliver a stronger punch or a flying kick. So in other words, it's kinda like the turbo charge in NBA Jam. That's what the meter up top is for. You can hold L or R until the meter reaches halfway and do a huge spinning kick, or until the meter fills up top entirely and you can knock enemies down with one shot, and that lasts for about 10 seconds. There's there's also weapons here like nunchucks and kendo sticks, and of course I have to mention that this game is two-player co-op, with both the regular gameplay and the style where you can hit each other. Now, one thing that clearly stands out about Super Double Dragon that can't be ignored is that this game plays at a very slow pace, especially compared to other beat-em-ups. I mean, take a look at Turtles in Time. Or even stuff like Ninja Warriors. Now go back to Super Double Dragon. I totally understand if this game is too slow paced for you, and unfortunately this game only operates at 30 frames per second as opposed to 60, so yeah, that's kind of a problem. But the thing is, you gotta approach this one differently than you do other beat-em-ups because of what I pointed out earlier, the block mechanic is so important to progressing in the game. There are other moves here like holding down and pressing kick, but you still leave yourself open to take damage. You gotta utilize the block function if you wanna progress in this game. And personally, I like that about Super Double Dragon because it makes it stand out as something a little different and because all the fundamentals here are executed so well, the hit detection and the timing are consistent, and the shoulder button special attacks add a little bit to the gameplay as well. But sadly, I gotta point out another flaw here that makes itself known pretty quickly. The enemy design here is very limited, even by beat-em-up standards. There's only about four different enemy patterns in this game, and man, when you're slogging through a beat-em-up, that gets old pretty quickly. Still, Super Double Dragon stays true to its name, and it reminds me a lot of the first Double Dragon game, for better or for worse. Yeah, it sucks that this game runs so slowly at 30 frames per second, and there's seven long levels to get through with no passwords if you want to finish this one, but it's a beat-em-up where the combat is actually a little different for once, and it's still a fun time with a second player. Let's drunk!
The Super Nintendo didn't have a whole lot of horror games, at least not in North America. Sure, there were the Castlevania games, Super Ghouls and Ghosts, Nosferatu, and Zombies Ate My Neighbors, but those games really just had a horror motif. They weren't really horror games, so to speak. They were just platformers or shooters or whatever. Meanwhile, the Super Famicom in Japan had horror games like Shin Megami Tensei, Clock Tower, and the Vic Tokai developed Laplace no Ma, or Demon of Laplace. This is a turn-based RPG with some survival horror elements to it, so in many ways it's unlike any other game in the Super Famicom or Super Nintendo library. It takes place in Newcomb, Massachusetts, USA in 1924. Three kids had gone missing while exploring an old house which was said to be haunted. Well, yeah, I mean kids are drawn to haunted houses, like steel to magnets, but of course there can be some drawbacks to exploring a haunted house, like, you know, getting killed or going missing, which is what happened to these kids. The owner of the mansion, Benedict Weathertop, also went missing rather conveniently in his case, and police and investigators were unable to figure out what happened, so the place was locked up and sealed off from the rest of town. That is, until some random guy wanders in and unlocks it. And that's where your character comes in. You play as either a male or female that has taken an interest in what has now become a cold case. You have five different class types to choose from, all with different stats. Detective is a solid fighter but can't use magic. That's really the best class for people playing this game for the first time. Medium uses psychic powers but can't wield many weapons or armor. Scientist also can't use many weapons, but does use what's called a spirit machine. They start out pretty weak but can get really powerful the further you progress. Journalist is probably the weakest fighter, but they accumulate money like crazy by selling photos of the mansion, and that allows you to get tons of weapons, armor, and items quickly. And Dabbler is your average all-around character. What's cool here is that once you pick your class, you head to the speakeasy and pick out up to three other party members. So, in other words, there's one class you have to leave out, and it's up to you to pick which one. You can double down on one class if you'd like, but I wouldn't recommend doing that. After picking your party, you can mosey around town and visit other places like the library, where you would eventually store your photographs if you pick the journalist. There's the hotel, where you can switch party members, the hospital, where you can heal or resurrect fallen party members, the fortune teller, who hints at what to do next, the psychic, where you can allocate your experience points to certain skills, and the shop, where you can buy and sell weapons, armor, ammo, tools, and supplies like film for your camera. Bear in mind, you have to equip this stuff yourself. The game doesn't do it for you. I have to take a second to call attention to the translation here. This one was done by Aeon Genesis. Their track record speaks for itself at this point. But in this game, they did an especially good job. All the item descriptions are here. There's plenty of personality in the dialogue throughout, and it really helps guide the player through what could potentially be a confusing game for some people. Anyway, you eventually make your way to the mansion, Weathertop Hall on the west side, and that's when you encounter your first random battles. Yes, that's right, traditional RPG random battles here, for better or for worse, and the encounter rate is exactly what you'd expect for the time, so there are a lot of battles. It's all very standard stuff, nothing particularly unique or anything. There are limit breaks here, that's what the meter is below your character's HP and MP, so there's that. But overall, the battles can be a bit of a drag. I should mention that if you try and level up in this game through random battles, the game doesn't give you much experience that way, so don't bother. You get more experience by completing quests, which you'll come across here and there, and the game does a nice job introducing those organically throughout your playthrough. You also have the option to talk to enemies, which grants you some clues about what's going on and where to go, but many opponents will refuse and just fight you anyway. You need to build up your parley skill in order to get adept at getting any kind of information. I will say the flee option here is actually pretty forgiving, unlike most RPGs of the time. So if you get burnt out on battles, or if you just need to get out of the mansion, fleeing is an option available to you. And yeah, you can leave the mansion to restock items, heal up, resurrect someone, or save if you need to. Also, I should point out real quick that when a party member dies, he doesn't disappear from the party. He's just in a body bag, being dragged around. Now that's funny. So yeah, the combat system really isn't all that great, but what really carries this game is how you can investigate practically every little thing in this entire mansion, trying to find clues to unlock more rooms and more of the story as you go, which includes talking to enemies like I mentioned earlier, and the dialogue here really adds to the atmosphere quite a bit. Yeah, the art direction and music certainly do their part, but the dialogue surprisingly goes a long way in creating an unsettling atmosphere. So even if the adventure or combat elements here don't stand out for you, the story definitely should. 
As Daria Plays RPGs points out in her video featuring this game, La Place Noma takes obvious inspiration from the Call of Cthulhu board game, and that's definitely not a bad thing since this game gets all the horror elements down pretty well. There just aren't many other games like this on the Super Nintendo or Super Famicom. I really don't want to spoil too much of the story here because that's the main reason to play through this one, and there are a couple of elements here that I don't want to give away. I'll just say both the way the story is structured and the way that it's told through dialogue is well done. I should mention that La Place Noma is actually a port slash remake, and it was originally made as a first person dungeon crawler for the PC 88 and 98 before getting ported to all sorts of other computer platforms like the MSX and the Sharp X68000, as well as the PC Engine CD, although that version also stayed in Japan. The Super Famicom Edition, however, went for a different kind of presentation, but rest assured the story is pretty much the same. So yeah, La Place Noma is a unique experience on the Super Famicom, and I like it. The story is well done, it executes the horror motif surprisingly well for a 16-bit game, there's all sorts of twists and turns featuring giant demons, time travel, and there's plenty of side quests that I haven't even mentioned that you can go through. I will admit, the usual RPG random battle stuff is a downer, that can get frustrating for all the wrong reasons. I mean, come on, can I just land one attack? Ugh. But the real problem with a game like this is that there's not much replay value once you know the story. It's not like there's multiple paths here or anything. It's kind of like a book you plow through once every few years, but that's definitely not a bad thing. It certainly has a unique place among its 16-bit peers, and I think it's well worth checking out. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Drunk. When I made a video about Super Nintendo games compatible with the SNES mouse a few years ago, there were a surprising number of people in the comments that did not know that the mouse even was compatible with any other game other than Mario Paint. And yeah, it most certainly is. There's all sorts of interesting games like Sheen's Revenge, Trodlers, Tin Star, as well as Mario and Wario, a puzzle game that, for whatever reason, never got released outside of Japan. And not only that, this game was developed by Game Freak, and the project was headed by Pokemon creator Satoshi Tajiri. That's right, a freaking Mario game made by Game Freak that stayed in Japan. And that's too bad, because this game is pretty solid, and it helps that the story is actually pretty amusing and something a little different. Well, different for a Mario game, anyway. So Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Yoshi are all exploring a forest looking for this fairy named Wanda, because why not, I guess. Anyway, Luigi gets lost, of course he does, so the rest of the gang has to go looking for him, but that dastardly Wario shows up and drops stuff on everyone's heads, which promptly gets stuck and impairs their vision. Wanda shows up and decides to help them out to try and find Luigi, and of course Wanda can't simply help take Mario's bucket off, because, uh, I don't know, I guess it's above her fairy pay grade or something. But that brings me to the gameplay. You control Wanda, and you're tasked with guiding Mario, Yoshi, or Peach to the perpetually lost and confused Luigi. And yup, this is one of those escort games, where one character is constantly moving, and it's up to you to remove all the obstacles in their way within the time limit. I reviewed another game like this a while back, Rocco's Modern Life, Spunky's Dangerous Day, but this game is a great deal better than that one, and that's mostly because this game is much more polished, with more clever puzzles to get through. Plus, the mouse control definitely helps as well, and I should mention that this game only works with the SNES mouse. It doesn't recognize the controller. But really for me, using the mouse here wasn't that big of a deal because the Wanda sprite is big enough to cover plenty of ground and the hit detection for activating blocks is reasonably forgiving. Plus when a character is about to fall, they have a short animation that gives you an extra split second to act. There's 110 levels in this game, and you only start with two lives, but you have plenty of chances to get more. There's three different difficulty settings, so to speak. If you play through as Peach, that's the easy setting since she moves the slowest. Mario is medium, and Yoshi is hard, and man oh man, this game really gets hard if you pick Yoshi, so I would definitely recommend starting with Mario at the very least. What's cool here is that you can pick a different character at the beginning of each level, so you're not stuck with the same one throughout your playthrough. I'd also recommend setting the mouse speed at high, the game just plays much better that way. The game also gives you the option to start at whichever level you want via this menu screen, so if you want to skip the super easy level 1, you can do so, so that's pretty cool. There's 10 different puzzles in each level, complete all 10 and you get a fun little bonus game where you crash Wario's plane, that's always fun. 
You start out with just basic blocks that you have to activate, then more elements get introduced the more you play. There's timed blocks that deactivate after a few seconds, there's blocks you have to break, blocks that alternate with other blocks, there's springs that launch you upward, there's coin blocks you can hit, and of course 100 coins grants you an extra life, there's stars you collect, and four of those grant you an extra life, and there's enemies you eventually have to avoid. Thankfully, you can click on the item on your character's head and make them change direction as well, and there's some enemies that you can just zap with the mouse to make them disappear appear. But yeah, there's a lot going on in these puzzles, and a lot you have to try and manage, and it makes for a stressful playthrough. It boils down to clicking blocks in the right order either before or just as your character gets there, and that is easier said than done. It is a real challenge to figure this stuff out on the fly, but the game never feels convoluted or unfair. The puzzles for the most part all make sense. Well, they all make sense eventually. Some of the later levels are huge and feel overwhelming and take multiple tries to figure out, and you don't get much of a chance to explore either thanks to the time limit. And then there's enemies like these bats. Ugh. But yeah, Mario & Wario is a fun game, but it's definitely a challenge, and I understand that this kind of game isn't for everyone. Not everyone likes games centered around escort missions. It's frustrating not being able to directly control one of the characters. But I will say, as far as puzzle games of this nature go, this one is well made featuring some clever design, and there's almost always more than one way to get from point A to point B. The game doesn't expect you to follow just one singular path, so I really appreciate that. Even better about this game is that there's no English patch necessary. Everything's already in English. Which which makes it even more confusing as to why this never got a release outside of Japan. Oh well, either way, if you dig puzzle games, then you gotta play this one any way you can. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Finally, a game that lives up to its title, but Alien Storm isn't just a veritable storm of aliens, it's many things. It's a gallery shooter, it's a run and gun, it's a beat em up. This game is fantastic. It was originally made by Sega for Japanese arcades back in 1990, and of course, the luxury of making your own arcade cabinets and having your own home console system is that you can keep everything in-house. This game did get ported to a bunch of other platforms like the Master System, Amiga, and Commodore 64, but the Sega Genesis port of Alien Storm is the best of them all. It's not quite at the level of intensity that the arcade original reaches, but rest assured, this is one of those games where you're going to be hearing the plastic on your controller creak and squeak as you play this one. It is intense. Plus, not only is this game two-player co-op, it's a reasonably cheap cartridge as well, usually going between $10 and $15. You have three characters to choose from, all with different weapons. There's a dude who uses a short-range electrical zapper thing. The manual calls it a thunder bazooka. There's a gal who uses a flamethrower. And there's a robot who uses a whip. You have three lives and zero continues to get through eight levels with no saves or passwords. When you lose all your lives, it is game over. Start from the beginning. But you do at least have a few chances to gain some extra lives here and there. When you do die, you continue right then and there, so that's nice. However, bear in mind there's no opportunities to switch characters here. You're stuck with whoever you pick at the beginning. But that's no big deal, since while their weapons are different, each character's speed and range of motion is pretty much the same. As you can see, the gameplay is pretty simple, at least at first. You're just zapping and blowing up these bizarre looking monsters. Check out this thing that tries to friggin' eat you. So cool. If this part of the game looks familiar to anyone, it's because Alien Storm was directed by the same fellow that produced and directed Golden Axe, Makoto Uchida. And sure enough, the controls are pretty similar, with B attacking and A unleashing a clear screen attack, which is different for each character. Plus, if you manage to get close enough to an enemy, your character will do an even stronger melee attack, like this dude for example spiking a grenade. While there's similarities between Alien Storm and Golden Axe, there's two big differences I should point out. One is the gameplay variety. After getting through the beat-em-up section, you go into this warehouse here, and the game transitions into a gallery shooter, destroying even uglier monsters and blowing up crates for energy that powers your clear screen attack. You start the next level with more beat-em-up action, this time leading to a boss fight against uh, whatever this thing is, and after you defeat it, you get these handy-dandy alien bug things that drop power-ups. Next, you're running 99 miles an hour gunning down anything that moves. Okay, this would make sense for the robot, but how do the humans run this fast? This game goes back and forth between these three game modes, and all three are well done. I especially like the gallery shooter stages that take you to convenience stores or an electronics retailer so you can blow up all sorts of crap. 
The second major difference from Golden Axe is the speed of this game. This game plays really fast and cuts a very quick pace, and there's two main control functions that add to that big time. One is being able to roll or dash by pressing the C button, and the other is the ability to run by double tapping left or right. The only thing that's kind of lousy about this setup is that it means you've got to do a little finger gymnastics to be able to jump. You have to double tap left or right, then press C, and then press B to do an attack in midair. This can be tricky to pull off and actually hit an enemy, but it is cool. I really like that this game is just go, go, go the entire playthrough. Even the gallery shooter stages manage to be fast and intense. Now, normally in games like this, the key to progressing through the game is getting all enemies on screen on one side. That's usually done with a toss or a suplex of some kind. In Alien Storm, the key is to move yourself from one side or the other, and you do that by dashing or deftly rolling from side to side. It's a nice twist on the usual beat-em-up formula that I appreciate. This game also has lots of weird little touches everywhere, like this monster gnawing on a house. Hey, you gotta get your fiber one way or another. There's lots of terrified, panicked civilians that run screaming past you. There's aliens popping up from underneath mailboxes. There's aliens harassing civilians. There's regular Joes that walk out and actually turn into aliens. And the music throughout this game does a great job providing even more energy to the playthrough. I should mention one quirk of the gameplay, however. The energy meter isn't just for special attacks. It does slowly trickle down the more you use your weapon, and it can run out, rendering your weapon a blunt object. Having said that, I don't think I ran out of energy once. This is really only an issue if you abuse the clear screen attacks. There's a couple other game modes in Alien Storm as well. One is the duel, and it's just that. You duel enemies one-on-one -on -one in nine straight battles on one health meter, gauntlet style. There's also a one-on-one -on -one fighting mode against a second player, but as you might expect, that mode is pretty limited. One other thing I should point out is that you have to go to the options menu to turn rapid fire on, otherwise you'll be pounding the B button like crazy, and that's always annoying. So make sure rapid fire is on before you play. So yeah, Alien Storm is a fantastic encapsulation of early 90s Sega. The gameplay is fast and chaotic, the aliens here are straight out of something like Splatterhouse, and the different game modes aren't just there for the sake of variety, they're actually fun and add a lot to the game. Sure, you could nitpick certain things like how the three characters should have had different capabilities, or how there's quite a few enemy palette swaps, but ultimately those things don't detract from what is a really fun playthrough. Alien Storm was part of the Sega Mega Drive Ultimate Collection for 360 and PS3 made in 2009, but it's really a shame that this game wasn't included as part of the Genesis Mini Collection. It's a fantastic, fast-paced two-player game that has really held up well over time. Alright, I want to thank you for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Snestruck. If you take a look at the Super Nintendo Video Games price charting website, you'll see the top games listed on there are mostly goofy titles with absolutely insane prices. But with the magic of emulation, for some of these games anyway, we can at least take a look at these games very briefly and see what they actually are. First on this list is Nintendo Power Fest 1994. This is sort of like the Super Nintendo version of Nintendo World Championship cartridges for the NES that were made a few years previous. It's mostly the same deal here, albeit with not nearly as much fanfare. It was a competition held in select department stores across the country, with three objectives, the first one being to finish the first level of the Lost Levels from Mario All-Stars as quickly as possible, the second objective was fastest time in five laps in Mario Kart, and the third was most home runs in a home run derby for Griffey Presents Major League Baseball. These would all add up into one big store, narrowing down to the top eight across the country, and then the top four, down to two, and then finally a winner. The highest score I could find was this dude named Mike Ayarasi, who put up 24,127,300. Nice job. Job, dude. Anyway, 33 copies of the actual cartridge were made, and only two survive today. So yeah, pretty dang rare. Its last eBay price was something around $23,000. Next on the list is Nintendo Campus Challenge, with this contest taking place at colleges across the US back in 1992. Again it's three games and again it's highest accumulative score. First is collecting 50 coins in Mario World, just like Nintendo World Championships for NES. Second is completing two laps in F-Zero, and third is successfully landing on two targets in Pilot Wings. Once again there's only two known copies in existence, and its last known selling price was for only $1,000 at a yard sale, and I'm not sure it's ever even been seen on eBay. There's a couple other competition-styled cartridges produced for the purpose of having competitions at Blockbuster Video. The two games were for Donkey Kong Country and Star Fox. 
Star Fox was the first one to come out in 1993. You get a five minute time limit to accumulate as many points as you can on Corneria and the Asteroid Belt levels, which are altered a bit with a few extra rings and stuff to help pile on points. About 2,000 cartridges were made and they go for between $600 and $700. Then there's the Donkey Kong Country competition, which happened in 1994, so it only features the first Donkey Kong Country game. Again, the goal here is most points and a time limit, so the levels are tweaked a bit to gear the gameplay toward that goal. So there's no treehouse or banana cave in the first level, for instance. This game had about 2,500 copies printed, and again, like Star Fox, it goes for between $600 and $700. Now we move on to Exertainment Mountain Bike Rally slash Speed Racer. I always think that says excrement when I glance at the title. It's probably not the best name for it. Anyway, this game was originally sold in a huge box with a big block thing that attaches to the bottom of your Super Nintendo, which then would connect to the Life Fitness Bike Unit. Good luck finding one of those. Anyway, this is a dual cartridge with the games Mountain Bike Rally and Speed Racer, both compatible with the bike and both really not all that great. This cartridge goes for $1,500 and way, way more if it's complete in the box. Next there's the Multi-Purpose Arcade Combat Simulator. This was developed for the US Army as a shooting sim, except instead of a Super Scope 6, they developed a replica of a Jaeger AP-74, otherwise known as an M16A2 clone. But yeah, pretty simple gameplay here as you can see, awfully bare bones. Obviously this wasn't sold in stores or anything, but it has popped up on eBay once in a while, selling between $600 and $700. Now these are probably the most well-known rare games. From there we can go into more conventional games like Evo, Hagane, Aero Fighters. I'm not going to talk about what these games consist of here because this video first and foremost is about high-priced video games. And I have to rant about that for a bit if you don't mind. As most people are aware by now, prices for retro games in general are insane right now. NES, Genesis, N64, Sega Saturn, and especially Super Nintendo. According to the video game's price charting website, the average Super Nintendo cartridge eBay auction has been over 15 Games like Super Mario World, a game that sold millions of copies, goes for an average of $14.50. It seems like there's two reasons for this. Number one, people that grew up with these games now have their own expendable income, so they can do what every generation has done, spend it on recreating their childhood. I do not say that derisively, I'm no different, but let's face it, it's been this way for decades, especially in the United States. For example, our parents' generation has spent tons of money buying back the muscle car they might have had as a teenager, or the comic books they read as a kid or the baseball cards that mom threw away. The number two reason these games are so expensive, despite selling millions of copies, is that not very many people want to get rid of the games that they have, which means that there's not many for sale in the wild. If you want copies of, say, Wild Guns or Harvest Moon or Metal Warriors, you're looking at 200 bucks each on eBay. It's extremely unlikely you're going to find these games at a garage sale or in a bundle or whatever. It seems like people are more likely to realize what they have, look it up on eBay, see the ridiculous prices, and then sell it on there themselves. So is it worth it to pay such an absurd price for one game? Hell no. No, in my opinion. It really depends on if you consider yourself a collector or if you just want to play the games. Now, the games I mentioned at the beginning of this video are all legitimately rare, and if you're a serious retro gaming collector, then I gotta say, yeah, any of those would make great pieces in your collection, but as far as stuff like Harvest Moon or Wild Guns or whatever, then well, you gotta do what you gotta do to get your collection together. But a lot of these games really aren't all that rare. If you're in this just to play the games, get a flash cartridge or get a Wii U and play what's available on the virtual console. So yeah, that's the decision you gotta make. Are you a collector, or are you just happy playing the games? Me, I'm just happy playing the games, but if you're a collector, then it's definitely worth checking out some of the legitimately rare games I mentioned earlier on. Although don't expect any earth-shatteringly great gameplay or anything like that. S drunk. SNK made a ton of great arcade games, but one that gets slept on a little bit is Shock Troopers, made by Saurus in November 1997 for arcades, and man, this is one of those games where if I'm walking around an arcade and I see this cabinet, I am rounding up any quarters I could find because I'm spending the rest of my day playing this one. It's a top-down shooter where you can fire in eight directions, and it plays like Metal Slug crossed with Pocky and Rocky. One token gives you a health meter and two lives to get through at least seven out of a possible 16 levels. One has you driving a motorcycle and a horizontal shooter before you go flying off and drop down into a cave as enemies drop down on top of you. Another level features a market with fruit stands that inexplicably explode. Another has you on top of a train shooting dudes flying around in jetpacks. It is a ton of fun and it's up to two player compatible. 
Based on the footage here, you might think this game is extremely simplistic and not much different from other games of its kind, but you'd be pleasantly surprised. There are eight different characters here you can play as. Each has the same primary weapon, but they all differ slightly in speed, strength, armor, and special weapons. For instance, this guy has a grenade he can toss over barriers, this gal has a rocket launcher, this guy uses a boomerang, it's pretty dang cool. You can either go it alone with just one character, or you can select three characters that you can switch between anytime you want. Yeah, the characters really aren't that different from each other, since ultimately it's just different varieties of making stuff go boom, but still, it gives the game some replay value, especially since each character has their own story sequences in between levels. Yes, there is a story here, and yes, someone's girlfriend got kidnapped, and yes, the main bad guy is some Final Fight-looking dude who apparently went to Wolverine's stylist. As you might expect, there's tons of different weapon power-ups you can pick up, each with their own limited ammo, everything from lasers, flamethrowers, spread guns, all the usual Contra and Metal Slug power-ups you're used to seeing. There's a couple other things that make this game stand out. One is how great the controls feel, especially if you're playing with a joystick, and that's because this game has auto-strafing. You can fire in any direction you're facing, or you can hold down the button to keep firing in that same direction while moving around. It gives this game a comfortable, player-friendly feel to it. But don't go thinking this game is easy. There are projectiles flying around everywhere at all times, and the game only gets faster and more chaotic the further you progress, to the point that I personally had to start unfocusing my eyes a little bit so I could concentrate on dodging instead of aiming and firing, kind of like playing a shoot 'em up Thankfully, there's a button dedicated to rolling or dashing out of the way, and like I said, the controls feel exactly as they should. This game is hard, but it's still really approachable. Another unique thing in Shock Troopers is that there are split paths, so you not only can play through this one multiple times with different characters, you can take a different route to the end, which is really cool. You start out with a choice of three different paths of three different levels, and then after that, another three sets of two levels before you get to the final boss. One playthrough of this game usually takes somewhere around 35 to 40 minutes, but if you want to play through all 16 levels, then you'll be playing this one for close to two hours. So yeah, just a quick video here on Shock Troopers. It's awesome, and I consider it a must-play. It's a very well-made game that checks all the boxes. It's got great controls, great sound, great visuals, tons of replay value, and lots of tiny little understated touches. For example, I love all the different death animations. Some enemies get their arm blown clean off. Man, that's brutal. Some enemies go flying up into the air. Some enemies just explode like they're being blown apart by Dr. Manhattan in Vietnam. The only downside of this game is that the boss fights are a bit of a letdown. Each one is just a big tank or a big helicopter, nothing all that interesting. But that's totally fine, because this game offers plenty as it is. Shock Troopers received ports on PS2, PS3, PSP, Nintendo Wii, and there's a version available on Steam that came out a few years ago. So you've got no excuse but to go play this one. Alright, that's all for now, and I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Drunk. When you think of SNK and Neo Geo, you're usually going to think of fighting games like King of Fighters, beat-em-ups like King of the Monsters, or running guns like Metal Slug. But they did crank out a couple quality action platformers like Magician Lord, made for arcades by Alpha Denshi in partner with SNK in April 1990, before it was ported to the Neo Geo AES home console in July 1991 and Neo Geo CD in October 1996. On the surface, this is a very simple game with only two buttons, one to jump and one to attack, and you run to the right and kill everything that moves, but there's some cool extra stuff here that makes this one worth playing. One token gives you a health meter and two lives to get through eight levels, making this about a 30 to 40 minute playthrough, and this game gets hard right away. The first level's pretty simple, but at the beginning of the second level, you've got these spikes coming down that you can't see until you walk under them. Then you've got more spikes dropping down as enemies surround you. Later on, you've got these floating eyes and squid snails that randomly fire slow-moving projectiles at you. 
Eventually, you've got some tough platforming to get through with enemies popping up all over. It's one of those classic arcade pick up and die kind of games. You move forward, you get killed by something, you learn from your mistake, and you try to make it a little further the next time. What helps you out are all the different transformations your character can do. You start out as just a regular dude with a regular projectile, but as you destroy enemies, you'll pick up weapon upgrades, and most importantly, you'll find these orbs that will have you change form. There's three different colors, red, blue, and green, and you can carry two at once to combine forms and weapons, a little bit like how weapons work in Gunstar Heroes. For example, if you have two red orbs, you'll take a dragon form that breathes fire. If you combine red and green orbs, you'll take the form of a ninja that throws magic in a circular pattern. Red and blue gives you a water projectile attack. Green and blue makes you a samurai. It's pretty cool. The weirdest transformation is this transparent looking dude that just flexes his bicep and lightning bolts come out of him. Okay, that seriously seems like a low ranking superhero from One Punch Man. But in this game it's pretty effective, and it helps that in most forms you take you can fire in four directions, including downward in mid-air. Another nice thing about this game is that there's plenty of hidden areas you can find, and there's no time limit here, so you can take your time and explore, which is cool if you're someone that wants to get the highest possible score, or you're just into 100% runs. If you want more of a challenge, you can also just ignore all the transformation orbs and try and finish the game as the default character, but beware, it's really freaking tough. I also gotta point out some truly weird boss designs, like what in the hell is this thing? Or this thing that busts through a giant ceramic face? As you can see, the graphics here are top-notch, and the game does a great job making each of the eight levels unique and distinct, and the music holds up its end of the bargain as well. Adding to the fun of the game is the story. You play as Elta, one of the last remaining magician lords, and you must defeat the dark wizard Gal Agais, because he plans on summoning the evil god of destruction as a Taurus. But most importantly, Magician Lord features a truly terrible translation. Dale of Evil Gods? Wow, Dale Gribble was really into some weird conspiracies back then. What imprudent, you human being. Face your trial by God. Oh yeah, if you want an evil intimidating villain, just make sure the voice samples make them sound like Lorenzo music. I'm destined just to die. I'm just destined to die. Mondays just kill me. So yeah, Magician Lord was made during a time when SNK was still trying to find its footing. This game was made well before King of Fighters or Samurai Showdown or Metal Slug, so it's a pretty interesting playthrough from that standpoint alone. This game is a lot of fun. It's regularly made lists from publications like Electronics Gaming Monthly, ranking among its top 200 games ever made. But it is a tough playthrough. There's tons of arcade cheapness here, sections designed to gobble up quarters, and there's a brutal boss gauntlet at the end of the game. But hey, it's a 90s arcade game. It goes with the territory. What I find interesting is that if you play either of the home versions of Magician Lord, it's pretty much the exact same game, but unlike playing this one on an arcade emulator, you can't just pump in fake quarters. You're stuck with a finite number of lives to get through the whole game. So if you're looking for a really tough challenge, try playing it that way. But ultimately, Magician Lord is a quality playthrough any way you play it, and you should play it any way you can. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Let's keep the Patreon request train rolling with a request from Phil, a pretty unusual one with Sukeban Deka 3, only released in Japan for the Famicom Disk System. Obviously, I've spent a lot of time yammering about Super Famicom stuff on this channel, so what the hell, let's look at a Famicom game. It received an English patch not too long ago, and at the very least, it's an interesting opportunity to look at how friggin' weird some of these games can be. First of all, Sukeban Deka 3 is based on a manga, which eventually was made into an anime as well as live-action movies, and as far as I know, the 3 in the title 
doesn't mean it's the third game in the series, but rather it being based on the third TV series. Although there was a Sukeban Dika 2 for the Sega Master System, but again, that only means it's based on the second TV series. Again, Sukeban Dika means female delinquent cop. You play as three crime-fighting sisters, and you can switch between the three sisters at will in a top-down adventure-style setting, with each sister having a different weapon. But, as you'll find out right away, having an English patch here isn't necessarily going to help you all that much, because, uh, what the hell do I do? Where do I go? What am I doing? Thankfully, some kind soul out there has provided a fact on GameFacts.com, so here's how everything works. You start with the three playable characters, like I said. The top one, Yuka, has the lowest HP and AP of the three, but she knows more spells. The second sister, Yuma, has the highest HP, but knows the least amount of spells. And the third sister, Yui, whose stats are in between the other two sisters. You learn spells by leveling up, and you level up by defeating enemies. So yeah, this is kind of an action RPG. So now that we have a better sense of what this game is, now it's time to figure out what the hell to do, and where to go. And that's where this game kind of hits a wall. Nothing here is intuitive in the slightest. Maybe you gotta be more familiar with the source material. Maybe it's the translation. Maybe it's the limitations of the Famicom. And you can only do so much, and this game is just too ambitious. But it's really tough to get a consistent sense of what you're supposed to do at any given time. Here's what I mean. You go all the way to the right, and you find this sweater-looking thing. It's actually a chain mail. You pick it up, and then you switch to Yui, and go to the nearest telephone booth. Use your telephone card where it gives you a tip. In this case, it tells you to master the art of flight. Okay, how? And where do I fly? You go from booth to booth collecting info. Some clues make sense and some don't. And like I said, maybe you have to be familiar with the source material. So how do I get to the next freaking area? All these cryptic clues aren't really helping me. It turns out you have to get to level 5 with Yuka and learn the art of flight spell so she can fly across the river. Go all the way to the left and there's your next area. Yeah, not exactly intuitive or player friendly. The next area is a 2D side-scroller through a forest. And again, there's weird stuff here you have to do with specific characters in order to proceed. It isn't until the third area until you finally get some straightforward stuff without having to deal with any of that nonsense. So yeah, Sukeban Deka 3 is a really interesting game. There's a lot of cool ideas here, and it's the rare 8-bit action RPG. I like the use of items and spells, being able to switch between three characters is cool, but the game is just too confusing and convoluted, and the combat here isn't all that great to begin with. It's decent, but it's nothing all that special. Another deal breaker here is that there's no battery save, only passwords, and they're 73 characters long, no thanks. So yeah, Sukeban Deka 3 is an interesting look back at a story-driven action RPG, but I wouldn't be able to recommend in good conscience because it's just not very player friendly. Mm, that's drunk. Carl Sagan once famously said, and I'm paraphrasing here a bit, the significance of our lives is determined by our own wisdom and courage. We are the custodians of life's meaning. Knowledge is preferable to ignorance, better by far to embrace the hard truth than a reassuring fable. If we crave some cosmic purpose, then let us find ourselves a worthy goal. Sagan was a brilliant writer, not just because of the depth of his knowledge and wisdom, but because he was such an effective communicator. He was able to sum up complex and nuanced ideas in ways the layman could understand. And he was never afraid to confront the really hard questions that we all eventually face as human beings, like, what is the meaning of life? Is there a god or some kind of creator? Is there a heaven or a hell? Development team Manly and Associates made a bold statement in an attempt to answer these questions with their game Wizard of Oz for Super Nintendo made in 1993, proudly declaring that life has no meaning, with this game serving as clear, definitive proof. But don't get the wrong impression here, because while life has no meaning for them, evidently they do believe in some kind of afterlife, because Wizard of Oz cheerfully and joyously delivers the player to the slobbering mouth of hell via a meager gray plastic cartridge. As you can see, this is a 2D side-scrolling platformer where you play as Dorothy, although that looks a lot more like Christy McNichol, or even Joe from The Facts of Life. You have three lives and no continues to get through four countries, made up of seven or eight stages each, and you end up with zero faith in God after trying to play through this game. The B and A buttons both jump, Y does a projectile attack that has limited ammo you collect along the way, and the ammo here is not easy to come by, so you really have to pick your spots when using it, and it doesn't help that the game doesn't even bother to tell you how much ammo you have. And when you run out, and you will, you have to rely on the X button that does a kick with a pretty pathetic range, and that brings me to the hit detection. This is one of 
of those games where every freaking thing in this game wants you dead, and it doesn't even matter if they're on screen, off screen, or not even on the same plane as your character. Like I'm standing on this fence, and tons of stuff is hurting me? Then what's the point of the freaking fence? What, is this thing shooting spitballs at me or something? Even the hands of a clock can hurt you. And even better, you can't kick while jumping. Ugh. Oh, and of course, the hit detection isn't just bad when taking damage, it's even worse when jumping. You regularly fall through platforms, there's no rhyme or reason to it, it's just sometimes you don't land where you're supposed to. I swear this game is possessed or something. There's two other huge problems that jump out immediately when playing this one. First, there are certain enemies that are like 10 times faster than you could ever possibly react, like these vulture things. Ugh. An imbalance of speed that big is game-breaking. But no, Wizard of Oz doesn't stop there. It also throws in lots of confusing perspective changes, like making the player guess what they can and can't jump on, leading to all sorts of annoying problems and cheap deaths. And not only that, the game also implements this confusing maze layout where you're going through these doors and trees. But the problem is, when you enter a door, the game just places you off to the side. Wait, which door did I just come out of? Where do I go next? It's just a miserable time, and it makes me wonder what I am doing with my life. <sighs> so the main objective here, other than just completing each stage, is to collect bricks that will build a bridge to advance to the next country, as well as tickets that will allow admittance into the Emerald City at the end. One positive I will point out is that you can eventually play as a few other characters, the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Cowardly Lion, and not only can you switch between them at any time, they each get their own life bar. Hey, great, so now I can suffer through this thrown together level design with these enemy patterns that had like 30 seconds of thought put into them with four life bars. It doesn't help that Tin Man can't jump or duck, and every other character's attack range might be even worse than Dorothy's. Switching characters sounds nice, but all it does is extend your misery. Sure, there's items you can collect that can kind of sort of help you or whatever, but who even cares? I'm done with this crap. And just one last kick in the nuts, if you lose all your lives, you're doomed to this 24 character password system. No freaking thanks. To go back to Carl Sagan's wise words, if you do crave a cosmic purpose, please do find yourself a worthy goal, and for the love of God, make sure it doesn't include playing Wizard of Oz for Super Nintendo. Instead, make sure it includes a happy, funny little guy like Clyde T. Dog. Alright, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day!
getting us drunk. Nope, it's not. And I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.